Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's file, The Sorrowful Swindler. Before opening tonight's file, it is my pleasure to bring you season's greetings from the Equitable Society. This week at the Equitable Society in the lobby of our home office building, we have decorated one of the tallest Christmas trees in New York. And this very afternoon, as we gathered round this tree and the sound of the traditional carols echoed through the halls, there was one pleasant thought that kept coming to our minds. We thought of all the homes in this country that are celebrating Christmas more merrily, more securely. We thought of all the children to whom Santa Claus will be more real, because someone in that home had the forethought to purchase life insurance. And we of the Equitable Society and the Equitable Society representatives all over America are happy to have done our share in bringing that kind of happiness to so many American homes this Christmas time. And so to each of our three and a quarter million members and to the other millions of Americans who enjoy this radio program, we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States wish a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. And now to the file on the Sorrowful Swindler. With America virtually on the eve of celebrating her first peacetime Christmas in several years, the topic of crime seems hardly in keeping with the mood of the day. But then there is a negative kind of relationship between the two. Because it can be said truly that the doctrine of crime is the direct antithesis of the philosophy of Christmas. One is the religion of taking. The other, the religion of giving. And to the criminal, Christmas time is no more than just another time in which to ply his profession of cheating. I, his profession of cheating. As demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Several years ago, during another Christmas season, a man using the alias of Colonel Weatherford and a companion in larceny were speeding eastward on a crack train headed for New York. You know, Colonel... Yeah? I still can't figure out how come we leave Chicago so quick. I think, Michael, we may sum it up in one word of two syllables. Like which? Police. You mean they were hep to us? They would have been, Michael, shortly after that check I cashed began to ricochet. Yeah, but suppose they get an idea we caught this train and they got the New York police waiting for us when we roll into Grand Central. Please, Michael... I'd rather not have to wrestle with that remote contingency for the moment. Huh? Allow me, if you will, to revel in a vision of the unbounded joy of my dear Valerie when I show her the fruits of this little mission to the West. You ain't going to give her the whole five grand. Valerie has demanded a mink coat of Santa Claus. And Valerie, my dear Michael, knows who Santa Claus is. Have your tickets ready, please. All right, get them right here, Colonel. May I check your... Ticket, please, madam. Oh, yes. Here's my ticket, right here. Thank you. What time do we get to New York in the morning, Mr. Conductor? Nine o'clock. Well, I do hope my daughter is there to meet me. Sweet little old lady, ain't she? Yes. 
You may keep uh, this part, madam. Oh, thank you. Oh, just a minute, please. Yes? I wonder if you'd help me. I have some stock certificates with me, which may be very valuable. Colonel, I'm listening. I'm kind of afraid to keep them in my berth with me tonight. Well, I'll be back directly, madam, and uh, we'll make some arrangements, I'm sure. Oh, thank you very much. Michael, I think Donder and Blitzen and the other tiny reindeer are about to make a landing on our own roof. Since crime never takes a holiday, neither does your FBI. And at about the same moment that the pompous gentleman on the New York-bound train became stock certificate-minded, Special Agent Barclay in the New York office of the FBI was handed a teletype from Washington. What does it say, Alan? Well, Jim, there goes my Christmas shopping push with Marjorie today. Oh? They want us to go to work on a swindler. Oh, anybody we know? No, he's avoided federal violations up to now. Well, what's the up to now? He put over a fraudulent deal in Denver a few days ago by posing as a United States attorney. Uh-oh. He may have stopped over in Chicago, but they believe he's headed for New York. Oh, is this his home? He's got a record here. Well, who is he? Several persons, it seems. Colonel Josiah Weatherford and about six others. Well. Here, look this over and let's get busy. Right. While you're digesting the teletype, I'll check with the New York police. And also put a cover on railroad, plane, and bus terminals. <laughs> I didn't quite catch the name. Weatherford. Colonel Josiah Weatherford. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I'm Mrs. Greeley. How do you do? Uh, will you please sit down? Thank you. I came primarily to apologize for staring at you as I did. Oh, I didn't think anything about it. You see, you look so much like my own dear mother. Oh, then I feel quite honored. She passed on last March. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. This is to be my first Christmas without her. It'll be most desolate. Yes, I know it will. <sighs> you live in New York, Mrs. Greeley? Oh, no, no. It's too big a place for me. I'm just going there to spend Christmas with my daughter. How fortunate for your daughter. Oh, uh, I suppose that you live in New York? Well, I sort of divide my time between Chicago and New York. Uh, I have an investment business with offices in both. Investment business, did you say? Yes, well, then maybe you'd know about my stock certificate. I beg your pardon? I mean, uh, know whether they're any good or not. Oh. Well, I don't know. May I see them? Oh, dear. I've already let the conductor put them away in a safe place for the night. Oh. You see, I was going to have them looked into while I was in New York. Uh, I could do that for you. You see, my husband has been dead about ten years, and I didn't know he'd left anything like that till... So the other day I was rummaging around in his old desk and, well, there it was, a thousand shares all tied together. A thousand shares of what? A Lodestar Mining Company. What was that again? Lodestar Mining Company. Lodestar? That's what I thought you said. Do you know something about it? Uh, well, it's not listed on the exchange anymore that I know. Oh, then, then you mean it's, uh, it's no good? I wouldn't say that. I, I want to look it up for you. Oh. You will let me serve you in this, won't you? Oh, I'd be very glad if you would. Especially since that's your business. Well, now, you just leave everything to me and I'll be talking to you again in the morning before we get off the train. Oh, thanks. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> well, how'd you make out? Santa Claus is not merely knocking at our door, Michael. He's trying to break in with a pack full of gold. Special Agent Farrell speaking. Morning, Jim. This is Alan. Hey, say, where are you? Grand Central, waiting to cover the Manhattan Limited when it gets in. Good. I was just going to have to hop over there myself. What's up? Well, Weatherford's on that train. How do you know? A teletype just came in from Chicago. He passed a bad check there yesterday. And a ticket agent at LaSalle Station remembers selling Weatherford and a man with him space on the Manhattan. Then I'd better run. It's about to pull in. Right. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yes, sir, Mr. Barclay. A man of that description occupied space in car 254. Then what happened to him, Porter? Well, uh, he and the fellow with him got off at Harmon this morning. Uh Uh-oh. I sure wish I'd have known earlier. Well, we didn't know ourselves in time to be prepared for that trick. Well, thanks, anyway. Uh, Oh, say, uh, uh, wait a minute. Yes? There's somebody might know something about him, and maybe she's still in the station. Who? A little old lady who had the space across the aisle from there. Oh? This man gave me a note when they got off at Harmon to give to her when she got up. What does she look like? Well, her name is Greeley. She's about five foot two, gray hair, and she's wearing... Michael. Yeah? Valerie's waiting in the apartment here for me. I prefer to see you alone. Yeah, I prefer the same thing. I'll wait for you downstairs. Splendid. Valerie? Valerie? I'm in here. Valerie, my darling, come here. Wait a minute. Not so fast. But, my dear, aren't you glad to see me? I don't know. How was your trip? How was it? Look, my sweet. Yeah. Five thousand dollars. Let me see one of the bills. They're genuine, every last one of them. Oh, my darling, I am so glad to see you. I have missed you so much. <laughs> and now I can go right down this very day and get my mink coat. Oh. Well, you see, Valerie. What's the matter? Well, naturally, you're going to get the fur coat, Valerie. That's right. But tomorrow will be ample time. What is my sweet? I'm waiting for the hook. What is it? I merely want to retain possession of the money for the balance of the day. Go on. For five dollars a share, darling, I can pick up a thousand shares of Lodestar mining stock from a party who doesn't know their true value. Have they got any true value? Have they? Lodestar merged a few years ago with Rocky Mountain. Each share of Lodestar is still exchangeable for one share of Rocky Mountain, worth today one hundred dollars a share. You mean put out 5000 and get back 100000 Exactly. Look, a mink coat on the back is worth 40 in the window. Nothing doing. Well, darling, you can't... You fight. just dreamed this up to keep from coming across. I swear you... I didn't, Valerie. She's going to call me any minute. What, she... Now, don't get excited, my dear. Don't get excited. It's a little old lady. A Mrs. Greeley I met on the train. She has the stock. Oh, yeah? That's probably Mrs. Greeley now. <laughs> Colonel Weatherford speaking. Oh, hello, Mrs. Greeley. Are you at your daughter's now? No. No, she lives in the country and she didn't get my telegram until this morning. Oh, but she'll be in for me this evening. Oh, I see. Uh, it was snowing, so I took a room in a little hotel not far from the station to wait for her. Of course. Well, Mrs. Greeley, I have some good news for you about your stock. Oh, you have? How would you like to have $5,000 in cash for a Christmas present? Mm. $5,000? That's right. Good gracious me. Now, you just give me the name of your hotel, and I'll be right over in a few minutes. You mean we'll be right over. Alan. Yes, Jim? Well, I mushed over as soon as I could. Good. I think this is our best prospect of getting a line on Weatherford. Mm -hmm. The Greeley woman checked her back at the station, huh? Yeah. You got anything out of the conductor? Mrs. Greeley gave him what she said was some stock certificates to keep safe for her last night. Oh? Weatherford was across the aisle and saw it all. I see. Ten to one, he's trying to pull a swindle on her for that stock. Well, I hope she comes back for her bag before the job's done. Yes, but she checked it two hours ago. And a lot can happen in two hours. Weatherford? Yes? Uh, if the Lodestar Mining Company is out of existence, I, I don't see why the group this young lady represents wants to buy my star. Oh, you should make that clearer, Colonel Weatherford. Uh, the group still controls the Lodestar Company's property, Mrs. Greedy. Oh. And they're going to start operating again. And they're willing to pay five, five, let's say five dollars a share for all the old outstanding stock. Well, maybe I'd better hold on to mine and... Maybe it'll be worth more after a while. Oh, oh, explain it to her, Colonel. It may be years before it's worth a cent more, Mrs. Greeley, and after all, $5,000 is a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, well, I'll trust your judgment, Colonel Weatherford. Good, I'm sure you won't regret it. Do you, uh, 
have all that money with you? Yes, here it is. Five thousand dollars. Fifty one hundred dollar bill. Gracious me. Now, if you have the stock for you. Oh, of course, yes. It's right here in my handbag. Splendid. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, here we are. Mm-hmm. And now I want you both to put up your hands. What? What's the meaning of that gun? Oh, it merely means that I know as much about Lodestar as you do, you old swindler. <laughs> and I wish I did have some of the stuff. Well, now, look here, you, you can't... You asked her if she didn't want $5,000 for a Christmas present, didn't you? But, but I... Well, I'm not going to give up my mink coat uh, this uh, evening. Uh, 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 be nice now. And back into that closet over there. Both sell you. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe somebody will open it before Christmas. <laughs> Crooks don't qualify as men of goodwill, do they? So let's leave them for a moment while I tell you about someone you like. A man who is bubbling over with the contagious good humor that infects all good people this time of year. This week at the Equitable Society, I met a senior vice president coming out of the building. He was carrying a regular pyramid of packages in his arms. And just as I said hello to him... Something went wrong with the middle of the pyramid, and half of his packages fell out of his arms and slid to the floor. Serves me right, he laughed as I helped him to pick him up. Just what I deserve for putting off my Christmas shopping till the last minute and then trying to do it all at once. He paused and chuckled. And I'm the man who's spent his life telling folks not to put things off. My business in life is telling folks not to put off buying the life insurance protection they need. Well, I said, that's not such a bad way to spend your life, is it? We smiled and answered, saying, Yes, there are a lot of people in this world who are much happier right now because someone from the Equitable Society kept urging a husband or father not to put off buying life insurance. Believe me, that's a pretty pleasant thought for a fellow to entertain this time of year. Well, as I said goodbye to him, the thought came to me that it'd be a very fine thing if all members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States had the same opportunity to know the officers of their society that I have. Could get to know the sincerity and human understanding that they put into their daily work managing the life insurance of three and a quarter million Equitable Society members. I've met all these men. And I've yet to find any stuffing in any one of their shirts, or any brass in any one of their hats. No matter how important their jobs are, their doors are always open, and their time is always at the disposal of members of this Life Assurance Society. You see, the officers of the Equitable Society are the kind of men who take pride in the thought that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security For you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the file on the Sorrowful Swindler. There is a saying that no one is so easily swindled as a swindler. And the victim intending himself to commit a crime, can ill afford to complain to the law. Therefore, being denied recourse to the law, he usually takes matters into his own hands and generally with the same net result. Both are caught. At the moment, however, the little gray-haired confidence woman is trudging through the snow away from the hotel with $5,000 in $100 bills while behind the locked door of the closet in the hotel room. But, Valerie, darling... Don't darling me, you financial wizard. Nagging me is not going to get us out of here. You'd just be glad it's a closet where there's not room enough to swing at you. Michael's waiting just outside the hotel. Sure, probably building a snowman. But he's surely seen the woman leaving by herself. Oh, of course, of course. He probably helped her across the... You'd think he'd suspect something and come up here to see about us? Oh, no, that calls for thinking. Valerie, if you'll help me push against the door just once more, I'm sure we can force it. I should knock myself out getting you out of a closet. Look, 
you're in here, too. You got us in, you get us out. Very uh, well. Five thousand and get back a hundred thousand. Can't miss. It's a sin. Oh, for heaven's sake, Valerie, shut up. Come on. Let's get out of here quickly. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I'm warning you, I'm getting a mink coat tomorrow, or else... Or else what? Or else the police are going to learn where you got that 5000 in the first place. But, Valerie, darling, you can't... You heard me? <laughs> it's the mink or the clink. Well, it doesn't look like our Mrs. Greeley's coming back for a bag. She only checked it a couple of hours ago. Give her time. Yes, but in the meantime, this weather hey, could have... This looks like our little lady now. Yeah, uh, seems to fit her description all right. And she's going over to the baggage counter. Come on. No, wait a minute. What? For one thing, somebody's trailing her. Huh? Look over there. And according to the conductor's description, that would be Weatherford's pal. Yeah, you're right. And item number two, do you know who our Mrs. Greeley really is? No. I had dealings with her a couple of years ago. That's an old-time operator who's known as Larson E. Annie. What? So far as Weatherford and she are concerned, I'd say at this point it's a question of who has done what to whom. Well, then let's pick them up and ask some questions. And miss getting Weatherford? Hey, look, there she goes. And a shadow, too. Come on, Jim. Let's make it a convoy. What good is it going to do to come back here to the apartment? Michael wasn't in front of the hotel, was he? So what? Darling, please. Patience and fortitude. Probably saw the woman leave and suspect... Oh, just a minute. Hello? This is Mike. Say, what's going on? Where the devil are you, Michael? I seen the old lady leave the hotel by herself, and I said something's crazy about this. Where's she now? I'm in a telephone booth at the State National Bank. I said, where is she? She's standing in line with a deposit slip and a fistful of dough. Oh. What happened? We've been robbed, Michael. Yeah? Don't take your eyes off her until she holds up somewhere, and then call me, do you hear? Sure, I If you slip up, Michael, it'll be a cheerless Christmas for you and me. What do you mean? Did you ever spend Christmas behind the bars, Michael? Not yet. Then do what I tell you or you will. Here comes Larson and his shadow back from the phone. He must have contacted Weatherford. What do you make of all this? I'd say that Weatherford has now learned how it feels to be swindled himself. He took somebody for the money first, and now Annie's taken him. Yes, which puts it up to us to take them both. Well, what's your idea? You stay here and keep your eyes open. And you? If Weatherford's pal saw me talking to Annie, what would he probably think? Well, that you were a confederate of hers, maybe. That's all I wanted to be sure of. What? Maybe this will do the trick, Jim. Come, darling. Let me help you trim the Christmas tree. You better get out and trim somebody for that mink coat. I tell you, I'm waiting on a telephone call from Michael. I'm surprised he can even use a telephone. You should not disparage Michael's intelligence, my dear. Ha! Providence beat me to it. Michael is a simple soul, but a loyal one with a great amount of common sense. And on occasion displays a flash of superior intelligence. Maybe you ought to be working for him, then. May I fix your cocktail? No, and don't try to soften me up because I'm... Yes? It's me, Colonel. Well? I done what you told me. Where is she? You better meet me quick, corner of Madison and 91st. There are four corners, Michael, you know. Yeah, but I'll be standing on just one of them, boss. East side, downtown. You better hurry. I'll be there right away. You mean we'll be there. Then come on quickly, my dear. Now you shall have that mink. Yes, sir. Uh, Valerie, my dear. Okay, okay. Here you are, driver. Oh, thanks, miss. All right, where is he? Uh, right over there. Michael, 
Oh, hiya. Where's the woman? I done a good job of trailing her. You ought to be proud of her. I said, where is she? Right in that brownstone house. Well, what are we waiting for? Lead the way, Michael. Okay, come on. She went right in here, the ground floor. This better work. Please, my dear. Yes? Greetings, Mrs. Greeley. Well, come right in. Go ahead, darling. Hmm. Michael. I dare say you're a trifle surprised to see us again. Well, as a matter of fact, Colonel Weatherford, I am a little surprised the way things turned out. But we rather expected you'd come here. Who's we? Yes, what do you mean? What she means, Weatherford, is that you're Uh, all under arrest. What? (laughs) What is this? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? This is an apartment that we used on another case. It was also convenient to bring Mrs. Greeley here for questioning. We hoped you'd follow her. You mean she's working with you? Oh, not willingly, Colonel. But as you know, this is the Christmas season and it's full of surprises for everyone. And now, your FBI would like to take this opportunity to wish for all of you a Merry Christmas and a happy, peaceful, and prosperous New Year. And through your continued support and cooperation, it will go on protecting your right to enjoy them year after year. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society for the Financial Security of Life Insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society agent, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Murder on the High Seas. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation... Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Midway through tonight's program, we shall have the special pleasure of bringing you once again one of America's best-loved businessmen, Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Society. Tonight's file, Murder on the High Seas. The international thief, whose criminal activities were curtailed by wartime restrictions on ocean travel, is now at work again along the ship lanes of the world. The international thief is the cleverest of his breed. Because of the scope of his activities, it is difficult for the law to detect his work and track him down. But when he commits a crime on a vessel flying the American flag, he finds himself up against the forces of your FBI. It is 9.30, and the small American freighter Edna May, out of Maracaibo, continues steadily on its northward course toward New Orleans. In his cabin under the bridge, Captain Peterson has been dinner host to two of the ship's passengers, a Dr. Myler and his secretary. They have just finished their coffee. Have a cigar, Doctor? No, oh, thank you, Captain. I prefer my pipe. Yeah, it's been a delicious dinner. Degree, Karen? Well, with two such charming companions, I must say, I hardly noticed the fool. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see, Captain, why I engaged her as my secretary. <laughs> Indeed, I can. Beg your pardon, Captain. Yes, Mr. Ramey. Glass has fallen, sir. Looks like it's making up in the Northwest. Secure everything. I'll be along. Right, sir. Well, I, I'm afraid, folks, it's going to get a little rough. Well, then we better make for our cabins while we can still stand up. Good night, Captain, and thanks for your hospitality. Yes, it's been charming. This was my pleasure. Now, good night, Captain. Good night. Good night. Karen, uh, give me your hand. Mm -hmm. A very entertaining man. Yes, he's delightful. We go around the radio shack here. Very well. Oh, wait a minute. What is it? My bag. I've left it in the captain's cab. Oh, I'll get it for you, my dear. You go on ahead to your cabin. I'm awfully sorry. <laughs> oh, nonsense. It's getting rough. I'll be careful. I will. Who are you? I say, who are you and why are you standing... <clears throat> I left him just a few minutes ago, Captain. It, it's incredible. I know, Miss Brenner. How did it happen? Your fellow passenger here, Mr. Hanley, found the body. Yes, uh, purely by accident. I was taking a turn around the deck when I fairly stumbled over the doctor. He was between the radio shack and the captain's cabin here. Where did he leave you, Miss Brenner? At the after ladder. He was coming back here to get my bag. I see. Can you think of any motive for his being killed? Yes. Yes, Captain, there was plenty of motive. What do you mean? Dr. Mahler was in a Nazi concentration camp. The report was that he had died there. Actually, with the help of friends, he escaped to South America. Yes? In South America, he fought the Nazis just as he had fought them at home. But the war is over now. All the Nazi troublemakers have not been caught, Captain. You think he was killed because of this? He must have been. He was on his way to the States to tell what he knew. Do you know of anyone on board who might have had a reason to kill Dr. Myler? No. We never knew Mr. Hanley or your other passenger, Mr. Dargan, until we boarded ship. Uh, excuse me, Captain. Yes, Hanley? Of course, I don't wish to create any trouble for a fellow passenger, but... Uh... Well? I saw Mr. Dargan on deck just before I discovered Dr. Myler's body. What was he doing? Walking rather hurriedly away from where the body was found. Well, I think we should have a talk with Mr. Dargan. I'll have the steward get him up here at once. Come in. 
I have Mr. Dargan here, Captain. Uh, bring him in, Steward. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Hi, Miss Brenner. Mr. Dargan. Hanley. Hello, Dargan. Mr. Dargan, do you know why I sent for you? Yeah, the uh, steward gave me a fill-in. It's too bad. I am trying to check on everyone's activities. Can you tell me what you've been doing for the past hour? Yeah, I was in my cabin most of the time. Were you on deck at all? For a while. Why? Mr. Hanley here discovered the body. It was between my cabin and the radio shack. Yeah? He told me that just before this discovery, he saw you on deck. So what? You were walking away from where the body was found. If it was near the radio shack, he was right. I was in there sending a message. You can check that with your operator. I will. Who was with Hanley when the body was found? I was alone. Why? Maybe somebody ought to check up on you. <laughs> now, see, I here. believe you're in the mining business, Mr. Dargan. That's right. Have you ever had any dealings with the Nazis in South America? Are you kidding? We just fought a war with them, remember? Captain, I wonder if I might go to my cabin. Oh, yes, yes. Go ahead, Miss Brenner. I'm going to question these men a bit further and then radio a report to the federal authorities. A uh, steward. Yes, sir? Uh, take Miss Brenner below. Yes, sir. Good night, everyone. Good night, Miss Brenner. Good night. Go ahead, miss. Thank you, Stuart. This way, miss. Never mind the act, you fool. What do you mean? You bungled the job. What are you talking about? Why didn't you throw the body overboard? I never had the chance. Why? Somebody beat us to the job. Tom. Yes, Nick. Radio message from the captain of the freighter Edna May, bound for New Orleans. There's been a murder on board. Oh? A Dr. Heinrich Myler escaped to South America two years ago from a German concentration camp. Oh. He was accompanied by his secretary, Karen Brenner. Oh, and uh, seems both originally from Vienna. Radio the captain to send us a list of his passengers right away and all details he has on them. Mm, what about the crew? Well, there's a possibility he took on a hand or two at Maracaibo we can't check on at this end. Get that information, too. Right. Meantime, we'll go to work on Myler and Brenner. Who? Who is it? Message for you, Miss Brenner. Mr. Dark. That's right, baby. The first name is Sam. What's the meaning of this? I guess you might call it a business call. I don't know what you're talking about, but please leave. Look, baby, I just came here. Please, I don't feel well. I'm terribly upset. Over the doctor? Yes. Now get out of here. I told you this was a business call. The business is why the doc died. What do you mean? Well, it's uh, kind of a long story, but if I were you, I'd listen, baby. Well? When the Nazis invaded France, they helped themselves to a lot of things that didn't belong to them. When they left France, some of those things weren't uh, returned. Yes? One of these light-fingered Nazis was a guy named Karl von Ritter. His touch was paintings, paintings stolen from a gallery in Paris. Look, I am not interested Just in... listen. This Von Ritter guy took these paintings to South America with the idea that eventually he'd bring them to the States and make a nice score. Uh, only he didn't quite make it. You know why, don't you? You know that the doc was really Carl Von Ritter. That's not oh, true. Oh, now look, baby, I did a lot of research on this. It's a lie, I tell you. Suppose we let the captain decide that. Come on, let's tell him the story. Wait a minute. Okay. What do you want? <laughs> uh, now you're talking, sweetheart. Where are the paintings? I don't know. Now, wait a minute. I swear Look, I don't. Look, you were working this thing with him, weren't you? Weren't you? I knew who he was, yes. And you know about the painting? I didn't know where he kept them. Somebody did. That's why the guy was killed. Then find out from whoever killed him. Oh, baby, that's why I came here. I had nothing to do with his death. Look, you and that guy, Hanley, are working on this thing together. Hanley? I pegged him the minute they came aboard ship. He's a larceny guy from way back. I never saw him before in my life. Stop, will you? I swear it. Okay, maybe you're leveling. But if you are, you've got real trouble. How? 
Hanley must have killed the doctor. The chances are you're next on his list. Oh. You still got one chance. What? We become partners. How do I know you didn't kill the doctor? You don't. But I didn't. How do I know I can trust you? You don't. But you got to play ball with me. Now, where did he keep the paintings? In a secret compartment in his trunk. That's my girl. Let's nail him now. Here's the Edna May's passenger list, Tom. Just came in. Good. There are only four passengers aboard. I see. Did you get a call back on Myler and Miss Brenner yet? Not yet, Nick. They're still checking. Mm-hmm. Captain Peterson took on two hands in Maricabo. Yes, I see. An oiler and a steward. Shall I start a check on them, Tom? Yes, and on these passengers, too. Grady speaking. All right? Definitely, huh? What about Brenner? Uh-huh. All right, send over the files on them, please, and thanks. Well... Dr. Heinrich Myler died two years ago in a concentration camp. Then who was the murdered man? We've got to find that out. Tom, what about Miss Brenner? Been in South America four years, suspected of having worked with Nazi agents, but nothing was ever proved. You think she could have killed a man? We can't think anything yet, Nick, until we get the answers to an awful lot of questions. When is the ship due at New Orleans? Sometime tomorrow, if the, the storm she's in now doesn't delay her too much. Well, we've got some fast work to do. We can make that 8 o'clock plane for New Orleans... Radio the captain will board the ship when she drops anchor in midstream for inspection. All right. Meanwhile, we've got to find out who Dr. Myler really is. Isn't this his cabin here? Yes. There we are. Go ahead, baby. All right. The lights are right over... We ain't putting on any lights. I've got a flash here. There. Now, where's the truck? Right in the corner. Okay. Where's the secret compartment? In the bottom. Hey, this trunk is locked. I have a key for it. It's back in my cabin. That's great. Go get it quick. Very well. What was that? At the Equitable Society, I happened to hear President Thomas I. Parkinson talking about New Year's resolutions. And some of the things he said impressed me so much that I've asked him to repeat them in person to our radio audience tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I take pleasure in introducing Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Thank you, Carl Frank, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In three days and a few hours from now... The bells will be ringing, the whistles will be blowing, and people will be saying Happy New Year to one another. Since I won't be able to be with you at that moment, I'll have to give you my good wishes in advance. So a happy and prosperous New Year to all of you, from me personally, and from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. I think everybody realizes that this year, 1946, we are soon to enter, will be a critical year in the history of civilization, the beginning of a new age for the whole world. So when we make our New Year's resolutions, isn't this a good time for all Americans to reaffirm their faith in the traditional American virtues of thrift, neighborly cooperation, and self-reliance? In all past times of crisis, those three qualities have stood us in good stead. We've depended on them before. We can depend on them again. Of course, when I say traditional American virtues, I don't mean that we Americans have any monopoly on them. The Scotch, for example, are celebrated for their thriftiness. The Scandinavian people are famous for the success of their cooperative movements. But in all history, in all the world, no other nation has ever beaten America on self-reliance. I believe that this is a matter of inheritance. After all, every citizen of this country, if he goes back far enough, is descended from emigrants. And that's something to be proud of. Any emigrant is a man or a woman 
who had the courage and initiative to leave his homeland and cross an ocean in search of greater opportunity and greater freedom. That's the pioneer spirit. And this same spirit of self-reliance is the backbone of our American system of free enterprise today. Self-reliance is what makes a man start a little business and then develop that little business into a big business. Self-reliance is what makes a man buy a farm, build a home of his own, and plan things so that his children will get a first-class education. For 86 years, the organization of which I have the honor to be president, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, has been working with Americans who practice the virtues of thrift, cooperation, and self-reliance. You see, when a man buys future security in the form of life insurance, he gives a perfect demonstration of self-reliance. He proves that he believes in taking care of himself and his family, no matter what happens. He proves that he believes in standing on his own two feet. Furthermore, our society is strictly a cooperative enterprise, owned entirely by its members and run solely for their benefit. Thanks to the thrift of our three and a quarter million members, a great protective fund has been built up which gives every individual member far more security than he could achieve by his own unaided efforts. Thrift, neighborly cooperation, and self-reliance. These are the qualities that have made the Equitable Society strong. They are also the qualities which have made America strong. The more we practice those three virtues in the future, the more certain we can be of a happy new year in 1946 and of happy new years for many years to come. And now back to the file on Murder on the High Seas. Many unusual methods have been employed by your FBI in the solution of crimes. Tonight's file is an example of this. A murder is committed on the high seas. FBI agents have neither seen the corpse nor interviewed the suspects. Nevertheless, they are already gathering facts, building evidence that will ultimately lead to the apprehension of the killer. The killer is still at large, however. And aboard the freighter Edna May, in a cabin below deck, Sam Dargan, victim of an unknown assailant, lies unconscious on the floor. Dargan. Mr. Dargan. <gasps> Mr. Dargan, what's wrong? What happened? In my head. What happened somebody, to you? Somebody slugged me. Who? I don't know. I, I was... Wait a minute. Yes? Did you really leave this room? But of course. Why? I heard the door close, but... I might have stayed here. I didn't look around. Look, here's the trunk key. I went to my stateroom. Look on those lights. I did when I heard you moaning. Look. Look. The trunk, it's been opened. Hey, what is this? It's been rifled. The secret compartment is open. The paintings are gone. Hanley. What? This is Hanley's work, baby. You mean he has the paintings? Sure. But he ain't gonna have him for long. Good morning, Captain. Well, good morning, Mr. Hanley. May I fall in with you? Of course. You're up and about rather early, aren't you? Oh, yes. I'm always an early riser at sea. You sleep well? Yes, like a top, sir. Um... Anything new in the killing? No. I'm just waiting now to turn it over to the FBI. Good morning, Captain. Well, Mr. Dargan, Miss Brenner. Good morning, Captain. Looks like a lot of early risers this morning. Yeah. What happens, Dargan? What? Your head. The bandage. What happened? I took a pretty good wallop last night, Hanley. Oh, how was that? I got a little restless and took a walk. And just as I came to Dr. Miles' cabin... Yes? Uh, that's uh, where it happened. What do you mean? Oh, the ship did a half roll, Captain. I banged my head on a brass fitting. Oh, well, that's too bad, old man. Yes. Um, what time are we due at New Orleans, Captain? We ought to drop hook in about an hour. Good. Well, uh, uh, shall we continue our stroll, sir? Very well. Will you join us, folks? I know, thank you. Uh, see you later, then. Uh, cheerio. I was watching Hanley's face when you told the story. He's the one, all right. Sure. We arrive in an hour. 
What are you going to do? You make sure that he stays on deck. I'm going down now and case out his cabin. Well, what happened? No dice. What? I went through everything in Hanley's cabin. The paintings aren't there. What do we do? Where's Hanley? Up forward there. Come on, we're going to talk to that guy. What good will that do? At least I can find out if he really slugged me. It still could have been you, sweetheart. Now, look. Shut up. Hanley. Uh, yes, old boy? I want to talk to you. Very well. Uh, this, uh, a slug on the head I got last night, you know how it really happened, don't you? Yes, I heard your story. Quit stalling. I know all about you, Hanley. You work on the same side of the street that I do. I'm afraid I don't follow you. Larceny Boulevard, mister. You gave it to me last night in the doctor's cabin, and you were there for the same reason I was. Mrs. Brennan, what's he talking about? Look, she belongs to the same club, too. Now, where are the paintings? Uh, what paintings? I'm giving you one chance, Hanley. Either you play with us on a three-way cut or everybody falls. There's a boat pulling alongside. That's probably the G-men, Hanley. You know, the FBI. Now, talk fast. Very well, but, uh... What I have to say will be very disappointing. I give you my word, I have not got the paintings. Captain, I think you should know some of the facts we've already assembled on this case. You mean you have something just from that list of names I sent you, Mr. Grady? Yes. Dr. Myler's real name was Carl von Ritter. He was a Nazi who fled to South America. I understand he had in his possession some very valuable paintings. Stolen, I suppose. Yes. We can assume that he had them with him aboard ship here, that he hoped to dispose of them in the States. Yes? Oh, come in, Mr. Jackson. Thanks, Captain. How'd you make out, Nick? I searched Von Ritter's cabin. And? I found a trunk that had been forced open. Mm -hmm. There was a secret compartment in the bottom. It was empty. Yeah. Paintings were probably in that trunk. They must have been town. There's no trace of them anywhere else. That Brenner girl sounds like the logical suspect, gentlemen. Could have been either of your passengers, too, Captain. Hanley or Dargan? Yes, we're waiting for information on them now. Mm-hmm. It also could have been that steward you took on at Maracaibo. What? In fact, he's the first man we'd like to talk to, if you'd be good enough to send for him, Captain. Surely. Send for me, Captain. Yes, Stuart. Uh, this gentleman is a special agent of the FBI. I see. He wants to talk to you about the death of Dr. Myler. I'm afraid I know nothing about it. Then let me tell you something I know. What do you mean? Your real name is not Paul Mason. It's Max Schmidt. Uh, that's true, but... But I tell you, I didn't... Wait have... a minute. You and your oiler friend jumped a Swedish ship six weeks ago in a South American port. Well, what if we did? Police down there keep pretty good track of strangers, Schmidt. That's how they were able to tell us about your contacts with Miss Brenner. Shall I go any farther? All right. Miss Brenner did hire us to make this trip and help forge our papers and everything so we could sign on the ship. And you were supposed to kill Dr. Myler and get part of the money from the sale of the paintings. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. No? What happened? The oiler and I decided not to go through it. Excuse me, Tom. Yes, Nick. The wireless room just gave me this. I see. Oh, that'll be all now, Stuart. You can go. Yes, sir. Well, this is the information we wanted on Dargan and Hanley. Both of their records would fill a book. Well. Captain. Yes? I'm going to call on you for some help. Now, here's what I'd like you to do. Well, Captain, it's very gracious of you to tender us a farewell dinner. This was by request, Mr. Hanley. Really? Whose request? The special agents of the FBI. What was their point? Well, for one thing, Mr. Dargan, they wanted to be sure they'd know where you all were. Stuart? Uh, Yes, miss? Some more coffee, please. Surely. They also wanted to acquaint you with a few facts. Like what? Like who murdered Dr. Myler. They have learned who the killer is, Captain. They have plenty of suspects. For instance... All of you know that Dr. Myler was really Carl von Ritter. He was attempting to smuggle some valuable paintings into the States. And uh, how could we know that, Captain? Well, for one thing, Mr. Hanley, 
You dropped your initial cigarette case in Von Ritter's cabin last night while you were rifling it for the paintings. Cigarette case doesn't prove that. The lump on Mr. Dargan's head does. What? There was no blood on the brass fittings outside of Von Ritter's cabin, Mr. Dargan, where you might have bumped your head. But there was some on the floor inside the cabin. That doesn't make me the killer, Captain. I'd say whoever has the paintings committed the murder. The paintings have been found. What? Where? In one of the crew's quarters. What? All right. What? Stay where you are. All of you. Put, put, put down that gun, Stuart. Huh? Oi! Be careful, will you, Nick? All right. He is the killer? Yes. He told us all about his deal with you, Miss Brenner. We figured if he'd do that, he'd also double-cross you. That's why we searched his quarters. Now, Captain, you may proceed, if you wish, to dock the Edna May. The subsequent finding of the murderer's weapon led to the trial and conviction of the ship's steward on the charge of first-degree murder. Hanley... Dargan and Miss Brenner were sentenced to the federal penitentiary for their part in the conspiracy. Their apprehension is a reminder that wherever the American flag flies as a symbol of civil authority, your FBI is on the job day and night, enforcing the law of the land on all who conspire against it. Before you hear about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, may the Equitable Society again wish you a happy and prosperous New Year. Just as you look to the FBI for national security, you look to the Equitable Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the same spirit in which it has lived through 86 years, The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States shall, throughout 1946 and the years to come, continue, like your FBI, to be dedicated to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Crime in the Roaring Twenties. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, this first broadcast of 1946, 
This first week in January is a good time to look forward into the future and back at the past. We of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States are happy to report that the end of World War II finds our society in a stronger position than ever before. Our membership, our assets, and the amount of life insurance owned by our members increased during the war years. So the Equitable Society has weathered this war as successfully as it did three previous wars and seven major depressions. We wish to report also that in the future, as in the past, the premium dollars of Equitable Society members will be invested in ways that benefit the entire country. And by serving its members, the Equitable Society will continue to serve America. Tonight's file, Crime in the Roaring Twenties. This week, as America begins the first year of another post-war era, she faces here at home, just as she did some 25 years ago, those many grave problems which grow out of war. But of them all, none is a greater menace to the right of American citizens to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness than that problem which is splashing more and more black ink across the front pages of our newspapers every day. Crime. Addressing the International Association of Chiefs of Police recently, Director J. Edgar Hoover of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, your FBI, uttered this warning. After every great war, there has been a recession of moral fortitude. This one will be no exception. I hope, as you do, that the racketeers, the overlords, the desperados, and the criminal scum who characterize the Roaring Twenties will not come back to the American scene. I fear, however, that this is wishful thinking. Once they get a start and find they can succeed, we shall face very serious trouble. It is the delinquent youngster of the war years who is now graduating into the ranks of seasoned criminals. They are now becoming the postgraduates of crime and are committing the more despicable offenses. It was the delinquent youngsters of 1917 and 18 who graduated into the seasoned criminals of that post-war era, who made the Roaring Twenties roar. Roar with the explosions of pistols, machine guns, and pineapple bombs. Will it happen here again? This is how it happened then. This is how one delinquent youngster of 1917 became a postgraduate of crime in the Roaring Twenties. In a cellar room of the Black Cat Club, the roadhouse just outside a large Midwestern city, the slot machines and dice games, as usual, were taking more than giving. While upstairs on the main floor, the young hip blast set were drinking bootleg liquor in dim corners and dancing the black bottom to a pasty-faced orchestra. Presently, young Red Martin and two companions sweep into the room and take over a booth in a corner. Hey, waiter. Yeah. Give these guys a setup and bring me a Coke, will you? Okay. What's with the Coke? Why don't you take a real drink, Red? None of that rot got for me, pal. You can't make dough out of it and ulcers, too. And I'm going to make dough out of it. Yeah? How do you mean? I'll tell you all about it in a minute. Hey. Look. Yeah? A couple of dames over there making a big play. Forget them. I'll show you something with real class. Where? That blonde. Huh? There she goes now, toward the back. Hey. That's for me, fellas. Are you kidding, Red? You know who that is? That's Legs Miller's dame. I know. Guy that runs this joint? Yeah. Look, stupid. Don't you know who Legs Miller really is? Yeah, I know. He does a little bootlegging. A him. little? He ain't in the pint and quart business. He runs the stuff by the truckload. Yeah? Sure. And he's the guy I'm here to do business with. Are you huh? kidding, Red? What are you set up, boys? Your coke, Red. Okay, say, uh... Tell Casey I want to see him. Sure. Now, before this Casey gets here, I want to tell you guys something. Okay. Up to now, we've just been playing a nickel and dime rackets. It's time we graduated. How? 
We'll hook up with a gang like Legs Miller's. Make some real dough. And if we're smart, we'll have our own business before you know it, okay? Well, well, gee, Red, I... Uh... What's the matter, you yellow? No, no, of course not. You want to but... see me, Red? Yeah. Well, what about? You know what about, Casey. Yeah, but Legs ain't... Don't give me that. He's here. I saw his dame go back a minute ago. Look, Red, the guy is busy. I want to see him. Now. Okay, kid. Come on. Stick right here, boys. I'll be back with a deal. Legs. Yeah, Casey? Hey, uh, you got a minute? What is it? I, uh, I got a guy here. I want you to talk to you. Okay. Bring him in. You want me to leave? No, stick around, honey. Go ahead, Red. Okay. This here is Red Martin. Hiya. Hiya, Legs. What do you want, kid? I want to talk business. I'm not a kid. <laughs> he means now he's shaving, honey. <laughs> but where did he get those big shoulders? You like him, sweetheart? What do you mean by that crack, kid? Darling, he means do I like him? And I do. Look, Legs. Do you want to talk business or don't you? Okay, Mr. Martin. What kind of business? Did Casey tell you anything about me? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I got a proposition for you. Yeah? You've been doing pretty good for yourself, but you could be doing a whole lot better. No kidding. Yeah. Here's my deal. This will really put you on top. I got some guys, you got some guys. I bring my guys in and join up with you and work on a commission. Before you know it, everybody in the whiskey business is working for us. That's your proposition? Yeah. How's it sound to you? Casey, huh? bounce this bum. Wait a minute. I said bounce him. Keep away from me. I'll walk out of here under my own power. But I want you to remember something, Legs. Next time you and me get together, it'll be you that gets the bounce. What? And your dame here will get to stick around and try out these big shoulders. Boy, you... What happened, Red? Did you make a deal? No. But I made a promise. So let's get started on it. What are we going to do? First, we're going to get lots of power on wheels somewhere. Come on. Crime, like history, repeats itself. This juvenile delinquent product of World War I has his counterpart today. Somewhere in the nation, a youngster like Red Martin may be planning a similar career of ruthless violence. Let him listen, then. Listen and learn. The first report on Red Martin is received in the local office of the FBI. Special Agent Brown speaking. Good morning, Mr. Brown. Police headquarters. I think this is one for you FBI fellas. All right. What is it? Morristown, across the state line last night. Yes? Three young fellas stuck up an all-night garage in auto storage, slugged the man on duty, and escaped with a black Cadillac sedan. Mm-hmm. I believe they came back across the state line with it. What are the details? The garage man gave a pretty fair description of them. I've got all the facts about the car. Good. What do the thieves look like? Uh, one of them was about five feet eleven, big shoulders, red hair, seemed to be the leader. The other two... Give me your light, will you, Casey? You better wait. We, uh, we gotta stop for this railroad crossing, you know. <laughs> Don't worry. I ain't taking no chances with a load of legs, booze. Well, it looks clear to me. Give me that light okay, before I can... Okay, put your hands up and get out of that... Truck. What is it? Hey, what's the idea? Shut up and get out of there quick. They ain't fooling, Casey. We better haul out. Yeah. Go ahead, kid. Right. And this is for not moving when I told you. Mm. Drag him over to the ditch, Al, quick. Okay. Uh... You know where to drive the truck, Joe. Get at it. Sure. Casey, I guess we better rough you up a little, too, so everything will look on the up and up for you when your pal comes out of it. Okay. And you better not ride the next load we knock off. Legs might start wondering. Just tip me off about it. Right. Hey, you know something? What? Knocking off this truck makes me and Legs partners after all. What's the story, Bob? It's the Cadillac we're looking for, all right. And I've got some fingerprints. They abandoned it right at the scene of the hijacking? Yes. The watchman at the crossing who... 
saw it take place, said one hijacker drove off with a truck. And while he was calling the police, the other two disappeared on the run down the tracks. What about the two men in the truck? He was sure one of them was slugged. But by the time he made the call and got over there, there wasn't a sign of anybody or anything but the Cadillac. Since the victims didn't bother to report to the police, that tells what was in the truck. Liquor. Exactly. But why did the hijackers leave the Cadillac there? They don't have to worry about a hot car anymore. They can buy their own now. They obviously stole it to pull this job and get a stake. The start of a new gang, eh? Yes. So let's get busy and find out who they are and see how soon we can stop them. Hiya, Red. Oh, hiya, Joe. I've been looking all over for you. What's the matter? Huh? Nothing. Nothing. I just thought we might get a couple of dames and go dancing. I'm a scratch. Why? I already got a date. Oh, yeah? With who? Legs Miller's dame. Huh? Yeah, I sent word to her. I told her I'd be here. Oh, you did, huh? What makes you think she'll come? She'll come. You know, uh, you mean plenty of trouble, Red. This kind of trouble I like. Yeah, but if Legs finds Wait a minute, wait a minute. Huh? You come in the door. Blow, will you? Okay, but take it easy, will you, Red? Hello, shoulders. Hi, honey. Sit down. Thanks. You want a drink? No. Okay. How's legs? He's all right. Did you uh, tell him you were coming here? Now, what do you think? Well, he's got to know sooner or later. What do you mean? About us. <laughs> You're wonderful. That's right. What about us? We're in business, baby. Just like that, huh? Look, I had this figured months ago. And when I get ready for you, that's when I sent you the word. Really? Yeah. You see, there was a lot of things I had to do along the way. Get cards, which I got. Get dough, which I got. And now you. Which you ain't got. Don't be a sucker, baby. I'm your kind of guy. How do you figure that? You hear that music? Hear what the guy is playing? Yeah. That's my favorite song. That's why he's playing it. See the box there? Yes. It's loaded with them orchids. Your favorite flower. And I got an order in with the jeweler for a ruby ring. That's your favorite rock. How did you know all this? I've done research on you, honey. Now you see what I mean? I'm your kind of guy. You're forgetting something, Red. What's that? Legs. What about him? He's going to have something to say about this. I figured that too, honey. You know something? I'm going to give him a chance to, to say it. Got to pay a call on Mr. Legs Miller tomorrow night. I found the dealer finally, Jim. Good. He sold them two second-hand Cadillacs. Here are the descriptions. Registered in what name? Jack Smith, obviously an alias. What did Jack Smith look like? The one with the red hair, according to the dealer. Mm-hmm. There's a report from Washington. Those fingerprints, Jim. Thanks. Did we get anything? On the redhead, yes. His name is George Red Martin. Served six months in a reformatory in 1917. Here's the full description and photos on the way. Good. I think I'd better get over to police headquarters and see if they have anything on the private life and public habits of said George Red Martin. <laughs> All right, you guys, listen to me a minute, will you? Now, here's what I figure we do. Yeah? Hello, darling. Oh, hi, honey. Come on in. Hey, what is this, Legs? A convention? No, sweetheart. It's sort of like a reception committee. For who? Mr. Casey. Oh. The boys here got some kind of bad reports on him. Like what? He's been hanging around with that punk Red Martin, which just about accounts for a lot of that liquor we've been losing lately. Yeah? 
Hi, Legs. Come on in, Casey. Okay. What is this, a meeting or something? Yeah. A real important meeting. It's about you. What do you mean? Where have you been tonight? Oh, I was, uh, I was just down collecting a little dough I had riding on an egg. Why? Let's see the dough. Oh, sure. Here, I... Ow! Get up. Now, wait a minute, Legs. What's the matter with you? The horse's name was Red Martin, wasn't it? Red Martin? I don't know what you're talking... Okay, boys. Pick him up and take him out for a little ride. Now, wait a minute, Legs. Give me a chance, will you? Get him out of here, quick. All right, get him in the air, everybody. What? Cover him, boys. First one he makes a move for his heater gets a belly full of this. Hiya, honey. Hello, Red. Legs, this is what I told you would happen, remember? Yeah? I want all you guys to listen to me. I'm in and I'm taking over. Any of you don't want to play ball with me, line up against the wall and I'll check you off right now. Okay, then you're working for me. Hey, you... You come just in time, Red. Casey, get over there with legs. What? I said get over there. Oh, sure, but, uh... What's your idea? There ain't gonna be any double crosses in my outfit. Huh? You double cross legs, you might double cross me. Now take it, both of you. Oh! No, Red, wait a minute! Wait. Ah. Honey... From now on, as long as you play it straight, these big shoulders are yours. Now for a moment, let's talk about another kind of youngster. The kind of clean-cut American boy in a typical American home who is going to be one of America's worthwhile citizens. This week at the Equitable Society, one of the agents told me a story that gave me quite a kick. It seems that when he got home the other evening, his young son, Jimmy, aged eight, was chewing candy. Well, like fathers everywhere, he said, Don't eat that candy now, Jimmy. You'll spoil your dinner. Where'd you get the candy, anyway? Fred gave it to me, said Jimmy. His father's in the candy business, and he brings home samples. Say, Dad, why don't you ever bring home some life insurance samples? Well, Jimmy's dad tried to explain. Look, son, he said, life insurance isn't like candy. Candy is something you can see and feel and touch and taste right now. But life insurance... Well, now let's suppose that Fred's dad should die. There wouldn't be any more candy unless Fred's dad had arranged for life insurance to keep Fred supplied with candy and food and clothes. Well, Jimmy thought a minute, and then he said, I get it, I get it. Life insurance is candy for when the samples run out. Candy for when the samples run out. That's something to think about. Life insurance is candy for future delivery, security for tomorrow. Well, thinking about that makes us of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States feel pretty happy about the work we do. There's a real satisfaction in being in a business like this. You see, we always know that what we're doing today will benefit boys like Jimmy and millions of other young Americans far, far into the future. Yes, this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the file on crime in the Roaring Twenties. Red Martin and his companions, delinquent youngsters of 1917, had now graduated into major crime. And together with thousands like themselves, whose potential counterparts after this war were to be far greater in number had added the explosions of their guns to the roar of the Roaring Twenties. It is now some 30 or 40 minutes after Red Martin's blazing Tommy gun put him on the little throne which had been occupied by the man called Legs Miller. The murdered man has been discovered. The police notified. They, the special agents of the FBI, are now viewing the bodies. That's Legs, all right. The other one, I've heard him call Casey. Who did it, waiter, do you know? Uh, let me answer that, officer. 
It was Red Martin, wasn't it, Widow? Well, I, uh... And it's Red Martin and his gang who've been knocking off Legs Miller's trucks. Is that right? I seen Casey and Red Martin together. But why did Casey get it? I guess Martin doesn't want any double crosses on his staff. Want anything, officer? A couple of slugs on the floor that went clear through him. I'd like to have them for a lab check, if you don't mind. Here you are. Obviously, Martin doesn't intend to do business here. No, uh, he'll probably set up a new headquarters. Waiter. Yes, sir. Did Legs Miller have a girlfriend? Yes, sir. Is this her picture on the desk here? Yes, sir. With all my love, honey. That's what she was called. We're taking this picture along, too, officer. All right, Mr. Brown. I guess we can go now. And let's keep our fingers crossed. This picture could be the clue to the whereabouts of Red Martin. Assuming you mean that when Red Martin takes over, he takes everything over. Right. Red. Yeah? What time is it? A little after ten. Thanks. <gasps> Not your time. No, no, I'm bored. What's the matter? Well, these past few days haven't been what you might call exciting. Now, look, honey, I told you. I know, you... we have to stay here until the heat's off. Couldn't you have picked someplace else for a hideout? Did it have to be two dingy rooms above a garage? We ain't gonna be here forever. We already have been. Who is it? Me, Al. Come on in. Hi, Blondie. Hello, Junior. Want to see me, Red? Yeah. Tell the boys that tomorrow we start expanding. You do? How? We're going to start taking over Mr. Cicero's customers. That's a big order. I'm a big guy. Tomorrow the boys start calling on Cicero's customers to tell them from now on they're buying from us, okay? It'll be okay until Cicero decides to pay us a visit. That's what I want. It'll be a quick way to take over. We'll be here waiting for them. Pass the word on, Al. All right. See you later. After Mr. Cicero, do we hide out again? Come here, baby. Well? Look, just play along with us for a few more days, will you? Oh, I wish you didn't have those big shoulders. What luck, Bob? Enough, I think. What do you mean? I checked the photographer this morning who made this picture of Honey. Well? He said all he knew she was a nightclub singer. Mm-hmm. So I checked with the booking offices and I finally got this address. Whose? Her mother's. On the north side. I'm bound to see her mother once in a while. We'll keep a 24-hour surveillance on the house and wait for Honey to show up. <laughs> Brown speaking. Jim, the girl just came home to see her mother. Yes? Better get over here so we can follow her back and pick up Martin. You follow yourself, Bob, and then come on in. Why? I want to pick up everybody at once. Yes, but how? You keep tabs on Honey and find Martin's hideout. I think I've got a way for seeing that everybody is at home when we go calling. Joe? Yeah? Stand over there by the window. Right. Al, find yourself by the door. Okay. And don't take any chances. Have your rods on that door when she opens. And honey. Yes, sir. For the tenth time, go on back home to your mother. Nothing doing. I'm staying here. Look, baby, that was Cicero that called and said he was coming over. Not a magazine salesman. Cicero. I'm not afraid of Cicero. So I suppose you like his shoulders, too. Darling. Okay, then get out of line of that door anyway. Hey, Red. Yeah? They're here. How many? Be careful. Get set for anything. They'll be upstairs any minute. But they won't all come up here. Never mind what stays downstairs. Just take care of what comes in that door. That's all we have hey. to... Listen, Red. Only one guy coming up. Yeah. Must be Cicero himself. Gonna try talking first, I guess. Can we let him have it when he comes in? I'll take care of him. Come in. Evening. That's not Cicero. Hey, 
Who are you, pal? I'm Special Agent Brown of the FBI. FBI? Oh, you better get out of here. There might be a lot of shooting in a minute. There'll be an awful lot if any of you starts at Martin. Those are FBI agents down there, and they're ready to blast you to kingdom come. But Cicero... I'm just... afraid I'm guilty of impersonating Cicero, Mr. Martin. What? We just wanted to show you how easily you boys can be taken over, that's all. Now, drop your guns and file quietly downstairs. We'll go to headquarters and arrange futures for one and all. Young Red Martin's short and unprofitable career of crime ended with his death in the electric chair. The members of his mob were sentenced to long terms in prison. That was a page out of the Roaring Twenties, part of the criminal aftermath in America of World War I. Already the criminal aftermath of World War II is splashing black ink across the front pages of our newspapers. It happened before... It can happen here again. The FBI and your local law enforcement officers will fight it day and night. But it must be fought by all the people if it is to be licked. What are you doing about it in your community? Before we tell you about next week's case from the files of the FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To the FBI, America looks for national security. And to the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans look for the financial security of life insurance. These three and a quarter million people are the sole owners of the Equitable Society. Because you see, the moment they purchased life insurance through an Equitable Society agent, they became part owners of this great mutual organization. Yes, like your FBI, the Equitable Society representative in your community is constantly working for the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Innocent Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. But all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, will you imagine for a moment that you're looking in the dictionary? There's one word in it of special importance for millions of you who have tuned in this program. If you look in the dictionary, you'll find that the word society comes from an ancient Latin word, societas, which means literally a group of allies. 
So don't you agree that the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is well named a society? It is a group of allies. Every member of the Equitable Society has three and a quarter million trustworthy allies. They are his fellow members, the men and women who have joined forces with him to provide the security of life insurance for themselves and their families. So now you know that the word society in the name Equitable Society has a very deep significance. It means that this great mutual organization is owned entirely by its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's file, The Innocent Killer. Too often, grave injustices have been committed against innocent persons through circumstantial evidence and coincidence. Therefore, your FBI has never relied solely on either in fixing the guilt for a crime. Considering, rather, the establishment of innocence as a first principle of true justice. Your FBI, as tonight's case from its Alaskan files demonstrates, takes nothing for granted, suspects all evidence until proven valid, and never jumps at conclusions. All day long, the blizzard sweeping down from the Arctic has howled across the flat, bleak country surrounding the little Alaskan village of Rutland. And now, as the deeper gloom of night closes in, a woman sits all alone in John Miller's log cabin trading post. She is mending a sweater near the old pot-bellied stove. Suddenly, the front door swings open. A man enters. Well? Where's the trader? You got something to trade? I said, where is he? Mr. Miller ain't here. When will he be back? He's up north. Be down in about a week. Anybody else here? Would that be bad? What do you mean? What could I mean? You put up your dogs? I haven't got any. You haven't got any snowshoes either. I rode with an Eskimo sledding this way. That thing on the counter behind you. What does it look like? Shortwave radio. That's right. Works both ways. Where does it reach? Fairbanks. Any news? About what? About anything. Why should you be so interested? Answer my question. Okay. They signaled here about 15 minutes ago. Yeah? There was a report on some trouble in Fairbanks. What kind of trouble? The government assayer was shot and killed in his office earlier today. Huh? They asked me to be on the lookout for the guy that done it. Any description? Yeah. Real good one. They said he was a fellow about your size. Mm Mm-hmm. He was wearing a red and black Mackinac, just like the one you got on. Anything else? That's enough, ain't it? What'd they tell you to do if he showed here? Call him back. That might make trouble for you. I know. Well, what are you going to do, sweetheart? Gets awful lonesome here. How about some tea? Immediately after the body of the government of Sarah was found on the floor of his office, United States Marshal Henderson had contacted the FBI office in Juneau. Special Agent Rankin caught the next plane for Fairbanks, where he is now going over the scene of the crime. They say I must have put up a fight. Looks like signs of a struggle, Marshal. Sure does, Mr. Rankin. Well, you have any opinions? Could have been. Somebody had a grudge. 
Somebody who thought the government was trying to cheat him on weight or quality? Yeah. How about robbery? Could have been. Only nothing seems to be missing. Safe wasn't even touched. Oh. How did you fix the time of the killing? I was here myself at 11, and just a little before 12.30, Charlie the barber stopped in to say hello and found the body instead. Charlie was the one who reported it. Where does the man with the red and black Mackinac fit in? Charlie again. His shop's just across the street there. He saw the man come in here around 12 or so. Did he recognize him? No, he was too far away. Oh. According to the books, Uncle Andy was the only one in the day. He brought a little pan in. Who's he? Old booze fighter. There's a little panning and trapping down around Rutland, a few miles south of here. Did he ever make any trouble? Oh, he's rowed with the assayer some. Even threatened to blow his head off a time or two, but it's just liquor talk. Or maybe. And maybe not. There's been a man killed, and we're not overlooking any angle, Marshal. Let's run them all down. tea, mister? The name is Kurt. The more tea, Kurt? No, thanks. Nan. Nan? Uh-huh. Tell me something, will you? What? What's with you in a setup like this? What do you mean? How'd you wind up here? I married the guy. You like it? What do you think? And why do you hang around? Because I've had no way of getting out. Huh. Now, suppose you tell me something. Okay. You are the guy the marshal's looking for. That's right. How'd it happen? You kill him? Mm-hmm. Well, I was kind of in the same spot you are, baby. So I made a stab at some getaway dough. Which the assayer didn't want to give you. Mm-hmm. Did you get the money? No. After the killing, I had to get out of there fast. Oh. Why do you want to know all this? If you'd gotten the money, it would have made it easier. Made what easier? You're getting me out of here? Hmm? That's what you're going to do, you know. <laughs> Are you kidding? You're getting me out of here and back to the States. Oh, look, baby, i got enough worries taking care of myself. Ain't you forgetting the marshal? I told him I'd keep a lookout for a man Listen, with Listen, you a... ain't blowing no whistle on me. Then get me out. Oh. That's your problem. <laughs> Get in the back room, quick. Okay, but if he's wearing a badge, get rid of him or don't stand between okay. us. Okay. Just a minute. Uh, howdy, Miss Nan. Oh, hello, Uncle Andy. Gotta have a snort of antifreeze. I'm fresh out. Wouldn't say you've been doing so bad. No, no, but the whiskey run out on me between Fairbanks and here. You were in Fairbanks today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had another row with that thick-headed assayer. Someday I'm going to blow his head plumb off his shoulders. Uncle I... Andy. I mean it, Miss Nan. Doggone it. Haven't I'm a you priest. heard? Uh, heard what? He was shot and killed today. Uh, it's about time. To... Huh? What'd you say? I said the assayer was shot and killed today. You mean that? When did it happen? Got it over the radio. The marshal said about noon. About noon? What? I was in round with him about that time. It must have happened right after. How come you didn't hear about it? Well, I hit the trail right after. I was in his office. I wanted to take a look at some traps up the way before coming down here. I... Well, what do you know? Here. Have a drink. That'll kick your pump over a little faster. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Miss Nan. Thank you. Uh, uh, who done it? They don't seem to know. Well, I guess that'll get me over to my cabin. Take the bottle with you. Well, thank you, Miss Nan. Thank Just you. Just a minute, pal. Okay. No need of you rushing off, mister. Who's this, Miss Nan? Oh, he's a, a friend of mine. Uh, Kurt, this is Uncle Andy. Hiya. Hiya, son. What'd you, uh, what'd you want with me? Just your company. Well, now, well, that's real nice of you. Pull up a chair. Don't mind if I do. Man, you got another bottle of that stuff? 
I'd like to buy Uncle a little drink. Well, now, Nan, this is a man after my own heart. Uh, I'll get some cups, honey. Let's be stylish. What is all this? You told me I had a problem to solve, sweetheart. Maybe now I got the solution. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Rankin. Why, sure. Pick up anything? I took a look at the slug that got out of the assayer's body. Oh? It's thirty-two caliber. Well, that may be a help. Will be when we find the pistol that fired it. I did some more asking around, but nobody but Charlie seems to remember seeing anybody wearing a red and black Mackinac. Marshal, where did you say this Uncle Andy is located? He's got a cabin down around Rutland. Why? Well, he was seen hitting the trail in a hurry a little after 12 noon today. Yeah? Maybe we ought to take a run down there. Be kind of rugged going tonight. Yeah, I can get Miller's trading post down there on the radio. You want to do that? Well, what for? Uncle Andy's around there a good deal. No. No, there's no need letting him know we're coming. We'll get down there in the morning. Say, you know, I'm beginning to like this young fellow an awful lot, Miss Nan. You're okay yourself, huh? Give us another bottle, Nan. Yeah, yes, another bottle, honey. And you know something? You ought to make him stay around this country. You and him might hit it off, you know? Maybe I'm not his type. Sure, sure you're his type. Sure, she's she's any man's type, huh? Ain't she, son? That's what they tell me. Rat. (laughs) What do you say, son, eh? Like to settle down here and... Can it be a neighbor? Huh? No, no, I don't think so. Can't make any money here. What? Money? Why, you can make lots of money around here. That's so? How? Sure, prospector, trapper like me. You make money? Well, I make money. You just ask John Miller uh, when he comes back if old Randy ain't doing all right. Yeah? Sure, sure. He's keeping a lot for me over in that there safe right now. You hear that, man? Huh? Unc's got a couple of bucks put away. Yeah. Couple of bucks. Couple. He's holding five thousand dollars for me. If he's holding a nickel. That's all I wanted to know. Yes, yes. Huh? Baby, this guy's our passport. What do you mean? Yeah. What do you mean call me passport? When's Miller coming back? About a week why? That's plenty of time. Passport. Give me a little drink, honey. I got it all figured out now. Oh. Please, please, Miss Nan, give me one of those drinks. Sure, pour him one, sweetheart. A stiff one. Yeah, a stiff one. Okay. Hey, you are. Bottoms up, huh? Yep. Yeah. Here's to you, son. Oh. Oh. Baby? Yeah? Get on that radio and tell them they can come get the body of the guy who killed the Isaiah. <laughs> The Frozen North, crime, the FBI, these are the ingredients of a thrilling story. But there's another kind of story that can be thrilling to Americans, the sort of kindly human story such as happened this week at the Equitable Society. This week, At the Equitable Society, I read a very sincere letter of thanks received by the Equitable Agent in Olympia, Washington. It was from a widow who had just received a totally unexpected check from the Equitable Society. I did not realize, she wrote, that I had anything coming on this old policy which my husband dropped many years ago. As I'm now well along in years, this money is surely a godsend to me, as it will give me something each month to live on. I didn't realize that a company such as yours would make all this effort to locate me. And I cannot thank you too much, and would you please give my heartfelt thanks to the officers of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, who are so kind and of so much help to me. Now, I'd like to point out that the equitable agent in Olympia, Washington, didn't receive one cent of pay for the time and trouble he devoted to this widow's case. He did it gladly and willingly, because he is the kind of man who enjoys doing good turns for other people. 
And in that respect, he's typical of all the agents and representatives of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. The equitable representative in your community is more than just professionally trained on security. He's a man who went into life insurance because he saw in it unlimited opportunities to benefit his fellow men. He's the sort of man who takes deep satisfaction in the thought that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the file on the innocent killer. The crime files of this country contain hundreds of cases in which criminals have temporarily escaped justice by manipulating circumstance and coincidence to pin the guilt on an innocent person. But invariably, the truly guilty person pays for his crime. Regrettably, however, as in the case of the unfortunate man lying dead on the floor of the trading post, justice occasionally comes too late to fully spare the innocent. It is now some four hours later, and Special Agent Rankin and Marshal Henderson have arrived at the trading post. That's Uncle Andy, all right, Mr. Rankin. Well, tell us what happened, Mrs. Miller. Well, I'm still so upset hard to remember everything, but uh, he, he was awful drunk when he came in. He said he'd been to Fairbanks. Yeah? I asked him if he'd heard the news about the killing. That was after I talked to you on the radio. Yes. And I believe the marshal told you to be on the lookout for a man with a red and black Mackinac. Yes, yes, he did. Well, didn't you suspect something right away when this man walked in wearing a Mackinac like this? Well, of course, I, I noticed it, but I, I just couldn't believe that Uncle Andy would... What did he say when you asked him if he knew about the killing? He just looked at me, kind of funny. I told him the marshal had warned me to be on the lookout for a man wearing a red and black Mackinac. Yes. Then he pulled out a pistol and said, what was I going to do about it? I see. Go on. Well, he was so drunk, I thought maybe I could handle him, and I started fighting with him for the gun. Before I knew it, it went off, and he was lying there on the floor. At any time during the struggle, did you get possession of the pistol? No. No, I tried to jerk it out of his hand, but he was too strong for me. Hmm. What's this bottle here? Oh, that. He asked for a drink when he first came in. I gave him the bottle. Well, Marshal, I guess we'd better get the body into the sled and head back to Fairbanks. All right, Rankin. Is there uh, anything else you want me to do? Well, we'll let you know, Mrs. Miller, if there is. Hmm. Marshal, will you give me a hand, please? Sure. All right. I'll open the door for you. All right, sir. Good night, Miss Nan. Good night. Good luck on the trail back. Get going, Kurt. You did a good job, baby. I was awful scared. Kurt. Yeah? What are we going to do now? I got that all figured out. Well, would it be asking too much to let me know about now, it? Now, don't get jumpy, sweetheart. Well, what are we going to do? I pull out of here tonight. I'll take the old guy's sled and head down to Nanana. That's the first stop on the railroad south of Fairbanks. You go alone? That's right. I'll grab a train and go on to Anchorage and wait for you. When do I leave? you got to stick around here for a couple of days in case the law wants to ask any more questions. We get Uncle Andy's dough out of the safe, cut it up, take $2,500 apiece, and you... Wait a minute. What's the matter? You think I'd buy that deal? You're out of your mind. Well, what's wrong with it? Oh, not a thing. It's just peachy. You kill two men, get a gift of 2500 use the dough for a getaway, and leave me holding the bag. Now, look, Well, it just I... ain't going to work out that way. You're leaving here tonight, all right, but I'm going with you. It'll make it look bad for you. I'll take that chance. I'm going with but you. Baby, and I'm... furthermore, I take charge of the dough. Can I come in, Mr. Rankin? Oh, yes. Come in, Marshal. How are you making out? Well, the doctor just left here. He performed the autopsy. Did he find the bullet? Yes. What's the story on it? Well, there hasn't been time for a ballistic check, but I'd say it matches with the one taken from the assayer's body. That figured? I think it figured a little too well. What do you mean? 
I'm beginning to wonder if that woman at the trading post gave us the true story of what happened out there. Why? Well, Marshal, several factors have come up. First of all, remember you're telling me you never saw Uncle Andy ever carry a pistol? Yeah. Well, I confirmed that around town. He's never been seen with anything but a hunting knife and a deer rifle. What else? I checked the prints on that liquor bottle I picked up at the trading post. There were three different sets. One was the old man's. One, I assume, was the girl's. What about the third? Well, right now, all I can do is ask the same question. And there's another factor in this thing I don't like. What's that? Here. Look at this red and black Mackinac that the old man was wearing. Yes? The woman said the bullet was fired at close range. There's no trace of powder burns. In fact, there isn't even a bullet hole. Well... Of course, his coat might have been open when the struggle occurred. There'd still be powder burns. That's right. Marshal, I wonder if you'd go out and get Mrs. Miller and bring her in here for further questioning. Sure. Meantime, I'm going to try and find out who belongs to that third set of fingerprints. Get the ticket? Yep. When's the train due in? Any minute now, I guess. What do we do with this dog team? Just leave it here. Oh, now, that ain't very smart. Somebody will find it. So what? They'll know we came here to take this train. By the time that happens, we'll be in the clear. I don't see... Look, I'm the one that's got real trouble in this deal, remember? We leave the dogs right here. What do we do when we get to Anchorage? I got a hotel room there. I want to stop by and pick up some things I left, and we head right for the States. Here it comes. Yep. Take my bag, will you? Okay. Oh, how much for the ticket? Why? I gave you $50. There ought to be change. Now, look, this ain't going to work. I told you, I take care of the dough. Okay, but I'm holding out five of it for carrying your bag. Oh, how did you make out, Marshal? Not so good. What happened? I went out to the trading post. The woman wasn't there. From the looks of things, she's gone for good. What do you mean? Well, I looked around the place. All her clothes were missing. The safe was open and empty. I see. Well, that more or less ties in with the information I picked up around town. What's that? I talked with some friends of Uncle Andy's. They saw him the morning of the killing. He wasn't wearing this red and black Mackinac. No? No, and I also learned that Uncle Andy let John Miller at the trading post keep money for him in that safe out there. Oh, then she skipped out with Andy's dough. Looks that way. You think she killed him, too? No. No, I have another theory on that killing. What? I believe that the murderer was the real owner of this red and black coat. Oh, then that would be the owner of the third set of fingerprints. That's right. But who is he? His name is Kurt Williams. Well, how'd you find that out? I'll explain that later. You think he's run off with Mrs. Miller? Yes. Well, we'd better get an alarm out on him right away. Yes, yeah, send out an alarm. But I have an idea we may be able to pick them up ourselves. How? Well, let's get the airport on the phone. We're taking a little trip. Is that the hotel? Yeah. Crummy looking junk. Honey, you weren't exactly living at the Ritz. How long do we stay here? I told you, just till I pack up and check out. And, uh, dig into that bankroll, sugar. This hotel tab is on you. Okay. Open the door, will you? Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, while I'm upstairs packing, you'll find out about flights to Seattle. That'll be a pleasure. I've got to get my key. Let me have the key to room 27, please. Yes, sir. Hello, Mrs. Miller. What? Remember me? Yes. FBI. The marshal and I had an idea we might find you here. Who's your friend, Mrs. Miller? You mean him? Yeah. I believe his name is Kurt Williams. He'll tip you up. Take it easy. How'd you know we'd be here? The red and black Mackinac that you used to make Uncle Andy appear guilty established your own guilt. You see, I found a hotel envelope that had slipped down in the lining of that coat. This hotel? That's right. So I called here, gave them your description, Williams. They said you still had a room. You Oh, I think we ought to have a little talk about a double murder. Good. 
Burt Williams was tried and convicted in a federal court on the charge of first-degree murder. His female accomplice was sentenced to a long term in the penitentiary. Yes, occasionally, justice comes too late to fully spare an innocent person of a malicious conspiracy to fix a crime on him through criminal manipulation of circumstance and coincidence. But the truly guilty will not escape justice. As for your FBI, we repeat, it never takes anything for granted. Suspects all evidence until proven valid and never jumps at conclusions. There's another thrilling story from FBI Files ready for next week's broadcast. Before we tell you about it, just a few words about a man in your community who is helping to bring this program to you. Just as you look to your FBI for national security, so to the Equitable Society you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school, and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens, who recognize his contribution in bringing security to you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Cold-Blooded Kidnapper. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI. An official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's important and exciting case will open in just a moment. First, a brief word on what's ahead for our returning soldiers, sailors, and Marines. Eighty years ago, in the year 1866, America's number one problem was the same as we face today, jobs for ex-servicemen. And in 1946, as it did in 1866, at the close of the Civil War, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is helping American business and American agriculture to create jobs and more jobs 
for the men who serve this country well. Funds of the Equitable Society are invested in thousands of farms and ranches, as well as in hundreds of the great basic industries on which our national prosperity depends. That is how Equitable Society dollars help provide opportunities for veterans in search of employment. That is why we say that by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. Tonight's file, The Cold-Blooded Kidnapper. After nearly a decade of comparative freedom from his scourge, the kidnapper has gone to work again. The combination that defeated him before has gone to work again, too. The combination of your FBI working in cooperation with local law enforcement agencies. Tonight's case is the story of a kidnapping which did not make nationwide headlines. The victim was an average person. The family was a family of modest means. And the ransom demand was small. But in the eyes of the law, all persons are of equal rank. And a crime against any member of society is a crime against the whole of society. Back in the hills on the outskirts of a New England town, there's a squalid shack belonging to one Jed Monroe and his wife Clara. On a porch of this hovel, Jed is stretched out in the warm sunshine, sleeping. Jed? You, Jed! Jed, wake up. Uh-huh. Wake up, I said. What? Well, what is it, Clara? Is it time to eat? Huh? Nope. No, and... Leave me be. Just a minute. I want to talk to you. Now what? I'm getting sick to death about what's going on around here. 365 days a year. You eat, you sleep, then you get up and eat again. Well, don't go starting that again. I tell you, I'm sick to death of it. Oh, Clara, quit your name. When are you going to get to work? I already told you. I don't like work. Well, we need to eat and we need clothes. Working is the only way to get them things. And what makes you think that? You've got some other way. Maybe I have. Like what, for instance? Clara, a man don't make no real money working with his hands. He gets it out up here, his head, thinking. That lets you out then. Now leave me talk. All the time that you've been yapping and nagging at me around here, I've been thinking. Thinking real hard. And I got a way to make me some big money. More than you ever seen in your whole life. <laughs> now you just listen to me. Now here's what I'm aiming to do. Later that afternoon... A young high school girl is walking down the street in a nearby town. She nears a corner. A battered old car pulls up close to her and stops. I, uh, am a big pardon, Miss... Uh, yes? Could I speak to you for a minute? Well, I... What do you want? Oh, I, I wonder if you could help me. How? Well, uh, my wife's sick and I... I have to work all day. She's got to have someone to look after children. Yes? We need somebody to come in the afternoon till I get home. Oh, I see. Would you be interested in the job? Gee, I... I don't know. I'd like to make the money, but I'd have to ask my mother first. Oh, sure, of course you would. What's your name? Where do you live? My name's Dottie Barnes. I live over on Miller Street. Uh, why don't you just hop in the car and we'll drive around and see your mother right now. Hmm? Well... All right. Uh, now, just get right up here, front seat and me. Thank you. Even if your mother won't let you work, this will save you walking home. Huh? Sure. Excuse me, but Miller Street is down the other way. Yeah, I know. Then why are we going this way? Because this is the way I want to go. 
wait a minute. Where are you taking me? Be quiet. Look, you stop this car. Shut up. No, let me out of here. Let me out of here. Shut up, I said. Special Agent Briggs speaking. It's police headquarters, Mr. Briggs. This may be a kidnapping. Oh? Dorothy Barnes, 16 years old, daughter of J.A. and Mrs. Barnes, 1625 Miller Street. Yes? She left Central High School at 3.15 this afternoon. About three blocks from the school, two of her classmates saw her talking to a man seated in a parked car. Yes? She was seen getting into this car and driving away. Hadn't been heard from since. You got anything on the car? Only that it was a sedan, no license number. How about the man? No description of him at all. Sounds like an abduction, all right. The girl's father is a rug salesman at Gilby's. Not much money. Well, some kidnappers aren't as ambitious as others. What do you want us to do? Well, if this is a kidnapping officer, we must be careful to do nothing that would endanger the life of the victim. Our first consideration is the victim's safe return. Yes, sir. Alert your force. Furnish them with the girl's description. We'll be in touch with you later. Right. Wade. Yeah, George. I just got a report from police headquarters, a possible kidnapping. What's the story? A girl named Barnes, 1625 Miller Street. She's been missing since 3.15 this afternoon. I see. I think we should set up an observation post and arrange to be near the family at all times. Now, let's get to work at once. feeling? Where am I? This is my home. Oh, it, it's you. Now, now, just take it easy. <laughs> Cut out that crying. Why did you bring me here? Why? Well, it's a business deal, that's all. What do you mean? You stay here until your pop buys your way out. This is a kidnapping. Maybe you'd call it that. Oh. Pop pays off. No harm's going to come to you at all. Oh, my head. It, it hurts so. Huh? Some cold water in the bucket here. <laughs> just fix a rag for you. Oh, no. See, go away. Just leave me alone. Now, don't be afraid of me. I... No. Please go away. Please. Yes. What? You get away from her. Clara, you get out of here. I said let her alone. You, uh, what are you doing with that gun? Just seeing that you get out of this room and get yourself into town. I didn't want to get mixed up in this, but there's some money due on this kid. Now that I'm in it, I want my share. Get started, I tell you. Ugly old fool. Don't get no wrong ideas, miss. It ain't that I'm sticking up for you. Because <gasps> that's what I think of you. Can I get you some coffee, gentlemen? No, thank you, Mr. Barnes. How is uh, Mrs. Barnes? I think I've persuaded her to try and get some sleep. It'd be a bad idea if you tried to get some rest yourself. Oh, I'm afraid that would be impossible. You answer it, Mr. Barnes. Very well. This may be the call we're waiting for. You remember your instructions. Yes, sir. Hello? Who's this talking? This is J.A. Barnes. Who? Who are you? I'm the one you've been waiting to hear from. Is my daughter safe? Is she all right? She's all right. If you want to see her again, you do what I tell you. You understand? I'll do anything. You want money, of course. That's right. Well, how much do you want? I haven't got a great deal, but I'll... Hey, shut up and listen. Now, you know where the road crosses over Thompson's Creek, north of town? Yes. Yes, I know. Well, then you put your thousand dollars, five dollar bills in a paper sack under the north end of the bridge by noon tomorrow. You'll have your girl back by sundown. All right. I'll have the money there. If the police are watching, you'll never see her again. You understand? I understand. But... 
Uh, how can I be sure my daughter will get back all right? You just do like I tell you. I ain't talking no more. He's hung up. Let me have the phone, Mr. Barnes. Yes, sir. Operator. Operator. Yes, sir? Did you have a tracer on that call? Yes, sir. The party called from the pay station in Drake's Drugstore, 3rd and Main. Connect me with the drugstore right away, please. Yes, sir. Wade? Yes? Uh, take this phone, and when the drugstore answers, tell them to get a description of anybody using their phone booths, if they still can. I'm going to run out there. Hello, Wade. Oh, hello, George. Any luck? I've got a pretty fair description of the man. Oh, good. He's about six feet tall, middle-aged, rough clothes, and unshaven. Looked like somebody out of the hill country around here. Anything else? The man out in front of the store remembered seeing him drive off in an old black Ford sedan, but didn't notice any more details. What do we do now, George? We'll arrange to deliver the $1,000 in Mark $5 bills to Barnes in the morning to put under the bridge. And after sundown tomorrow, whether the girl is back or not, we move in and go to work fast. <laughs> Jed? Yeah. Well, how'd you make out? I made out all right. How are you feeling, girl? Never mind how she's feeling. How much did you get? I got $1,000 right here in this paper sack. Let me see the money. Never mind. I got it. Then you'll let me go now, won't you? What'd you tell him you'd do about her? You will let me go now, won't you? Won't you? Well, what'd you tell him, Jed? I told him she'd back by sundown. Then we better blindfold her and get started. And let her out somewhere. What do you mean, we'd better? Because I'm going with you. That's why. You ain't going nowhere, Clara. What do you mean? I'm changing my mind about taking her back. Oh, no. You no. You ain't going to vex me no more, Clara. What are you saying? I'm saying I'm through listening to that tongue of yours and... Looking at that ugly face. Jed, what you got there? I'm getting you out of my sight for good. Jed! Now, young lady, you don't do like I say from now on. Same thing will happen to you. At the conclusion of tonight's file, which we will reopen in just a moment, you will hear an important message to parents prepared by Director J. Edgar Hoover of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But now let me tell you a story from the Equitable Society that I think will tug at your heartstrings as it did mine. This week at the Equitable Society, I heard a sentimental story, but sentiment that rings true. The story of a threadbare overcoat. Forty years ago, the owner of this coat was a hopeful young man with a very small salary and a very pretty little bride. Well, one winter morning, this young wife surprised her husband by handing him a little roll of dollar bills that she'd saved from her household money. This is for a new overcoat, she told him. That old one is getting too shabby for a rising young man like you to be seen in. But that night when he came home... He was still wearing the old threadbare coat. And from one of the frayed pockets, he took out a receipt for a life insurance policy with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. He'd used his overcoat money as a first payment. And he told his wife that it meant more to his self-respect to know that she would have the security of life insurance than buying the finest overcoat in the world. And today, after 40 years, his wife still keeps the shabby old coat and sometimes runs her hands lovingly over the threadbare cloth. To her, it's a symbol of a husband's self-sacrifice. Well, when you come to think of it, almost every equitable society policy we issue is just such a symbol. A symbol of a husband's love for his wife. A symbol of a father's forethought for his children. A symbol of unselfishness. 
And that's one of many reasons why we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States are happy in our work. Happy. And proud to say that this week, and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the file on the cold-blooded kidnapper. Yes, the kidnapper has gone to work again. And we repeat, the combination that defeated him before has gone to work again, too. The combination of your FBI working in cooperation with local law enforcement agencies. Because the first concern of the FBI is the safe return of the victim, Special Agents Briggs and Wade stand by in the local FBI office awaiting development. Special Agent Wade glances at the clock. It's two hours after sundown, George. Yes, they've had enough time. Let's get moving. We'll phone the newspapers and press associations, tell them to release that list of serial numbers on those $5 bills. Right. Then let's put out an alarm on the descriptions of the kidnapper and the girl. Here's that sketch from the artist, Mr. Briggs. Thanks, Tom. Hey, what's that, George? I had an artist make a sketch of the kidnapper from the description we got from the druggist. Why? He's an ugly-looking devil. Well, let's just hope for the girl's sake he's not too much of a devil. Say you're from the FBI? Yes, sir. We thought since you run the general store up here, you might be pretty well acquainted with most everybody in the hills. Well, if they live in the hills, I know. Well, this is just a rough sketch, but do you know anybody it looks like? Oh, let me see now. He's about six feet tall, middle-aged. Drives an old black Ford sedan. And it can't be nobody else. But this is a heap better looking than him. Who? Old Jed Monroe. Jed Monroe? Yep. As mean a cuss as ever was born to. Whereabouts does he live? Oh, he's got a little shack, him and his woman, Clara, about three miles from here. Can you tell us how to get there? Uh, sure. You just keep right on up this road a piece, take a second left-hand turn, then after spend. There's the shack. Yeah. No sign of a lamp. Don't flash your light. Let's make it up at the door. Come on. If the door's unlocked. Flash your light inside the minute I open it. Right. Well, doesn't seem to be anybody in there. Let's go in. Okay. Wait a minute, George. Huh? Look, here on this table. What is it? School books. Here's a name in one of them. Dottie Barnes. Oh, this must be the right place. I'm afraid we've arrived a little too late. Looks like they've cleared out. Yeah. I guess we ought to... Hey, George. What? One of them didn't clear out. Look over in the corner. Well. Must be Monroe's wife. Uh-huh. She dead? Yeah. Let's get back to the store and call the sheriff. He can send the coroner out to examine the body. Okay. Then we'd better catch Jed Monroe before the girl wishes she was in that woman's place. You must be worn out. Riding all night this way, girl? Well, we're going to stop pretty soon, then you can rest up. Well, why don't you say something? I... I want to go home. Oh, now, look here. I ain't meaning you no harm. You you get home. When? As soon as me and your pop do a little more business. But he's already paid you. Well, that was just the down payment. I'm sure he's given you all he could afford. It ain't enough. See, the way I figured, you're kind of like my meal ticket. Just like money in the bank. Anytime I need some, I just send word to your pop. 
that I'll never get home. Oh, no, no, you'll get home now. Cut out that moping and listen to me. Now, we're going to stop at that filling station up the road, gas up. And if you do decide to start talking, don't say the wrong thing while we're there. Or I'll be doing the same thing to you I've done to my old woman. You understand? <laughs> It's going on 8 o'clock, George. Not a trace of them yet. Yeah. That beats me. We throw a ring of police and deputies around this country 200 miles wide, and yet somehow Monroe seems to have gotten through. I don't think he did get through, Wade. Why not? I think he's been moving around inside that circle. How do you figure that? Well, this is the only country Monroe's familiar with. Well? He's kind of act to stick to familiar countries, especially if they're on the run. I'll show you what I mean. Here, take a look at this map. Yeah. Here's Monroe's shack. Uh-huh. Now, follow the circle to the lunchroom that he stopped at four hours ago when he cashed one of the five-dollar bills. Yeah. The circle continues around to the farmhouse where he was reported to have stopped to get water for his car. Yeah, he's moving around inside that circle, all right. All back roads, too. Yes. Yeah. Special Agent Briggs speaking. Police headquarters over in New City, Mr. Briggs. What's up? Monroe and the girl stopped at a filling station outside of town about a half hour ago. What? How do you know? We checked the five-dollar bill he gave the station man, and it's on the list. Which way did they go when they left the filling station? I don't know, but they didn't come through New City or we'd have caught them. That's all right. I think we'll catch them anyway now. Thanks a lot. What was that? When Roe and the girl stopped at a gas station in New City half an hour ago. Let's see how that figures on the map. Well, he's following the same pattern, Wade, still continuing the same circle. Mm-hmm. Half an hour ago, traveling in an old car should take him to... Come on, Wade. I've got a pretty good idea of where we might find him. Quit that sniffling now. Oh, leave me alone. I stopped here at this tourist camp so you could get some rest. Oh, please, go away. No, 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 no. We've got some business to take care of. What do you mean? Well, it's time your pop was hearing from us again. This time, it's going to be direct from you. How? I want you should write him a letter. Oh, No. Now, look, you want to get home, don't you? You won't let me go home. You just want to get more money from my father. You're writing that letter. I said no. Now, you listen here. I don't want to do nothing mean to you, you understand? But you'd better be remembering what happened to my wife, Clara. Now, write me that letter. Keep away from me. I'm giving you one last chance. Keep away. Please. Stay where you are, Monroe. Huh? Who, Who are you? Special agents of the FBI. What? Oh, thank heaven. And my hands are just itching for you to resist arrest. Young Dorothy Barnes was returned unharmed to her parents' home. Although Jed Monroe could have been tried for kidnapping, he was first turned over to the local authorities who tried and convicted him for the murder of his wife. He paid for this crime by death in the electric chair. With indications that kidnapping has once again threatened the security of the American home, J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, has prepared this following important message. In case of kidnapping, regardless of the hour, contact the nearest office of the FBI whose number can be found on page one of the telephone book, or contact the Washington headquarters of the FBI by calling the celebrated kidnapping number, National 7117. Keep the details of the abduction together with details on demands for ransom strictly within the family circle. Talk only to law enforcement officers. Information regarding kidnappings is not public news so long as the victim's life is at stake. Turn all letters or communications relative to the kidnapping over to trained investigators. Do not permit them to be handled by others. Do not disturb evidence at the scene of the crime. Remain calm. Do not act disturbed. Carry on normal routine so far as possible.
Mr. Hoover is asking for the cooperation of you, the citizen. You were a vital part of that army which, over a decade ago, smashed the hordes of kidnappers who preyed on you and members of your families. With your help, they shall be smashed again. In a moment, we'll tell you about next week's exciting case. Meanwhile, remember that to your FBI agents, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Society agent in your community you look for the financial security of life insurance. And whatever special meaning that word security may have for you, a home of your own, an assured education for your children, or a retirement income for your old age, your Equitable Society representative will gladly do everything within his power to help you reach your goal. Like your FBI... The Equitable Society representative is dedicated to the security through life insurance of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unwelcome Guest. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated, but all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. How we think about the future determines in large measure the way we act today. Before opening tonight's file, let me tell you how your Equitable Society views the years to come. Does the year 1996 seem a long way off to you? To us of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, 1996 often seems just around the corner. You see, the future is our business. Every week we sign life insurance contracts which may not be paid off until the 21st century. This means that we of the Equitable Society have to be constantly alert to the requirements of the future. We have to be progressive and forward-looking. Because the Equitable Society has to take a long-range viewpoint, it invests its funds in ways that promote the long-range prosperity of the country, so that by serving its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society will serve America.
Tonight's file, The Unwelcome Guest. The valley of the Hudson River, which runs north from New York City, is very attractive country. Driving along the river highway, you can see the homes of people who lead normal, useful lives. We refer to these people, for want of a better phrase, as middle class. They live neither in mansions nor in slums. Their lives are well regulated. They work six days a week. They go out on Saturday night. They rest on Sunday. On rare occasions, their lives are disturbed by crime. On very rare occasions, as this case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation shows, they are victims of a dramatic crime. A crime like extortion. As our story opens, it is dinner time in the attractive home of the Fultons, located near a small city in upstate New York. Emma Fulton is in the dining room, doing what so many wives do every night. She's waiting for her husband to come home. Emma? Emma? Here I am, John. Hello, dear. Hello, darling. Sorry, I'm late. Oh, that's all right. The food's still hot. Here, let me take your coat. Oh, thanks, dear. You look tired. I am. These meetings every night are beginning to get me down. So you know what I've been thinking? No, what? I've been thinking maybe we ought to get away for a little vacation when these meetings are over. Oh, sounds wonderful. Now, this isn't another business trip, though, is no, it? No, no, just the two of us. Oh, wonderful. Oh, my goodness. What's the matter, dear? That man who called while you were out last night. Hmm? You know, the Connecticut call? Oh, Mr. Parker. Yes, I forgot all about him. He came here about an hour ago, and he's waiting for you in the den. Parker. Just can't seem to place him. Oh, but he, he said he's an old friend. Well, I'll see him. We'll be back in a minute. All right, dear. Hello. Hello, John. Leonard Parker. Remember me? Well, I don't mean to be rude, Mr. Parker. Think hard. Afraid I don't. <laughs> and after all, we meant to each other, too. Mr. Parker, you're obviously enjoying this, but I'm afraid I'll have to be getting back to my dinner. Uh, wait a minute, You uh, aren't very hospitable to an old bunkie after 21 years. Oh. Remember now, huh? Yes. You don't sound very happy to see me. Why did you come here? Take it easy, John. I'm not going to blow any whistles. I wouldn't if I were you. When I escaped from that road gang, you were with me, remember? Like it was yesterday. There's one thing you don't know. What's that? I was caught about a year later and went back to finish my time. Well, that's too bad. I ain't coming for sympathy. Why did you come here? Because I'm hot. I'm so hot right now that if you touched me, you'd burn yourself. Hot? You mean you've been legitimate so long you don't know what the word hot means? It means the coppers are looking for me. Look, my dinner's getting cold. Drop by the office, huh? Tomorrow afternoon we can... Cut it, John. I'm not leaving. You're a solid citizen in this community. I checked on that. Nobody'd suspect you of running a hideout. Well, Look, I... I always wanted to live like this. Now I'm going to find out what it's like. I'm staying here. John, may I come in? Oh, Emma, this is an old friend of mine, Leonard Parker. I introduced myself before. Yes. Yes, uh, would you care to join us for dinner, Mr. Parker? Thank you. I think I would. Emma. Yes? Mr. Parker's going to stay with us for a while. Oh, that's fine. Welcome, Mr. Parker. That same evening, in fact, at just about the time John and Emma Fulton and their guest were sitting down to dinner... There was a conference being held in the New York offices of the FBI. Special Agents Beckley and Preston were going over what facts they had on the robbery of a bank in Peekskill, New York, that afternoon. Well, Bob, we've got enough to get us started. How many were there? As far as we can find out, only two. They entered the bank just as it was closing. That's right. Get any description? Mm Mm-hmm. 
If the bank teller and the guard are right, we've got a pretty good description. Good. Mm-hmm. I've already flashed the alarm to Connecticut, Jersey, Pennsylvania, and upstate New York. Well, they couldn't have gone any further than that since this afternoon. I don't think so. Also been watching LaGuardia Airport, Grand Central, Penn Station, the bus terminals. The only way they can keep moving is by car, then. Uh-huh. I'd uh, steal a new one. Sent out the description of the car they used and even had the license plate numbers. Something on the teletype. Uh-huh. Description, your office, 4.25 p.m., covers Leonard Parker and Robert Keene. Complete records follow. Beckley speaking. Yes, Sergeant. One of them, huh? Okay, we'll be right up. The police found the car. Where? Up on the parkway, near Peekskill. One of them was in it. Dead. What now? Come on, grab your hat. We can talk in the car. John. Yes, dear? I... I've got to talk to you about something. What's wrong? John, in all the time we've been married, I've never tried to... to pick your friends. Well, I know that. And I've never tried to tell you who you could or or couldn't invite here as a guest. Parker? Yes. Since you invited him last night, dear, he's taken over the household. He even went into your closet today and took out one of your suits. He's got ashes all over the library rug, and when I mentioned it to him, he simply said, Skip it, Emmy. Well, I... I'll speak to him, dear. John, I... I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to do more than that. What's that? I'm afraid you'll have to ask him to leave. If you feel that way, dear, I will. I'll go in and tell him right now. Oh, John. Come on in. Leonard, I want to talk to you. That's fair enough. Would you like me to pick a subject, or did you come prepared? Leonard, this is very serious. You'll have to leave. I thought you said this was going to be serious. You can't stay here any longer. John, that's no way to run a hideout. You'll never get any business that way. You've got to be courteous to your guests. I'm not joking. Look, you want me to tell your wife about you? No. Then let's not discuss it anymore. How long are you going to be here? Maybe three, four weeks. I may have to go out of town before that on business. Go ahead. Emma and I can stay here alone. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. I, I wish you'd do something for me. What? Uh, speak to your wife and tell her to be a little more polite to me. I mean, the way she acts, she thinks she didn't want me around here. She doesn't. I know that. And she's got no choice. I'm your guest. Leonard, I've got a proposition to make. What is it? I've got trucks that go from here to California with shipments of everything from fruit to pianos. Yeah? I'd be willing to ship you out there. No doubt. But you'd be perfectly safe. John, I'm going to stay right here. Now, mix me a scotch and soda, will you? And uh, nobody can say I'm not democratic. Take one for yourself. Special agents Beckley and Preston had discovered upon examining the body of the man in the bank robber's car that he was Robert Keene. Keene had been killed when the car ran off the parkway and crashed into a concrete bridge. There was no clues on which way Leonard Parker had gone. But there was one thing they could work on. One clue which might break open the whole case. Hi, Bob. Come on in, Dan. What'd you get? Well, I checked that key we found in Keene's pocket. Yes? It was from a small hotel called the Benton Arms. Never heard of it. Neither did I until today. It's near Greenwich, Connecticut. What'd they say at the hotel? Parker and Keene were registered there under aliases. Mm -hmm. But I found enough fingerprints to show they used the room. Clerk remembered them, too. How long were they there? One night. They had no luggage, so they paid cash for the room when they checked in. Must have had their plans pretty well set if they were in town for only one night. Yeah. They, uh, they made one phone call while they were in the room. Who'd they call? A number up in Westchester. What was the number? Oh, I got it written down here. Um, belongs to the home of a fellow named John Fulton. What about Fulton? Who's he? I checked the neighborhood. He's a... Substantial businessman, owns a trucking company up there. And he's one of the town's leading citizens. Did you call him? Yeah, but he wasn't in. You know what I vote for? 
Going up to see Mr. Fulton? Right. Good idea. Let's go. Yes, dear. Look at this. What? What is it? This newspaper. His picture's in it. Whose picture? Mr. Parker. And read this story. The police are looking, are connecting him with a bank holdup. Oh. I knew there was something about him. John, you've got to call the police at once. Well, dear, I... He's a dangerous criminal, dear. Call them, John. Wait, Emma. Let's reason this out. But there's nothing to reason. If you don't call them, I will, John. Just a minute, Mrs. Fulton. You're not calling the police. But I... You want me to tell her why, John? Okay. I'll tell it. Leonard. John and I were in prison together and we broke out. Oh, no. That was a long time ago, 21 years ago. The cops are all looking for me, but remember, they're also looking for John. If I go, he goes with me. Now, do you want him to call? Perhaps he does. Huh? I want to thank you, Leonard. I feel better now than I have in 21 years. What do you mean? I never wanted to keep this story from the world. That didn't make any difference to me. But I did want to keep it from Emma. Because I thought it would hurt her. Oh, John. Now that she knows, I'm willing to take my chances with the law. Ah. Oh. The FBI called the night before I got in. It was undoubtedly about you. I'm going to call them back. Hand me the phone. Why, certainly, John. Here you are. Oh! <laughs> Now we can hang the phone up again. We will return to the file on the unwelcome guest in just a moment. Meanwhile, let me tell you about an incident that might have happened at the drugstore just around the corner from your house. This week at the Equitable Society, one of the executives told me a story. He was treating his little girl to a chocolate malted down at Sam McGuire's drugstore, and the kids were having great fun watching Sam juggling glasses, putting on a show for the kids. Sam, he said, someday you'll miss, and there go your profits. I won't miss, Sam said. The kids would lose faith in me. I've got to be good. Well, if Sam the Soda Man has to keep faith with children, what about us who work for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States? The safety and soundness of Equitable Society policies are responsible for all the joy there is in a lot of children's lives. Yet the big job of thousands of Equitable Society policies is keeping homes together and boys and girls in school. Maybe that will help you understand why we of the Equitable Society take our business so seriously. Why we make every effort to keep ahead of the times. To keep our life insurance policies fitted to the needs of all Equitable Society members. You see, all of us in this society, we all want to be able to keep on saying that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security. For you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Unwelcome Guest. Roughly speaking, criminals can be divided into two classes those who suffer from an inferiority complex, and those who have inflated egos. The criminal with the inferiority complex takes to a life of crime because he does not feel equipped to make his living by ordinary methods. Those others, like Leonard Parker, suffer from too exalted an opinion of themselves, an opinion which makes it beneath their dignity to work for a living. That class is the group which practices extortion because it gives them a peculiar pleasure to see their victims squirm, a peculiar pleasure to see their victims lose their every shred of personal dignity. Leonard Parker, through brutal assault, now rules the Fulton household. What are you doing? 
just going to move this husband of yours. Where are you taking him? Oh, I think I ought to move him to a bed so he'd be comfortable. Well, I'll call the doctor. No, you won't. Oh, but he's badly hurt. Look, I slugged a lot of guys like this. Nothing happens. They get a headache and then they get over it. I insist that we call a doctor. Shut up. Oh. I'm giving the orders around him. You got any ideas about calling the cops? Forget them. And uh, one more thing. John said something about the FBI calling. If they call again, you tell them there's no such person here as Leonard Parker, that you never heard of anyone with that name, that your husband left town on a business trip. Very well. And if you remember all those answers, nothing more will happen to John. Is that a deal? Yes. Yes, it's a deal. As John Fulton was being dragged to his bedroom, a black sedan was being parked in front of the Fulton home. A black sedan which had carried Special Agents Beckley and Preston from New York. They walked across the snow-covered lawn, past the garage, up the few steps to the front door, and rang the bell. This must be the house. Yes. Yes? Good evening. Are you Mrs. John Fulton? That's right. My name is Beckley. I'm a Special Agent of the FBI. Oh. And this is Mr. Preston, who's also an agent. Here are our credentials. Well, uh, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Is Mr. Fulton at home? No, I'm sorry, he's not. I uh, just came back from driving him to the station. Where'd he go? Uh, uh, to New York. I see. When do you expect him back? Tomorrow night. Uh, Mrs. Fulton, your husband got a telephone call the other night from a gentleman named Leonard Parker. Well, he, he may have. Do you know Mr. Parker? No. He must be a business acquaintance. I see. You don't remember hearing your husband mention Mr. Parker's name, do you, Mrs. Fulton? No. No, I don't. But then my husband and I never discuss his business. Uh, one more thing. Yes? Can you tell us where Mr. Fulton is going to spend the night in New York? No, I'm sorry. I, I can't. Well, thank you. We'll drop by tomorrow night when Mr. Fulton returns. I'll tell him you called. Thank you. Goodbye. 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 That story about Fulton being driven to the station's a phony. Yes, I know. I noticed the same thing you did. There isn't a fresh mark in the snow in front of the garage. Mm. I think we ought to go into the village, get a search warrant, and come back here. Okay, Emma. And I'm real proud of you. I didn't do it for you. I know that. What do we do now? Why? Well, you heard them. They're coming back here tomorrow night. Let them come. Hey, where are you going? I'm going in to see John. Sit down. No. Sit down. Oh. I said. I gotta figure out something. You don't think I'm gonna be here waiting for those coppers to come back tomorrow night, do you? What are you going to do? We're gonna drive into New York. We leave in about a half an hour in your car. They know your car in this town. They won't stop it. You'll drive. Then what about John? He stays here. Oh, no. Look, he's got to stay. He's dead. <gasps> That's the third time I've rung this thing. The car's gone. She must have left. Look, if she doesn't answer this time, let's move in. We've got the warrant. Let's move in now. Hello? Hello in here? Sounds like nobody's home. Yes. They can't have been gone long. There's still a cigarette burning in the ashtray. They sure left in an awful hurry. Why? Looking in the kitchen. What's that? Something's still cooking in the stove. Uh huh. Uh, let's see what's in this room over here. Right. Hey. Yes, I see him. Well, I don't know who he is, but my guess is that it's Fulton. Looks as if he died about an hour ago. That means he was dead when we were here before. Yes. That also means that Parker must have had the drop on her when she was talking to us. More than likely. 
Say, look at the sleeve of this coat here. Hmm? Oh. What about it? These spots are old bloodstains. You... You think they might be Parker's? Well, let's take a look inside the pocket. <clears throat> Here's a label with a name. But it's not Parker's. Bolton's? No. The name is Ralph Cousins. Cousins. Let's call the tailor and find out who Mr. Cousins is. Right. And send out an alarm on the Fulton automobile. Right. I think Mr. Parker has finally run into a red light. taking me. To my house. And where's that? In New York. But don't worry. We won't get caught. I'm not worrying about that. That's good. You just let me do all the thinking. That way we'll be safer. See, I thought this out a thousand times, so we're pretty well prepared. Uh, in the apartment house where I live, I'm a respected businessman named Ralph Cousins. Remember that? Why? Because when we go in, if you mention my name, call me Ralph or Mr. Cousins. Forget that Leonard Parker business. When are you going to let me go? As soon as we leave my apartment. What are you slowing down for? This is where I show you how to steal a car. What? First we park here. Now. See that car up ahead? Yes. See the boy and girl sitting in the car? Yes. And you walk up there and ask the boy if he'll come back and give you a hand. No. Tell him you're stuck. No. Do as I say. Because if you don't, you'll be very, very dead. Well, here we are. This is where I live. Get out. You were nice enough to have me as a guest at your place. Now I'll return the gun. This is ground floor apartment. Here we are. Wait till I turn on the light. Stay where you are, Parker. What? Who are you? The FBI. That's right, Mrs. Bolton. Oh... My name is Ralph Cousins, not Parker. Either one will do. Just stand still while I remove this gun. Okay. You win. But tell me one thing. What is it? How'd you know I was Ralph Cousins? Remember the suit you were wearing when you arrived at Fulton's? Yeah, sure. That pepper and salt job? It had your name inside. That suit is going to convict you for murder. You know something... I always liked that suit, too. Leonard Parker was tried on the charge of murder, convicted, and sentenced to death in the electric chair. He was right when he said that you can't be too careful. Especially if you're a criminal whose path crosses that of the FBI. John Fulton's life might have been spared if he had followed the simple instructions issued by the FBI. Criminals cannot be defeated by ordinary, decent, law-abiding citizens unless those citizens avail themselves of the help that lies at the other end of every telephone line. The Federal Bureau of Investigation. Remember that. The reign of terror which struck at the home of John and Emma Fulton could have struck at your home. If it ever does, remember that the FBI works on a -a 24-hour-a-day schedule, a schedule which continues to prove beyond any doubt that crime does not pay. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing, the Equitable Society representative in your community. 
To your FBI, you look for national security. And to the Equitable Life Assurance Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time, over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Life Assurance Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Souvenir. The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Jerry Lewis, and your narrator was Dean Carlson. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, for this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI. An official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's FBI file, let's consider the slogan, E Pluribus Unum that appears on every United States coin. It means one from many. In other words, get together, stay united. A perfect example is the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. In the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans have united for security, have pooled their dollars to give each individual member far more financial security than he could achieve by his own unaided efforts. These Equitable Society dollars are invested for the benefit of its members and to promote the industrial and financial health of the entire country so that by serving its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Sinister Souvenir. of you men who are now wearing discharge buttons in your lapels, here is a message from your FBI. It's about those souvenirs you brought back home with you, the shooting kind. 
You know, that rifle or pistol or Tommy gun? Well, already scores and scores of these weapons have figured in serious crimes committed by other persons who got possession of them. A little later, we'll tell you how you can keep your war trophy from becoming an instrument of crime. But first, listen to the recent case of one returning vet and the crime that came out of his gear bag. Most of the fellows kissed the good old USA's terra firma the minute they got off the boat. But not PFC Joe Williams. He saved his kiss until he came up out of the subway and planted it smack on Flatbush Avenue, Brooklyn. A little while later, he planted another kiss on the cheek of his sister. Gosh, Joe. Hey. It's just so wonderful you're home. I'm you're home. home? Yeah, I'm home, baby. Oh, I'm so happy I don't know what to say. Well, I feel pretty good myself. Just let me look at you again. Okay. Oh, uh, oh, I've got to stop this. Let's get organized. You sit right down over there and I'll go fix you something. Now, to now, eat. wait a minute, wait a minute. Food can wait. I've got some things to show you first. You have what? Presents, souvenirs, junk like that. I've got them right here in the bag. But you must be hungry, Bob. Hey, you just stay put. Here, now take a look at this. That's for you. Oh, Joe. Perfume. Yeah, that's genuine French perfume. Don't smell bad either. Here, take a sniff. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Good, huh? And, and look, look here, here's something for Eddie. One of those fancy Heidelberg Steins. Oh, that's beautiful, Joe. By the way, where is that husband of yours? Well, he's still sleeping. I'll call him now and tell him that you're here. No, 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 no. Don't bother. Here, look, take a look at the rest of this junk. All right. Souvenir, souvenir. Here, look. This here is a Nazi flag. Uh, it is? Yeah. Here's some Heine medals. Take a look at this. There's an honest-to-goodness German Luger. Oh, Ooh, that's a nasty-looking thing. Yeah, that's one of the sweetest automatics there is. I, I took it from the owner personally. How? Well, it's a long story. Hey! <laughs> hey! Oh, there's Eddie now. He's awake. Hey, where did you... Hi, me? Eddie. Huh? Oh. Hello, Joe. I was just going to call you, Eddie, and tell you that Joe was here, but I was so excited. Isn't this a wonderful surprise? Uh, yeah. Welcome home, kid. Well, thanks, Hey, where did you put my brown suit? It's in the hall closet. Eddie, you talk to Joe for a minute now. I want to go out and fix something to eat. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, you look good, kid. Thanks. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, uh, when'd, you, when'd you get here? Oh, I just got in a few minutes ago. Uh, yeah, what's all this stuff? Souvenirs, presents, junkyard. Oh, here's something for you, Eddie. Oh, for me? That... Oh, there, my dear. Mm-hmm. Right from Heidelberg. Oh, thanks. Hey. And yeah, what's with the gun? Oh, that's a uh, German Luger. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Hey, that's a good-looking job. Where, where'd you get it? I took it off a guy. Yeah. Uh, look, you mind if I look at it? No, go ahead. Hey. Huh. <laughs> yeah, this is okay. Uh... Joe. Yeah? Look, I don't want to sound ungrateful, but could I maybe work a swap with you? Oh, what, what do you mean? This Luger instead of the beer mug? Oh, gee. Oh, I throw in a little cash on the side. What do you want with a gun? Well, just for a souvenir. What do you say? I'm afraid not, Eddie. Okay, kid. Come on, let's go in and eat. you, Eddie? No, it's me, sis. Joe. Well, did you visit all the neighbors? Yeah, I saw a few of them. Were they surprised? Mm-hmm. I purposely didn't tell any of them that you were home. I wanted them to hey, be. Hey, yeah. Yeah? I got to talk to you. What about? Eddie. Well? Now, look, Peggy, I, I know this is none of my business, and if, if he wasn't married to you, I'd keep out of it, but what does the guy do? You mean his job? Yeah. He's a salesman. What does he sell? Lots of things. Well, I mean, what? What, for instance? Well, now, why do you want to know this, Joe? Well, for one thing, I was talking to some of the guys in the neighborhood today. From what they said, Eddie's mixed up with the wrong kind of people. Oh. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah. I had another reason for asking, too. You know that Luga I brought home with me? The gun? Mm Mm-hmm. Eddie wanted it. He said he'd swap me the beer mug for it and give me some cash besides. Yeah, but you didn't give it to him. No, no, but I looked in my gear bag this morning. Yeah? The Luger is gone. (laughs) 
Yes, the Luger is gone. But it is no longer a war trophy, a souvenir. It has gone to a darkened warehouse on the Brooklyn waterfront. There, in the hands of Joe's brother-in-law and a companion, the Luger has now become an instrument of crime. How many more boxes? This is the last of them here. Okay, let's get them out of the truck. Look, we've been here long enough. It's only take a couple of more minutes. Come on. Okay. Easy now. Wait a minute. Hmm? Listen. Probably the watchman. Dutch. Don't you quit. Told you we should have. Shut up. He's coming right at us. He's going to spot us. No, he ain't. Oh! <laughs> Let's blow. Mr. Forrest? Yes? My name is Hope. This is Mr. Rogers. We're from the FBI. Well, how, how do you do? Uh, the body of the watchman is in the main warehouse. Uh, come with me, please. Surely. Any idea when the killing occurred? Not more than two hours ago. That's the last time the watchman checked in. I see. When he missed making his last report, we investigated. After finding the body, we immediately called you. Uh In here, please. All right. Go ahead, Jack. There he is, right over there. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go outside and wait for the coroner. Surely, Mr. Forrest. Okay, Jack. Let's have a look at him. Okay. Build him right through the head. Yeah. Well, we better start looking for where that bullet lodged. Now, let's see. He was standing right here at the entrance of this row of narcotic packing cases. A bullet entered low on the forehead. Came out high in the back of his head. Hey, look, Larry, high up on that post there. Where? Oh, looks like a fresh chip. Yeah. Uh, come on, give me a hand with this ladder. Okay. Hold it here, now. Yeah, that's good. All right. Now hold it steady and I'll go up. Watch it. What'd you find, Jack? What we're looking for, all right. Good. If I don't break my knife digging it out. Yeah. Yeah, that's got it. Okay, come on up. What's it look like? It's not big enough for a thirty-eight. Doesn't look like a thirty-two either. No. Well, let's not bother guessing. Let's see what other leads we can pick up and then get over to the lab. Somebody here to see Eddie. Who is it? He says he's your brother-in-law. What's he doing here? Tell him I'm busy. Now you can't be that busy, Eddie. Okay, kid, come on in. Wait outside, don't you? Okay. What's on your mind? Well, uh, Peg asked me to come here to your office. She was worried when you didn't come home last night. I was working. All night? Yeah, all night. Doing what, Eddie? What's that to you? Well, it's nothing to me, but well, Peg's my sister. Now let her ask the question. Look, Eddie, I talked to some guys in the neighborhood and they told me some things about you that didn't sound so good. Oh, yeah? Like what? Well, that you were mixed up with the wrong kind of guys. What is this? Are you trying to pin something on me? No, I just want to find out if it's true. Of course it ain't true. Someone's trying to knife me, that's all. And there's one more thing. Well? That uh, German Luger I brought home with me. What about it? You wanted it. That's right. I looked for it yesterday. It was gone. Now, wait a minute. Are you trying to say I took that? Eddie, all I know is it's gone. Have you told all this to Peg? Yes. Oh, that's great. That puts me in a terrible spot. Look, could you go on home? Tell Peg I'll be home for dinner. Then the three of us can sit down and straighten this out. Okay? lab report on that bullet check yet, Larry? No, but they had to call any minute. Looks like that's going to be our best clue. Why, Jack? What about those fingerprints we got off the windowsill where the thieves came in? They were the night watchmans. Well, that's that. Targeted. Hope speaking. Oh, it's the lab. Oh. Yes. Yes, all right. 
Uh-huh. Now send over the complete report, will you, please? Thanks. What's the verdict, Larry? Caliber of that bullet was 7.65. Millimeters. That's right. It was fired from a German Luger. Peg. She isn't here, Eddie. Uh, oh. I did. I say, Peg went out. Well, didn't you tell her I was coming home for supper? Yeah, yeah, I told her. Where'd she go? See the doctor. Doc? What for? Well, looks like you're going to become a father. How no good. Eddie, have you seen today's paper? Why? There's a story in it about a holdup in a government warehouse. Yeah? The watchman in the warehouse was killed. So what? Well, let me read you something. The bullet which killed the watchman was found lodged in a wooden support. The FBI laboratory positively identified it as having been fired from a German Luger. What are you telling me for? When I was in your office today, I saw some boxes, Eddie. Boxes with government stencils on them. Look, what are you driving at? I know now what happened to my Luger. Now, look. You did that job, Eddie. You did it with my gun. You're crazy. Where's the gun? I don't know what you're talking about. Turn around. Keep away from me. There's a bulge over your hip. I want to find out. There we are. I was right. Yeah, wise guy. This is your gun pointing right at you. Let me have it, Eddie. What? I want the gun. Keep away, kid. I said I want the gun. Okay. So long, sucker. Tonight's FBI file on the sinister souvenir will reopen in just a moment. Meanwhile, perhaps you'll be surprised, as I was, to learn that there is more than one kind of security. This week at the Equitable Society, I got a brand new slant on the subject of security from Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Society. Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Parkinson said to me, that there's such a thing as having too much security? Well, how could that be, I asked. Well, Mr. Parkinson said, a convict in jail serving a life sentence has perfect security. His clothes, food, and shelter are assured for the rest of his life. But who wants that kind of security bought at the price of freedom? Of course, that's an extreme case, President Parkinson went on, but don't forget that the oldest trick of all dictatorial governments, from Julius Caesar to Adolf Hitler, was to promise the people bread and circuses and security and then take away their liberties. Mr. Parkinson paused for a moment, and when he continued, there was a note of deep conviction in his voice as he said, that's one reason why all of us in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States are glad that Americans believe in life insurance. Equitable Society members do not pay for their security with lost freedom. Life insurance security is the result of individual thrift and forethought, of initiative and self-reliance. And a man with life insurance is pretty sure to turn a deaf ear to the glib promises of demagogues and agitators. Yes, we're proud to say that this week, and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security the right kind of security for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file on the Sinister Souvenir. Of course, no returning veteran expects that the pistol or tommy gun or other lethal weapon which he brings home as a war trophy shall ever become an instrument of crime. Joe Williams certainly didn't expect that to happen to his German Luger automatic. But two nights after he got home, one man had been murdered with it, and next day he himself was shot with it. A few minutes after the brutal shooting of Joe Williams, his sister returned to the apartment. Finding him on the floor, she called the doctor, then worked feverishly to bring him back to consciousness. 
Here, darling, drink this water. Thanks. No, don't move, Joe. I'll lift your head. Okay. That's fine. That's fine, darling. I bandaged the wound and checked the bleeding. The doctor will be right over. Uh-huh. Joe, what happened? Uh, it was an accident. I shot myself. That's not true. Honest, Peg. Yeah, then where's the gun? Well, it's... Look, I've got a pretty good idea what really happened. Eddie did this to you. No, Peg. Joe, I saw him run out of the building here as I was coming down the street. I called out to him, but he just kept right on going. Now, you tell me the truth, Joe. Okay. It was Eddie. Why'd he do it? Why? He did take my gun. He used it in the holdup. He killed a man. Oh. I tried to take the gun back. He shot me with it. Oh. oh. I'm sorry, sis. Joe... Joe, we got to call the police. No, don't. Joe, he killed a man. He's gone. He won't be back. Look, you're going to keep out of this. What about the doctor? He's going to know that something was wrong. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll tell him it was an accident. Look, sis, you're going to have a baby. Huh. Let's do this for the kid, huh? Right number, Jack? Yep. Yeah? Good afternoon. We're special agents of the FBI. The FBI? Yes. We learned about your brother's accident. May we come in and talk to him? Well, uh, uh, yes, I guess so. Thank you. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. This way, please. Thanks. Who's the company, sis? These men are uh, special agents of the FBI, Joe. What do you want? Well, Joe, we thought you might be interested in something we found out about the bullet that the doctor dug out of your shoulder. How did you know about it? Our doctors have to report these cases to the police, you know. That's how we got hold of the bullet. Well, what about it? Well, under our microscopes in the laboratory, it exactly matches the one that killed the night watchman last night. We'd like to see your German Luger, Joe. I, uh, I, I haven't got it. We know you didn't kill the night watchman. Uh, yeah, I say, I, I haven't got the gun. Let's see. Did your husband take it with him, Mrs. Oakland? You know. Yes. We've checked everybody in your house since we found out about the bullet. Sis didn't know the truth about Eddie. We're sure of that. You see, she wanted to spill everything right away, but I kept her from it on account of... I kind of... Yes, we even know about the baby, too. What we want to know now is where is Eddie Oakland? I wish we could tell you. We need a good description of him. The police knew him, of course, but nobody has a photo of him. I can furnish that. Oh, good. Jack. Yeah? I'll stay here and get a full interview on everything. You go back to the office, get out an alarm on Oakland. I'll meet you there. Right. How have you been doing, Jack? No results from the alarm yet. How did you make out? Very well. What did you get? Oakland's wife told me about an office he had. I went over to the place, found some of the goods stolen from the warehouse. Well. I also found a man there. I've had him booked as a suspect. Could he tell you where Oakland was? No, but he's being questioned now. I've put out an alarm on his car. Oh, he'll probably stay out of that. It's too hot. I'll get it. Hope speaking. Oh, hello, Howard. What? Yes, yes, wonderful. Good work. We'll get on at Prano. Thanks. Got something? Oakland's on the Commodore, headed for Chicago. Really? At least Howard turned up a ticket seller who sold Oakland space on it. Which section? The second. Let's see, it's midnight now. Train hasn't gotten to Buffalo yet. Let's get the Buffalo office on the phone. Can I get you anything else, Joe? No, thanks. But you didn't eat a thing. I wasn't hungry. Now, you know the doctor said you've got to eat. I know, I know what the doctor said. Look, sis, I'm getting out of bed tomorrow. Joe. I don't want you waiting on me like now, this. Joe, I'll I don't... cause you enough trouble. What are you talking about? Well, if I hadn't brought that stinking gun into this house... That gun's got no bearing on what Eddie did. Well, it was my pistol that killed that watchman. Eddie killed the watchman. Oh, if I could only get my hands on him, I... do what, Peg? Look. Tell me. What would you do? Why, you dirty... Take it easy. Eddie, why did Shut you... up and listen. I come back here for a couple of days until the heat cools off. Then I'll be on my way again. No, you can't stay here. This is the safest place for me to be. I'm supposed to be on my way to Chicago. 
Can I help it if I'm smart? You're so smart, you've got the whole FBI looking for you. That's why I come back. The FBI will never think of looking for me here until after I'm gone. That is, uh, unless one of you tries to tell him something. In which case, there's plenty of bullets left in this Luger. Tell him where he can go, sis. Fix me something to eat, Peg, and some hot jam. I said tell him where Shut he up, can go. Shut up, before I... Daddy, don't. I'll get you something to eat. Swell. Oh, and look. Nobody's leaving this house until after I do. Understand? <laughs> Larry, the Commodore left Buffalo 30 minutes ago. We ought to hear something. Well, maybe it was late. Maybe so, but... Okay. Home speaking. Yes. Oh, it's Buffalo now. Good. Hello, yes. What? Uh huh. Yeah, I see. Pull the old gag, huh? Well, thanks anyway. So long. What happened? The man riding in Oakland space wasn't Oakland. Pulled the old trick, book space, then turned it over to a hotel porter to sell to somebody else. Oakland's trying to be foxy, huh? Well, Jack, there's another part that usually goes with that particular piece of foxiness. What do you mean? Come on. I believe I'll get to show you what I mean. Good. I hope it chokes you. Thanks. Any more jabber there, Peg? Yeah. Pour me some. Let him pour his own. I didn't do a very good job on you, did I? Just swinging you in the shoulder. Maybe I can make up for it before I leave. What do you mean by that? Just trying to make him behave himself, that's all. That gun makes you a real big guy. I'm a big guy without it. Yeah, as long as I'm in bed, you are. Peg, will you tell us... Where did she go? Well, the... You wanted more coffee, didn't you? She had coffee right here. Well, maybe she went to make some fresh. Maybe she went to do something else, too, like getting on that phone. Leave her alone. Oh, no. Beck, what are you doing? Operator, hurry, please. Get away from that phone. Hang up, I said. <laughs> Told you not to do that. <laughs> get back in there. Take your hands off her. Joe, get back to bed. I'm going to fix this guy right now. Look, kid, I don't want to blast you again. Keep away, I'm warning you. Eddie, don't. Drop that gun, Oakland, and huh? don't turn around. The FBI. Ah, you see what I meant, Jack? If he was dumb enough to pull the old railroad gag, then he had to pull the rest of the act, too. Try to hide out at home. All right, Oakland. Come on. Eddie Oakland and his accomplice were tried for the murder of the warehouse watchman. They were convicted on the charge of first-degree murder. As for Joe Williams, his war trophy, the German Luger, was returned to him. But after it had been rendered harmless by experts of the FBI. And that brings us to the final part of your FBI's message to you returned veterans who have brought back firearm souvenirs from the battlefield. No one wants you to give them up. You earned the right to keep them. Earned it the hard way. But please, for your sake, for the sake of your loved ones, and for the sake of society, have a firearms expert render your gun harmless. Do this now. Do it now without delay. And you can be certain that your souvenir will always remain just that and never become an instrument of a crime. Next week, you will hear another thrilling case from the files of the FBI. Before telling you about it, Here's a brief but important message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To the FBI, America looks for national security. And to the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans look for the financial security of life insurance. 
These three and a quarter million people comprise the Equitable Society. Because, you see, the moment they purchased life insurance through an Equitable Society representative, they became members of this great mutual organization. Remember, like your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society representative in your community is constantly working for the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Cautious Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation... Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file, it occurs to us that as you have listened to previous programs in this series, you may have wondered about the word society in the name Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Why is it called a society, you may have said to yourself? Why not a company? Well, the answer is very simple. The Equitable Society is called a society because it is a society. It is a voluntary association of men and women who have joined together for security. It is a cooperative enterprise maintained solely for the benefit of its members. And all its members receive the friendly service and personal attention that the word society implies. So when you next consider the purchase of life insurance, remember that by becoming an equitable society policyholder, you automatically become a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Cautious Killer. A crime of passion, such as killing in a rage of jealousy is seldom committed by the hardened, cold-blooded professional criminal. It is more often the act of a normally law-abiding citizen, a store clerk or a banker or a doctor or a laborer, such as the coal miner in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. And because it is not a professional crime, its final solution may rest solely on getting a confession of guilt from the suspect. But many arduous steps between the start of the hunt and victory for the hunter.
In most any small coal mining town, a pretty young woman storms out in sharp and refreshing relief against the dinginess of the community. And often she is the target for the idle gossip of the envious. In this particular mining village in Ohio, the pretty young woman was Mary Clifton, whose husband, John, always drank too much beer at the corner bar and sometimes got wind of too much gossip. Tonight, as usual, Mary has put supper in the warming oven while waiting for the sound of steps on the porch. Tonight, the steps are heavier than usual. Mary. Mary. I'm right here, John. Oh. Supper ready? Yes. Let me have your dinner pail, dear. I can take care of myself. And don't call me that. Call you what? Dear. Let me have your dinner pail, dear. Supper's ready, dear. Wash up, dear. John, please. You know why I don't like the word? No. Because I know that's what you call him, too. Who are you talking about? You know who I'm talking about. He was here again today, wasn't he? Who do you mean? Jim Monroe. Yes, Jim was here. I knew it. He came to see you. Don't give me that. Everybody in town knows who he comes to see. John. He's in love with you. John, don't say that. Everybody in town is saying now, it. Now, look, you've been drinking. That's what you always say when I start talking about you and him. Please. You don't like to hear me talk about it, do you? But you like it when he comes here to see you. Stop it, John. You like it when he holds you in his arms and kisses you. I can't stand it. But you can't stand him loving you, can't you? Can't you? <laughs> Thank you, John. Huh? Thank you for slapping me. Help me get hold of myself so I can tell you something. What? I'm leaving you. So I was right, Wait huh? a minute. Let me talk. When I married you, I loved you as much as any woman ever loved a man. But through the years, you've done everything possible to kill that love. And now that it's dead, things around me have begun to matter. All I can see is this, this dirt and this filth and this shabbiness. And I can't stand it anymore. Are you through? Yes, I am. Okay. Now let me tell you the real reason you want to leave. You want to go away with him. Think whatever you like, John. I'm leaving tonight. Oh, no, you're not leaving. You don't think I'm going to let you go away with him, do you? I said think whatever you like. Come back here. Take your hands off me. You ain't pulling any double cross on John, me. let go of me. John. John, you took me. This kind of spoils your plans, don't it? This kind of messes everything up for you and Jim. He can have you, all right? When I'm done with you. Sure. Now he can have you any time he wants. <laughs> Exactly two weeks after the brutal slaying of the miner's wife, in the adjoining state of Pennsylvania, agent in charge Leeds of the Pittsburgh office of the FBI has just received a caller. Mr. Leeds, I'm Chief of Police Baxter from Larkin, Ohio. Oh, yes, yes, I've been expecting you. Sit down, won't you? Thanks, I will. <clears throat> I think I have a case for the FBI. Yes? Two weeks ago in Larkin... The house of a coal miner called John Clifton caught fire and burned to the ground. Mm hmm We found the charred body of Mary, the miner's wife, on the floor of what had been the kitchen. What about the husband? Well, he was drinking at a bar when the fire alarm was turned in. He ran to the fire and he tried to get his wife out, but the fireman stopped him. Where's the crime angle, Chief? Mr. Leeds, I don't think Mary Clifton died in that fire. Oh, I've got a suspicion that she was murdered before the fire. Murdered by her husband. Yes, but you just said that when the fire broke out, he ran to the house and attempted... I know, I know. I haven't got enough material evidence to back up my suspicions or I'd have him extradited. Extradited? Yes. That's why I came here. John Clifton left Larkin, Ohio a week after it happened. We traced him to Ridgewood, Pennsylvania. And he's working there in the coal mines. Chief... 
If you haven't enough evidence, I... I don't see where we fit in the case. We can back into the murder. You see, Clifton was jealous of a man named Monroe. He tried to extort money from Monroe on the grounds that he was carrying on with his wife. Hmm. I see. Now, let me give you the whole background on this fellow Clifton. Here's the reason why I think that... You want to see me, Mr. Leeds? Yes, come in, Jeff. Thanks. Did you finish reading up on the Clifton case? Yes, I just finished. According to our vocation avocation file, you spent some time around coal mines, Jeff. That's right. I spent a couple of summers in the mines when I was studying engineering. And I think you're our candidate to contact Mr. Clifton. Good. You have to work alongside him without him suspecting your plan. I see. Have you any opinions on the case? Yes. The neighbors said they heard an explosion and saw a flash of flame in the kitchen. Mary Clifton cooked on a gas stove. That's right. And if her husband did it, he could have opened the gas jet in the oven, attached a slow fuse like they use for a blowout in the mines, lit the fuse, gone out the back door, and reached the bar before the explosion. That sounds reasonable. As for how he actually killed his wife, the neighbors heard no pistol shot. And even a half-charred body should have showed some trace of a stab wound, which hers didn't. I know. But it would have shown no trace of finger marks if he choked her. That's how I think he did it. If he did it. And I'm ready to start right now for Ridgewood to find out. I've already telephoned the superintendent of the mine. You'll be working with Clifton starting tomorrow. Right. What are you drinking, fella? Beer. New here, ain't you? Yeah, just came in this afternoon. Signed up yet? Yeah, start tomorrow. Here you are. Thanks. I'm supposed to work with a cutter named Clifton. You know him? Yeah. Yeah, I know him all right. What's he like? Well, you can size him up for yourself. He's coming in now. Oh. Give me a boil and make a Sam. Your name Clifton? Yeah, what about it? My name's Jefferson. Come on, shove it out, Sam. Here you are. I, uh, I said my name's Jefferson. Yeah, I heard you. I thought maybe you might like to know who's working with you. What do you mean? I'll be loading in your room starting tomorrow. What's the matter with the two working there now? One of them is switching shifts. Yeah? Yeah. You don't look like any miner to me. Give me another one, Sam. Right. That was too bad about your wife, Clifton. I just heard about it this afternoon. Never mind about that. You don't mind a guy saying he's sorry? I mind anything you say. (laughs) You act like I'm accusing you of something. What do you mean? Well, nothing in particular. It's just... All right, drink your beer and shut up. Okay. There you are, Sam. Thanks. Uh, Jefferson. Yeah? Now, I get this. You're working with me. Okay, I can't do anything about that. But from the time we get in that cage tomorrow and start down the shaft until we quit and come out, don't bother me with talk. Understand? Let's get in the cage and get down to midnight. Okay, let's go. Well, since we're first on, we must be working the same level. That's right. You knew? Yeah, just come on. Name's Jefferson. I'm Hinton. What drift you working? Don't know yet. Said I'm working with Clifton over there. Oh, that's number three. You're working in a small head. Tight fit and dead end, huh? Yeah. Jefferson. Yeah? I want to ask you something. I thought we weren't talking, Clifton. Where do you come from? Still don't think I'm a miner. I said, where did you come from? Carter Mine in Kentucky. Oh, soft stuff, huh? Trying to do, Trippy. What do you mean? Carter's hard, same as here. That passed me okay? 
All right, come on, let us up. This is our train here, Jefferson. Come on. Okay. Low seam. You better bend down. All right. Okay, let's go. What's the idea of stopping? Ground fall blocking the track ahead. Well, you can't prop up a roof with a toothpick and expect it to hold. Well, you can get around the fall on foot, all right. All right, all right. All right, you go back on the train, Hidden. Get a crew to come clean this stuff out, put in some real props, and wet the dust down. Right. Come on, Jefferson. Okay. <coughs> can't take the dust? I'm not complaining. A few more yards, we'll be in the head, and you can straighten up. Okay. This is our happy home, and we don't make money standing still. You don't mean you're going to start cutting before they wet down? Why not? This cloud of dust. Suppose you hit gas. Some dust ain't combustible. Well, you know this kind isn't. I hit some gas the other day in a dust cloud, and nothing happened. Well, maybe it wasn't inflammable gas. Oh, a book miner, huh? Well, just cautious. Time is money. I'm going to start cutting. Hold it, Cliff, will you? It's a fire damp. Let's get out of here. We'll never make it before it hits the dust. I said let's get out of here. As you will learn from tonight's case, which will reopen in just a moment, training, the right kind of training, has plenty to do with security. This week at the Equitable Society, I learned something about training. The president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, Thomas I. Parkinson, told me about it. Do you know he said that the FBI operates a school for law enforcement officers called the FBI National Academy? Policemen from all over the country attend its classes in modern crime detection and advanced police work of all kinds. Down there recently, I was astonished to find how closely this FBI school parallels our own Equitable Society schools and training courses, and for the same purposes, too. Protection and security. Yes, representatives of the Equitable Society are always going to school, Classes run steadily at the Equitable Society, and special courses of instruction are given to Equitable Society representatives throughout the country as field training instructors constantly bring new information to Equitable field men everywhere. That's why the Equitable Society representative in your community is so well-versed in the things that are closely tied in with life insurance. Things like trusteeship, tax problems, mortgages, partnership agreements. And let me tell you that because many factors such as taxes are constantly changing, equitable society representatives must be progressive, must be forward-looking. So we can always say that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the equitable society has been building security. For you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file, The Cautious Killer. The courage of Special Agent Jefferson of your FBI in risking the danger of a coal mine explosion to carry out his duty as a law enforcement officer. That kind of courage was not peculiar to him. Rather, it is exemplary of the courage of all law enforcement officers who daily risk their lives in the performance of their sworn and sacred duty. The protection of the lives and property of you, the American citizen.
at the first sound of the distress signal at the Ridgewood Mine, Superintendent Miller and Agent in Charge Leeds of the FBI rushed to the shaft head. Miller personally took charge of the rescue party, which is now making its way deep into the scene where the explosion occurred. Think there's any possible chance that they're alive, Mr. Miller? Well, if they are alive, Mr. Leeds, they're sealed up in a small head, and that's pretty bad. Even if the force of the explosion knocked out the gas fire before it burned up what oxygen was in the head, well, there couldn't be too much left for them to breathe. I see. Here's where the fall begins, Mr. Miller. All right, men. Wet it down. How far is it to where they are? Oh, I should say about 20 or 25 feet. Then that's many a ton of coal. How long would it take to reach the head? If they're alive, we can't wait that long. Hmm. We'll clear out about half and then try to drive an air shaft through before we go any farther. I see. All right, that's enough, men. Now dig it away and keep it wet as you go. And I don't need to tell you to work fast. <coughs> Lefton. Yeah. You okay? I think so. I must have passed out for a minute. <coughs> yeah. You got any room over there? Not much. Jefferson. I wonder how bad off we are. I don't know. That depends on how much fell between here and the main shaft. I know, I know. At least the explosion snuffed out the fire. You still got a little stuff to breathe. Talking burns it up faster. <laughs> you mean, why don't I shut up? Yeah. <coughs> hey, Clifton. What is it? It's just... <coughs> There's just one trouble with this keeping quiet. It starts a fella thinking. In a spot like this, you don't know if you'll come out of it or not. Well. Well, what? Well, you start thinking of all the bad things you did. Know what I mean? No. You mean you never did anything you're sorry for? Well, keep quiet, will you? No, I just asked you. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Okay. I'll keep quiet. Let's both keep quiet. And think. <laughs> Haven't the men dug through halfway yet, Mr. Miller? No, well, we've only made about ten feet. But it's been a couple of hours now. Yes, I know, I know, but we're not getting through as fast as I'd hoped. Do you think they could still be alive? If they were alive when we started, there's a chance. Just a chance. But I'm not going to wait any longer. What do you mean? All right, stop work, men. I'm going to see if they can hear us. Clifton! Clifton! Jefferson! Clifton, Jefferson, can you hear us? Clifton! Oh. All right, men. Bring up that shaft. All right. We're going to try to drive through them right now. Come on, hurry up with the shaft. Coming up. All right, now, start driving. And remember, if they're still alive, every second counts. <laughs> Jefferson. Jefferson. Yeah? I... I changed my mind. Let's talk. Did the... thinking get a little rough? Just let's... let's talk. Okay. Got a subject? Yeah. Getting out of here. How? There should be a rescue party digging through to us. Yeah, that could take days. 
Yeah. <laughs> that ended that subject. Got another one? No. I'll throw one in. What? Women. I'm not interested. Why? Just not interested. On account of your wife, Clifton? What do you mean? What happened to her? What are you talking about? Why did you do it, Clifton? Do what? You thought she was in love with somebody else, didn't you? What are you talking about? You were insanely jealous, weren't you? I said, what are you talking about? Look, why don't you get it off your conscience? I don't know what you mean. Your wife wasn't in love with Jim Monroe. It's a lie she was. You just thought she was. That's why you choked her to death. She said she was leaving. That's why you choked her to death. She was going away with him, I know it. That's why you choked her to death and set fire to the house. Yes, yes. You, you did kill her, didn't you? Yes. You did kill her, didn't you? Yes. I killed her. I killed her. <laughs> Listen. What? They're coming through to us, Clifton. What? Listen. You can get hold of yourself now, Clifton. This part of your troubles are almost over. What do you mean? It's just like you said in the bar yesterday. I'm not a real miner. What? I work for the FBI. John Clifton was returned to Ohio, where he was tried and convicted for the murder of his wife. Yes, a crime of passion is seldom a professional crime. And its final solution may rest solely on getting a confession of guilt from the suspect. And although many arduous and sometimes dangerous steps may lie between the crime and the confession, victory for the hunter over the hunted is inevitable. For there's always a limit to the capacity of the hunted to endure. <laughs> Next week, you'll hear a particularly exciting case from your FBI files. Before telling you about it, a word about one of your neighbors. Just as you look to your FBI for national security, so to the Equitable Society you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school, and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens, who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Corrupt City. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community... 
and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. Now I should like to read a statement from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The observance of Boy Scout Week should command the attention of the entire nation. At a time when our country is suffering from the ravages of youthful crime, the spirit of the Boy Scouts of America is doing much to influence the future thought not only of our nation, but the world. During this period of readjustment, there is a definite need for honor among men. The Boy Scouts' theme for this year is Scouts of the World Building Together. All of us might very well adopt this theme. If we do, I am sure the family of nations will enjoy peace instead of war, truth instead of false ideology. The keynote of scouting is good citizenship. A scout promises on his honor to do his duty to God, his country, and to help other people at all times. This is America at its best. Friday nights, there are great programs on ABC. Next comes Fun with Alan Young and his guest, Rita Hayward. Don't miss this laugh-packed show. This is ABC, the... The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before opening tonight's file... Let's give a few moments' thought to a frequently asked question. Since these programs began almost a year ago, a number of people have written to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States asking how they could become members of the Equitable Society. They agree with the aims of the Society and want to know what they have to do to join. Well, of course, the answer is very simple. When you take out life insurance with the Equitable Society, you automatically become a member of the Society. You become part of a great cooperative enterprise that is run entirely for the benefit of its members. Yes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is a voluntary association of men and women who have joined together for security who, because they have banded together, are able to assure each individual member greater security than he could attain by his own unaided efforts. Tonight's FBI file, The Corrupt City. Which of these two, standing before the Supreme Court of Public Opinion, would merit the severer judgment, the greater moral condemnation? The professional criminal whose business is violating the law for profit, or he who occupies a position of public trust and uses its power to protect the criminal for self-gain? It is eloquent testimony of the worthiness of a system of free elections that there is in America a minimum of corruption in public office. It is proof of the essential integrity of the overwhelming majority of those who seek office. Proof also of the conscientiousness of the people in selecting their public servants. And as demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI... It is proof of the uncompromising devotion of America's law enforcement officers to their sacred duty to uphold the law against all transgressors, 
no matter who they may be. In a Midwestern city along the waterfront, midnight darkness and a light fog shroud the deserted docks and warehouses. A little while ago, a man standing in the deeper shadows behind a bale of cargo heard a large powerboat idle its motors and watched it drift in against the pier. Two of its crew clambered onto the pier, passed several heavy crates to those on board, and then... How many more cases, Mike? That's all of them. Okay, get aboard and let's shove off. The man in the shadows snaps on a flashlight and steps swiftly out along the pier. Just a minute there. Huh? Stay where you are. Who are you? This badge will tell you who I am. Oh. Cop, huh? That's right. You have authority to move those cases of cargo? Sure. Why? Because there's been quite a lot of cargo moved from piers lately without any authority. Hop aboard, Mike. Wait a minute. I want to see your papers authorizing movement to those cases. My copper boy. Let me straighten this copper out first. Well, go ahead, stupid. We're pulling out of here. Stop that boat! Looks like you missed them, copper. So you'd better arrest me. You want to see me, Chief? Yes, come in, Donovan. Donovan? Yes, sir? If I were asked what I think of you and your work, I'd say you're one of the most promising young men on the force. Oh, well, thank you, sir. And the thing that really sold me on your earnestness about your work was last fall when you asked for a leave so you could attend the FBI's National Academy. And at your own expense, too. And that diploma you came back with... Well, I guess I was almost as proud of it as you were. Thanks, Chief. You have a great future ahead of you as a law enforcement officer. If you can stand the test of hard knocks. Well, I... Uh... They can come in a million forms. Sometimes they're hard enough to break a man's spirit completely. If it's not strong enough to take it. Yes, sir. Personally, I want to commend you, Donovan, for the arrest you made two nights ago at Pier 26. Thank you, sir, but I... I read your report. I think you're on the right track. And somehow that gang of river thieves has got to be broken up. I bungled the job the other night by getting only one, but I'll get the rest of them, sir. The man you arrested was released this morning. I'll get... What did you say, sir? Mike Haynes was released this morning. Released? But, but and I... here is your first test in the school of hard knocks, Donovan. A statement from the councilman in charge of our appropriation. You may read it all later, but I, I'll read only the last paragraph. Okay, sir. Therefore, in view of the evidence furnished me be by reliable authority, it is my conclusion that Detective Donovan acted wholly without cause and recklessly endangered the lives of the crew by unprovoked and unjustified use of his pistol. What? Therefore, I demand his transfer to another assignment, patrolling a beat, and his promotion canceled. That's a pretty sordid story, Donovan. Well, Mr. Craig, I didn't come here to the FBI office looking for sympathy. You don't have to tell us that. I don't blame the chief for not going to bat for me. His hands were tied. Apparently that goes for everybody on the force. Yes, I know. I don't know who the Mr. Big is who's running the show in this town, but... Well, whoever he is, there's one set of hands he can't tie. The FBI. That's right. But where's our angle in the case, Donovan? There has to be one or we can't touch it. Well, those goods were part of an interstate shipment. Where's your evidence? Well, the river is the state line, isn't it? Yes. Well, the rest of the gang got away in the boat the other night, and they headed for the other side of the river. But you don't know for sure that the boat went all the way. No. It could have turned and cut back to this side at a point farther up or downstream. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I guess I was just a little over-eager to get you boys into the picture. Well, we may get into it yet. But until there's a definite federal violation... 
I'd suggest you keep your eyes open for anything on Mike Haynes. Watch where he goes, who his pals are. Maybe you'll stumble onto something. Yeah, something Mr. Big can't cover up. Yeah. It might be pretty risky business for you. I'll get on Haynes' trail starting tonight. Busy, Sam? No, no, no. Come on in. Yeah, got me sprung, huh? Yeah. I don't know why, though. What do you mean? That was a real stupid play, Mike. What? Playing the big shot for that copper. You acted like you had protection sticking out all over you. Well, that's the deal, ain't it? No, not for publication, sucker. They're still honest cops, you know. Well, how was I to know? The big guy didn't like it. Well, he sprung you this time, but from now on, take it easy. Something's got to be done about that cop. Why? He's been tailing me ever since I was sprung. I go in for a beer, and he comes in for a beer. I go in the bowling alley, and he comes in. I go home, and he walks by the house. Well, he hasn't tailed you across the river any time, has he? Uh, how could he? That's out of bounds for him. Well, the guy's driving me crazy. Maybe that's what he wants to do. Huh? Figures you'll get too jumpy sometime and make the wrong kind of move. Oh, uh, not me, Sam. You're not I... going to take a chance on that. What do you mean? You want to get that copper off your neck? Sure. And here's what you do. Tomorrow, as soon as you know... Can I see you a minute, Mr. Craig? Oh, come ahead, Donovan. Any evidence on a federal violation yet? No, but I've got a pretty uh, good idea how they operate now. They've got a legitimate front here in River City. What kind? It's a small river freight business. They don't do much. I watched it for three days. But it gives them a front just the same. Yeah, and license to operate any kind of boat they want to anywhere on the river. Mm-hmm. Who's the company? It's Sam West, an ex-rum runner, but I'm pretty sure he's not Mr. Big. Where do they keep the stolen stuff? Across the river. You have proof? Well, I can prove that they go across the river. How do you know? I watched them with glasses last night in the moonlight. Oh? Huh? It was clear, you see, and I, I could follow the boat all the way across to the pier line on the other side. Mm-hmm. And then it turned up upstream, and I lost it in the shadows. Were they carrying stolen merchandise? Well, I couldn't swear that, but... Well, at least we know two facts now. They steal merchandise, and they operate across the river. I'm going to send the Bureau headquarters a report on this, Donovan. But I'm afraid we can't move in yet. Okay, but I'll make you a bet, Craig. What's that? Before I finish my war of nerves against Mike Haynes, you will have something to move in on. Well, don't stick your neck out too far. <laughs> River City needs it. What are you drinking, mister? Well, maybe I'm not drinking. That's about all you can do in here. The sign outside says, uh... Bar and grill. Okay. How'd you like some nice grilled salami on graham crackers? That's what we got left. Thanks. You looking for somebody? Yeah, I, uh, I thought I saw a fella come in here just ahead of me. I guess I never seen him. Uh -huh. You got a back door? Yeah, it's out back. Thanks again. Looking for somebody, Copper? Yeah. Mike Haynes? That's right. He's right behind you. There you are, Mike. Now the guy don't bother you. We'll return to this FBI file in just a moment. In the meantime, since it's still only a few hours past Valentine's Day, let's consider a subject that's very close to every man's heart and every woman's. This week at the Equitable Society, one of the representatives told me about a unique valentine which he helped prepare. The giver of this valentine was a young man who came home from the Navy just three months ago to marry his childhood sweetheart. It seems that this newly wedded husband made up a giant valentine complete with cupids, 
forget-me-nots, and all the customary fixings. And in the center of it all was a brand new life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Well, when you come to think of it, what better proof of his love can a husband give his wife than to provide her with the security of life insurance? You see, here in the Equitable Society, we're not just guardians of the dollars and cents sent in by our members. We're guardians of human hopes and human happiness. Our job is to keep home fires burning and to give boys and girls wider opportunities for education and advancement. Our mission is to help banish fear from the hearts of men, to save widows and elderly people from the humiliations of poverty, charity, and dependence. So is it any wonder that we of the Equitable Society are proud to call ourselves life insurance men and life insurance women, and that we're equally proud to say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Corrupt City. Every day and night, 24 hours around the clock, your law enforcement officers risk their lives to keep their covenant with you to protect your lives and properly, and to uphold the sanctity of your laws. And many of them risk their lives in keeping that faith. It is nearly noon now, the second day after Officer Donovan walked into the trap set for him by Mike Haynes of the River Gang. Agent in charge Craig of the River City office of the FBI is sitting at his desk with Special Agent Tom Farrell. I'll take it, Tom. Okay. Craig speaking. Oh, hello, Chief. What? Yeah, I was afraid of something like that. Where? Uh huh. I see. Well, I guess that puts it up to us now, Chief. And we're moving in on the case right away. Thank you, sir. And we'll keep in touch with you. Right. Trouble? Yes, that young policeman, Donovan. What about him? A farmer on the other side of the river found him in a ravine this morning. Five slugs in him, but he's still alive. He had to be kidnapped. Okay, what's our first move? Not much doubt about whose work it is. Want to round up the gang now? No. No, we've got to get the proof first. And we'd better start on that stolen goods angle. That might lead us to Mr. Big himself. Mr. Big could be that councilman. Why? He made the chief break Donovan, didn't he? Proving what? Well, in his memo, he referred to evidence furnished by a certain reliable authority. But he could be that certain authority, you know. Yes, it's possible. The chief of police might be mixed up with him. Oh, I doubt that. I'll bet my last cent the chief is honest. Chiefs of police are clean, Tom. They've got to be to get that far. Sometimes they've got to take a dirty order and like it, and ask no questions in order to do a bigger job. Well, where do we start on this case? Well, let's watch their boats first and see if they'll lead us to a cache somewhere on the other side of the river. Okay. And then we'll figure out a way to get Mr. Big. Hi, Mr. Adams. Come in, Sam. You want to see me? Yes. Okay, what's on your mind? That policeman. Who are you talking about? Donovan. Oh. Okay, so he was getting too nosy, so we got rid of him. Did I tell you to? I take protection from you, Adams, not orders. Really? Now, what are you squawking about Donovan for? He might have found his way all the way up to you, you know. I could have handled that. Are you kidding? It goes to the papers, then, and you can't handle them. You may be the party boss, councilman, and run everything in this town, but you can't... Shut up. Now listen to me. Okay. You know what you've done by kidnapping Donovan? Shooting him, dumping him across the state line? What? 
That's not a local police case. That belongs to the FBI. Huh? You heard me. All right, but that ain't my worry. Protection's still your job, Adams. You can't fix the FBI. So, what are you going to do? I'm going to give the orders from now on, or pull out. You and the boys lay low for a few days. No more jobs until I tell you. Understand? Put a head on that for you, mister? No, thanks. Oh, it goes better with the music when it's flat. <laughs> a comedian. Tom? Yeah? Mike Haynes down the bar a ways. Yeah. Wish we could take him in now. Don't worry, we'll get him. Looks like he's about ready to shove off. I imagine he'll head for home. Well, we've been watching them three days now. They haven't moved a boat. Yeah, they must have gotten orders to lay off for a while. Yeah. Come on. Let's get back to the office and plan our next course of action. What about Haynes? Let him get home by himself. We've got more important work to do right now. Sam. Yeah? I got a hot tip on something big, Sam. Big like what? Big like a big pile of dough. Oh, the boss said to lay off. Hey, he likes the cut he gets, don't he? Well, sure, but... Then he... he'll drop his teeth when he hears about this. What do you got? Big shipment of nylon. No kidding. Yeah, and at present prices, we ought to split a hundred grand. Well, where is it? It's on Pier 42, waiting for us. Well, let me get Adams on the phone. No, I'll leave him out of it. We'll do it now and tell him afterwards. Suits me. Nearly midnight on the river now, and a ferry boat crossing far upstream seems to be the only sign of life on the surface of the water. But three hours ago, shortly after dark, four small boats put out from the River City shore, deployed, and took up assigned positions. Three are now hidden in the shadows at widely separated points along the pier line on the far side of the river. The fourth, on this side, is hidden among the pilings under Pier 42. A man speaks into a portable radio transmitter. Hello? Hello? Agent in charge, Craig. Boat number one. Report, please. Over. Boat number two reporting. Standing by. Boat number three reporting. Standing by. Boat number four reporting. Standing by. I don't know how much longer we'll have to wait, men. Maybe the plan's not going to work at all. But we'll stick it out. It's got to work, Craig. Haynes fell for the tip anyway, I know. Agreed to cut me in. Maybe Sam West or Mr. Big put the nicks on it. Ah, uh, time will tell. And it looks like time's beginning to tell a sad story, so I guess we'd Craig, better... listen. Motorboat. Yeah. Making this way, too. Let's not give the boys a false alarm until we're sure it's the boat we're looking for. Uh, that's it, all right. It's cutting in this way. Yeah. Hello? Hello? Craig speaking. I think we're in. There's a boat heading in for this pier. Keep radio silence and stand by. Hello? Hello? Boat number two, come in. Boat number two reporting. They've loaded and pulled away. Headed across the river for your position. Number two reporting. They've turned upstream and headed your way, number three. Over. Boat number three reporting. They've passed my position and continuing upstream toward your position, number four. Over. They've had time to pass number four by now, Craig. What's happened, I wonder? Maybe we'll hear something in a minute. Don't want anything to go wrong now. Just Hello. When... Number four reporting. They've just put in under a warehouse 50 yards from my position. Good. What are your orders, Craig? Over. Stand by number four until we all reach your position. Then we'll move in. Number two and three. Let's go. (laughs) 
All right, boys. You can set those cases down right there. Now put yours up on the table here, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Break her open and let's see what we got. Right. <laughs> Adams is going to be real sorry he passed this one up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this ought to be worth a hundred grand. That's all for us. I wouldn't be too sure of that. Huh? Adams. Tried to pull one without me, didn't you? So? You pulled this job against my orders. So from now on, we never heard of each other. Understand? I hear you. And if you don't clear out of this county and stay out, I'll have you slammed in jail so far it'll take you 40 years to walk to the front gate. That's enough, Adams. Put down that gun. Oh, no. I said put down that gun. No dice. Not until I... From that gun, gun West. West. What? We're special agents of the FBI. You're all under arrest. Thank you, gentlemen. Save it, Adams. You're in this, too. Now, just a minute. I'd like to explain. Explain it to the people of River City. The people who trusted you. They'll want to hear it all, I'm sure. Put the handcuffs on a man. Right. What? And by the way, I think you all should know that Donovan is recovering rapidly and will be happy to testify at your trial. <laughs> The vicious political influence of John Adams and his accomplices was broken up by their trial and conviction in a federal court. They were sentenced to long terms in a penitentiary. The significance of tonight's case can be best illustrated by a quote from an article written by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in this month's American magazine. In this article, Mr. Hoover stated... A great menace to successful law enforcement is the crooked politician or policeman who places the pork barrel above the welfare of society. These politicians either corrupt policemen or destroy their morale. I must say here and now that if we are to stem the rise of crime, we must take police and sheriffs, the first line of defense against terrorism, out of the hands of venal politicians. The police department must be placed, like so many municipal fire departments and school systems, in the control of a nonpartisan commission. It may be a hard job, particularly when a powerful political machine exists in a city, but it can be done if every decent citizen puts pressure on his local lawmakers. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a word about a man worth knowing. To your FBI, you look for national security and to the Equitable Society for the Financial Security of Life Insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time... Over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This tower of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, revealing for the first time the inside story of South American espionage, the Pan-American Patriots. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. 
This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for this is your FBI. Friday nights, there are great programs on ABC. For a laughing good time, listen to the Alan Young Show with guest star Vera Vague, which follows next. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In these programs, you may have noticed that we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society usually speak of the men and women who own equitable life insurance policies as members of the society. In calling them members, we're being strictly accurate. For when you purchase life insurance from the Equitable Society, you really are joining a society. Your policy is your certificate of membership in a great cooperative enterprise which is run solely for the benefit of its members. Get to know the Equitable Society representative in your community. He is the never-failing source of all those benefits which accrue to members and those who are to become members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Tonight's FBI file, The Pan-American Patriot. During the past few months following V.J. Day, many pages of your FBI's secret war diary have been made public. Pages which tell the thrilling story of your FBI's victory over Axis agents here at home. But until now, the seal on a certain other chapter has remained unbroken. A chapter which might be entitled Foreign Operations. Tonight, we shall break that seal and bring you for the first time a story of your FBI's foreign operations in South America. Among the most vital points along America's line of communications and supply to the Mediterranean and Middle East during the war were certain ports and relay bases in South America. But in the fall of 1942... Information on operations at these points was still getting through to Berlin by secret Nazi radio transmitters. Here was a job for your FBI. And this particular story opens on a certain night in the capital city of a certain South American country, friendly to America, but not yet at war with the Axis. Easily the most striking couple on the dance floor of the famous Casa Managua nightclub this night is the very attractive blonde young girl. American, or perhaps English, and the tall, handsome young South American, who, at this moment, suddenly presses the girl closer to him. Yes, yeah. If you don't mind, you're crushing my corsage. Forget your corsage, my dear Vera. I'll get you a dozen more, a thousand more. <laughs> then you can enter me as a float in the flower carnival. Darling, can't you be serious for just one moment? Oh, no, I'm allergic to it. Vera, for the millionth time... Will you marry me? No. Well, why not? Because, for one thing, you're a slave to that old shipping company. Well, then I'll give it up and be your slave, your humble, groveling, devoted slave for the rest of my life. Uh-uh. I wouldn't have that on a bed. Uh. Raphael, I'm going out on the terrace for some fresh air. And if you will put your hands in your pockets now and leave them there, you may come with me. What a girl. 
<laughs> what a girl. Go ahead, darling. Thank you. May I have a cigarette? Sorry. My hands are in prison in my pockets. Oh. I'll grant them a temporary parole. Good. Here you are. Thank you. And a light? The moon is lovely. Yes. Do you know the lines, Yon rising moon that looks to us again? How oft hereafter will she wax and wane? How oft hereafter, rising, look for us through this same garden? And for one in vain. Well, that's beautiful. You see, I do have my serious moments. Oh, darling. Raphael, look behind you. Oh. Das hast du gut gemacht, Müller. Jetzt tragen wir weg. Jawohl, Herr Bonner. In a house in another part of the city, Special Agents James Phillips and Stanley Douglas of the FBI, working by permission of and in cooperation with the Director of National Police, have established a shortwave radio receiver for the purpose of locating and monitoring the illegal Nazi transmitter known to be operating somewhere in or near the city. Three days ago, they had just picked up the transmitter for the first time when suddenly it stopped sending. It is now two nights after the incident at the Casa Managua. Douglas at the receiver keeps a listening vigil with the headphones. Still dead air, Stan? Yeah, not a peep. Well, maybe they've been changing the location of the transmitter. Shouldn't take them three days to do that, Jim. Maybe they've also been waiting to get hold of important information. Like what? That I wouldn't know. But when they do start sending again, we'll know what they're talking about. What do you mean? The police arrested a Nazi agent this afternoon, and when he was confronted with the ironclad case built up against him, he told all he knew. Oh. Here's the whole breakdown on the code the Germans are using. Hey, what a break. Yes. Want me to relieve you a while there? Yeah, I'd like to stretch my legs and get some coffee, if you don't mind. Right. Is the antenna angled in the direction we picked them up before? Yeah, it is now. I've been all around with it, but I have... Hey, wait. Wait a minute. Got something? Yeah, I, I think so. It's uh, it's awfully faint, and it may not be them. See if you can bring it up with the antenna. That does it all right. Jim, it's them. That's their call signal. Good. You spell out the message. I'll take it down and decode it. Right. Come in, Senor Phillips. Thank you, sir. Have you picked up something? Yes, and thanks to your men getting that code, we know what that something is. Yes. German agents have just transmitted to Berlin some very important information on American ship movements and cargo going out of this port. Shipping information? Yes, sir. I see. And there could be a connection between the two. I beg your pardon, sir? Senor Phillips, not an hour ago we received a report here at headquarters that Rafael Corinto is missing. He's missing two days now. Rafael Corinto? Si, si. He's connected with one of the Allied shipping firms here. Oh. And he would have access to information on all shipping that enters or leaves this port. Then I should say there could be a connection. What is your suggestion? I have an idea that if we find that German transmitter, we'll find Corinto, too. But finding the transmitter, that is the problem. A problem that my partner may have solved by now. How? Once a transmitter has been picked up, its position can be determined with mathematical precision. I'll get back over to our house, and as soon as my partner has the answer, I'll contact you, sir. The Corindo comes to see you, brother. Now, help him a little bit. Uh-huh. Come. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. You are sufficiently awake, Herr Corinto. Who? Who are you? One of your hosts. Where am I? That is not important. What? What happened to me? It's quite obvious, isn't it? 
You are drugged. That's right. Nazis. Correct again, sir. And in the name of our Führer, I thank you for having rendered us a great service. What do you mean? You have given us much valuable shipping information, which is now in the hands of our intelligence in Berlin. No. I don't believe you. Oh, you didn't give it willingly. After two days, we are to resort to giving you the drugs, Kapoloman. Two days? I have been here two days? Yes. Well, what about the girl who was with me? What have you done with her? Well, answer me, where is Vera? Oh, me, da- darling. Are you all right? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Thank heavens. What shall we do with him, Paula? Mm, just let him stay here. Paula. Here. He called you Fräulein. That's right. But why should he go... These men work for me. Fira! You see, Raphael, as I said on the terrace the other night, I do have my serious side, too. Solano, I think we have some good news for you. You found the German radio transmitter? My partner here, Mr. Douglas, has determined its location on this map. Good. Where is it? Show him, Stan. Right. I've checked my own calculations three times, Mr. Solano, and I'm pretty sure this is right. Uh, Show me, please. I'd swear the transmitter is located within this tiny circle I've drawn at this point. Ah, in the mountains. Ah, About ten miles airline, west of the city. Mr. Solano, are there any houses or vacation resort buildings around there? Let me think. Uh, There is one small lodge hidden in a strip of woods and overlooking the valley below. That must be the place, John. What do you wish me to do now, Senor Phillips? You have authority to arrest anyone operating an unlicensed radio transmitter. Did I? Rafael Corinto is missing. And if he was abducted, whether by German agents or anyone else... That is a crime. Yes, and time is precious. They may decide to move the transmitter again any moment. And our work would have to be done over again. Then we shall leave immediately. Pablo, the al Capitano Tero que tenga pronto sus hombres. Tenemos que irnos en cinco minutos. Brenna. Yes, Bob. Is the transmitter dismantled and ready to go? In a few more minutes. Good. I don't understand why we are moving. We've only just established ourselves here. We can't take the chance of having our position located. But moving so often is a risk to... Brenna, let me handle things, please. Very well. What shall we do with your friend? I'm seeing him now. Let me know when the transmitter's in the car. All right. How are you, Raphael? What do you want? Well, oh, I've just come in to say goodbye. Don't talk to me. Darling. No pouting, please. Leave me alone. That sounds like the voice of frustrated love. It's the voice of something that you wouldn't understand. Mm-hmm. You've made me betray the friends of my country. A Nazi would not understand that. Oh, oh Raphael, you are so delightful. I really hate to leave you. Please go away. Not until I've made our parting final. Sorry, Raphael. The car's ready for him. Oh, thank you, Brenna. It's a lovely day for a drive. Tonight's portrayal of your FBI's efforts to protect American security will reopen in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's consider two qualities which have been fundamental to American security since our nation's birth, thrift and self-reliance. This week at the Equitable Society, we were talking of a young Virginian who landed his first important job when he was only 16 years old. In the year 1748, he became a surveyor in the backwoods of his native state. Within one year, he'd saved enough money to purchase 456 acres of land. The name of this thrifty, self-reliant young man was, of course, George Washington. And from his day to ours, good Americans have followed his example. And their thrift and self-reliance 
have helped America grow from 13 small colonies to the most powerful and productive country on the face of the earth. For the last 86 years of that period of national growth, millions of Americans who agree with Washington that thrift and self-reliance are good qualities have joined the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, every policy we write in the Equitable Society is someone's declaration of independence. By taking out that policy of his own free will, its owner declares that he believes in personal independence, believes in taking care of himself. He declares that he doesn't want to be coddled or regimented, that he's not interested in paternalism or handouts. And here and now, let me say that we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States consider ourselves privileged to be associated with men and women who feel and act that way. And we're proud that this week, and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Pan American Patriot. Agents of an enemy country differ from the average professional criminal in their objectives only. Both employ the same general methods in achieving them. Treachery, cunning, deception, surprise, violence and both leave traces of their crimes. Traces which eventually make a trail leading the forces of justice to them. It was barely ten minutes after the girl Vera, the leader of the ring of German agents in the South American capital, shot Raphael Carinto, that FBI agents Phillips and Douglas, accompanied by the director of national police and a force of men, arrived at the mountain lodge. They have now just entered the deserted quarters. Well, they've cleared out of here all right, Mr. Solano. See? Si. By all the signs, Senor Phillips, they seem to have left in a hurry. Ordinarily, that would indicate they'd received a tip that we were coming. Well, there was no time for that. I know. I guess they simply just decided to move again, and unfortunately for us, they timed it right. But Corinto, what did they do with him, Mr. Yes, Dan. In here. Look. Oh. That answers what they did with Corinto, Mr. Solano. It was the work of an automatic, Jim. I just picked up this empty cartridge. Small caliber, too. Ah, looks like it might have been fired by one of those little pearl handle jobs that women use. Say, look in this ashtray. Cigarette stuff. Lipstick, honey. Yes. It's not an American blend of tobacco, anyway. English? No. That'd be straight Virginia tobacco. And this one has a... Turkish or Egyptian odor. Uh, we can have it analyzed in the laboratory, senor. Yes, Miss Cartridge, too. And the bullet in Corinto's body. Well, I guess there's nothing more to be done here. Then I shall have the men take care of Corinto's body and we'll return to headquarters at once. If the police should have determined the other location of our transmitter, they will find Corinto's body. What of it? His body won't tell them where we're going. But that is murder, Fräulein, and the police may start a general roundup of all suspected German agents. Is the risk of our job too great for you, Brenner? It is not that. Perhaps you would like me to send you back to Germany to fight. What are your plans, Fräulein? Your orders are to set up the transmitter... When we've arrived at the new location. Yes. I'm returning to the city to the Hotel Esplanade tonight. You are to report to me there at noon tomorrow. Very well. Corinto has helped us to achieve one objective. Now we must move on to another. I must make a new contact, Brenner. Uh, I wonder what he'll be like. Stan? Oh, hello, Jim. Get the ballistic report from Solano's office yet? Yep, I just phoned it over. 25 caliber automatic. American make. And I think I've got a lead on the girl who fired it. What? I've been tracking down the source of that Egyptian cigarette. Oh? 
Only one tobacco shop in the city imports them. And he has only two customers for them. Well? One customer is an attache of the British Embassy who spent some years in Cairo. Well, that eliminates that one. And the other is an attractive young girl, a Miss Vera Morgan. Hmm. Who's she? Well, the tobacconist thinks she might be American or English. But I'm going to find out if she's German. How? She lives at the Hotel Esplanade. Oh. You think I'll look all right in swimming trunk, Stan? <laughs> what do you mean? According to the assistant manager of the hotel, Miss Morgan usually takes a dip in the hotel pool every afternoon about four o'clock. And it's a quarter of four now. So long, Stan. I'm not. I, I planned it this way. I, I, I beg your pardon. I misjudged your last two dives and you didn't bump into me. Oh, so you deliberately plotted this collision. Do you mind? No. Well, shall we sit down here and talk or isn't that being done in 20 feet of water? I'll race you to the side. Right. <laughs> oh, no good. It was a tie. Well, may I, I help you up? No, thanks. I can make it. <laughs> now, uh, what time are we having dinner this evening? Uh-huh. Did you say your name was Swift? No, it's Jim Phillips. Who are you? <laughs> Don't tell me you haven't already found out. I'd rather hear you say it. All right. Born in Connecticut. My parents moved to Paris when I was four, to South America when I was 18. My mother is dead. My father is in France and can't get home. Now... How does your biography go? Born in Cleveland. Went to engineering school. Came the war, and here I am working in South America and looking into a pair of the most exciting blue-gray eyes in the world. And how am I doing? An engineer. How fascinating. If I'd been a man, that's what I would have been. Personally, I'm glad you turned out this way. Working in the mines down there? No. Doing a little stuff for Uncle Sam. They call it hush-hush, you know. Oh, sorry. Well, you haven't answered my question. What time are we having dinner? Why don't you call for me about 8.30? It's a date. Well, I guess I just wasn't cut out for the job of tackling him out of Harry, Stan. <laughs> Must be pleasant work, though. It's two weeks I've been working on that girl now. Lunching, swimming, and dining, and dancing, and driving. I haven't tripped her up once. How about you? What do you mean? You told her you were an engineer down here on a hush-hush job. What you done about that? Questioning you, I mean. She's been pretty neat about it. Nothing obvious enough to incriminate herself yet. Uh, maybe I've got some incriminating information. What? Solano's office called me just before you walked in. Oh? Uh, they found out where Corinto was the night he was abducted. Yeah? Where? Casa Managua. And he went there with Vera Morgan. Hmm. And that was the last time Corinto was seen alive. Hmm. Maybe we ought to go over there tonight and have a little look around and see what's what. Or, uh, have you got a date? Tentatively, but... Oh, excuse me. Hello? Oh, hello, Vera. Yes. Why, why, yes, of course. Oh, I'd love to, you know that. Where? Uh, where? Yes. Yes, I'll join you there. Bye. Well, I've got a date now, Stan. Yeah. She's giving a little dinner party for me tonight at the Casa Managua. <laughs> You dance beautifully, Jim. Thanks for letting me hold you in my arms again, darling. I wanted to get away from those stuffy people. I know. Jim. Yes, dear? I'd like to go out on the terrace and get some fresh air. Wonderful idea. Let's go. After you, dear. Thank you. May I have a cigarette? Here you are. Thanks. His life. Oh, the moon is lovely. Do you know?
know the lines. Yon rising moon that looks for us again. How oft hereafter will she wax and wane. How oft hereafter rising look for us through this same garden. And for one in vain. You see, Jim, I do have my serious side. And I have my serious side, too, darling. I... Jim, look. Look out. Don't worry. We already have. What? Get out that gun. Stay where you are. What's going on? Look for Dodge. We're all under arrest. I'm afraid that means you too, Vera. Well, what do you mean? We searched your suite, senorita, after you left to come here tonight. We have found the pistol with which you killed Rafael Corinto. You will come with us now. Jim, what is all this? Well, Vera, it's like I said a moment ago. I, too, have my serious side. As a special agent of the FBI. <laughs> Vera Morgan and her Nazi accomplice were tried and convicted by the local authorities for the murder of Rafael Corinto. You have just heard for the first time a page from your FBI's secret war diary of foreign operations. While your FBI humanly takes pride in the success of its work against enemy agents abroad as well as at home during the war... This story was presented solely for the purpose of reporting to those whom the FBI serves. You, the citizens of America, of reporting that your FBI has duly carried out its single obligation to protect the lives and property and welfare of your country wherever flies the American flag. Before you hear about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society wants to tell you about a citizen of whom your community can well be proud. Just as you look to the FBI for national security, you look to the Equitable Society representative in your community for the financial security of life insurance. He is a man ready to serve you in the same spirit in which throughout 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has always served its members. Like your FBI, your Equitable Society representative is dedicated to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Castaway Killer. The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank... Speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for This is Your FBI. Friday nights, there are great programs on ABC. Maybe Washington never told a fib, but listen now for Frank Morgan on The Alan Young Show. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This
This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's file, which will open in just a moment, concerns, as all FBI activities concern, the future of America. Here at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we also deal in futures. Yours, ours, the country's. The future is our business. And that is why, for 86 years, our constant endeavor has been and is to keep the Equitable Society up to date, well informed, active, and progressive. That is why, when life insurance problems arise, your Equitable Life Insurance Society representative is a man worth knowing. A man whose business in life is building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. Tonight's FBI file, The Castaway Killer. By far, the vast majority of our foreign-born population are good, conscientious American citizens to whom the ideals of our way of living and the laws which govern it are as sacred as they are to any native-born citizen. But a small minority of our foreign-born are a part of the criminal element of our society. And from time to time, some of these, upon conviction, are ordered deported to their native land. However, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, this is not always the end of the story. Shortly after dawn one morning, the fleet of fishing trawlers off the coast of Maine made their last haul. And now, with a full catch, they're preparing to return to their home cove. Captain Brewster, the skipper of the Anna Girl, bellows to his first mate. Let's be underway, Mr. Walpole. Aye, sir. Well, don't stand there glued to those glasses. There's a blow on the way. Personally, I'd like to run in ahead of it. I, I think I see something, sir. Well, now, don't tell me it's periscope. Because the war's over. I'm not sure what it is, sir. You have a look. Where is it? Far out off the starboard bow. Bobbing in the water, sir. Uh, let's see I don't see any... But I'm positive, sir, there's something. Wait a minute. You're right, Mr. Walpole. Lower boat. What is it, sir? It's a man. We'd better get to him. Aye, sir. Man boat number one, make ready to lower away. Now, just take it easy, mister. You're going to be all right. Just take another swallow of this. Okay. Uh, now, that's fine. Who are you? I'm Captain Brewster, skipper of the Anna Girl. She's a fishing trawler. Oh. I picked you up just after dawn this morning. Where am I now? You're at my house. I brought you ashore. Uh-huh. What happened to you? Well, close as I could remember, I, I was on the fourth watch. Had heavy going. I went forward to batten down number one. Bow took a dive. Well, here I am. What was your ship? Name on your life belt is too dim to make out. The Oreo. Cargo. 8,000 ton around New York. What company? North Star. Why? Well, I won't send a report. Uh, I'll take care of that. <laughs> You'll be in the blankets for two or three days. Look, Captain, uh, you like a joke? Oh, as well as the next one. 
Why? I owe the bosun 50 bucks, and I'd like to let him worry those two or three days. Okay? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I thought you'd understand, Captain. Thank you, sir. John. Huh? Oh, come in, come in, Anna. How is he? Well, you see, he's become long fine. I, uh, I don't think I know your name, mister. It's, it's Butler. Joe Butler. Well, this, uh, this here's my wife, Anna. I'm pleased to meet you. How are you? Think you're, uh, up to eating something, Mr. Butler? Well, I guess maybe I could. Oh, uh, fine. L- look, I, I don't want to put you in any trouble, though. Nonsense. Oh, no, Butler, Anna, just love to have someone around to fuss over. Sure. You're going to be around here for a while, so you just plain make yourself to home. <laughs> That same day, in the Boston office of the FBI, agent in charge Lanham is reading a radio message as Special Agent Wiley enters. Wiley? Yes, sir? I have a report here you might be interested in. What's it about? Nick Corona. Corona? Why, I thought immigration wished him bon voyage and no happy returns yesterday. They did, but this radio message just came in a while ago from the ship he was aboard, the Oreo. Yeah? Corona went over the side sometime during the night. What? When they unlocked his cabin to take him to breakfast, he was gone. Evidently got out through the portal. Are they sure he went over the side? He left a note saying he'd rather take a bath than take that kind of a rap. So he chose suicide, huh? I don't think so. Huh? Nick Corona liked to live too well. Yeah, I know. I believe he went over the side all right, but I believe he stayed on top of the water, too. You mean he arranged for somebody to pick him up? No, Corona wasn't that important. Well, what else then? If the ship wasn't too far out, he could have used a life belt and counted on being picked up or washed in. Yeah, but that's a pretty big chance. Maybe, and maybe I'm entirely wrong, Wiley. But I'm going to have a lot more proof in this message before I'll believe Nick Corona committed suicide. What's the next move, then? Radio the captain of the Oreo and get him to try to establish when Corona went over. Right. And have him check with the ship's log and find what her position was at that time. Come in. Good morning. Good morning. I, uh, I have some coffee for you. Oh, that's well. Yeah, just drink this and tell me what you'd like for breakfast. Look, I, I wish you'd quit knocking yourself out of me. Oh, I'm glad to do it. You're okay. How did you sleep, Mr. Butler? Oh, real good. Real good. I was afraid I kept you up too late last night, but... I just loved hearing you talk. Oh, well, it's the best thing I do. All those wonderful places you've been to. Oh, I could have listened all night long. Oh, no. No, I mean it. Just to be free. To go wherever you please. Sounds funny coming from you. What do you mean? Well, you're married to a sea captain, ain't you? I'm married to a fisherman. I've never been further than a hundred miles from here in my life. Some more coffee? No, thanks. Tell me something, will you? What? How long have you been married? Five years. You ever been married before? No. He's a lot older than you, ain't he? Yes. Why did you ask those questions? I just wanted to know the setup. And now I think I got it. Well? You kind of got scared of the calendar, didn't you? I don't know what you mean. The boat was sailing, baby. The parade was passing by, so you settled for the guy. Maybe I did. Can I tell you something? Yes. You sold yourself short. You could have done better. Lots better. In fact, sweetheart, you could have... I know! (laughs) I'd better see what he wants. Yep. What about your breakfast? That can wait, Mrs. Brewster. Call me Anna, please. Okay. Anna! I'll be right there, John. Why? 
Riley. Yes, sir? Here's a radio message from the Orioles. What's the word? Looks like I might be right in my hunch about Nick Corona. Yeah? The captain questioned the crew, and one of the men on the fourth watch said he saw somebody standing by the starboard deck rail about 2.30 a.m. Oh? Didn't give it another thought, though. Just figured it was a passenger who couldn't sleep. And did they check the life belts in Corona's cabin? One of them was missing. What was the Orioles' position at that time? 6710 West, 4340 North. That's only about 25 miles or so off the coast. Well, what was she doing in that close? The captain says they were trying to stay out of the gale. 25 miles is still quite a swim. Well, there are a lot of fishing fleets in those waters now. But even if Corona missed them, there's a good chance he could make it all the way in anyway. Come on, let's get busy. What's the move? Alert the whole New England coast and keep our fingers crossed that Corona doesn't slip through. I'm right here, Nick. Oh, I was wondering what happened to you. You said you were going to come in and see me as soon as the captain left. I know. Well, I saw this car pull out of here a half hour ago. Yes. <laughs> I guess you finally got sick of hearing me talk. Girl. Oh, no. Well, then what goes? I was listening to the radio a little while ago. Yeah? There was a news broadcast on it told about a federal prisoner named Corona who was being deported on the ship, the Oriole. Uh-huh. When that ship was about 25 miles off our coast the night before last, this man, Corona, jumped overboard. Go on. Nick, that was you, wasn't it? Yeah. I knew it. Well, what are you going to do? Yell for the cops? No, I know what it's like to be in a jail myself. Thanks, sweetheart. Did the captain hear this, too? Not while he was here. Good. But I'm afraid he will as soon as he reaches the village. Well, then, looks like I'd better be getting out of here. Nick, wait. Well? I want to go with you. Huh? Take me with you, please. Now, look, you're letting yourself in for a lot of trouble. I don't care. I can't stay here any longer. Well, I guess you know what you're doing. You will take me. Yeah. Yeah. But look, we got to hurry. Oh. Oh. Hiya, Captain. Hello, Mr. Butler. You, uh, you been in the village, John? Yes, Anna. Well, if you excuse me a minute, I was just telling your missus here, I guess I'll go out and take a little walk. Just a minute. Well? I heard a story up in the village about a man who was being deported, jumping ship. Uh-huh. Not much doubt as to who that man was. Me, huh? You're admitting it? Yes. Well, before I did anything, I wanted to be sure. I guess you know there's only one thing for me to do, sir. Call the cops. That's right. John, you can't. Huh? You can't call the police. Anna, now you keep out. He ain't calling no cops, honey, so get in and start packing. Now, just a minute. What is this? I'm pulling out of here. And I'm going with him, John. Anna. Hurry it up, honey. Anna, do you realize what you're doing? Yes. This man's a criminal. He's a fugitive from the law. Don't you understand that? I know all about him. What's got into him? I'll break this up, will you? We gotta move. You're not leaving here, either one of you. Keep away from that phone. No. Okay, Pop, you asked for it. Nick. He ain't breathing. That's right. Now you can take your time about packing. The second half of tonight's program, dealing with the eventual downfall of Nick Corona, will open in just a moment. Meanwhile, let me tell you about a man who makes a business of worrying. 
This week at the Equitable Society, well, I've never known it to fail. Every time I go down to the Equitable Life Assurance Society, something interesting happens to me. Yesterday, as I was passing a group of executives, one of them called, Come on over here. I've got a man I want you to meet. Well, a big, genial citizen stuck out his hand, and I said, Gosh, you look so happy, you must have had something pleasant just happen to you. Said he, Happy? Well, I may look happy, but the truth is, I'm a professional worrier. Back in my hometown, I'm known as the town's official worrier for one and all. You see, I'm an Equitable Society life insurance representative. And people have been piling their worries on me for years. People worried about their children's education come to me. Families worried about keeping their home together ask my advice. Men and women worried about taxes, protection for old age, security for the future come to me, and generally, thank goodness, I'm able to say, forget your problems, friend. Let me do your worrying for you. That's my job in life. Well, there you have one of the Equitable Society's best assets. A responsible, keen, sympathetic man trained and able to meet emergencies and glad to help you solve your problems through life insurance. Multiply this Equitable Field Man by thousands and you'll see why the Equitable Society has woven itself into the fabric of everyday life in towns and cities all over the United States. Yes, because equitable life insurance representatives are professional worriers, proud of their calling, anxious to help, we are able to say that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Castaway Killer. Nick Corona's treatment of Captain Brewster proves again that in dealing with criminals... The policy of appeasement does not work. Being kind to a criminal pays no dividends. You merely expose yourself as a potential victim. That is because the basic ingredient of every criminal is greed. Nick Corona had been in trouble with the police before. Trouble which led to deportation proceedings. Now, the most recent manifestation of his greed had made him commit another crime. The number one crime, murder. It is an hour or so now after Nick Corona struck down the sea captain in the small fishing village on the main coast. In the Boston office of the FBI, agent in charge Lanham awaits possible reports after alerting the New England coast. I'll take it, Wiley. Hello? Yes, all right. Long distance radio station in Portland. Radio station? Wait a minute. Hello? Hello? Yes? What's that? Yes. Yes, I see. Where? I've got it. We'll get on it right away, and thanks for reporting it so promptly. Goodbye. You got a lead? Somebody in a little fishing village, Randall's Cove. Yeah, they heard a news broadcast in Portland about Corona and called the station. Yeah? They said a Captain Brewster's fishing trawler picked up a man at sea night before last. Corona. Well, they weren't sure since they didn't see him. Well, I'll contact the police up there right away and have them investigate. Good, and I'll be ready to fly out of here if they nail him. Shall I answer it? Yeah, go ahead. But whoever it is, get rid of him fast. All right. Yes? Good evening, Mrs. Brewster. Oh, hello, Constable. The captain at home? Why, well, no, he's not here now. He might be down to the pier. Tell you why I'm here. It's about the man they picked up at sea night before last. Oh. 
Oh, well, I'm afraid we're all a little too late to do anything about him now, Constable. What do you mean? Well, you see, we didn't hear the news broadcast until noon today, telling who the man really was, and, well, he'd already left here. When did he leave? Early this morning. Did he say where he was going? We, we didn't ask him any questions. Didn't have any reason to suspect anything then, of course. No. Well, I better be getting along back. Got to report this to the FBI. Yeah. I'm awful sorry he got away, Constable. Oh, you couldn't help that. Well, good night, Mrs. Brewster. Good night. Ah, you handled that beautiful, sweetheart. Oh, I was awful scared. Uh, it's dark enough now. Let's get out of here. But, Nick... Yeah? What are we going to do about... about John? Well, you can't take his body with us. Yes, I know, but... Look, they won't pay another visit here before we put a lot of miles behind us. Where are we going? You leave that to me, sugar. Let's move. Maybe this is it. I hope so. Well, I'm speaking. All right, put him on. The constable? Yes. Hello? Hello, constable. Yes. Yes. She said he'd already gone, huh? Uh-oh. You did what? You went back again later? I see. What was that? Yes. Yes. All right, get me the license number and description of the car and call me back as soon as you can, please. Thanks. Well, what's up? Captain Brewster's been murdered. His car's what? gone, so's his wife. Corona? Definitely. Where do you think he'd most likely head for? Not where he's been recently. Then I guess all we can do is wait for a description of the car and put out an alarm on it. Yes. In the meantime, get me out the complete file on Corona. Right. Maybe if we do a little research, we might pick up a clue as to where he could be heading for. come across anything yet? Well, how about you? I'm covering his career in 1931. I just got down to the part about his rum running days here. Yeah? Maybe I'll come across something in it that... Wait a minute. Let me see that record, will you? Sure. Here you are. I had several encounters with Mr. Corona in those days. Seems to me there was something... Wait a minute. Yeah. Here it is. Wiley. Yeah? Slide that map over here. I've got a hunch where Nick Corona might be headed for. Well, Anna, how you like the scatter? It's uh, real nice. I used to use this cabin years ago when I was running liquor from Canada. It's a good hideout. Nick. Yeah. Where do we go next? Are you kidding? We're going to be holed up here for a long, long time. Oh, no. Well, what else? Well, I thought we'd, well, travel. Look, sweetheart, I'm what is known in the trade as a very hot character. Right now, I'm wanted for everything up to murder. So we better just sit it up. Oh, but that isn't how I planned it. All those places you've been to, we should see them together. I didn't write any contract on that. Oh, I know, Oh, but... forget it, will you? I've been driving all night. I'm tired. Please, I've got to talk about this. What is there to talk about? You asked me to take you away from that fishing village. I know. So I did more than that. I got rid of that guy of yours for you, too. I didn't ask for that. Not the way you did it. Oh. Trying to cop a plea now, huh? Trying to hang the whole thing on me. That's not true. Then let's drop it. Nick, if you really love what? me... You... Love? Did you say love? Yes. Well, that's a brand new entry. Where did that come from? What do you mean? I think I better straighten you out, baby. This ain't no love deal. You're stuck for your convenience. What? You're a real good cover. Having a legit like you along made it possible for us to get here. That's the only reason? That's the only reason. <laughs> oh, no, no, not that. <laughs> What a fool I've been. Stop it, will you? <laughs> I'm getting out of here. 
Now, wait a minute. Please, let me go. Not a chance, sweetheart. You think I'm going to let you blow a whistle? Take your hands off me. Turn me loose. Out. Let her go, Corona. Who are you? The special agents of the FBI. Oh, yeah? Well, you ain't going to take me now, are you? We are taking you, Corona. Now, get up. Come along. Nick Corona's desire to remain in this country was fulfilled by a federal jury who tried and convicted him for the murder of Captain Brewster. He died in the electric chair. As we stated before, the vast majority of our foreign-born population are good, conscientious American citizens to whom the ideals of our way of living and the laws governing it are as sacred as they are to any native-born citizens. But there are Nick Coronas among our criminal element, too. And it is the duty of your FBI to pursue them as relentlessly as any other criminal who conspires against the laws of the land. Before telling you about next week's thrilling case from the files of the FBI, a message from the Equitable Society. To the FBI, America looks for national security. And to the Equitable Society, three and a quarter million Americans look for the financial security of life insurance. These three and a quarter million people actually comprise the Equitable Society. And as members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, they know that the Equitable Society representative in their community is a man worth knowing, a man constantly working for the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week... We will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Skyway Swindles. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Society's broadcast are taken from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Skyway Swindles. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation... Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Here's an old saying you'll recognize. In union, there is strength. It appears in some form or other in ancient as well as modern literature. 
but it has special significance for the three and a quarter million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Through union in the Equitable Society, they have created the security of life insurance for themselves and their families, provided education for children, helped make old age secure and comfortable. Remember, too, the premium dollars of Equitable Society members are invested in ways that promote national prosperity. So that by serving its members, the Equitable Life Assurance Society serves America. Tonight's file, The Skyway Swindle. You can cure an alcoholic, a drug addict, and sometimes you can even cure a golf player. But you'll never cure a flying man. Once he has learned to fly, his heart and soul forever after belong to the sun, wind, and stars. That is why the thousands of young Americans who flew the fighters, bombers, and transports during the war are finding it so hard to reconvert to peacetime pursuits on the ground. They know that America's civilian aviation industry cannot possibly absorb them all, and they are readjusting as best they can. But just let them see an opportunity to fly again, and, well, one young veteran of 30 missions over Tokyo saw such an opportunity recently, and here's what happened. For Bill Renton, Fairview's returned flying hero... The banquets and speeches and dinner parties in his honor were all over four weeks ago. And in a way, he was glad, because he wanted to forget all about the war. But life on the ground began to get pretty dull. and was getting no better fast until the phone rang one morning. Bill answered and heard a feminine voice say, Is this Bill Renton? Yeah. The Bill Renton? That's right. Well... You don't know me, of course, but you knew my husband very well. Oh, uh... He, he flew in your squadron, Jack Martin. Jack Martin? Oh, I'll say I... I knew Jack very well. You say you're his... I mean... Uh... I'm his widow, Carol. Well, and you're right here in Fairview? I just arrived this morning. I, I, I'm at the Central Hotel. Well, gee, uh... I'd sure like to see you. Well, I'd love to meet you, too. Jack mentioned you so often in his letters. Well, then, hold everything. I'll meet you in the lobby in ten minutes. Well, I... I'm certainly glad you thought of calling me, Mrs. Martin. The name is Carol. Okay. And uh, I'm Bill. Well, I, I guess you can understand how I like to meet and talk to anybody who flew with Jack. Oh, sure. Jack was a great guy. He felt the same way about you. Well, I... See, uh, look, Carol, it's nearly 12.30. How about our having a bite of lunch together? Oh, I'd love to. We could talk about how you happen to be here in Fairview. <laughs> Well, how I happen to be here may come walking into the lobby any minute now. Who's that? My Uncle George. I, I'm traveling around with him as sort of a secretary. Oh? He uh, represents a group of men in the East who are planning to establish a chain of airports and flying schools over the country. I see. And they're going to put one in Fairview. <laughs> That's why he's here. Well, there's a man I'd like to meet. Why? Well, if there's going to be an airport and flying school around here... I've certainly got to get in on it. Well, I can certainly see to it you get to talk to Uncle George anyway. Gee, that's swell. When? Well, how about here at the hotel tomorrow morning? All right. What time? Mm -hmm. Ten o'clock. That's a date. (laughs) 
Mr. Sterling, mm, yes? uh, your niece has already told me that actual operations of the airport and flying school are, well, probably still six months away. Mm, about that, I'd say. But I thought if I got my bid in early enough for a flying job, sir, well, uh... Renan? Yes, sir? How would you like to start work right away? Right away? And how would you like to be head of the flying school? Well, I... I... And how would you like for it to be called the Renton Flying School? Now, wait a minute, Mr. Sterling. One thing at a time, I... I, I... <laughs> now, don't misunderstand. This is not a sentimental gesture to a war veteran. Nor is it because you're a friend of my niece's husband. It's strictly business. Well, I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. My group could easily finance a hundred airports and flying schools, Renton. But we've found by experience that the community is more likely to support a thing... If it has some money of its own invested. Well, that's true, sir. Therefore, in each case, we're going to put up half the money if the businessmen of the community will subscribe the other half. Well, that certainly sounds fair enough. All right. Noon today, I'm to lay the plan before the Fairview Businessmen's Luncheon Club. I see. And if I can introduce you and tell them you'll head the flying school, the Renton Flying School. <laughs> well, I... Why, those men will subscribe for $50,000 worth of stock before you can wink your eye. The deal? Well, gee, Mr. Sterling, that's awfully flattering. No, I say, it's just plain good business for us. Fairview will have an airport and flying school. You'll be in the flying business for the rest of your life. Uh, uh, just say that last part again, Mr. Sterling. I say you'll be in the flying business for the rest of your life. <laughs> that did it. Where's the contract? In another part of the state that same morning, agent in charge Redding of the FBI field office has just finished reading a teletype from the Washington Bureau. Well, Tom, nobody can accuse this swindler of laying down on the job of reconversion. What have you got? Washington Bulletin to all officers. Who's wanted? Man about 50, girl about 26 or 7. Here's all the information on him. What did you mean about reconversion? Well, this swindler is working on a post-war angle. Promoting airports and flying schools. Using a local war hero for bait. Very smart. Girl Angle's smart, too. She poses as the widow of a former flying mate or hero. That's how they get him. I see. But the swindler wouldn't have gotten away with it, Tom, if the people in the town had been a little bit more careful about checking up on it. How long ago did he pull the job? Three weeks ago. He'll probably strike again any time now. But far away from the last one, eh? Yes. So let's get ready for him in case he invades our district. What's your plan? Notify police chiefs in all towns over 7,500 without an airport. And suggest that they warn their chambers of commerce. Right. The girl is using the name of Carol Martin. Widow of Lieutenant Jack Martin. Well? well there had to be such a flyer. Let's check. See if the girl working with the swindler is the real widow. Okay. You start on that. I'll get busy alerting police chiefs. <laughs> George. Yeah. Hello, Carol. <laughs> How did the luncheon go? It was quite successful, Carol. Quite successful. Oh, your uncle is too modest, Carol. He raised $20,000 for the airport and flying school right on the spot. Well. And the other 30000 will be in his hands before the day is over. Oh, that's wonderful. But I can't take the credit for it, Renton. It was your name and their admiration for you that raised the money. Well, I... And now, if you don't mind, Renton, I want to dictate some letters. Oh, of course, uh, when do you want to see me again? Uh, check with me in the morning. Right. Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Sterling, I think you told me you had optioned the Johnson land south of town for the airport. Well, that's right. I thought I'd run out there before dark and have a look at it. Well, uh, uh, I'd rather you'd wait until morning. We'll drive out together. Well, uh, all right. Whatever you say, sir. Goodbye, Carol. So long, Bill. Bye, Mr. Sterling. Goodbye. Yes, he seemed to be doing all right. When do we get the rest of the money? Well, they'll have it here by 5 o'clock. Good. Then we can make the 6 o'clock train and head for the sea, sand, and sun. For where? Florida, darling. 
Well, that's not on my list of things to do next. Look, George, I want a vacation. Yes, yes, so do I, my dear. But we have other business to tend to first. Look, I'm withering up inside these widow's weeds. I, I want to dance and swim and roll over on the sand and watch the beautiful brutes go by for a while. Won't you ever get men off your mind? Sure, when I'm as old as you. Oh, thank you, my dear. Now, look, be practical about this. If we stick together and finish up our list of prospects, we stand to make plenty. With your half of the take, you can go anywhere in the world and do whatever you want all by yourself. That's worth waiting for. Well, Tom, anything happened while I was out? Yes, I got the information on the widow of Lieutenant Jack Martin. Oh, the girl working with a swindler is faking. I was pretty sure of that. The real Carol Martin lives in a little town in Oregon. Hasn't been away from there for ten years. Mm-hmm. I wonder how the swindler and the girl knew about her. Well, let's go to work on that. Maybe we can get a lead on the pattern of a swindler's operation. Oh, this this teletype from Washington just came in, too. Follow up on the swindle? Yeah, he and the girl rigged another town last week. But somebody got suspicious and they made a quick exit. Where was that? Shenfield, Kansas. That's two states nearer this way than the first job. I know. Have all the notices to the police chiefs gone out? Well, it's still in the works, but they'll all be alerted before the night's over. Good. And I hope the swindler does try to pull a job in our district. I guarantee it'll be his last one. Hurry it up, George. All right, all right. Give me a hand with some of this stuff. Oh, you're worse than an old woman when it comes to packing. Come on, cram it in. Let's go. Yeah, what time do we get to Midland? Seven tomorrow night. Where's the money? Locked up in the other bag. All 50000 Do you wish to count it, my dear? I just want to get out of here. We've only got 15 minutes to make the train. We... Don't answer it. But whoever it is must have heard us talking. Go see who it is. But don't let them inside. Yeah, but suppose... Oh, hello, Bill. Going somewhere, Captain? Urgent call, Renton. I've got to go to Chicago for a few days. Too bad the flying school's not in operation. I could get you there in a real hurry. Yes. Yes, that would be a great help. But I'm afraid what I'd really do is bail out and leave you two to figure out the gadgets for yourselves. What's that? I let you two make a sucker out of me. But you're not going to do the same thing to those men who invested $50,000. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. I disobeyed orders, Mr. Sterling. I went out to look over the Johnson land. But I told you... I know. You told me you would option the land. But you were lying. Johnson says you've never even talked to him. All right, but I can explain that. Then maybe that. you can explain something else I found out. What do you mean? You said you had made a deal with Northrop to use their trainers in the flying schools. I just called Northrop, and they'd never heard of you. Now, look here. Hand over that dough, Sterling. I'll do nothing of the sort. I tell give you... Give me what... that money. Look, Renton, you're in on this too, remember? I said give me Put that... Put up your hands, Bill. What? And don't turn around. Pick up the bag, George. Wait a minute. You've already stabbed me in the back, Carol, so maybe you'll shoot me in the back, too. But before you do, I'm gonna... Oh. Oh. He was such a sweet boy. Come on, George. Before telling you about the next exciting development in tonight's FBI file, let's talk for a moment about two very important elements in America today. Labor and management. This week at the Equitable Society, I was invited to accompany a group insurance serviceman to a conference between labor and management. The purpose of the meeting was to announce to a certain group of employees that their company had taken out group life insurance with the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. To start the meeting, the Equitable Man told the assembled employees about the benefits they would receive under this plan. Insurance on their lives, accident and health insurance, hospitalization and surgical expenses in case of sickness or accident to themselves or their dependents. 
Then the president of the company told his employees that he considered this group insurance with the Equitable Society one of the best things that had happened to the company since it was founded by his grandfather over 60 years ago. When a veteran shop foreman jumped up and said he could vouch for that because he'd been with the company most of those 60 years, well, I wish you could have heard the storm of applause. I wish you could have seen the expressions on the faces of the employees. And then you'd understand why we of the Equitable Society are proud that group life insurance is an equitable first. It is one of scores of examples of this society's leadership and progressiveness. One of the many reasons why we say that this week and every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Skyway Swindle. Put it mildly, it must turn the stomachs of America's returning veterans when they come back home and encounter some of the people for whom they fought, and for whom so many thousands of their buddies gave their lives. People like, to cite only one of many types, people like swindlers such as George Sterling and his accomplice, the girl Carol. Greedy, conscienceless people who scheme day and night against the possessions and human rights of others, even victimizing the very ones who fought to safeguard the country from which they suck their miserable existence. It must have been two hours after Sterling and the girl fled from the hotel in Fairview, leaving their victim, Bill Renton, sprawled on the floor. But the phone rang in the FBI field office some hundred miles away. I'll take it, Tom. Okay. Redding speaking. Oh, hello, Chief. You got our warning, eh? Was that too late? I see. Yes. Yes, go ahead. I'm getting it all right. Uh-huh. All right. Good. We'll get busy right away. Yes, we'll leave here immediately. Thank you, sir. Something on the swindler? Yes. That was chief of police of Fairview calling. What happened? The same pattern. The man and the girl used a war hero for front and skipped town a couple of hours ago with $50,000. Well. The kid caught on to the swindle, went to their hotel room. They slugged him and escaped. Is he dead? No, thank goodness. How did they get out of town? Nobody knows. Come on. We're headed for Fairview. <laughs> Mr. Renton, I'm agent in charge Redding of the FBI. This is Special Agent Willard. How do you Hi. do? How's the head? Well, it's not my head that's bothering me now, Mr. Redding. It's letting those rats get away with $50,000. Well, I can understand how you feel. But after all, you were only a victim like the rest. Yes, but it was my name that raised that money. Let's hope we catch Sterling and the girl before they spent too much of it. Well, if we don't, I'll be working for nothing for a long time to come. I'm going to pay back every cent those men put up. How did they first contact you, Mr. Renton? A swindler and the girl. Well, she she telephoned me from the hotel. Uh-huh. Said she was Carol Martin, the widow of Jack Martin, who flew in my same squadron. Then? Well, of course, I fell for it and said I'd like to see her. So I met her at the hotel. And when I asked her what she was doing in Fairview... She started telling me about this project that her so-called uncle was working on. Naturally, that interested you. Yeah, yeah. So I, well, I made a date to talk to her uncle about a job. Uh -huh. Next thing you knew, you were fronting the project, raising money through the businessmen's luncheon club. How did you know that? He's done it twice before in the same way. Did you know Lieutenant Howard Jones? Jonesy? Why, sure, he flew in the same squadron with me. Why? He was their first victim. How about Lieutenant Robert Lansing? He flew with us, too. Did they get him? He was their second victim. 
Well, it looks like they're going right down the line of fellows in my outfit. Those of you who live in the smaller towns, anyway. But how did they know who we were or, or where we lived? I have no idea. But we've got to get a roster of your squadron. That's about the surest way we'll have of catching. You got a list of the men in your outfit? No, sir, I haven't. Well, then we better contact the War Department right away. As soon as we get the list, we'll alert all the men on it. Good. I've got an idea we're going to get all of that $50,000 back for you. Well, that'll be plenty okay with me. Uh, Good morning, my dear. Who's kidding who? What's the matter? Look out the window. It's just snowing a little. I'll guarantee it isn't snowing down in Florida. Come on, it's 10 o'clock. We'd better call our prospect here in Midland. Okay. What's the sucker's name? It's marked right there in the magazine article. Lieutenant Fred Bristol? That's the guy. Give me the phone book. Mm, here you are. Say, baby. Bristol. Here it is. Yeah. Um, operator, I want uh, 6087, please. That's right. That magazine article was really something. I don't know how much the author made out of the glorious record of that squadron, but I feel like sending him a bonus for including a roster of the heroes. Anytime you send anybody a bonus for anything, Greatheart, I'll buy you a bit... Oh, uh, hello? Is this Fred Bristol? The Fred Bristol? Well, you don't know me, of course, but you know my husband very well. He... Ruin your squad. I sure wish that teletype would start sounding off, Tom. So do I. My hands are pretty well tied until that roster comes in. The swindlers may have already reached the scene of their next job, too. Yes. One good thing for us, though, it takes them a couple of days to set the stage and cash in. Oh, it doesn't take us longer than that to start. Uh-uh. There she goes. Oh, let's have a look. Following his list of men who served in... This is it. Get Barnes and Kennedy in here. Okay. Tell the switchboard operator to keep six trunks clear for us. We're going to get on long distance and stay on it until we make a strike. <laughs> Keep on the alert anyway, Lieutenant. Thanks. That's six for me, Redding, and all blanks. Take six more names. Start again. Okay. Contacted 14 names by long distance. No luck. We're narrowing the field anyway. Get some more. Keep going. Right. Take another batch of names, Barnes. See what you can come up with. Redding. Yes, Hop? We're in. <laughs> Oh, here comes Uncle George now, Fred. Good. Uh, I'm awfully sorry, young man. I was late for our breakfast appointment. Oh, I'm sure you're quite busy, sir. Mm, so you're Lieutenant Bristol. Ex-Lieutenant. My niece spoke to me about you yesterday, Bristol. Said you were interested in the connection with the airport and flying school we plan to establish here in Midland. Yes, sir. Bristol, how would you like to be head of the flying school? Head of it? And how would you like to have it called the Bristol Flying School? Well, gee, I... Now, this is not a sentimental gesture to a war veteran. No, because you were a friend of my niece's husband. It's strictly business... Uh, uh, pardon me for interrupting, sir. How's that? Uh, There are two gentlemen just coming into the dining room. I'd like to have meet you. Oh, interested in the project, perhaps? Oh, yes, sir. Well, here they are. Good morning. Good morning, Bristol. Uh, Mrs. Martin, Mr. Sterling, I'd like you to meet Mr. Redding and Mr. Willard. How do you do? Won't you join us for a bite of breakfast, gentlemen? Mr. Bristol tells me that you're interested in the airport project, which brings me to Midland. We're quite interested, Mr. Sterling, but... Then uh... do sit down, by all means. I should be glad to explain it to you, and perhaps... Well, that won't be necessary, Mr. Sterling. We're quite well acquainted with it already. Really, sir? Yes. See, Mr. Willard and I are special agents of the FBI. (gasps) FBI? Yes, that's right. And if you are interested in the project that has brought us to Midland, 
We should be glad to explain it to you. <clears throat> if I may quote you, sir, that won't be necessary. I'm well acquainted with it already. <laughs> George Sterling and his accomplice, Carol, were tried in a federal court for their cruel swindle. They were both sentenced to long terms in a penitentiary. The swindler, the cheater, is one of the most loathsome species that crawls in the criminal scum of any society. And he is numbered by the thousands. But his whole breed could be wiped out overnight for he lives solely by preying on the carelessness of his victims. The simple exercise of due caution in dealing with and checking on the stranger with a proposition, this one step alone on the part of each of us could exterminate the swindler. Next week, the Equitable Society will bring you another exciting and thought-provoking case from the files of your FBI. Before telling you about it, let me remind you that just as you look to your FBI for national security, so to the Equitable Society you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society life insurance representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens, who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week... We will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Paroled Killer. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Paroled Killer, on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Since you've been listening to these programs, such as the one which will start in a moment, you doubtlessly have often heard someone say, I'm insured in the Equitable Society. But just what does that much-used word equitable mean? Well, in the big dictionary, its synonyms are reasonable, right, honest, impartial, upright, fair. 
pretty good list of pretty good words, isn't it? And we of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States do our best to live up to them. It's because we've worked along these lines for 86 years that the Equitable Society is a part of the life of your community. And whether you know him or not, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a good friend of yours, working through life insurance for the security of you, your home, and your country. Tonight's FBI file, The Paroled Killer. There is not one of us, with his inborn American sense of fair play, who would deny the essential justice in principle of the parole system the system under which certain categories of convicts may be conditionally freed from prison before the expiration of their full sentence. But the front pages of our newspapers almost daily bear violent witness to the fact, demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, that some convicts are paroled whom, for the sake of society, it would be far wiser to leave behind the bars. Convict number 728056 of a certain state prison has just been ushered into the office of the warden. He is a rather tall, lean, blonde young man with smooth, sensitive features. His artistic hands grow restless as he waits for the warden to look up from a sheaf of papers on his desk. Presently, the warden speaks. All right. Yes, sir? Uh, I guess you're anxious to know the outcome of your appearance before the parole board yesterday. Uh, yes, sir, as you might well imagine, I spent most of the night wondering. Did you ever hear of the Second Chance Society? I think I have, sir. It's a very worthwhile organization, and with a noble purpose. But I sometimes wish they were better informed on criminology before they exerted pressure on parole boards. Well, what do you mean, sir? The board was inclined to deny you parole, Norwood. Oh. But a representative of the Second Chance Society interceded in your behalf. Your parole has been granted. That's fine, sir. Norwood, I opposed your parole. Why? My prison record is without a blemish. That's right. But you didn't become a criminal by chance, nor because of environment or association with evil companions. A man of your intellect can pretty much choose his own way of life. And can make mistakes, too, Warden. Well, I earnestly hope you've resolved to go straight. Oh, your instructions uh, for reporting to your parole officer... You'll find in this envelope with your other papers. Thank you, sir. You have my sincerest and best wishes. It's all up to you, Norwood. This is your second chance. I'll make the most of it. You can rest assured, sir, that I shall. <laughs> Carl. Mm. Carl. Uh, Wake up. What? Wake up, I said. Oh, leave me alone. I'm tired. Carl, I want to talk to you. Look, if this is about where I was last night, I had to work, so leave me alone. I don't want no rhubarbs. I don't want to argue, darling. Oh, that's a switch. I have a surprise for you. Hmm? Guess who's out of stripes as of yesterday? Out of jug? Yeah. Who? What are you talking about? Hmm. Sweating already. Answer me, will you? Who's out? Ray Norwood. Ray? I told you had six more months to go. He was paroled. Look, is this a rib or something? No. How do you know he's out? He called about a half hour ago. He's on his way over here. He's what? You want to borrow my hanky, darling? Your lovely low-cut brow is... Covered with itchy bitchy beads of perspiration. Shut up, will you? It's understandable, of course. You got a perfect right to be scared. After all, it was your testimony that hung the rap on him. Shut up, I said. What are your plans, darling? Let me think. Now, what are your plans? Don't answer the door. But I told him we'd be here. Tell him. Tell him I ain't home. <laughs> That'd be childish. Wait a minute. Come back here. Oh, no. Jane. 
Hello, darling. Hello, Ray. Come on in, won't you? Thank you, sweet. Well, it certainly seems Here we like. Are, a... Ray. What? That's what I said. Well, I must say that's hardly a way to greet an old friend. Call for down that gun. Oh, I know. Well, I think Gene's made an excellent suggestion. Why the gun? What do you say? Oh, my dear boy, you have nothing to fear from me. Absolutely nothing. Are you kidding? Why, of course not. You evidently imagine that I've come here seeking revenge for your testimony at my trial. That's right. No. I hold no grudge for that. From your standpoint, it was simply a matter of self-preservation. Huh? Well, one of the reasons I came here was to convince you of that. Oh, now, no, please, put down that gun. Do as he says, Carl. Well, uh, okay. That's better. And now you might be interested to know that I've been given a second chance. The warden asked me to make the most of it. So, uh, to please him, let's get busy. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? It's all written down on this piece of paper, Mr. Teller. They, uh... Oh, let me see. You want stacks of 20s and stacks of 10s. Right. Fifteen grand worth. You can put it in this bag. Ian? <laughs> but your check, sir. Your check to cover. This gun looking at you should be cover enough. What? And if you make one move to step on that alarm pedal, you won't be going home to your wife tonight. Put the bad stuff in a bag like I told you. Well, you... You won't get away with this. It better not be your fault, but... Okay. That's a 20s, not a 10s. And get this, too. I'm going to walk out of here normal-like, which means my back will be to you. But that girl standing over there is a better shot than Annie Oakley. So, hold this pose until we're both gone. Okay? It was about two hours later when Special Agents Griffin and Decatur completed their preliminary investigation of the scene of the bank robbery and started driving back to headquarters. Did you get any leads at all, Fred? Nobody I talked to saw anything. What about the bank's special officer on duty? Well, he was at the side door when it happened, overseeing oh. the transfer of some money from an armored car. Looks like they picked their time rather cleverly. Yes. Well, what about the teller? Well, he gave a pretty sketchy description of the man. Too excited, I guess, for all the details to register. Could he give you anything on the girl? No. Just said she was an attractive blonde. Hmm. Well, it seems like they just walked in, picked up 15000 walked calmly out, and disappeared without leaving a trace. No, they left a trace, all right. What? Oh, I've got the note that the bandit handed the teller through the window. Oh? It's not much, but he might have left a fingerprint on it. We'll know when we get to the laboratory. Oh, well, we're pushing time on this one. Let's step on it. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hello, Ray. Come on in. Thank you. Where's Carl? Out. I don't know where. Good. I want to talk to you. What about? You and Carl. Well? How has he been treating you? <laughs> Let's talk about something pleasant. He'd be back here before I could finish telling you what a dirty, lying, double-crossing, cheating, two-time... No, that's quite convincing. That's just how I feel about it myself. Hmm? Well, well, how come the Forgive and Forget Act the other night? It netted us $15,000, didn't it? You and me? What are you getting at, this you and me? A two-way division of the spoils, darling. Say, so, you know, I'd like to kiss that parole board for giving you a pass home. Then it's a bargain? How are we going to cut Carl out and make it stick? I planned the bank job, didn't I? Yeah. Providing a way to cut Carl out was part of the plan. I don't get you. <laughs> Let's wait for Carl. J. 
Jane. Jane? I'm right here, Carl. Oh, we're both here. Good. Well, how about getting down to business now? What business? Splitting the dough. Oh, uh, I'm afraid I have a bit of bad news for you concerning that, Carl. What do you mean? I'm afraid something happened this afternoon that'll deprive you of any part of the money. Are you kidding? No. What's this plush mouth talking about, Jane? Just listen, darling. You have a police record complete with fingerprints, you know, Carl. So what? The note you handed the bank teller was written on a piece of paper which you handled several times. Your prints are on it. What? So you see, the police will be looking for you now. Why, you double I'm just evening our score, Carl. That's fair, isn't it? You don't think you're going to get away with it? Why not? Well... Well, you, you were part of the act, too, you know. I wasn't in the bank. Yeah, but you were parked a block down the street and drove Gene and me away. The police can't prove that. They'll prove plenty when I tell them where to go to look for the money. Are you... You'll tell them? Sure. About Gene, too? Why not? Look, if I take a rap, you're all going to take a rap. I'll yell my head off before I let you get away. <laughs> and that, darling, is my good deed for the day. Before resuming tonight's FBI file, as we shall in just a moment, let me describe another little drama for you. A drama that, while it might be less exciting, nevertheless has a mighty important application to you and your loved ones. This week at the Equitable Society, I happened to walk into the building carrying a heavy suitcase. And suddenly the suitcase seemed to grow lighter in my hand, and a voice said, Here, let me help carry that with you. Well, it was a friend of mine in the company. An Equitable Society representative who'd taken hold of the handle. Thanks a lot, I said. It's a pretty heavy load. So I noticed, he answered. That's why I'm helping you out. That's my business. And you know, he was 100% right when he said that. For it is the business of life insurance agents to help people. Help them carry financial burdens and responsibilities. Responsibilities like education for children, security for old age, the problem of keeping a home together. And that's just what the Equitable Society representative in your town stands ready to do for you. He's a man you can go and talk to any time. He's trained in all the uses of life insurance. And you'll find he gets a real satisfaction in helping you use life insurance to make your burdens lighter. Don't be backward about piling your troubles on him. His shoulders are broad. And the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is strong. Yes, this week... And every week for 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file, The Paroled Killer. In most cases, the parole boards throughout America are composed of conscientious and qualified men and women who perform well the difficult job of deciding whether a convict eligible for parole can safely be returned to society. But far too often, they yield to the pressure of well-meaning but uninformed persons and are forced to parole convicts who are loosed upon society with tragic and criminal results. As witness... Forty-eight hours after convict Raymond Norwood was paroled, he had engineered a $15,000 bank robbery, murdered a man, and was still at large. It is some 30 minutes now after Carl Sterling crumpled to the floor with two pistol slugs in his body. Special FBI agents Griffin and Decatur arrive at the apartment. Better stand to one side, Fred. Just in case Sterling resents our visit. I can't imagine him being dumb enough to sit here and wait to be picked up. Well, he was dumb enough to leave his calling card at the bank, wasn't he? Yeah, but... Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? We'd better get the manager to let us in. Why? Look at what's oozing through the crack under the door. Uh-oh. We don't need a key. The door's open. 
Come on. Watch it. Looks like one of them got the worst of an argument. Mm-hmm. It's Sterling. Oh. Is he dead, John? Yeah. Well, it's all pretty fresh. We couldn't have missed it by very much. What's in there, Fred? Oh, bedroom. A lot of pull-out drawers. Mm-hmm. It's her stuff that seems to be missing. Sure. It would be now. He doesn't seem to have started any packing at all. Everything of his is in place. Well, then that's the answer. She wanted to be a widow and with $15,000 initial capital. Yeah, it looks that way. We'd better get a wanted notice out on her. See if we can get a line on what kind of car they own, too. Oh, that shouldn't be difficult to arrive at. Wait a minute, hold it. What is it? The little pocketbook automatic. Oh, her gun. Could be. Two shots fired. And that's the number of holes in Sterling, too. But what's the idea of leaving her gun behind? That's pretty stupid. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe it's too stupid. Huh? Maybe, to coin an old phrase, there's a little more here than meets the eye. Ray. Yes, darling? I'm not exactly the 90-mile-an-hour type, but... Considering our Class B movie exit tonight, uh, don't you think we ought to be driving a little uh, faster? And have a state trooper arrest us for speeding? Car's probably hot for now, anyway. That's true. So what are we going to do? Keep on modeling it? No, my pet. I have a much more practical idea. Like what? Like this. Hey! Hey, are you crazy? Why? You almost plunged us down that ravine. But I didn't. Thanks to the good brakes. But how come you're parking here? Well, I told you. I have a more practical idea. Uh, for me, anyway. What do you mean? Those skid marks across the road will look like you swerved over toward the ravine to avoid a crash. Right? I swerved? Oh, but, uh, but you're driving. But when they find the car pile up at the bottom of the ravine, I won't be in it. What are you saying? I'm saying... Au revoir, my sweet child. <laughs> and so the villain took the $15,000 and pushed the girl and the car over the cliff. <laughs> Fred, what's the lab say? The slugs taken from Sterling were fired from that gun you picked up. Well, that figured. You're still convinced it was the work of a third person, huh? Yes. Revenge work, too. Sterling's leaving his prints on that note of the bank wasn't a dumb move on his part. It was meant to be a smart move on the part of somebody else. To pin the job on him. That's right. Couldn't that have been his wife? No, no. She would hardly have been that clever and then left her pistol behind as obvious evidence. Oh, and that's where the third person comes in. Yes, Somebody who had good reason in his own mind to frame Sterling with a bank job and frame the girl with murder. Who would that be? Well, I've been looking over the police information on their background. Yeah? Sterling and his wife at one time were more or less stooges for a man named Raymond Norwood. Oh. Norwood was sent up a year and a half ago on a robbery charge. But where's the revenge motive? Well, Sterling turned state's witness against Norwood. But how could Norwood get revenge if he's still in prison? Oh, he was paroled two days ago. Well, then what are we waiting for? Let's find him. Well, we've got to get some tangible evidence on him first. Like what? Well, if we can prove the presence of a third party in all this, the bank job, the murder, and the girl's getaway, I'll take okay. it. Special Agent Griffin speaking. Who? Oh? oh, yes. State trooper. Oh, yeah? Yes. Oh? Uh, yes, I see. What's that location again, please? Yes. Yes, yes, good. Hold everything. We'll be out there right away. What's up? State Highway Patrol has just found Sterling's car piled up in the bottom of a ravine. Well? well I'm afraid the third person theory is shot to pieces. Now, how's that? A girl's body is the only one in the car. Oh, so she was getting away on her own. Yes. Well, let's get out there fast. <laughs> Oh, hi. 
agree with you, Fred. Those skid marks back up on the highway make it look like an accident, but then again, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> Sticking to the third party idea. Well, where do we take a look at the wreck? Oh, that looks like the heap over there by that state trooper. Yeah. Officer, do you mind if we have a look? We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, go right ahead. Thanks. Fred, throw your light over this way, will you? Oh, what a mess. Yeah. Oh, look. Look, there's a traveling bag. Come here. No. Lift up the side a little while I pull it out, will you? Okay. All right, now. Oh, okay, I got it. That does it. All right, shine your light down here, will you? What's in there? Just clothes. Well, that's all. No fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, but that still doesn't. I know. But... I, I know. The third party. Well, let's look around a little more. Fred. Yeah. Come here. What did you find? The evidence I've been looking for. What? Where? This is the right front door of the car, isn't it? Uh, that's right. With well, the girl sitting next to it, she couldn't very well have been driving the car, could she? Uh, no. Come on. Next stop, Norwood. Uh, but where? I think I've got a good idea about that too. Can I help you, sir? Yes, I'm Raymond Norwood. I'm making my initial appearance before the parole officer. Norwood, did you say? Yeah, that's right. I hope I shan't have to wait long. You won't. Just a minute, Mr. Norwood. Mr. Norwood is here now. Can you send him in, please? Come this way, please. Thank you. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. I presume you would like first to see my credentials. On the contrary, Norwood. Allow us to present our credentials. Well, what's this? We're special agents of the FBI. But I, I understood this was the office of the parole officer. That's why we're here. We knew you had to report here, Norwood, and we wanted to talk to you. What about? About the robbery of the City National Bank yesterday, the revenge murder of your former associate, Carl Sterling, the accidental death of Mrs. Sterling, which, of course, wasn't accidental at all. But you have no evidence that I had a hand in any of it? Oh, would... If you had wanted it to appear that Mrs. Sterling was alone in the car, you should have seen to it that her dress wasn't caught in the door on the right side. Very clever, gentlemen. I'm afraid I shall have to frustrate your plans for taking me... Oh, no, you don't... What? Now, what were you saying about frustrating someone? I... I suppose a retraction is in order. Come on, get up. And this time, Norwood, there'll be no parole. Raymond Norwood was tried for his murder of his two accomplices, was convicted and returned again to prison. This time, he was executed for his crimes. Now, we would like you to listen to a statement prepared especially for tonight's program by J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the subject of parole. Parole is a humanitarian and worthwhile institution designed to aid the wrongdoer who has learned the error of his ways by giving him another chance under supervision. Like all laws, its first objective must be the protection of society. Parole fails unless society benefits. The convenience of the wrongdoer must be subordinate to the safety of society. In far too many instances, parole is unworthy of its name. It is a liability rather than an asset to society when improperly administered. The fact that there are failures in parole, nevertheless, does not mean that the institution of parole is not worthwhile. It has not been adequately tried, except in few instances, notably under the federal parole system and a few states. Those experiments are notable examples of how parole should be applied. Not a day passes that does not find local, county, and state law enforcement officers and special agents of the FBI risking their lives to apprehend some criminal who has been freed by ill-advised parole. It is time that law-abiding citizens demanded and made provisions for adequate parole systems in their respective states. In just
just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of the FBI. It will once again demonstrate the accuracy, the speed, and above all, the intelligence with which FBI men work. But now, let me introduce to you another expert in security. The Equitable Society representative in your community. You'll find him just as accurate, just as swift and intelligent in solving the problems of life insurance. Solutions that mean homes kept together, children educated, and old age made comfortable. In your community, the representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States is a man worth knowing. A man who likes his job. A man who is making a great contribution to building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Wasteland Hideout. incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner... The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI as a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation... The Wasteland Hideout. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances... Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, President of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will not be able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program as has been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. If you've been listening regularly to these FBI programs, such as tonight's case, which we'll open in just a moment, you have heard the word cooperation used a great many times. And that's because it's a key word in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Eighty-six years ago, a group of self-reliant men and women cooperated to found the Equitable Society to assure each member more security than any individual effort could provide. And now, the sound common sense of such an enterprise is revealed once more in the yearly report of the Equitable Society to its members. Just published, this report is so interesting that later on I want to tell you about this book. A book which proves once again that by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. <laughs> Tonight's FBI file... The Wasteland Hideout. Far more 
more numerous than the so-called psychopathic killers and dangerous to more people are killers of the type dealt with in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Professional criminals to whom murder is merely another tool of their trade, who kill without cause, real or imagined, solely as a means to an end. They are indeed the dealers of sudden death. In a small cabin somewhere deep inside the blackness of the Bitterroot Timber Country, separating Idaho and Montana, a man sits before a rough table in the yellow glow of a lantern, clenching his left arm from which blood oozes. Eddie. Eddie. Yes? Hurry up with that pan of water, will you? Uh, right with you. I wish you'd let me heat this stuff first, Rocky. I don't want no fires. Well, it's night outside. Who's going to see? Look. You can see smoke against the sky at night. I don't want no forest ranger getting hep that anyone's here. Oh. Now clean off this arm and get some bandage on it. Uh, are you sure the slug ain't still in there? I told you it went clean through. Oh. Well, just hold still then. <clears throat> yeah, how long you had this hideout? I picked it up five years ago. Yeah, it sure is buried away. That's why I nailed it. Any hunting around here? Sure. How about fishing? Plenty. Hey, this is going to be a regular vacation, huh? Not exactly. We just go under here until the heat cools off. <laughs> Easy, will you? Oh, sorry. Uh, Eddie. Yeah? There's a job you're going to have to do. Uh, what's that? you got to rustle us some grub. You mean go hunting? Nah, stupid. you got to get some store grub. Hey, but you said there was plenty of hunting. There's plenty of guys hunting for us. We ain't running loose in these woods. Oh. Uh, where's the store? There's a joint about ten miles from here. Uh, you got any dough? You don't use dough. You heist it. Oh. If I could make it, I'd go myself. But I can't, so I gotta send you. And look, just for once, do a job right, will you? Oh, now, Rocky, you know I... I know if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have this bum wing. Now, listen close. I'm gonna tell you how to get there, and you're gonna get it right if I have to spell every word. Pop Culwell's combination filling station and grocery store on the highway through the Bitterroot country is not too heavily patronized, but enough to keep him going. And the radio on the counter is enough to keep him company. Pop is sitting on a box in his store reading a paper and listening to a musical program out of Spokane. Then suddenly... We interrupt this program of music, ladies and gentlemen, to bring you a special police bulletin. Well, what's that? All motorists and persons living on highways in the area comprising southeast Washington, northern Idaho, and southwest Montana are warned to be on the alert for two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary this afternoon after killing a guard. Well, what do you If you know? should see them, go to the nearest phone and call the police or the FBI. Under no circumstances, engage them in conversation. They will kill without provocation. Here are their descriptions. Edward Corning, age 35. Five feet Turn that off, mister. Huh? Turn it off. Weighs 100... Where'd you come from? I just walked in. You're... You're one of them fellas That's who just... That's right. What you want here? Groceries, a big stack of them. And I need a car, too. Well, you ain't getting either one. Oh, no, you don't. Jerk. Hey, Pop! Pop! Pop, I gotta get my girl home and... Hey, mister, where's Pop? Maybe I can take care of what you want. I gotta talk to Pop. I gotta get some gas on the cuff. Where is he? I'll come back here. Oh, it's okay. I always... Oh, gee. I told you not to come back here. What happened to him? He had an accident. Why, his head's bleeding. Leave him alone. You did this to him. Dick, are you going to take... Don't come in here, Midge. What's wrong, Dick? Stay back. Don't come in. <gasps> come on, Midge. Let's, let's get back in the car. Wait a minute. You're going to stay here and give me a hand. Now, look, the mister. The gun's giving the orders. Oh. 
You're going to help me load some groceries. Then we'll all get in the car. How are you feeling now, Mr. Caldwell? Well, I'm coming around all right, I reckon. Who are you fellas? My name's Perry. This is Mr. Norton. We're special agents of the FBI. How do you do, sir? How do you do? Well, now, that beats all. How do you know I was in trouble? We didn't, Mr. Caldwell. Hmm? We're on the trail of two men who escaped from the federal penitentiary. Yeah, I know. I heard it on the radio. It was one of them that walloped me. Yes, we had an idea it was something like that. When did it happen? Well, it was right after 8 o'clock. That was only 30 minutes ago, Jim. Yeah. We can't be very far behind them now, especially since they're on foot. On foot? We found the car they stole down the road, abandoned, burned out bearing. What'd they come here for, Mr. Caldwell? Well, it's only the one came in. He wanted some groceries. Groceries? Yeah. Oh, then they must have a hideout somewhere up. Wait a minute. What is it, Jim? It's a girl's compact here on the floor. Well, no. Where'd that come from? The initials are M-E-L. You know who that might be, sir? M-E-L. Well, sure, that, that can't be nobody else but... Young Midge Ellen Lancaster lives back in Summit. I see. And if she was here, then Dick Barstow, who's sweet on her, was here with her for sure. Does he have a car? Yeah, he practically lives in one. And that accounts for the fresh car tracks outside by the gas pumps, Jim. Mm, probably means more than that, too. Uh, do the parents of these youngsters have phones, Mr. Caldwell? Yes, they do. All right, we'll call them, George. Right. And if neither of those kids is at home, the bandits have them in their car, too. No telling where they are by now. Let's get on that phone, quick. I got slower going back. We don't want to miss that turn off trail into the woods again, you hear? I hear you. If we'd only started for home before dark like I promised Mother, this wouldn't have happened to us. I know. It's, it's all my fault. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, but it's true. Hey, look, pay attention to your driving, will you? Dick, Mother and Daddy will be out of their minds. Oh, don't worry about them. They're okay. It's us I'm thinking about. Especially you. Oh, Dick. What'll we do? I know what we'll do. <laughs> Hey, what are you stopping for? Look, mister, I don't know what you're planning to do with us, but whatever it is, I'm not letting my girl in for it. You better start the car going again. I'm not driving another foot. I'm not taking... Hey, hey, oh. hey. Shut up, both of you. Now, let's move. And like I said, go slow so we don't miss the turn-off trail to the woods again. <laughs> Yes, sir. And try not to worry. I'm confident everything will turn out all right. Yes, we'll keep in touch with you. Goodbye, sir. Well, I guess that cinches it, Jim. Both kids are missing. Mm. While you're at the phone, George, you better get out an alarm on the car and the boy and girl. Oh, sure. Hello. Hello, operator. Oh, get me the FBI office in Spokane right away, please. Yeah, that's right. I'll hold on. Say, George. Yeah? Those car tracks outside turn around going out of the drive and head east. Now, if they kept driving steadily after leaving here, they couldn't have made more than 50 or 60 miles. What are you thinking? Let's get the office to contact police at all points 100 miles east of here. That'll block all roads ahead of them. Right. Then if we don't get a report back here in a reasonable length of time, we'll know that they've holed up somewhere in this area. Well, let's hope they keep driving through. Well, if they take to the tall timber, that'll be rugged hunting. Yeah, I, wait. I think I've got the office. Hello? Hello? This is George Norton. Get out an alarm right away on this car. Black Ford Sedan. Okay, 
rest up here. Get out, both of you. Come on, Midge. We have to do what he says. Dick, I, I'm scared. Just, just hold my hand. Walk ahead of me. Head for the cabin. Come on, get moving. Dick, what are we going to do? We'll get out of this some way. Don't worry. I hope you're right. Yeah, this is it. All right, inside, you kids. Eddie, what is this? Oh, hiya, Rocky. <laughs> hey, did you think I was never coming back? Who are these kids? They brung me here. What? I used their car. Oh, you stupid. I had to, Rocky. Why? Well, they come in the store right after I slugged them. Slugged who? The grocery guy. Oh. Well, you sent me for groceries, didn't you? Look, mister. Shut up. I won't shut up. We want to go home. Eddie... This puts us in a real jam. Well, I couldn't help it, Rocky. Anybody see you take those kids? Anybody tell you? No. Are you sure? Yeah, there wasn't anybody in the joint but the grocery guy. Look, what else could I do? You could drop dead. <laughs> and sister, cut out the crying. Not till you let us out of here. That ain't gonna happen, sweetheart. What do you mean by that? You're staying here, Junior. No. No. Shut up. <laughs> Why, you dirty... Easy, Junior. Oh, no, oh, I'm gonna... Hey. Oh, Dick. Hey, let's eat something, Rocky. I'm hungry. In a moment, we'll reopen tonight's FBI file. Meanwhile, let's open another important record. This week at the Equitable Society, the advertising manager handed me an attractive little book. Here, he said, you might like to look this over. It's our annual report for 1945. Well, I expected to see the usual columns of dry figures. But this Equitable Society report was something else again. It was a 24-page book, bright with color, sparkling with interesting facts. Its title is Your Policy. And as, as I read it, I thought... Here's one of the most forceful tributes to cooperation I've ever seen. It just shows what people can accomplish when they honestly and willingly work together for protection and security. Of course, this book, Your Policy, will be mailed automatically to members of the Equitable Society. But let me give all of you listening tonight some of its highlights. This book explains how the Equitable Society's investments aid government industry, agriculture, homeowners. In short, how the society, by serving its members, serves America. The book tells about the $238 million that the Equitable Society paid out in 1945, paid to widows and children, paid on endowments, paid in annuities, paid in dividends to millions of members. It tells what every war veteran should do to keep his National Service life insurance in force. And it tells you how your Equitable Society representative is trained to serve you in many, many ways. This isn't all it tells. But it's enough to prove to anyone that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Wasteland Hideout. When fugitive criminals keep on the move, they're in the open. And their capture is largely just a matter of keeping on their trail until they can be overtaken. But when they go underground, when they hole up in some unknown hideout, the job of capture is not so simple. And if, as in tonight's case, the unknown hideout be somewhere inside several million acres of mountains and timber, the job may present a staggering handicap. So 
Some two hours have now passed since the man called Rocky struck down the boy, Dick Barstow, in the hideout deep inside the Bitterroot Timber Country. Back at Pop Caldwell's filling station and grocery store on the highway, actually only ten miles as the crow flies from the hideout, Special Agents Perry and Norton of the FBI are studying a map and hoping the phone will ring. They couldn't possibly have had more than a 50 or 60 mile start from here when you put out the alarm, George. Yeah, I know. We've got police and deputies covering all roads east of here. I don't see how they could have gotten through. Still, the phone doesn't ring with any report. Mm. Then that's got to mean only one thing. They've stopped traveling. Here's some hot coffee for you, boys. Oh, thank you, Mr. Caldwell. Take milk and sugar in it? No, not for me. Oh, thanks. Say, Jim, Hmm? if they've taken to the tall timber, what do we do now? Well, I'm afraid there's not a great deal we can do tonight. We stand a much better chance in daylight of finding some trace of where they might have turned off. And let's be up at the crack of dawn and get at it. Right. You know something, boys? What's that? It'd be mighty funny if them convicts wasn't much more than spitting distance from here. Lie still, Dick. Don't try to move. Mitch, what are you doing here? I mean that... Oh. Please, Dick, just lie still. Where are we? What happened? Don't you remember? Remember? Remember what? Never mind. Don't try to think. I'm just so happy that you're alive. I, I thought that horrible man had killed you. Killed me? What are you talking... Hey, wait a minute. I remember now. He slapped me and... And you started to fight him. And he slugged me? Yes. How long have I been out? All night. What? Look outside. It's daylight. Are Are we still in the cabin? Yes. Where are those men? They went outside a few minutes ago. Hey, then... Then maybe we can get out of here. No, please. They're just down by the car. I can see them through the window. Oh. Dick? Yeah? I don't think we're ever going to get out. What do you mean? I heard them talk. They're escaped convicts. They killed a guard and then got away. They're very desperate men. Pop probably got killed, too. Yes. Dick? Yeah? If that's how it's going to be, they may kill us, too. And, well, there's something I want you to know. Yeah? Remember the night at at the school dance? You, You asked me something? Yeah. About... About us getting married someday? Uh Uh-huh. I didn't know the answer then. But I do now. Thanks, Midge. (laughs) Oh, Dick. (laughs) Don't, Midge. Don't cry, please. If we're going to have to die, then... Hey, wait a minute. Maybe we are going to have to die. What? Let, Let me get up. What are you going to do? I've got an idea. If those men only stay out of here long enough, it might work. Well, George, we've cruised up and down this road for 20 miles and still no sign of where any car turned off up in the woods. Oh, they must have colored up any signs like that. I'm afraid so. Hey, I've got an idea. Yeah? If they've got a hideout in the timber, it must be an old trapper cabin or a hut in an abandoned logging camp. (laughs) So we start looking for all the cabins scattered through several million acres of tall timber. No, no, we can make the job easier than that. How? There's a forest ranger lookout up in there, and he's probably got every cabin spotted on a map. Say, you're right. Let's go see him right now. (laughs) 
You FBI fellas have picked out a pretty good job for yourselves, I'd say. How do you mean? Reducing the area where the killers are likely to be hiding, even to that smallest circle. Yeah? I'd say there are probably 30 or 40 cabins sprinkled around in that area. Well, uh, I I realize it's a lot of legwork, but it's got to be done. And one of them might be the one we want. Okay. Here's your map with the cabin spotted on it. Good. And I'll get a guide for you, and that'll save time. And Look. Where? On that ridge, right over there to the east. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's smoke from a cabin. I saw it just before you fellas drove up. Yeah, but look at it now. What about it, George? Somebody's doing something with that smoke. What? Yeah. Looks like somebody was trying to signal with it. Yeah. Say, where is that on the map? I can locate it in a second on the fire finder here. Good. Jim, if that smoke is coming from a cabin in the circle we laid out, it'll be the first one we go to. And in a big hurry, too. Well, that's that. Why'd you drive the car way under them trees, Rocky? So nobody could spot it. Nobody could see it where it was. In the air they could. That car's red hot. They'll use planes or anything to find it. Oh. Hey, Rock. Yeah? Did you start a fire this morning? What are you talking about? Look. There's smoke coming out of the chimney in the cabin. What? Hey, see it? Come on. Hey, what's the matter? The kid started that. Oh, I thought... Shut up and hurry. Put that fire out, kid. It's too late now, mister. Give me that bucket of water, Eddie. Right. Here you are. There. What you set a fire for, kid? I know what he set it for. How long you been at it, kid? Long enough, I hope. Well, we're not going to stick around to find out. Are we leaving, Rocky? Yeah, stupid. Uh, what are we going to do with them? What you should have done at the old man's place when they came in, if you had any brains. Dick! Wait a minute, mister. You got no time to argue now, Junior. Look, kill me or do anything you want to, but let her go, please. Not a chance. Drop that gun, you. Rocky, look out. I'm not dropping any gun. Rocky! All right, keep this other man covered, George. I'm sorry, young lady, that you had to see that. Thank you, mister. We're special agents of the FBI. And I imagine uh, they were your smoke signals, huh, son? Yes, sir. Good work. And now we're going to take you both home to your folks. Come on. Rocky and his accomplice in crime were tried for the murder of the prison guard. They were both convicted for this crime and sentenced to death by hanging. And so ended the career of two more dealers of sudden death. There are, however, many more of their kind still at large. Unfortunately, neither your local law enforcement officers nor your FBI know just who and where they all are, nor when any will strike. But of this, you and they may rest assured. When one does strike, he'll be pursued day and night, 24 hours around the clock. And let him hide out wherever he chooses. He will be found. In next week's exciting program, which we'll tell you about in just a moment, This Is Your FBI, will present new evidence to prove how well the FBI guards national security. And in the booklet called Your Policy, the same one I was talking to you about a few minutes ago, the Equitable Society presents new evidence to prove how carefully and intelligently the society protects your financial security through life insurance. If you're not already a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, ask the Equitable Society representative in your community for a free copy of this booklet. It's so interesting, so easy to read. Get a copy from your Equitable Society representative, a neighbor whom you ought to know anyway, for like your FBI, he is constantly working for the protection of you, your home, and your country.
Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bogus War Brides. We exceedingly regret that due to unforeseen circumstances, Mr. Thomas I. Parkinson, president of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, was not able to address you on the subject of inflation on tonight's program as had been announced. Mr. Parkinson will, however, speak on this subject over this same network at a later date. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Bogus War Bride. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Before enacting tonight's timely case, I'd like to call your attention to a very significant fact about the sponsor of tonight's program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And that's the increasing number of women who are becoming members of the Equitable Society. More and more, women are seeking security through life insurance. They call on Equitable Society representatives eager to know of the many uses and applications of modern life insurance. In fact... A number of our Equitable Society representatives are themselves women. I'll tell you about one of them later. Just like the men, they realize the value of life insurance both to the individual policyholder and to the community. They know that by serving Equitable Society members, they serve America. Tonight's FBI file, The Bogus War Bride. Tonight's case from the files of your FBI presents another in the series of demonstrations of gratitude for the heroic sacrifices of the returned veteran being performed daily by that lower-rung member of America's criminal society. He was first in lying, first in cheating, and first in the pockets of his countrymen. The swindler. In a certain bar off Times Square, which became a favorite oasis of G.I.s during the war, two of the last three vacant stools have been quickly spotted by the deliriously happy couple just coming in the door. Well, here we are, baby. Bartender, give us a couple of champagne cocktails. Okay. We got a lot of celebrating to do tonight, huh, Betty? Rather. Oh, listen to that. Rather what? Rather be here than any sport on earth, that's what. (laughs) Oh, you kill me with those quick comebacks, baby. 
You know, that's what got me into this mess to start with. Now, just what do you mean by that, George? That night in Piccadilly when I asked you to marry me, you came back with yes so quick I didn't have a chance to change me blooming mind. Well, <laughs> if that's the way you feel about it, I'll get right back on the boat and go home. Would you really, baby? I say, what a jolly big lawyer I am, what? <laughs> Here's your drink, mister. Oh, thanks. Here, baby. Go. Here's to the Queen Mary for bringing me Princess Betty. Here's to you, love. Congratulations, chum. Huh? Uh, congratulations. Oh, thanks, pal. My bride's still stuck over there. Uh huh? May take another six months. Oh, sir, what a pity. Yeah, it's tough. Anyway, let me join in drinking to your reunion. Thanks, it's awfully nice of you. Yeah. Well, here's to you. Here's hoping you and your missus beat that six month rap. Rather. You know. Confidentially, pal, my wife here would still be stuck over there, too, if I hadn't run onto a way to do a little finagling. Sure. What's the matter? You want us to get arrested on our first night? What do you mean, get arrested? I'm talking about how we worked it, that's why. Oh, look, baby, the soldier here is one of us. Well, you can't tell who else might be listening. Well, there's no police in here. Just because you don't see any brass buttons, there's no sign. Okay, okay. Look, I, I don't know how you worked it to get your wife over, but I'd sure like to know. Well, I guess you can tell from the way Betty's putting the clamps on me that it's kind of a down-under proposition, if you know what I mean. Anything that will get my wife over here is all right with me. After all, she's, she's got a right to be here, hasn't she? Come on. Let's all move over to that empty booth in the corner. Okay. Come on, baby. All right, Al. Excuse me, mister. Slide in, sugar. Charlie. Now, look, pal. Here yeah. Maybe I better tell you first how much this deal cost me. How much? Five hundred smackers. Five hundred? Can't you raise it? I guess I can. Now, these guys work fast. Well, I'll have the dough tomorrow. That fast enough? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. What's the proposition? Was it all right with you if I tell him, Betty? After all, I gotta help a buddy, you know. Go ahead. Okay. If you can raise 500 bucks tomorrow, you can get your wife over here in two or three weeks, just like I did. Really? Sure. And here's how it works. In the local field office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett has just summoned Special Agent Grafton to his office. You sent for me, Mr. Everett? Yes, Grafton. I just got a special teletype from Director Hoover. A swindle case he wants us to go to work on right away. Yes, sir. It's a fake passport racket being worked against returned veterans whose foreign brides are still over there. Oh? Due to the tremendous backlog of applications for passports and other necessary papers, it may be several months before some of the wives can get over here. I know. So the racketeer spots a veteran whose wife is way down the list and sells him a fake American passport to send to his wife. Mm Mm-hmm. Have we got any lead? Two of these fake passports were picked up in London yesterday when two brides presented them for inspection. I see. They're being rushed to us by airmail. But in the meantime, here are the names and addresses of the two husbands here in the city. Aren't they liable to arrest on a conspiracy charge? Technically, yes. But Mr. Hoover has no desire to arrest a veteran for trying to get his wife over here. All we want is their cooperation in exposing the swindlers. Well, then I better try to contact them right away. One of them lives out in Jackson Heights. The other one up near Columbia University. Here are the addresses. Okay. And see if you can get a good description of who sold them the passports and how and where they were contacted. Right. You got that passport for the sucker nearly ready, baby? Just about, George, old thing. Oh, look, can that accent, will you, when we're not working on somebody? Okay, sugar. But if I slip out of character in the middle of a deal sometime, well, it just might be rather embarrassing for us, don't you know? <laughs> you and your British understatement. Look, George, you better get some more of this kind of paper from the station or we're about out. Never mind. We'll get some more when we get to the West Coast. Yeah, but we only got enough left for... What did you say? I said we'll get some more paper on the West Coast. What do you mean, West Coast? That's where we're going. How come? Look, baby, we've been sprinkling these phony passports around here like confetti. And making lots of nice dough, too. I know. And the way to keep the dough is to change scenery before we get caught. What makes you think we're Think nothing. We're hotter than a couple of tamales right now. So? So, 
Two more suckers after tonight, and we head for Frisco. Why Frisco? Because, my pet, there is a very sad situation out there, too. Huh? Yep. There's a lot of poor G.I.s out there with wives way out in Australia. Oh, of course, of course. And I must do something for me blooming sisters down under. What? Can I come in, Mr. Everett? Oh, come ahead, Grafton. Uh, did you locate the husbands? I talked to one of them. The other's out of town. What'd you find out? Well, I got a pretty good description of the swindlers. Good. How many are there? A man and a woman. Oh? Yes, he's around 35. She's younger and speaks with a British accent. Uh-huh. They uh, play the midtown bars frequented by servicemen and put on a big act about how happy they are to be reunited. She plays the part of his British bride who's just arrived. I see. And some serviceman whose wife is still overseas butts in and asks how they managed it. And there's another victim ready to be taken. Cost this chap $500. Well, obviously the swindler didn't produce a phony passport on the spot. At their first meeting, I mean. No, the victim raised the money and they met again next day to complete the deal. But he had no idea of where to contact the swindler in the meantime. That's right. First contact was at a bar and the second meeting took place at the victim's house. All right. Phone the descriptions of the swindlers to the police department and see if they check with anybody they have a record on. Right. And I'll get every available agent we have and get them started covering all midtown bars at once. Hello? Hiya, pal. This is George. Oh, hello there. Everything set? I talked to the guys and they didn't want to do business. What? They wanted to lay off for a while. Afraid they might be getting hot. Yeah, yeah, but look, I I already raised the 500 bucks. They can't back out on me. I gotta get my wife over here. Okay, okay, you're gonna get her here. Yeah, but you just said... Keep your shirt on, will you? You're in. I don't get it. Look, I'm not letting a buddy down. I talked the guys into making a deal for you. Yeah? They're just scared to deliver any more in person, the new customers, you see. Oh. So I promised I'd deliver yours for them and collect the dough for them. Then you've got it. Sure. Have you got the 500 with you? Yeah. Where, where'll I meet you? At that same bar? No, no. We better make it somewhere more private. I don't want to get caught either, you know. I'd have a tough time proving I'm not mixed up in this business. Sure, I know. I'll meet you wherever you say. Okay. How about your place? Swell. 36 Cherry Lane. It's down in the village. Basement apartment. Okay. Be there in 20 minutes. <laughs> Nobody like that in your files, huh, Sergeant? Okay, well, thanks a lot anyway. Police headquarters hasn't got anything on them, Graffin? No. Then I'll teletype the descriptions to Washington to see if identification has got anything that checks. Okay. You better hop out and cover a few midtown bars yourself for a while. Right. Uh, take the area between Broadway and 8th Avenue from 46 to 49th. I've got the rest covered. Want me to call in in case something breaks? Yeah. And I hope there's a break before another victim loses $500, too. Just a minute. Oh, hello, George. Come on in. Okay. Look, I I can't stay long. Guys gave me an hour to get back with the dough, and besides, Betty don't know I'm doing this, or she'd be scared to death. I was afraid you might change your mind yourself on the way down here. Ah, you know, I never let a buddy down. I know. Okay. Where's the dough? Where's the passport? I got it right here. Well, let's see it. What's the matter? You think it's a gag? I just want to see what I'm getting for my money, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, okay. There you are. Thanks. And I'm telling you, pal, it's a perfect imitation, too. Uh Uh-huh. All the information you gave me and your wife is fixed up in there right. All you got to do is paste a picture on there and you're all set. Yeah. All set to get my wife and me in a jam, maybe, and lose 500 bucks besides. What? She'd have as much chance of getting through on this as she would on a hat check. What are you talking about? My wife came through on one and I... Cut out the lion, mister. I got wise to your racket this morning. 
You rooked a pal of mine on the same deal. Look, buddy, you got me wrong. I'm not mixed up in any racket. I said cut out lying. But I'm telling you that... I went through with this just to get you down here, and the reason I haven't got a couple of cops waiting for you is because I wanted to do a little work on you myself first. Now, what do you mean? I mean like... Uh. Stand up, you dirty chiseler, and take another one. Stand up! Here we are, soldier. Put that gun away. Not when it's about to go off. Sucker. Some of the most important people in the American business world are women. While waiting for tonight's FBI file to reopen, let me tell you about one who works for our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I met one of America's outstanding businesswomen. She's a leading life insurance saleswoman. I asked her just how she happened to be in the life insurance business. Well, she said, when my husband and I were just starting out in life, we had very little money, but we had great plans. And we had a brand new life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. One month later, my husband died. Well, the money from his Equitable Society policy didn't lessen my grief and shock. But it did help me through some mighty difficult times. And one day I thought to myself, why, I can sell this. I can show people the importance of life insurance because I know from personal experience. So I got a position with the Equitable Society, and now I spend my life in this satisfactory business of building security. Well, having talked with her, I understand why 30% of all Equitable Life Assurance Society policies are currently being bought by women. Professional women, business women, women whose career is a home. Women everywhere are seeking the protection and security that comes with a policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, women, too, know that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Life Assurance Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Bo Bogus War Bride. There is a principle of human justice embodied in the codes of law wherever human rights are respected. A principle often referred to as mitigating circumstances. In the Victor Hugo classic Les Miserables, Jean Valjean was guilty of a robbery. But he stole in order to feed his starving family. That was the mitigating circumstance which lessened his guilt in the eyes of the just. Such a defense might be offered to lessen the guilt of the G.I. who was a victim of impersonation and conspired in the forgery of a passport. He was about to do it with the honorable intention of reuniting his family. In the office of the FBI, Assistant Agent in Charge Everett is just finishing a telephone conversation as Special Agent Grafton enters the office. Yes? Yes, all right, and thanks a lot, Inspector. We'll have an agent over there right away. Uh, Grafton. What's up? That was Inspector Riley of the Homicide Squad. Oh? An ex-serviceman was shot and seriously wounded a little while ago in his village apartment. I see. We don't know whether it has any connection with the shooting, but uh, a fake passport made out for his wife was found in the man's pocket. Uh-oh. The police are taking him now to St. Anthony's Hospital. By the time you get there, he may have regained consciousness. Well, I'm on my way. Uh, ask the police to let you have that fake passport. It might be our best lead to date in case the chap doesn't recover. And get back as soon as you can, will you? Right. Yeah? Who is it? It's me, George. Oh. 
Get your stuff together quick, baby. We got a scram. Why? What's all the excitement? I had to let the sucker have it. You did what? Somebody put him wise. He was waiting for me with both fists. George, you mean you... You think I'm going to stand there and let him work on me? You stupid fool, you... Look, baby, don't stand here gabbing. I killed the guy. Don't you understand? Well, if you're sure you killed him, that's not so bad. What do you mean? Well, I'll have a tough time tying it in with you. George, you had sense enough to bring it back with you, didn't you? What? Don't tell me you left that fake passport down there. Yeah, yeah, I did. Oh, brother! Oh, stop your beeping, will you? we got to get out of here. Not me. Huh? We're a lot better off staying right here. How do you figure that? Well, if somebody put them wise to us, they can also put the cops wise to what we look like. Okay, but we... will be watching every train, bus, and airline for us. All right, you stay here, baby, but I'm getting out. Wait a minute! They catch you, I fall too. Yeah, but we... No dice, George. You're sticking right here with me. You understand? Okay. Now, sit down, genius. Give me the whole story. Well, I talked to the victim, Mr. Everett. Good. What'd you get, Grafton? The swindler we've been looking for shot him. But he was apparently in such a hurry to get away, he left the fake passport behind. Was he able to give more than a description of the swindler? Only that he's known as George, and the girl is Betty, that's all. I see. The fingerprints of both of them are probably on this fake passport. We'll put it through for a check right away. And we ought to have another lead in the kind of paper they used in making them up. Right. Shall I take a sample of it and start checking stationers to see who handles it and who's been buying it? Yes, you start the ball rolling on that while I cover on all train, bus, and air terminals. Right. And then we'll... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? Well, we'll watch the travel terminals anyway. They're probably taking the smarter course of staying under right here. In that case, it's up to us to smoke them out. And I think I've got an idea that'll do just that. Huh? Oh, I'm getting. There's not a thing in the morning paper about your little stunt last night. You ought to hire a press agent. Never mind the wisecracks, will you? Oh, for heaven's sake, relax. You've been jumping up and down like a sewing machine all morning. I've got a right to be jumpy, haven't I? You don't hear my knees knocking, do you? I don't like it. There not being anything in the paper about it. Told you to get a press agent. I don't mean that. Well, what do you mean? Look... Sometimes cops keep things like this out of the paper on purpose. Like what purpose? Like when they suspect somebody of doing the job and don't want the papers to tell them so and make them harder to catch. Will you stop feeling the police breathing on your neck? Look, lay off, will you? I'm sick of... Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it? Well, genius. You can relax. Well, what'd you find? The newspaper didn't ignore your little party last night after all. Well, what's it say? The sucker's not dead. What? Then what do you mean, relax? He's in the hospital. We'll recover, and all he will say for publication at this time is that the shooting was all a mistake. And he refuses to identify the person who did it. No kidding. Well, what do you know? I think you ought to send him some flowers, George. I think we ought to get out of here now. Let's head for the coast like I said. Wait. What? How would you like for us to make maybe a lot of money all at once first? How do you mean? Selling another passport. Oh, are you crazy? We're both crazy if we don't make this sale. Who to? According to the paper here, the rich and social Richard Adams, ex-GI, is having all manner of trouble getting his blooming British broad over here, don't you know? Yeah? Yeah. And he's crying about it. From the plush depths of his penthouse apartment. And here's the address. Hey. I'll make up a book for him right away. You trade it to Mr. Adams for 5000 and we'll be off for Frisco. Well, here's the 
the report on that fingerprint check, Mr. Everett. Identify them? Yes, sir. The man is George Canton, alias George Patterson. And the girl? His accomplice, Betty Douglas, former nightclub entertainer. Both have swindling records. Good enough. And we've located the stationer who sells the paper used in the fake passports. Oh? He identifies George Canton as one of his customers, but has no address for Canton. Well, we won't worry too much about that right now. I have a plan in mind that should solve all our worries. It's about time you showed. California, here we come. You did okay? Oh, that guy Adams was like shooting lions in the zoo, baby. How much? Five G's, just like you said. Where is it? Right here. Give it to Mama. Huh? You heard me. I said give it to Mama. But, sweetheart, I can... First, I want to see if it's all here. What's the matter? Do you think I can add? Yeah. I think you can subtract, too. Don't trust me, huh? The last guy I trusted was the last guy. Hey, well, what's the idea? Why haven't you got your stuff packed yet? Oh, only take a minute. I guess you didn't have much faith in my salesmanship, huh, baby? Not after your performance last night. All right, all right. Lay off that now, will you? It's all turned out sweet, hasn't it? Uh, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed anyway until we're on the... Uh-oh. Keep quiet. It's too late for that. Whoever it is must have heard us talking. Okay. You go to the door and throw it open. I'll be ready with a blast. You think... Go on. Do what I tell you. Hello there. Well, Mr. Adams. That's right. And your butler, too. (laughs) What's the idea? If you had brought the young lady with you, we wouldn't have had to follow you here. What do you mean? I mean, miss, that we're really special agents of the FBI. What? I'll take that gun. Your victim down at the hospital is ready to identify you for publication now. Come on. For forging and counterfeiting a government document, the passport swindlers are now serving full term in a federal penitentiary. After he has paid his debt to the United States government, the man called George must still stand trial on a charge of assault with intent to commit murder in New York State. And once again, your FBI joins with your local law enforcement officers in urging you, the potential victims of swindlers, to be wary of the stranger with a proposition. If the proposition is sound, it will keep long enough for you to investigate it and the person who offers it. If it is unsound, your investigation will prove it to be so. That is your duty to yourself and to society. Next week, another exciting adventure story from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. As you listen to tonight's radio program, you must have realized why you look to your FBI for national security. Trained men such as these FBI agents are the best safeguard you can have. And you can depend upon the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States for the financial security of life insurance for the same reasons. Able, trained men and women, experts in preserving homes, in keeping children in school, making old age comfortable. The Equitable Society representative in your community, the name Equitable Society is in your telephone book, is skilled in all phases of life insurance security and experienced in its application to your particular problems. He... Yes, and she specialize in building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. 
The Delinquent Parents. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Delinquent Parents. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Tonight's significant story will begin in just a moment. First, a brief word from the sponsor of This Is Your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Here at the Equitable Society... We have been working for 86 years on one of the things that you yourself are most concerned about. Security for yourself and your loved ones. When we say you, we mean just that. You who are about to listen to this program. Even if you're not a member of the Equitable Society, you benefit indirectly through the stability that Equitable Society investments help bring to American industry and business. Get to know the Equitable Society Life Insurance representative in your community. You'll learn that it's a simple statement of exact fact that by serving Equitable Society members, he serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Delinquent Parents. In America today, for every 23 persons, there is one with an arrest record. And the tide of crime is rising. The greatest number of arrests in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old. And the number is growing. Tonight's case from the juvenile files of your FBI is a drop of water in the rising tide. There is a popular fallacy that youthful law violators are most always products of poverty or underprivilege. If this were true, Abraham Lincoln might well have become the arch-criminal of his day. The truth is that they are, with rare exceptions, the products of parental neglect, a condition just as prevalent in homes of the well-to-do as in homes of the poor. Take, for example, the Medford home in a suburb of New York City. It is a few minutes before noon. Drake Medford, 16, 
comes out of his improvised chemical laboratory to make a request of his mother. Mom? Mom, would you mind Not if now, you're... Drake. Can't you see I'm rushing? But, Mom, I just wanted to... Drake, I simply got to make the 1240. Bertha will be furious if I'm not there for the curtain. Oh, but I thought since you're going into New York... I don't you... have time to do any errands for you, Drake. It would only take you a minute, Mom, and I'm running low on nitric acid. Well, I... What? Nitric acid. Good heavens, do you want to blow me up? Nitric acid is perfectly harmless until combined with... Ah, well, I'm certainly not going to combine any with me. Okay... Whatever it is you're doing, Drake, it'll have to wait long enough for you to drive me to the station. All right. Be home for dinner? No, I'm never at home for dinner when I go to a matinee. Seems like you're hardly ever home for dinner. What, dear? Never mind. You'd better go back the car out. I'll be ready to go by that time. Uh, Ronnie's coming over after a while. May I use the car if we want to go somewhere? I don't care what you do, dear. Uh, say, by the way, Mom... Please, Drake, not now. Some other time. Some other time, some other time. It's always that way. I don't stand there mumbling. Go get the car out. But you never have any time for me. What? You said you never have time for anything concerning me. Why, Drake. The idea. How can you say such a thing? Never mind. Drake. Guess you're sorry you ever had a son. And so am I sometimes. You're talking utter nonsense. You know perfectly... Heavens, look at the time. Okay, I'll go get the car. And please hurry, dear. Sure, you can't afford to miss the curtain. That's something really important. Great. Come on in, Ronnie. I'm back in the lab. Okay. Anybody home? Nope. Well, how's it coming? It's all done. How much of the stuff did you make? That little bottle full. Hey, that's enough nitroglycerin to blow up the Croton Dam. Well, you asked me to make plenty. That's right. Hey, why do you want it? Drake, that stuff's going to get us something we both want awfully bad. What? That sailboat. The nitro? I don't get it. Look, we need 150 bucks, don't we? Yeah. And a fat chance we've got of getting it from our folks. They've turned us down three times already. I know. And we're going to go out and get it ourselves. How do you mean? Remember my Uncle Ben who lives in Connecticut? Yeah, he won't give you 150 bucks. He will, too, but he won't know it. How? Well, he and the family all have gone to Florida. But there's always money in his wall safe, and it'll be a cinch for us to blow it up. Blow up his wall safe? Sure, he's got tons of dough. He won't miss it. We'll even tell him someday who pulled the job, and he'll get a big laugh out of it. Oh, but it's not right. Look, it's in the family, isn't it? But even so... What's the matter, you scared? Oh, it's not that especially. Sure you are. You're scared your mother will find out. That's where you're wrong, Ronnie. Huh? She doesn't care what I do. And I don't either anymore. What's the matter? Have a fight? No. I'm just realizing where I stand around here. Well, I got wise to that in my house long ago. She lives her life, so from now on I'm going to live mine. Well, what are we waiting for? Nothing. We'll blow that safe tonight. I got the tools. You got the nitro? Yeah. Come on. Let's get out of the car. Wait a minute. You're not getting cold feet, are you? No, no. I thought you said they'd all gone to Florida. What do you mean? That light upstairs. Oh, that's Waters. The butler. What'll we do? I won't know anything's going on until it's too late. How are we going to get in? They left the key with the folks. I slipped it out and had a copy made. Come on. Don't close it. Okay. Okay, here we are. I'll open the door. I'll go first with the flashlight. You follow me. The safe's in the library, just off to the left. Okay, there's the safe. That wall there. I'll drill a hole first. You get the nitro ready. Okay. Ronnie. What's the matter? Listen. Put out the flashlight, quick. Right. What do we do? I'll take care of Waters. Hey, Ronnie, you don't mean you'll... Shh. He 
He's turned on the living room light. Quiet and keep down. That's funny. I just sworn I had to... Oh. Hey, Ronnie, we better get out of here. Not until we get what we came for. <laughs> About an hour later, a telephone rang on the desk of Agent in Charge Durant of the New Haven office of the FBI. Durant speaking. This is police headquarters at Meadowbrook. Oh, hello. What's up? We think this is a case for the FBI. Oh? What happened? The wall safe in the Pomeroy house here was blown a while ago and the butler was slugged. Well, what's the FBI angle? They got only $50 in cash but took jewelry valued at over 5000 We've reason to believe the thieves are from New York. Went back across the state line with the stuff. Well, that comes within our jurisdiction, all right. What do you want us to do? I'll start a special agent over to Meadowbrook right away to investigate. We'll be waiting for him. Right. Better take it easy, Drake. We don't want to get pinched for speeding now. I wish you hadn't taken that jewelry. What good's $50 going to do us? What good's the jewelry going to do us? Don't you know what the guys in the movies do with the stuff? Oh, you mean... Sure, hock it before it gets hot. Oh, where are you going to pawn it tonight? Oh, we can't tonight. But we'll be in a New York pawn shop with it first thing in the morning. Well, what are we going to do tonight? We're going to go home like nothing happened. Then you pick me up early in the morning and we'll head for a pawn shop. Look, Ronnie, I... Now, don't go getting nervous on me. You just sit tight and we're in Clover. Back already, Tom? Yes? Pick up any leads? The butler is positive the robbers were very young, just kids. Oh? He started into the library to investigate the noise he heard, and had just caught a quick glimpse of one of them... When the other one knocked him out. Well, could he give you a description of the other one he saw? He didn't get that good look at him. Oh, how did they blow the safe? It was a nitro job. Hmm. The kids in nitro somehow or other don't quite go together, do they? No. How did they gain entrance to the house? <laughs> the easiest way possible. What? They had a key, apparently, opened the front door and walked right in. Well, what do you know about that? Guess you're thinking the same thing I am. Inside job? That's the way it struck me. Well, before we go to work on that, telephone the New York office and give them the details and the description of the missing jewelry. It's okay, Drake. Nobody in the shop but the pawnbroker himself. Come on. Look, wouldn't you rather I'd wait out here? Huh? What's the matter? Are you getting scared again? Well, I thought he might be less suspicious if you went in by yourself. No, it's just the other way around. Come on. Okay. Well, good morning, boys. What can I do for you? Uh, we want to pawn something. That's my business. What have you got? Here you are. Well. What's the matter? Diamond bracelet? Pearl necklace? Where'd you get this? Well, uh, well, you see, it belongs to my sister. Oh? Uh, she didn't want to come here herself, and uh, she asked me to take care of it for her. Uh-huh. Uh, how much can we, uh, I mean, how much can she get for it? You wait a minute. I'll take them in back and examine them. Oh. Well, okay, but we're in kind of a hurry. I'll be right back. Well, what did he have to go back there for? To examine it, like he said. Now, don't start running it. Ronnie, listen dialing a number. Yeah. Maybe he's calling the police. Let's get out of here. Wait a minute. You watch the front. Where are you going? I said watch the front. Um, just a minute, mister. Something wrong? Oh, we changed our minds. We want the jewelry back. You can't have it back. I think this jewelry's stolen. Give me that jewelry. No, you can't. Come on, Drake. What happened? Let's get out of here fast. Wow.
While waiting for tonight's file to resume, as it will in just a moment, here's a message of particular importance to you and your family from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. This week at the Equitable Society, I heard a story of hope and courage about two young people who had everything that makes for success. Health, a home, and he had a good job, fine prospects for advancement, and a life insurance policy in the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. But then hard times struck, and the temptation came to surrender their life insurance policy. But somehow or other, they managed to keep it in force. And as a matter of fact, they are now, this week, about to retire in comfort on its proceeds. And that same dogged determination never to let a life insurance policy lapse is typical of more and more people. The figures prove it. Equitable society members are placing higher value on their life insurance than ever before, paying premiums promptly, frequently paying them well in advance. Yes, your life insurance, in whatever company, we hope it's with the Equitable Society, is a valuable possession. Keep it in force, no matter what. And when you need advice, speak to your Equitable Society representative, who is trained to help you use life insurance to your best advantage. He wants you to be secure. He wants you to be safe. And he wants you to understand, as he does, that this week and every week for more than 86 years... The Equitable Society has been building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Delinquent Parent. We repeat, mothers and fathers of America, the greatest number of criminal arrests today in all age groups is of boys and girls 17 years old. And back of it all, with rare exception, is parental neglect. The parent who doesn't take time to understand, to guide, to make a companion of his boy or girl may one day have to watch his child serve time. Mrs. Medford's attitude of utter indifference concerning her son, Drake, cannot now be far from a severe shock. The pawnbroker, struck down by Drake's companion, Ronnie, was taken by police to a New York hospital for treatment of his head wound. An official visitor enters his room. Mr. Adams, I'm agent in charge Durant of the New Haven office of the FBI. This is Special Agent Baker. How do you do? FBI in New Haven? Yes, we came to New York early this morning to follow up an investigation of a jewel robbery up in Meadowbrook last night. Oh? Uh-huh. When the police reported to our office here what took place in your shop a while ago, I thought there might be a connection. Uh, what can I tell you? What kind of jewelry were you offered? A diamond and emerald bracelet and a pearl necklace. That check's all right. And you told the police the jewels were offered by two boys? Yes, but they didn't look like criminals. They, they were so young and clean-looking. And... Could you describe them more fully? Uh, let me see. Well, try to be as accurate as you can, Mr. Adams. We have a theory that one of the boys was related to the family that was robbed, but we want to make certain before taking any steps. Uh, the one who did the talking, he was uh, 16 or 17. Uh-huh. He was a big boy... Like my son who plays football. And he's got red hair. That's what we wanted to find out. Yes. And now, Mr. Adams, if you will give us a brief description of the other lad as quickly as you can, we'll be on our way. Stick to this highway, Drake. When we get up around Peekskill, I get another idea. Hey, what are you doing? I'm going to turn around. Turn around? What do you mean? We're going back. Are you crazy? No, that's why we're going back. I don't get you. We're going to go back and tell them we did it and get everything straightened out. Now I know you're crazy. That's the only right thing to do, Ronnie. That's the only thing that'll land us in the hooskow. Not if we confess. Look, Drake, uncle or no uncle, we blew his safe, stole money and jewelry, slugged the butler. And a while ago, we slugged the pawnbroker. Maybe we even... Well... 
Even what? Well, I hit that old man pretty hard, and I might have hit him too hard. You mean he's dead? Well, he could be. We can't afford to go back and maybe have a murder pinned on us. Murder? Yeah. We're wanted by the police now, but good. We didn't mean to go this far, but we did. And we're criminals now. And there's only one thing we can do about it. We can't go back home. We've got to go on. Don't you see? Where did you say to head for? Peachskill. Just a minute. Yes? Mrs. Medford? Yes? I'm Special Agent Baker of the FBI. FBI? That's right. May I come in? Well, of course. Thank you. I have only a minute. I'm dashing over to the club for a bridge luncheon. I really wanted to see your son, Drake. Drake? Yes. I, I don't believe he's here. Oh, Drake. There, you see, he isn't home. He went off somewhere in the car early this morning. Do you know where he went? Well, I don't believe he said. Have you any idea where he was last night? Good heavens, I'm afraid not. I never try to keep up with that boy. Obviously. I beg your pardon? Perhaps if you had kept up with Drake, Mrs. Medford, we shouldn't be trying to catch up with him now. What did you say? Ronnie's mother doesn't know where he is either. I was just there. I... I don't understand. Your son, Mrs. Medford, and Ronnie are wanted by the FBI. Can you understand that? Wanted by the FBI? Yes. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Do you think so? I know so. How can you know that when you bothered to know so little else about your son? But, but I... At least I... you must have known that Drake has a little chemical lab in the house. Yes, I... But did I... you ever bother to know what he can mix in that lab? Well, no, I... One of the things he mixes is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin? Yes. Now, you'd better get a good grip on yourself for this, Mrs. Bedford. What? Last night, Drake and Ronnie blew open the safe in the Pomeroy home. Oh. Stole money and over $5,000 worth of jewelry. Struck down the butler with a deadly weapon. Oh, no. And this morning, struck down an old pawnbroker who got suspicious when they tried to pawn the jewelry. Oh, it isn't true. It can't be true. Have you ever bothered yourself enough about your son to see that it couldn't be true? But Drake couldn't do such a thing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Medford. But because you haven't faced the fact of your responsibility to your son, you'll have to face now the fact that he's wanted in connection with three crimes. Oh, Drake. My poor, poor Drake. I'm afraid I'll have to put out an alarm right away. <laughs> May I have the license number and description of your car, please? Yes, thanks a lot, Sergeant. I'll get on it right away. Oh, Baker. Yes? Looks like we've gotten quick results from the alarm. Really? Yes, I've just talked to police headquarters at Peekskill. Yes? They found the Medford car abandoned down by the freight yards. I see. Well, it's pretty obvious what they did next. Exactly. We're on our way to Peekskill right now. I'm having them check all freight train schedules, and by the time we get there, we should be able to figure out where those youngsters are. wish this train would get moving again. I bet we've been parked on the siding two hours. What time is it, Drake? What? I say, what time is it? I don't know. I can't see my watch. Okay. It doesn't make any difference anyway. Ronnie? Yeah? I want to go home. Look, are you going to start that again? I've made up my mind this time, Ronnie. Sit down. You can do whatever you want to, but I'm going to get off this train right now and start back home. Are you coming with me? No, and you're not going either. Yes, I am. Wait a minute. Don't try to stop me. Look, if you haven't got any more sense than to go back, I've got to stop you for your own good. I don't care what they do to me. Suppose the pawnbroker is dead. I guess you want to go to the electric chair for murder. I didn't murder anybody. So you're going back and squeal on me and get yourself off. I didn't mean it that way. I mean I'm not really a criminal and you're not either. 
We just didn't stop to think what we were doing. But we did it. And I'm sorry for it, too. So are you, and you know it. I want to go back home and get it off my conscience, and you ought to do it, too. You're just scared to be out on your own. You want to run home to your mother. What's wrong with that? You said yourself she didn't care anything about you. It doesn't make any difference. I care about her, and I can't do this. I'm getting off this train right now. Oh, no, you're Let not. Let go of me, Ronnie. No, you're That'll not. That'll do, boys. Huh? Well, who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. What? The FBI? And I'm awfully glad we waited to overhear what you were saying, Drake. It'll make things easier for both of you. Yes, sir. And you were wrong about your mother. She does care. She cares an awful lot. So, come on home. Because of their extreme youth, Ronnie and Drake, after a full confession of their guilt, were given the opportunity of becoming good citizens in the future by being paroled. And now, an important message about tonight's case from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, Director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. A crime wave of growing proportions is upon us. It demands immediate attention on the part of every right-thinking American. Increasingly, it is becoming a youth problem. Last year, more youngsters 17 years of age were arrested than in any other age group. Now, here is a challenge for every right-thinking American. Every community resource should be immediately mobilized, and every parent and adult should take their proper place in the fight against lawlessness. We have many splendid youth-serving agencies. Tonight, I want to single out one that has been tried and proven. The Boys Clubs of America. With over one quarter million members and 260 individual clubs, the Boys Clubs of America are celebrating their 40th anniversary. I have studied and seen the Boys Clubs at work from these groups come thousands of law-abiding citizens who are an asset to their communities. By developing good citizens, they are preventing crime. This is Boys Club's week, and I would urge upon my listeners greater support of this worthwhile activity and the extension of the facilities of the Boys Clubs of America. Before we tell you about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, a final important piece of information from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. To your FBI, you look for national security, and to the Equitable Society for the financial security of life insurance. In the past 86 years, the Equitable Society has weathered four wars and seven major depressions. During that time... Over five and one-half billion dollars have been paid to policyholders and beneficiaries. This power of strength, security, and stability is represented in your community by a man whom hundreds of your fellow citizens know as their good friend, the Equitable Society representative, who, like your FBI, is dedicated to the protection of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Nylon Hijacker. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The role of J. Edgar Hoover was impersonated. However, all other names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. 
This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Nylon Hijacker. On This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Freedom has been part of our American life for so long that people have grown used to it. And some of us don't realize what a priceless thing it is. For instance, you're free to tune in tonight's FBI file, which we'll begin in just a moment, or any program. Long wave or short wave, pro or con, any time you like. Yes, America, there are no pressures, no orders that you must or must not listen to certain things. And the Equitable Life Assurance Society is a good example of this freedom of choice. Membership in the Equitable Society is purely voluntary. But the advantages are so great that three and a quarter million Americans have elected to become members. That is, policyholder. And more and more people are joining it every year, staying in it, and reaping the benefits of membership in this mutual organization, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Truly, the Equitable Society is an American institution. For by serving its members, the Equitable Society serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Nylon Hijacker. It has been said that the female of the species is more deadly than the male. And while this expression applies zoologically only to certain of the lower animals and insects, Tonight's case from the files of your FBI demonstrates that in the field of human crime, no male could be any more deadly than the female who is motivated by a desire for revenge. In one of those cheap cold water flats across the East River from Manhattan, a pretty-faced young girl in a red chenille robe sits staring into a cup of coffee gone cold. She's been awake all night, waiting for the sound of certain footsteps in the hall, which never come. Suddenly, the girl straightens. But it is not his knock. He wouldn't knock. He'd use his key. Just a minute. Hiya, Bunny. Chris, what are you doing here this early? Just give me an aspirin and a bottle of beer, quick. Huh? Kid, your big sister is really hung over. Oh, come on in. I'll get you an aspirin right away, Chris. Okay. And I'll die for the icebox. Oh. Where's Frankie? Frankie? Hmm? Oh, he, uh, uh he, he's not here. Uh-huh. Hey, is this all the beer you got? Oh, take it, Chris. I ordered some more this morning. Okay. Where's an opener? Uh, right on the table. Oh, oh, yes. Well... Here's the aspen, Chris. Thanks, kid. That should do something. Hey, 
You don't look so hot, Bunny. What's the matter? Well, I, uh... Well, I didn't sleep very good last night. He didn't come home, did he? What? You heard me. Frankie didn't come home. No. I thought so. Chris, I... I'm scared stiff. I'm afraid he's gotten into some kind of trouble. Is that what you really think, honey? What do you mean? Look, kid, you're my sister, and I tear my hair out for you. You know that, don't you? Of course, Chris. And have I ever lied to you? No. Then you ought to know I wouldn't come all the way over here at 8 o'clock in the morning and with a hangover to boot to start lying to you now. What are you talking about, Chris? I know why Frankie didn't come home to you last night. You do? Yeah. And I know why he didn't come home the other two times. Well, well, what, what happened to him? Frankie has given you the business, kid. He's got a dame. Chris! I saw him together last night. Oh, no, no, Chris. You must have made a mistake. Not a chance. But Frankie wouldn't do that to me. Oh, wake up, kid. He is doing it. But he promised me. He promised he'd never look at another girl. Oh, honey, why don't you grow up? But I tell you, he promised. He promised to take out of this dump, too, didn't he? Yes, and he's going to as soon as he does a job or two and gets the money. I know for a fact Bunny, shut up and listen to me. Frankie's making good dough already. He's got a racket. What? I don't know what it is, but I found out that much, and it's paying off. But he never told me anything about it. Of course not. He's spending it all on that redhead. What redhead? The one I've seen him with. Oh. She's got a car and an apartment. Oh. And I'll give you one guess on who's paying for it. Who's paying? Oh, no, Chris. And when he gets ready to give you the brush off for keeps, he'll do that, too. <laughs> Look, kid, when you married that rat, I washed my hands, but I won't take you getting shoved around this way. Oh, this is awful. You can't handle the guy, but I can. So just let me know the next time he's home, and I'll be right here to really straighten that stiff out. In the New York City office of the FBI next morning, an assistant to the agent in charge is just finishing a telephone conversation as Special Agent York enters. All right. Yes. Yes, we'll get on it right away. And thanks a lot. New business, John? Yes, interstate hijacking. Oh? A truckload of nylons. Nylons? <laughs> well, who did it, your wife or mine? <laughs> No, York, I'm afraid they both got scooped on this one. Where did it happen? In Jersey, on the highway the other side of Hoboken. Uh-huh. Truck stopped at an intersection for a light. Three men stepped out of the shadows and did the rest. Anybody hurt? Well, they knocked the driver out. He came to about an hour later, made his way to the police and reported. Could he furnish any lead? Well, the police are questioning him now. Well, they must have brought the nylons on into New York. That's right. Truck was found abandoned at, here it is, Broadway and 125th. Well, probably miles from where they unloaded it. Yeah, I would think so. You know, this must be a new mob operating. That's the first interstate hijacking job around here since we broke up the Niles gang. Do you want me to do anything? Yes, will you go over to police headquarters and get the driver's testimony? Right. Then you'd better examine the truck, see if you can pick up any prints. Okay. And York, check with me later. Let me know what you found. Coming. Hiya, Bunny. Oh, hello, Chris. Well, ain't you going to ask me in? Oh, sure. Uh, um, come ahead. Is he home? Who? Now, who do you think? Uh, Frankie? That's right. Uh, yeah, he, uh, he's home. I thought you were going to get in touch with me when he showed. Well, you see, Chris, I... Where is uh... he? Sitting right over here, scared to death of you, hot shot. Oh. Please, Chris, you were wrong about Frankie. He explained about that girl and everything's fine. Yeah, I'll bet he explained. Did he tell you about Why the Why other... don't you keep your ugly kisser out of other people's business? Bunny's my sister, and I don't like the way you're giving her the business. What's the matter? You're jealous because nobody ever gave you a break like I did, Bunny? Why, you cheap little five-and-dime racketeer, I'll... Shut up. Frankie. Tell this big mouth to get out of here. Please go, Chris. Everything's all right between us now. You keep quiet. You heard a hot shot blow. Oh, no. 
I told Bunny I was going to come over here and straighten you out with her, but now I've changed my mind. Great, fine, so beat it. I changed my mind because you can't make anything else out of a rat but a rat, and I don't want her to go on living with one. Are you joking? Frankie, don't cheat my sister. That's your tough luck. I told you he'd brush you off for keeps as soon as he got ready, Bunny, but I was wrong. He's a two-timing bully that's got to have somebody to kick around all the time, and you're it. Oh, Chris, please, please. He can't bully anybody in his mob. They'd give him a belly full of lead. And the first time he kicks that redhead around, she'll stick a knife in his back. Chris! And he knows if he takes a swing at me, I'll blow his brains all over the joint. I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, Frankie, don't. I've had enough. Oh, see what you've done, Chris. Frankie, don't go. Don't leave me. Please, Let's don't. Go. Oh! Frankie! <laughs> Sorry, kid. He hit me. Well, what did you expect? Well, that was a very mean thing for him to do. He was just looking for an out, kid. You mean for keep? Sure. Oh, Chris. <laughs> now, look, that ain't worth crying over. You're better off that he's gone. But now I won't get any stockings. What stockings? From the hijacking. What are you talking about? Frankie hijacked a whole truck load of nylons last oh, night. Oh, stop, will you? Yes, he did. I heard him call up some men this morning to try to sell them. Look, there's the list right over there that he was working from. This, uh, this one over here? Yep. He promised me I could have as many nylons as I wanted. And Chris, you as a girl know just how tough it is Wait to get... Wait a minute. Huh? I think we can get more than nylons out of that character. What do you mean? Give me the phone book, quick. Hello? Mr. Fulton? Yes? Um, I'm calling for Frankie Austin. Oh. Frankie wants to know if you can use some nylon. So soon? I just got 3000 from him. Oh, um, uh, well, you see, these were for another customer, but he couldn't raise the cash, so Frankie thought you might want to nail these down, too. Sure, sure, I could use some more, all right. How many has he got? Uh, 6000 pairs. Say, that's fine. When can he deliver them? How about tonight? The sooner the better. Same place? Well, uh, Frankie, you don't like to deliver twice at the same time and place. I see. Here's what he said for you to do. Have the cash with you, and at 10 o'clock tonight, bring your pickup truck to the intersection of highway. Can I come in, John? Sure, come in, York. How'd you make out? Well, I went to police headquarters and interviewed the truck driver. And? Well, he doesn't remember too much about the hijacking. He stopped at an intersection when the three men ganged up on him. Could he describe them? He gave me a fair description of one of them. I, I have it right here. Uh, nothing on the other two? No. Huh? How about the truck? Oh, I went up and looked it over. There were over a dozen different fingerprints scattered around. I'm having them worked up now. Well, chances are none of them will belong to the thieves. Yeah, I know. Well, this one description may be of some help, though. How's that? We checked the police files. It tallies pretty closely with a man who's done this sort of job before. Who's that, you A racketeer named Frankie Austin. You know where he is? Not yet, but I'm going to work on that right now. Good. If you find him, bring him in. Gee, Chris, isn't it about time Mr. Fulton was coming? Yeah. Hmm. You ought to be driving up any minute now. Chris, I... I'm scared. So am I, but not for the same reason. What do you mean? I'm scared. He might have got suspicious and backed out. Oh. C can I turn on the radio? You could attract more attention by screaming. What do you mean? Never mind. You stay just like you are, kid, and after tonight, we're going to start making money out of those big blue eyes and empty head of yours. Oh, Chris, what a thing to say about your own sister. Wait a minute. There's a little truck pulling up at the intersection now. Oh, do you think it's... Wait, let's flash the headlights. But suppose it's not him. He answered. It's him, all right. Now just sit tight. Is that 
you, Frankie? Pull in behind us. Stop and cut out your lights and then come back here. Where's Frankie? Do what I tell you. Just sit right where you are, Bunny. What have you got there? A jack handle, darling. I thought Frankie was going to be here. Have you got the ten grand? Sure. Where is it? Right in this envelope. Cash? Yes. That's all I wanted to know, Mr. Fuck. Now, this envelope for me, and one for him. There. And that's that. Chris, you're not going to leave him there. Sure. Oh, pull him out of the middle of the road. He might get hurt. And now, before tonight's FBI file resumes, as it will in just a moment, a word about psychology from our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society. This week at the Equitable Society, I had lunch with a brand new policyholder whose lively conversation made me feel better myself. And I asked him, do all the folks from your part of the country talk with so much pep? Well, he grinned at me and said, well, I come from a lively state, but right now I've got more pep than I've ever had in my life. You see, I've just invested in life insurance with my town's Equitable Society representative. And you know, a very interesting thing is happening to me. I feel my worries dropping away, and I never knew till now how they dragged me down. Yes, sir, my mind is beginning to function at full speed, not just part of it, but all of it. All the things that have been holding me back are disappearing. The whole world's a grand place. Yes, it's great to be alive when a man's mind is at peace. Well, you know, you're likely to benefit in more ways than you realize when you let your Equitable Society representative help you get free from whatever financial worries may be destroying your peace of mind. With his help, security comes easily, for he's an expert in protection. And he represents an institution which has been a tower of financial strength and stability since 1859 the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Yes, this week, and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society has been building security for you, your home, and your country. And now, back to the FBI file... The Nylon Hijacker. The frame-up crime is one of the most popular instruments of revenge employed by members of the underworld society against each other. But in planting clues intended to incriminate their foe, They rarely fail to leave some track which leads eventually to their own guilt. It was nearly midnight before a highway patrolman discovered the body of the man named Fulton lying on the road about 100 yards from the highway intersection. Early next morning in the FBI office. Morning, John. Good morning, York. I think I finally got a line on Frankie Austin's whereabouts. Well... With any luck, we should pick him up this afternoon. Well, we certainly have... Oh, wait a minute, will you? Sidney speaking. This is Jersey Highway Patrol Headquarters, Mr. Sidney. Yes. We would have called you sooner on this, but we spent all night checking angles. Well, what have you got? Looks like something that ties in with the nylon hijacker. York, better get on the other phone and listen to this. Okay. All right, shoot. We found the body of a man named Fulton last night near the intersection of 64 and 22. Yes, we checked the identification card in his wallet and found out he's a dealer in women's stockings. Oh? The thing that really ties it in is the typewritten note we found on him. What is it? It said 3,000 pairs of nylons would be delivered to him at the intersection last night at 10 o'clock. Fulton was to bring $10,000 in cash with him. Oh? Well, who signed that note? It was just signed Frankie. Well, that must be Frankie Austin. Uh, do you know whether Fulton had the money with him when he got there? checked his office a while ago. He drew that much from the bank yesterday about noon. 
Well, I see. Well, Special Agent York is leaving here at once. He'll go over details with you and check on the scene of the crime. Right. Thanks a lot, officer. Bye. Goodbye. Well, that seems to be the clincher on Austin. Yeah. York, tell me where you think he's going to be this afternoon. While you're gone, I'll have somebody hop out and pick him up. Right. Austin. Yes, sir? You might as well come clean. The evidence against you will be here any minute now. I don't care what evidence you got. I didn't knock that guy off. What about the note? How many times do I have to tell you? It's a frame. Now, who would want to frame you? I don't know. Why would they want to frame you? I don't know that either. Then what makes you so sure it's a frame-up? Look, gee, man, I tell you, I didn't have Maybe you tried to, to cut that. somebody out after hijacking that truckload of nylons. That's a lie. It was my own job. Well, at least we got that much settled. Okay, okay. So I knocked off the truck, but I didn't kill that guy Fulton. Then where were you at 10 o'clock last night? I wasn't wherever he was. Can you prove that? Sure I can. Well? I was at a certain dame's house. I thought you were married. I am married. Does your wife know about the other girl? What's that got to do with proving where I was last Are night? Are you still living with your wife? What's that got Austin, to... Austin, answer my question. I walked out on her yesterday. Have a fight about the other girl? My wife's sister started it. She hates my guts, and when she found out about that thing... Can I come in, John? Yes, come in, York. I've been waiting for you. Oh. Is this Frankie Austin? Yes. We've been having a little talk. Well, what did you get? Well, here's the note that was found in Fulton. Let me see it. Please. Right. Thanks. Austin. Yeah? Is that your signature? Let's see. There you are. Yeah. I didn't write anything like that. I don't think Austin killed Fulton, John. Oh? That's what I've been trying to tell him. You see, in addition to Fulton's footprints at the scene of the crime, I found some made by high heels. A dame. And, John, there's traces of woman's face powder on the note as if it had been carried in a handbag. Hey. You can even smell it. Hey, wait a minute. I'm beginning to get the whole picture. What do you mean? I told you this was a frame. And now I know who's behind it, my sister-in-law. How do we know she wasn't working with you? Look, believe me, she wasn't. She hung this on me. Where can she be located? Wherever my wife is. All right, Austin. We'll check on your story. Bunny? Yeah? Bunny, ain't you packed yet? Oh, I'm having a terrible time, Chris. I can't get everything in. Look, we're wasting time. We gotta get out of here. We ain't coming back. I've got to take everything. And this book just won't fit in. So what? Leave it. Oh, I couldn't, Chris. It's my memory book. Look, stupid. You'll have the rest of your life to read it if the cops come here. Now, forget it. Why should the cops come here? Because we killed a guy, remember? Yeah, but you said they were going to blame Frankie for that. (sighs) That's why you put that note in Mr. Fulton's pocket. Bunny, please, just keep moving. Okay. Have you got that address? Uh, it's on the table there. I tore it out. Right. Where are we going? Wherever the first thing's leaving for, and I hope it's Mexico. Mexico? What's the matter with that? But I can't speak Mexican. That is not your big handicap, kid. Come on, shut that bag up. All right, all right. I'm ready. Okay, now let's get out of here fast. Nobody home, John. Hmm. Well, we have Austin's key and a search warrant. Let's go in. Right. Go ahead, Joe. You. Man, I'll say they're not here. Look at the mess. Yes, well, let's take a look around. They didn't bother to take half of their clothes with them. Well, with $10,000, they wouldn't need to. Hey, we must have just missed them. Yeah? Look here. Cigarettes still burning in the ashtray. Oh. Well, now the question is, are they going underground in this area, or are hey, they going to... What have you got? Oh, maybe nothing, but... Look at this newspaper. What about it? Oh, it's lying over there open at this page. Yes? And there's a piece at the bottom corner missing. Yeah, and it wasn't clipped out either. No, it's torn out like whoever did it was in a hurry. What's the date on that paper? Uh, it's it's this morning's. Okay, get on the phone, ask the newspaper what's printed on page... Uh, 26. Page 26 at the bottom of column... column 8, and hurry. Right. 
But I tell you, we have no tour leaving for Mexico just now, madam. Then what have you got? And don't call me madam. I'm sorry. <laughs> He thinks you're married, Chris. Shut up. Here's what we can do for you. Shoot. Uh, we can get you on a train leaving in one hour for New Orleans. And from there, you can take a banana boat. A banana boat? What's that? One that carries bananas, obviously. Okay, okay. Uh, Fix us up on that. But don't you want to know where the boat's going? Just book us and make it snappy. Very well. May I have your names, please? This is uh, Frankie Austin uh, and Miss uh, Christine Wilson. Uh, who are you? How did you know our names? We're special agents of the FBI. Huh? The FBI? That's right. You're both under arrest for murder. Mur- Chris, I told you we should Shut up. It's too late for that, Miss Wilson. You've left tracks a mile wide, including the ad for this travel agency torn out of this morning's newspaper. All right. Come along, both of you. The three criminals in tonight's case were all punished to the full extent of the law. Frankie Austin was sent to a federal penitentiary for hijacking. His wife received a long prison term for her part in the killing of Fulton. And his sister-in-law was convicted of murder in the first degree. Whether the female of the species is more deadly than the male or not, In the field of human crime, she operates under the same handicap as the male. The same handicap which ultimately defeats all criminals. The inevitable clues which sooner or later fasten upon them the verdict of guilty. Before you hear about next week's thrilling case from the files of your FBI, the Equitable Society wants to tell you about a citizen of whom your community can well be proud. And I mean your neighbor, the Equitable Society life insurance representative. Look to him for the financial security of life insurance. He's a man ready to serve you in the same spirit in which throughout 86 years, The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States has always served its members. His every working hour is devoted to building security through life insurance for you, your home, and your country. Next week... We will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swampland Kidnapping. The incident used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Swampland Kidnapping. On this is your FBI.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In just a moment, we'll bring you This is Your FBI. Every week, millions and millions of people listen to this program. That is proof of national interest in one of our great national services, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And the sponsor of This Is Your FBI, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, is proud of this national interest in security. For this is the spirit that prompted the Equitable Society's founders 86 years ago to create a life assurance society dedicated to financial security. And today... Three and a quarter million members of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States bear witness to the usefulness, strength, and stability of an organization that by serving Equitable Society members serves America. Tonight's FBI file, The Swampland Kidnapping. Stretching almost from coast to coast across the southern portion of the state of Florida is the great American jungle known as the Everglades, a vast and uncharted reptile-infested area of treacherous cypress swamps and marshlands, into which only the most foolhardy would dare to venture without a guide. And, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, sometimes it can be a grave mistake to venture into the Everglades with a guide. A few miles inland from the Gulf Coast and reached by a crooked chain of stagnant swamp lakes is the ramshackle cabin of Tom Blanton and his wife, Bess. But little sunlight manages to penetrate the patchwork canopy of intertwining cypress trees. It is fading rapidly now as Blanton makes his way along a footpath between bogs up to the cabin by the back way. You can wash up, Tom. Supper's most ready. Yeah, powerful hungry, too. Did you fix up that whole mess of catfish? I... Bess. What, Tom? You got three plates on the table. Didn't you see his motorboat tied up to the root? I come the back way. Whose boat? We got pretty special company, Tom. What company? Who's come here, Bess? Somebody we ain't seen in a mighty long time. Who are you talking to? Now, Tom, don't go getting all right. I riled. said, who are you talking about? Our boy, Danny. So he came back huh, after I told him not to. Tom, what do you think? Danny's been to all them big cities like Chicago and New York. And he can start back from right now, too. Now, wait, Tom. When I run him off from here, I said it was for good, and I meant it best. But Danny's our boy. He ain't none of mine no more. Tom is just here for a visit. Well, he ain't going to stay here another minute, Doc. Can... Hello, Pop. Your welcome's most touching. Now, Danny, he don't mean what he said. It was just... You shut up and keep out of this, Bess. Yeah, ma, you keep out. This is between me and the old man. I'm giving you five minutes, Dan. Get your stuff and get out of here. You heard, ma. I come here for business. No. And I'm staying for a while. Why, you low-down swamp rat. Danny, what are you doing with that pistol? Stay where you are, Pop. Danny. You're yellow, huh? Have to pull a gun on me. I just wanted to stop you with it before I had to hurt you with my hand. Just you put that gun down. We'll see whether you Shut can... Shut up and listen. I didn't come back here because I was dying to see you. What you want I here? as much use for you as you have for me. But here. Take a look at this. Dan, all that money. I'll pay for my keep, old man. And here's 50 on account. But... <laughs> look at him grab. Good Lord, this look. 
Fifty dollars. And there'll be more where that fifty come from if you don't ask a lot of questions. You mean it? I'm going down to coast tomorrow, and I'm bringing a friend back with me for a few days. Who is your friend, Danny? Now, Bess, Bess, look here. You, you, you heard what he said about asking questions. Put the supper on. Sit right down, son. Make yourself to home. And you call me a swamp rat. <laughs> Shortly after dawn, two mornings later, the well-to-do James J. Fillmore stepped into the small motorboat he had chartered for a day of deep fishing in the Gulf. But instead of the craft putting out into the Gulf, it cruised along shore for a few minutes, then suddenly turned into a stream leading back into the swamp country. I say, here, Captain, where are we going? The weather don't look so good for deep fishing, Mr. Fillmore. What? We're going fishing in the Everglades. The Everglades? Look here, young man, you might have consulted me before changing my plans. That might have spoiled my plans, Mr. Fillmore. What? What do you mean? Just take it easy. I've already mailed your wife in Sarasota some first instructions. You've done what? Sure. And if she does what I tell her to, everything will be okay with you. Look here, you don't mean you're... That's right, Fillmore. You're going to visit me for a while until your missus buys your bag. No, no, you don't. Turn this boat about right now or I... Take it easy, Wait, you feel more. Mrs. Fillmore? Yes. We're special agents of the FBI. Oh, yes. Please come in. The note instructed me not to call the FBI or the police, but I just can't cope with this alone. You did the proper thing in calling the FBI, Mrs. Fillmore. And you may be sure we shall do nothing that will further jeopardize the safety of your husband. Oh, poor Jim. If I had been home, maybe he, he would have taken me with him and this wouldn't have happened. You were not at home when your husband left? No, I... I'd been up in Tampa for a few days visiting friends. When did you return? Just last night. I found the note from him saying that he'd gone away on a hurried business trip. Did the note say where he was going? No. No, it didn't. Do you have any idea where he might have gone? No. We come down here every winter, and after a few weeks, Jim gets a little restless and goes to call on some of the people with whom he does business. I see. Well, may we have the note, please? Yes. Here you are. Thank you. Hmm. Look, Grant. Sarasota postmark, mailed right here in the city. Yeah. 6.30 p.m. yesterday. And Mr. Fillmore left home yesterday, so the abduction could have taken place right in this vicinity. Mm, Not necessarily. Kidnapping could have taken place in Palm Beach or wherever it was Fillmore went. In which case, the kidnapper came back here and mailed the letter? That would certainly be safer for the kidnapper than mailing it from his actual point of operations. What does it say? Your husband's plans have been changed, but do as you are told and you'll be... He'll be okay. But don't say what I'm to do. Don't call the police or the FBI. Don't get excited. Stay at home. You'll receive further instructions later. Well, what's the first move, Grant? We'll check the note for fingerprints and possible identification. Let's go. Not to ask any questions about him and his friend, Tom. Yeah, but I got—I reckon a man's got a right best to know what's going on under his own roof. Well, their business is their business, and you best leave them alone in there. But you seen the cut on that fellow's head, seems me. Danny said his friend took a fall in the boot. Uh, well, I don't believe it. Where are you going, Tom? I'm going in there and find out, but... Going somewhere, Pop? Look here, Dan, I want to... Shut up what... and sit down. Where's that box of writing paper I hid? Let me see now. Uh, uh, oh, here it is, Danny. Okay. My friend wants to write a letter. Look here, Dan, I, I want... shut up. If you want any more dough instead of a dose of lead, you'll stay shut up, okay? Okay. 
Okay, Fillmore, this time your wife's going to get a letter from you. No, she isn't. Take a sheet of paper out of this box with your own fingers. There's a pencil. I'm not writing any letter to anybody. No? And you won't get away with this. Kidnappers never get away with it. That really frightens me, you know. Maybe I better turn you loose. If you're smart, you will. Okay, Mr. Fillmore, I'll turn you loose. All right, you're joking with me, but... No, I'm on the level. You can go. But you'll have to get out of the big cypress swamp all by yourself. And on foot. If I thought you meant that... I said I was on the level. But remember this. I don't know nobody who ever got out without a guide. No? No. The swamp's full of rattlesnakes. Cottonmouth moccasins. Alligators. We even got lions in there, Mr. Fillmore. If one of them don't get you, the wrong step will. What do you mean? Sometimes it looks innocent, just like any other piece of ground, till you step on it. Then it's got you for keeps. You, you mean the... Yeah, the bog. You start going down, see? And you start yelling and screaming for help, and all the time it keeps sucking you down, down, down. You yell, you scream louder and louder and louder, and then all of a sudden... It's quiet again. You sunk out of sight. But maybe you can beat the swamp, Mr. Fillmore. There's a door you want to try? No. No, of course not. I haven't got a chance. Okay, then my services as a guide are going to cost you $50,000. So pick up that pencil and start writing what I tell you. Look, Grant. The ransom note was postmarked in Sarasota just as the other note was. Mm -hmm. I felt certain it would be. And the hideout can't be too far away. And we've got no lead to it. I know, but... And we still can't take any openly offensive action to uncover the hideout until Mr. Fillmore is out of danger. No, no, please don't. Are you positive, Mrs. Fillmore, that this note was written by your husband? Yes. Yes, it was. I'm positive. And he's pretty certain to be safe so far. But what are we going to do about the ransom? Well, my advice is to follow the instructions in the note in every detail. You mean... There's still time for you to draw the money out of the bank. Yes, then we'll have it in your mailbox down at the road by 10 o'clock tonight, as instructed. Well, I reckon I'd better get supper started before... Shh. Tom, what are you doing? Hush up, Bess. Danny catches you listening up there. I said, hush up. Okay, Fillmore, it's time I was starting to... You better come away from me. Listen, they're talking. My wife thought enough of you to leave the 50000 in the mailbox. Like I said, I'll come back and take you out of the swamp. If the money is not there, I'll come back anyway. And make sure you never get out of the swamp. Well, I'm a lot... What are they saying, Tom? You're a fool either way, because you'll never get away with it. As I told you before, kidnappers never get away with it. I'll worry about that, Fillmore. You just... He sure ain't going to get away with it, oh, mister. You've been snooping at the door, huh? I sure I have, I told and you... I told you to keep your dirty nose out of my business. I told you, Pa. Shut up, I... woman. Okay, so now you know what's going on. Can I say you ain't going to get away with Don't it? Don't figure on going to the cops, because I'll blast you. But even if you got to the cops, you might both be in a jam. What do you mean? After all, your house is a hideout, so you're both in it, same as me. Why, you low-down, crawling piece of... Don't try Tom. to get your gun off that chair, because I'm closer to it than you are. Danny! Oh. Danny! You killed him, Tom. I reckon it was him or me. I'm sorry it had to turn out this way, sir, but in doing so, it has brought me my freedom. So the least I can do is see to it that you are amply rewarded. I reckon that won't be necessary, mister. What do you mean? I mean we're going to collect that $50,000 now. In New England today, April 19th is Patriot's Day. Before returning to the case on the Swampland kidnapping, let me tell you what Patriot's Day should mean to Americans. 
This week at the Equitable Society, four famous lines from Emerson kept running through my mind. Lines written about something that happened on the 19th of April, 1775. The Battle of Lexington. The day right after Paul Revere's ride. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard round the world. Those heroic lines in praise of self-reliant men make your heart beat faster, don't they? And they should, because self-reliance is an American quality that is just as priceless today as it was in 1775. It's the backbone of the American way of life. And just to prove that it's still a factor in our country's progress, let me give you the number of people who belong to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. It's three and a quarter million. Three and a quarter million people, men and women, who have proved that they believe in taking care of themselves and their families by their own efforts. That's self-reliance for you. That's proof of thrift and cooperation, too. Together, these three and a quarter million people have built the Equitable Life Assurance Society into a fortress of financial strength. They've put together a great protective fund which gives each member far more security than he could achieve individually. They're carrying on that tradition, which enables us to say that this week and every week for more than 86 years, the Equitable Society is building security for you, your home, and your country. And now back to the FBI file, The Swampland Kidnapping. In following its policy in kidnapping cases of remaining quietly in the background during the ransom negotiations, the FBI greatly handicaps itself in the task of apprehending the criminal. But to the FBI, the safe return of the victim has right of way over all other considerations. After that, there is time enough to catch the criminal. And as the victim in tonight's case said, kidnappers never get away with it. Several hours have passed now since Tom Blanton shot down his son Dan during their fight in the Blanton cabin deep in the Big Cypress Swamp, where the kidnapped victim, James Fillmore, is being held. Just outside of Sarasota, the old house on the Fillmore estate is dark and seems deserted. But at a front window, three figures keep silent and constant vigil. The only sounds the rustle of the night breeze through the palm trees and the roll of the surf a hundred yards away. Can you see the dial on your watch, Grant? Mm -hmm. Two minutes of ten. Two minutes to go. He will come at ten, like he said, won't he? The note said only to have the money in the mailbox at the road by ten. But surely that means he planned to pick it up at that time. Well, we can only wait and see. But what if he doesn't come for the money? This crime's been committed for money, Mrs. Fillmore. I'm confident somebody will come for it. If they don't make it by ten, Grant, how much time... Shh. Listen. What was it? Thought I heard. Wait a minute. It's a car. Oh, thank heaven. Come on, let's make a move now. Watch. Must be pulling up to the mailbox now. I wish there were a moon. Somebody's getting out. Yeah. Can't tell anything about it from here, though. Just a shadow. Listen. He's opening the mailbox. Well, what are you young men waiting for? What do you mean? Aren't you going out there and catch him? Oh, no. What do you mean you're going to let him get away? Shh. We meant to let him get away, Mrs. Fillmore. You your mean? husband is not out of danger yet. It's our job first to get your husband back, and then to catch the kidnapper. I think it's safe now to go down and take a look at the mailbox? I think so. Let's go. Hurry 
and tie up, Tom. Did you get it, Bess? Was it there? Sure, I got it. Let's get in the house out of this rain. Oh, now you oughtn't to mind little rain now, Bess girl. We're rich. In the little rain. Looks like it's been raining here ever since I left. Now, Bess, don't go getting cantankerous. I'm holding you to your promise, Tom. You promised to take me out in this swamp if I'd done what you told me to do tonight. I will, I will. Now, come on. Well, I trust your mission was successful, sir. Sure thing. Best found the money, just like you said. And now that I've bought my freedom? You ain't got another worry, mister. Now you might as well go to bed and get yourself a good night's sleeping. Go to bed? Well, I ain't going to take you out in the swamp till morning, that's for sure. But uh, you will then? <laughs> well, sure. Me and my woman will be going away then ourselves. Very well. Good night, mister. Huh? About what? I'd like to turn him loose, same as you, but it ain't safe. What you mean? He knows who we are now, and he'll tell the police all about us. And no matter where we go, they'll be looking for us. Yeah. Sure, you're right, Bess. We can't let him go. But what are we going to do with Don't him? Don't you worry now. I'll figure that out come morning. And I think I got an idea already. You must go to bed, Mrs. Fillmore, and and try to get a night's sleep. I won't sleep a wink, Mr. Grant, until my husband is back home safely. Well, the note said he would be returned by morning. But what if something goes wrong? Oh, you mustn't think of that. Things do go wrong in these cases, I know it. We got a good picture of the kidnapper, Grant. Good. Picture? Yes, Mrs. Fillmore. We had planted an infrared camera in the mailbox. What? And it automatically took a picture of the person who opened the mailbox to get the money. And it was a woman, Grant. A woman? Here you are. Look. Hmm. Wearing a raincoat. I already checked on that, and I got our first big lead. What do you mean? I figured wherever she drove in from, it was raining. Uh-huh. Well, I checked with the Weather Bureau, and the only place it's been raining tonight is down in the Big Cypress Swamp area. Cypress Swamp, huh? Is... is your husband a fisherman, Mrs. Fillmore? Yes, he loves to fish. Has he ever gone fishing in the Everglades? Yes, he has. At a town called Everglades. Now we're getting somewhere. Come on, Monroe. That's where we're going. Are you the innkeeper? Yes, sir. We're special agents of the FBI. Uh, oh, what can I do for you? Do you know a Mr. James J. Fillmore? Why, yes. Uh, he come down here a couple of days ago for a little fishing. But you haven't seen him since? No, sir. Something wrong? Whose boat did he charter? Well, now you got me there. I know the regular charter boats was all busy. M- must have made a deal with one of the private boats. Would you know which one? Let me see, you know. Couldn't have been Charlie Bates. He just sold his little outfit a couple of days ago. Uh, who bought it? I think he said he sold it to Dan Blanton. Uh, he's been away a long time, Dan has. Just come back a couple of days ago. Where does Blanton live? Why, his folks got a cabin back in the swamps a few miles. Maybe they know. Could we get there tonight? <laughs> Couldn't possibly start for daylight. Even then, you need a guide, you know. I see. Do you recognize the woman in this picture? Here, let me see, sir. Why, sure, sure. That's old Tom Blanton's wife, Bess. Why? You rustle us up a boat and a guide, and you'll find out why. We hope. Yes? Come on out, mister. Best and me's ready to get going now. But uh, it's the middle of the night. I thought you said we couldn't leave before morning. Uh, we ain't all going. What? You see, Best and me was talking it over, and 
We decided since you know all about us, who we are and what we look like and all... Well? We decided it wouldn't be safe for us to turn you loose. Look here. You've got the money. What else do you want? Just like I said, we can't turn you loose. What do you mean? I mean we got to leave you behind. No, no, you can't do that. I'd never get out of here on foot alone. We ain't aiming for you to get out at all. What? Better go in the other room, Beth. Oh, you're wasting time, Tom. Get it over no, with. No, wait a minute. If the money you've got is not enough, I'll give you more. It's just like she said, we're wasting time. We can't take a chance on leaving you here alive. No, no, for heaven's sake, you can't do that to... Stand back, Bess, I'm going to... No, no! Drop that gun, Gladden. Who you would come busting in here like... Special agents of the FBI, and I said to drop that gun. I ain't aiming to drop no gun for no... Here. Take his gun, Monroe. Are you all right, Mr. Fillmore? Yes, thanks to you gentlemen. There seems to be one member of the party missing... Where's your son, Mrs. Blanton? His father here shot him and threw his body in a swamp bog. And that's what these two are about to do with me. All right, get out from there, Blanton. My wife. Is she all right? We telephoned her. She'll be waiting in Everglades for you when we come out of the swamp. Let's go. After having been tried for the murder of their son... Thomas Blanton and his wife, Bess, were both convicted and sentenced to die in the electric chair. There have been some abduction cases, such as the one you have just heard, in which the criminals were afraid to release their victims because of the information they could furnish the FBI or the police. The stupidity of this reasoning should be obvious. To add murder to the crime of abduction is to furnish one more indelible clue which serves only to shorten the criminal's road to inevitable justice. Before telling you about next week's exciting case, let me remind you again that just as you look to your FBI for national security... So to the Equitable Society, you look for the financial security of life insurance. Yes, like the FBI agent, the Equitable Society representative in your community is a specialist on the subject of security. His job is to preserve homes, to help keep children in school, and to make old age a time of happiness and contentment. It's a good job, and one that has won for him the respect and confidence of his fellow citizens who recognize his contribution to the security of you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Salesman of Espionage. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Salesman of Espionage. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American broadcast. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI.
This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. As you listen to the thrilling stories from the files of the FBI, one of which will begin in just a moment, you realize how solidly and firmly these FBI men stand for national security in nearly everyone's mind. And that brings up an important fact about the sponsor of this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. The Equitable Society stands for the security of life insurance in the minds of more than three and a quarter million Equitable Society policyholders. And with good reason. For the Equitable Society representative in your community is a trained man, familiar with life insurance in all its uses and applications. He's an expert in security, an authority on the subject. And he'll show you, without obligation, how to build security through the Equitable Life Assurance Society for you, your home, and your country. Tonight's FBI file, Salesman of Espionage. A few months ago, we presented a special version of the official FBI motion picture, House on 92nd Street which told for the first time the dramatic story of your FBI's war against some of the Nazi agents of espionage in America. Tonight, we turn back to the period immediately preceding December 7, 1941, and bring you another story of counter-espionage on the home front. We break the seal on a chapter from the file, German Operations Galveston. In the days immediately prior to America's entry into the war, increased FBI surveillance under a presidential directive had so restricted the maneuverability of Nazi agents known to the FBI that the Nazis were forced, in many cases, to employ professional artists of intrigue, those whose business it is to spy for monetary profit. In some cases, those agents were German, in some cases Italian, And sometimes, they were American. A few minutes ago on this particular night, a small cabin cruiser put out from a private pier near an isolated beach house somewhere in the Galveston area and headed out into the Gulf of Mexico. At the wheel, a young man about 22. His companion, a woman in her middle 40s. They're about four miles out now as the young man speaks to the woman. I say, Mother, we're in luck so far, but... But what, Richard? What if we should encounter the Coast Patrol? You have a permit for the boat, haven't you? Yes, but we hardly have a license to carry the kind of cargo we have on board. Let me worry about that, Richard. But suppose they should come aboard for inspection. I shall do the talking and no one will come aboard. But they just might. Richard, please. Okay. (sighs) detest violence of this kind. It's so uncouth. Well, there was nothing else to do after he repented and threatened to expose us. If we had let him get away, the jig would have been up for us. He was a handsome man, wasn't he, Richard? As I could tell, you thought so. Such a delightful cocktail companion, too. Well, getting back to business, Mater, what we learned from him should be worth at least a thousand dollars to the Germans. Nonsense, Richard. Two thousand, or they shan't have it. Very well. Uh, don't you think this is far enough out? Mm, I should think so. Okay, then I'll cut her down and let her drift while we do the rest. Can you manage alone? Yes, I think so. Well, here goes. Well, au revoir, old dear. And thanks for the information. Two days later, 
Agent in charge Harrison of the Houston field office of the FBI, some 50 miles from Galveston, is at his desk when... Harrison speaking. This is police headquarters, Galveston, Mr. Harrison. Well, hello. I'm calling about the man reported missing the last two days. The construction engineer? Yes, sir. His body was found washed ashore this morning. So? The information he was known to have had on his person is missing. Well, it's not hard to tell who has the information by now, but who procured it for them is another problem. Is there any further assistance we can give you? Yes, for the time being, I'd like you to keep the discovery of the body quiet. We'll be glad to cooperate with you. I feel sure this is the work of professionals. If we can discover who they are, then we'll have a murder charge with which to take them out of circulation. I see. How was the man killed? 32 caliber automatic. All right, I'll have one of our men hop down and check details with you right away. And thank you for calling. Say, Mater, are you expecting someone here? Not this evening, Richard. Why? Well, somebody just drove up in the courtyard. What? Well, who is it? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's the police. Nonsense. It's been 48 hours and there's been nothing in the papers or on the radio about it. Yes, but Mater... Moreover, there's nothing to connect us with it. Shall I go to the door? Wait. Look through the curtain. See who it is. Who is it? Looks like Mr. Sutter. Sutter. Go get him in quickly. And if he hasn't found out about the other night, don't say anything. I'm very sorry I had to come here. Come in, Mr. Sutter. Close the door quickly, Richard. Hi, Littler. Never mind that nonsense. Now, what pleases the reason for this visit? I'm sorry. It was necessary, Mrs. Fairfield. I told you at the beginning, Mr. Sutter, no one from the legation must ever be seen coming to this house. I have told you this is most urgent. What do you mean, urgent? Richard... The United States Army is strengthening its harbor defenses. We must have a map showing the new installations at once. Oh, oh is that all? Richard. I repeat, we must have the map at once. I cannot work miracles, Mr. Sutter. I'm aware of that, Mrs. Fairfield, but uh, I may have a new contact for you who can get such a map. Who? Here is his name and description. And who is this Mr. Fargo? He came to my office this morning. Wanted to sell information. Information of what sort? I did not go into the matter with him. I said we could not entertain such a proposition because... Because Germany has no hostile intentions toward America. Yes, yes, go on. He said he could furnish information on almost anything. Do you consider him a good risk? That is for you to determine. We cannot assume that responsibility. Mm, I see. Well, where can Mr. Fargo be contacted? He lunches in the Palm Garden of the Gulf Park Hotel every day. Very well. Five thousand dollars for the map, Mr. Sutter. That is too much. One thousand. Good night, Mr. Sutter. Two thousand. Show Herr Sutter to the door, Richard. Very well. Five thousand. Thank you. Good night, Mr. Sutter. Will you please not join us at the Gulf Park for lunch tomorrow? Richard, can't you keep your eyes off those silly girls for a minute? Oh, they don't look silly from where I sit, Mater. We're here strictly on business. But our man hasn't shown up yet, so why can't I have a dance or two? Later, perhaps. But I think this is Mr. Fargo coming in now. Where? Medium built, dark complexion man. Oh. But don't stare at him. Well, what do you know? He's coming directly to our table. Mm, shouldn't wonder. Now let me do the talking. Good afternoon, madam. My name is Fargo. I believe you were expecting me. I beg your pardon, sir. May I sit down? It's less conspicuous for all of us that way. Thank you. Please. I'm sure you've made a mistake. Why don't we save time, madam? After all, you two were the only ones in the room who watched me closely as I walked in. I wasn't aware of that fact. You don't think I was fooled by Mr. Sutter's refusal of my offer? I beg your pardon? I expected him to refuse it. After all, he must play his little game. But making the offer was the only way I could make contact with his... <laughs> Shall we say, clearing house? Well, really. Richard, does your mother look like a clearing house? Would you like for me to go, madam? Forgive me. 
no, do stay. You've aroused my curiosity. Well, perhaps I can satisfy it on one point anyway. Namely? A certain construction engineer. I beg your pardon? The police found his body yesterday, washed up on shore. Oh, waiter, get this young man another glass of water. Just exactly who are you, Mr. Fargo? It's like I told Sutter. I'm a salesman, a dealer in all kinds of information, and... <laughs> no, no, I'm not working for the police, madam. I learned about the body because the police questioned me in connection with it for three hours last night. Oh. And now, what can I do for you? I'm afraid it's rather a large order. Good. It should net us both a large fee. I understand the United States Army is installing some new harbor. Let me speak to Harrison, please. This is Special Agent Fargo. Harrison speaking. This is Fargo, Harrison. We're in. Yes? Who there are two it? of them. Two of them. A woman about 45 and her son about 21 or 2. You're sure they're the ones? We should have seen the reaction when I dropped the bombshell about the washed-up body. Yes, so what happened? The son dropped his glass of water. Well, we've got to have more proof than dropping a glass of water. Right. I realize that. When is your next contact? As soon as I get them a map of the new harbor defense installations. All right, we'll fix up a fake map right away. Good, good. Drop it in the mail to me here at the hotel tonight. Then I can contact them again tomorrow as planned. Where? They think here at the hotel. But this time I want to go to their house, wherever that is. And I think I know how I can find out where it is. I'll be in touch with you again in two hours. Right, and don't get yourself shot. Oh, hello, Richard. I I thought you and your mother had gone. Oh, is that why you went to the phone so fast? What do you mean by that? Why? <laughs> Look, kid, go ahead and be suspicious. We have to be in our kind of business, you know, safer. Yes, yes, I know. Go tell your mother I've got the map thing in the works. I think we ought to have it by tomorrow. So, I'll see you then. <laughs> I called his roommate. He's not there. Well, sit down, Richard. He'll probably be along soon. Well, I'm glad you're so confident. Now, please, Richard, don't start that again. Mater, I'm surprised that you, having having had much more experience in this field than I, I, I'm surprised that you're not suspicious of him, too. It's because I've had much more experience than you that I'm not suspicious. Well, now is a good chance maybe to prove one of us is right. What do you mean? I could get into his room and have a look about it. Do no such thing. But, Mater... Now, stop it. Being utterly childish. Okay. I beg your pardon, madame. Here is a telephone message I was asked to hand you. For me? Thank you. Oh, here you are. Thank you, madame. It's from Fargo, I'll bet. Richard. Yes, what's his alibi? He says he can't meet us here. He'll be waiting for us at our house. Be at our house? How did he know where it was? What's the idea? Come on, Richard. We must get there quickly. You have quite a charming place here, Mrs. Fairfield. Oh? I've been looking around your garden while I was waiting for you. Well, I trust you enjoyed yourself, Mr. Fargo. Oh, I hope you're not angry with me. That's not exactly the right word, Mr. Richard, please. I was afraid the police might be watching my movements in the city, even though they turned me loose. In which case, it wouldn't look good for you two if you were seen a second time in my company at the hotel. I told you we'd have a good alibi. If you're wondering how I found my way here, young man, it was easy. I watched you drive up the hotel, took your license number, checked it for name and address, and... 
here I am. With or without the map? With. Shall we go inside and look it over? Very well. I'll be in in a few minutes, mate. I've got to look after a couple of things outside. All right, Richard. We'll be in the library. As you can see on the map, Mrs. Fairfield, I've added a few notes of my own because the map was a little short on detail. You seem to have a thorough knowledge of the harbor. Knowledge is what I have to sell, madam. Let's not be so formal. <laughs> so you don't share your son's suspicion of me? Your explanation a while ago was entirely satisfactory to me, but... But? You could be selling a false map, you know. <laughs> Even in our business, my, my dear... Some measure of trust between buyer and seller is needed. Yes, I've always found that necessary. Please forgive me. Shall we shake hands on it? Oh, better than that. Oh? We'll have a glass of sherry on it. Fine. And drink a toast to further mutually profitable ventures in the line of... I hope I'm not intruding. Certainly not, Richard. Mr. Fargo and I... Yes, Richard, you're just in time to join us in toasting the success of our first venture together. The map is a splendid one, Richard. Oh, that's good. Well, I shouldn't think you'd be so indifferent about it. Get the sharing glasses out of the cabinet over there. Oh, okay, okay. By the way, Mr. Fargo, there was one notation on the map I didn't quite understand. Well, what is that, Mrs. Fairfield? Uh, this one right here. Oh, oh, that. Well, what that means is... Sim- oh, Richard! Oh. Richard, what on earth do you mean by this? Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah here it is, look. Cigarette case. It's an initial cigarette case, Mater. And he stole it out of the boat locker where I had it hidden. That isn't yours. Whose is it? That cigarette case made her could have hung us. It belonged to the man we dumped overboard the other night. Back to the FBI file, salesman of espionage in just a moment. First, let me tell you something I learned this week at the Equitable Life Assurance Society. A representative told me about an interview he had with a very up-and-coming young man who called on him and said, See here, I've got about $500 a year free for investment of some kind. Some of my friends say, buy good stocks and bonds. Some say, start a savings account. Some say, buy a share in a small business. I get all kinds of advice. Now, what can you life insurance people offer me? Well, said the equitable representative, we've got a lot to offer. But first, let's get down to the bedrock difference that distinguishes life insurance from all these other things. Suppose you put $500 into the bank today. You create an estate worth just $500. But suppose you take that $500 and buy a $25,000 life insurance policy. Well, the minute that policy is issued... You have created an estate worth not $500, but $25,000. Get the point? With most forms of investment, you start saving, and then gradually, over long, hard years, you create an estate. But with an equitable policy, you create an estate first, and then you start saving it. Now, I'm wondering if you've ever thought about that. You see, there are so many things concerning life insurance we all should know. And the Equitable Society representative in your community is ready to tell you about them without any obligation on your part. Yes, hundreds of just such responsible, friendly, Equitable Society representatives are busy this week, as they have been every week for more than 86 years, helping the Equitable Society to build security for you, your home, and your country. Now back to the FBI file, Salesman of Espionage. Yes, even during the days before the treachery of Pearl Harbor forced America into war against the Axis nations, their agents were plotting against the security of the United States. But night and day, 24 hours around the clock, special agents of your FBI were on the job, defeating their conspiracies at every turn. 
And quite often, as events thus far in tonight's case demonstrate, the job involved great personal risk to the special agents assigned to this duty. It is 30 minutes later now, and down at the Fairfield Beach House, Special Agent Fargo has just regained consciousness after being struck down from behind by young Richard Fairfield. I tell you, Mater, you're making a mistake. You should have let me finish the job. Quiet, Richard. I'm... I'm surprised your first blow didn't, young man. Why did you want that cigarette case, Mr. Fargo? You mean, am I a plainclothes policeman? Was I going to try to pin the murder of the engineer on you? Frankly, yes. So? So, if you are with the police, Mr. Fargo, we shall have to take drastic steps to protect ourselves. Of course you would. Well? It's true. I was looking for incriminating evidence of murder. Uh, see, I told oh, you. Richard. But only because I wanted an axe to hang over you two as insurance against your double-crossing me. He's lying. I'm sure you've done the same thing with agents you've had to deal with before. It's an old trick, of course. I tell you, he's lying, Mater. Look here, kid. I've had enough trouble with you, you understand? So what? So I'd pin your wet ears back against your adolescent head if I weren't in a hurry to get downtown. Please, Mr. Fargo. You make one move to leave here, and I'll... Now, if you're a good little boy until I leave, I'll give you back your blackjack. I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Fairfield. I apologize for my temper. Richard but... deserved it. Thank you. Now, about my pay for the map. When Sutter's paid me, I'll pay you. You'll trust me that long, won't you? Well, I... Uh... <laughs> of course... Good evening, my dear. Harrison speaking. This is Fargo, Harrison. What's happened? We were worried when you didn't contact on time. I had contact with a blackjack. What? I'll be at the rendezvous in 15 minutes. Good. I'll be there before that. They're absolutely guilty of the murder, Harrison. Oh, I'm convinced of it, too, after all you've told me, Fargo. If I could only get one piece of really incriminating evidence. You couldn't find the gun they used. Nah, no luck. The cigarette case would have only been supporting evidence. Well, just the same, I hated to part with it. But it was more important to bluff my way out of a tight situation. Now, wait a minute. Yeah? Bluff? What are you thinking? If you bluffed your way out of their hands, maybe we can bluff them into our hands. What? You said Sutter installed one of his men yesterday in the hotel room next to yours at the Gulf Park. Yes. Yes, he's got a sound recorder that'll pick up anything I say in my room. Then maybe we can figure out some way to use that to our advantage. Yes? How's that? I'll go back to my office, Fargo. You go back to your hotel room and telephone me. And here's what you're to tell me over the phone. Mr. Sutter. Out of my way, quick. It wasn't necessary for you to come here for the map, Mr. Sutter. I was going to get it to you. I have not come for the map. What? I'm sure now that any map you may have gotten from Fargo is a fake. See there, mate, I told Shut you. Shut up, Richard. What are you saying, Mr. Sutter? There's an Italian merchant ship sailing in one hour. I've arranged safe passage for you both. Stop talking in riddles, please. This recording will explain everything. May I play it on your machine? By all means. I put an agent in the hotel room next to Fargo. Tonight he recorded this. Listen. FBI. The FBI. I knew it. Shut up. Hello, Harrison. This is Fargo. Yeah. Yeah, I've just come from the Fairfield house. No. No, I didn't find the gun they killed him with. But we won't need it. I'll have another piece of evidence in about two hours. It's just as good. Then we'll move in on That's it. enough. Why didn't you tell me you had murdered that engineer? We got the information from him. That's all you wanted, wasn't it? Come on, Mater. We'd better get away from here quick. Yes. Once on the ship, you will be safe. I'm afraid you're going to miss that boat, what? Mrs. Fairfield. Oh. Fargo. Special Agent Fargo. And this is Agent in Charge Harrison. We came in the back way while you were listening to Mr. Fargo's record. And you're both under arrest for murder. 
On what evidence? On your own admission of the crime to your employer, Herr Sutter. How did you know about the record? As you Nazis say, Sutter, we planned it that way. Mrs. Fairfield and her son, Richard were both tried and convicted on a charge of first-degree murder and paid for their crime in the electric chair. The members of your FBI join with all other Americans and all people of goodwill everywhere in the fervent hope that the day will soon come when men shall cease to spy against their fellow men, when all shall dwell on earth together in a spirit of mutual trust. But until that day comes, your FBI shall always go out to meet your enemies and to protect you, the American people. As you listen to This Is Your FBI, you must have realized why you look to your FBI for national security. Trained men such as these FBI agents are the best safeguards you can have. And you can depend upon the equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States for the same reason. Able, trained men. The Equitable Society's name is in your phone book. And the Equitable representative in your community is skilled in all phases of life insurance security. And experienced in its application to your particular problems. He specializes in building security for you, your home, and your country. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Singing Swindler. The incidents used on tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Singing Swindler on this is your FBI. This program came to you from New York. Next week, many cities and towns will be on daylight saving time. If your community switches to daylight time, this program will be brought to you at exactly the same time you have been hearing it. But, if you live in an area which remains on standard time, don't forget, this is your FBI, will be broadcast one hour earlier. This is ABC, the American... The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents... This is your FBI... This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community.
In a few minutes, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, sponsors of this program, will have an important announcement for home owners and for all families that are thinking of buying or building a home. If your husband or wife is not now listening to this program, get him or her. Both of you should hear the good news about America's finest plan for home ownership. A plan that can save you money and give you greater security in a home of your own. Tonight's FBI file, The Singing Swindler. It is a paradox of human nature that we are most easily deceived in that field which we know best. On strange ground, we protect ourselves with the armor of caution. While on familiar ground, we expose a vanity of infallibility, which, as demonstrated by tonight's case from the files of your FBI, is the Achilles heel by which we are felled. To the visitor, it must seem that every night is carnival night in the famous old French quarter of New Orleans. For when the sun goes down, the spirit of the fiesta comes up. And from the cafes and gardens of balconied houses, music and laughter pour out into a main stream of gaiety which courses through the narrow streets until dawn. On this particular night, in a small side street cafe, a tall, big-shouldered man sits alone at a table in the corner, sipping his fourth absinthe frappe and obviously enjoying the club's table singer as he finishes a ballad for a couple of honeymoons. You would reign all alone Like a queen on a throne If I Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Here, here's something for you. Oh, thanks very much. Now I better go over and see what he wants. Huh? Yes, sir. Uh, some special song you'd like to hear? Yeah, you bet your son. Sit down. Oh, thank you. What would you like? Another drink. Hey, waiter. Yes, sir. Hey, give me another one of these things. <laughs> what do you want? Oh, not a thing, thanks. Oh, what do you mean, not a thing? Everybody drinks with Bill Taylor. Now, what do you want? All right, scotch and water. Okay, waiter, you heard the man. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, what's your name, partner? Eddie Burnett. Well, put her there, partner. I'm Bill Keeler. I'm from Texas. <laughs> I kind of thought you might be. <laughs> yes, sir, Eddie. <laughs> Just made another killing in oil. I'm out tooting it up a little. I never drink when I work. Hey, I haven't given you any too, have I? Your record's clean with me, Bill. Well, here's 20. Uh, how's about another song? How's about Eyes of Texas? Great. Only, uh, you're going to be here a couple of minutes, aren't you, Bill? Well, where are you going, partner? Wait, here's another 20. Sit down. Oh, no. I'll be right back. I, uh, I just got to go over and sit with that old lady for a minute. Yeah? Well, what's an old lady like her doing around here alone? Well, she was telling me about it before you came in. Asked me to sing a special number for her. Is that so? Yeah. She said she and her husband always came here every year on their anniversary. Well, where's the old man? Well, it seems he died a couple of months ago, but she... Decided to come anyway. Well, now, what do you know about that? Here are your drinks, sir. Well, wait, uh, you see that old lady sitting over there? Yes, sir. Well, you bring her the best bottle of champagne you've got in the house and tell her it's an anniversary present. Yes, sir. Well, that's pretty nice of you, Bill. Oh, that's nothing, partner. The, the, that's what money's for. You know, it's funny you being in the oil business. What's so funny about the oil business? Oh, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, it's just that the old lady was telling me that her husband left her some oil leases. Yeah? On some land down in the Delta. Well, what do you know? Well, you know how old ladies are sometimes. Tell everybody their personal business. Sure, <laughs> sure. Say, uh, what'd she tell you about the leases? Well, she told me she didn't much know what to do about them, but she thought while she was here in New Orleans, maybe she could sell them. Sell them, huh? Mm-hmm. Well, buying them is my business. Well, do you want to meet her? Yes, I'd like to very much. Okay. I'll find out what hotel she's staying at. <laughs> well, no, I like you. 
I like you too, Bill. Uh, do me a favor before you go, will you? Why, sure, partner. <laughs> well, you got me doing it now. <laughs> What's the favor? Uh, sing Eyes of Texas. Okay. Hey, Joe, Eyes of Texas. The eyes of Texas are upon. Come in, please. Mrs. Grayson? Uh, yes. I have this note to you. Oh. Uh, well, wait till I put on my spectacles. Uh, dear Mrs. Grayson, this is the gentleman I spoke to you about last night. His name is Bill Till. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, won't you please sit down? Well, thank you, ma'am. Oh, it's very kind of you, Mr. Taylor, to take the time to come and see me. Oh, no trouble at all, Mrs. Grayson. That's my business, oil leases. My, how lucky I am to meet a nice, honest man like you. Well, now, don't you worry, Mrs. Grayson. Old Bill Taylor is known as the most honest man in the state of Texas. Well, isn't that nice? Your wife must be so happy. Mary Lou? <laughs> Happiest wife in Texas. Yeah, but uh, <clears throat> let's get down to business, Miss Grayson. Oh, all right. <laughs> but I'm afraid that you have to do all the work. Oh, I don't mind that, big strong man like me. I don't mind telling you. I've been trying to pick up some more leases down there on the Delta. Well, now, isn't it lucky that we met then? Sure is. For you and for me. Here. Here are the papers that I found in Dan's safe. Uh, there are five different ones. Uh, what do they all mean, Mr. Taylor? Now, they cover different parcels of land, but you just oh. leave everything to me, Miss Grace, and I won't cheat you. No, I don't believe you would, Mr. Taylor. Well, <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Now, well, let's see. There's some 300 acres in all. Is that a lot? Oh, you bet it is. Oh. By George, right smack in the middle of the delta. Well, uh, what do you think it's worth, Mr. Taylor? Well, I'm going to tell you right out. It's worth $10,000 in cash to me. $10,000? Old oh. Bill Taylor, most honest man in Texas. That's what it's worth, and that's what you're going to get. Lance, Oh, I'm so grateful to you, Mr. Taylor. What well, nonsense. This is a business proposition. Yeah, we'll just call up the public stenographer and draw up a transfer, and you'll have your money inside of an hour. My, my. Then, uh, it's a deal? Uh, yes, Mr. Taylor, thank you. It's a deal. Not many blocks away from the Bio Hotel, where the deal between Mrs. Grayson and Mr. Taylor was consummated, Special Agent Nolan of the New Orleans field office of the FBI is just entering the office of Agent in Charge Clark. Did you send for me, sir? Yes, Nolan. I just received this alert from Washington on a swindler. Oh? Two weeks ago, she put over a job in Miami. A woman? Yes. Last week, it was Atlanta. Well, it sounds like she might be working the Southern Circuit. Yes, that's Washington's opinion. And New Orleans might be, or might have been, her next jump. What's her specialty? Well, she's an elderly woman who pretends to have been widowed recently, wants to dispose of property that her husband left her. Mm-hmm. In Miami, she sold a fake deed to a citrus farm. In, uh, in Atlanta, it was a fake deed to a thousand acres of pine trees. Here in New Orleans, it might be anything from oil wells to a sugar plantation. Well, that's about it. Here's a description. Okay. Our Miami and Atlanta offices are working on further details of a modus operandi. Anything you want me to do? Yes, I want you to start checking on all hotels. <laughs> How much did he go for, Granny? Oh, you mean Mr. Taylor, Eddie? I wasn't thinking about Clark Gable. Don't be funny, young man. Okay, okay. Hey, but what about that cheap bum trying to double-cross you and get those leases cheap? Well, it just shows, Eddie, that what I've told you is true. Honesty is always the best policy. Yeah, yeah, I know. But you didn't tell me yet. Didn't tell you what, Eddie? How much did you get? Oh, uh, 5000 uh, And we've got Granny, now. don't uh, play games with me. How much did you get from the sucker? Oh, all right. I I got 7500 Why, Grandma, what big lies you have. Why, my boy. Can what? it. I know you got 10 Gs. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What'd no, you lie to me for? Well, I was going to save it for a rainy day. Okay, but don't save for the Johnstown flood. My 
gracious, here we've been standing, talking all this while. Eddie, we've got to move along. Okay, I'll be packed in a minute. I'm going to leave the door between our rooms open, just so you don't get any ideas about making the trip by yourself. Why, Eddie, if you're going to talk like that to me, well, I'm just afraid that I'll never be able to swindle anybody else with you again. And you know what they say in baseball? What? They say never break up a winning team. Agent in charge, Clark speaking. This is Nolan. Oh, hello. Did you get a lead? Not yet. I'm still checking hotels. Thought I'd better call in. Yes, I'm glad you did. I just received more details from Miami and Atlanta. Good. What's new? A woman has an assistant. Oh? Young man about 35, 6 feet, 180 pounds. He plays the part of a table singer in nightclubs and cafes. Oh, he's the bird dog in spotting potential victims, huh? That's right. And if they're working in New Orleans... He might be easier to get a line on than the woman. Well, then suppose I hop over to the quarter and start checking cafes. Right. I'll put another man on the hotels. How are you coming along, Granny? No, I'm almost finished packing, Eddie. Are you all finished? Yeah, all packed and ready to go. No, who can that be? Don't answer, Granny. Don't be silly, Eddie. You, uh, I've got to answer. You get back to your room and close the door. Okay, but I'll keep it unlocked just in case. Oh, oh, why, hello again, Mr. Taylor. May I come in? There's something I want to talk to you about. Why, of course. There's something we overlooked this morning, Mrs. Grayson. Overlooked? Uh, well, what was that? I reckon you could have knocked me over with a feather, ma'am. Oh, no, not a big man like you. Uh, but what came as such a surprise? You. Me? Oh, well, I'm sure I don't understand what you mean. What I overlooked was uh, checking those leases with the records. The records? Yes, the records at the county courthouse where all the leases are placed on file. Well, I told you, Mr. Taylor, that I don't understand much about those things you... See, my husband... It's too late for that, Mrs. Grayson. Too late for... Yes. You see, I called the Crescent City Oil Company right off. Well, what did you do that for? To see if they wanted to buy the leases. And what did they say, Mr. Taylor? Uh, they weren't interested. Well, now, I don't understand that. You told me this morning that the land was so valuable. It is valuable. But you see, there was a slight coincidence. A coincidence? Yes. It just so happened that the Crescent City Oil Company already owns those 300 acres. They do? Well, yet yeah, that is a coincidence, isn't it? Mrs. Grayson, I'm a big man in the state of Texas. I didn't call the police the first thing. Well, uh, uh, because I feel a little embarrassed, you know, telling them I got caught in a swindle like this. Oh, Mr. Taylor, please. But, uh, Mrs. Grayson, if I don't get that $10,000 in the next minute, I'm going to pick up that phone. Stay away from that door. Eddie. Well, dog my soul. Uh, Eddie, be careful with that gun. You're pointing it right at Mr. Taylor. Yes, I am, and it's loaded, too. Don't worry, Mr. Grayson. He's not going to do anything with the gun. I said stay away from that phone, and I meant it. Well, I certainly was buffalo. Don't come any closer, Taylor. Why not? This gun might accidentally go off. Uh, what do you want me to do? Stop coming toward me, Taylor. I'll give it up. <laughs> You see, Mrs. Grace and I told you Eddie wasn't going to do much with that gun. So you did, Mr. Taylor. I'll certainly say that for you. Now, Eddie, we're a pretty even match without guns. So get up. Oh, I got enough. Oh, no, Eddie. I just started to play this game. Get up. Look out, Eddie. Look out, Eddie. Come on, Eddie. Mr. Taylor. Oh. 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 I think you've just about got enough now, young man. So I'll call the police and let them... Oh, why in the world didn't you hit him sooner, Granny? Well, that was the first chance I had, Eddie. Boy, he's really odd. What'd you hit him with? That beautiful big vase that was on the piano. Oh, remind me to pay the hotel for it when we check out. Pay for it? Are you crazy? Now, Eddie, we must pay for it. You don't want us to get a reputation for not paying our bills, do you? Mm-hmm. 
Back to the FBI file in just a moment after an important message to American home buyers and home owners. This week at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, I heard a story of a little girl with tears in her eyes. Because of her, thousands of American home owners live in greater security today. Some years ago, the president of the Equitable Society happened to see this little girl crying as if her heart would break, while the sheriff's men moved her family's furniture out into the yard. On inquiry, he learned that her mother, a young widow, had lost their home through a mortgage foreclosure. Shortly thereafter, the president of the Equitable Society called his associates together and said, We're going to have a plan for homeowners to prevent tragedies such as this. A mortgage that will be as near foreclosure proof as possible. And so was started the Equitable Assured Home Ownership Plan, which offers you these five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. Immediately, the widow owns her home free and clear. Two, a special cash fund is built up, and it's always ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Four, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. Five, one low monthly payment covers everything and provides free and clear ownership in the time you select. Frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. If you are planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the Assured Home Ownership Plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, -E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now, back to the FBI file... The Singing Swindler. No one likes to admit publicly that he has been duped. That is human nature. And swindlers make capital of it every day. But this false expression of self-pride which restrains the victim of a swindle from going to the police sometimes goes a step farther. It urges the victim to take matters into his own hands. And this can prove to be a most costly procedure. A few minutes ago, agent in charge Clark of the New Orleans FBI office received a telephone call from police inspector Rickert. Clark and special agent Nolan have just now stepped off the elevator on the eighth floor of the Bio Hotel and reached room 824. Oh, come in, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Inspector. Mr. Tanner, this is Mr. Clark, and this is Mr. Nolan. They're from the FBI. Oh, mighty glad to see you men here so quick. We got here as soon as we heard from the inspector. Yes, Mr. Taylor. I called him as soon as I found out from the clerk at the desk about the old lady. Well, then the description checked, Inspector? Perfect. And it checked on her accomplice, too. A singer. That's the fellow. Goes by the name of Eddie Burnett. Well, what was the racket this time, Mr. Taylor? Yeah, Mrs. Grayson, if that's her name, she sold me some oil leases. They were fakes, naturally. Yes. How much did you pay her? Ten thousand in cash. Mm -hmm. And then? I found out they were fakes. I came up here to get my money back. Well, I wish you'd call the police sooner, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, every time I touch my head, I wish I had two. Inspector... Where was Mr. Taylor found? He was right on the floor, right over there. I see. The maid found him when she came to make up the room. How long ago did they check out? A little more than two hours ago. How did they leave the hotel? I asked the cab starter about that. He said they just walked out. But didn't they have any bags? Yes, that's what made the starter remember them. Nobody leaves the bayou with the luggage and carries it themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, they couldn't have walked far. My guess is they caught a cab at the corner. Yeah, that sounds logical. They did. They could have been at the airport in half an hour. We'll check the airport, Inspector. But I have an idea that if they were smart enough to walk away from the hotel, they haven't left such an obvious trail as that. Mm hmm I guess you're right. Now then, start a check on all railroads and airlines. I'll have Blackwell go to work on the bus terminals. Oh, uh, one more thing, Mr. Clark. Yes, Inspector? 
Here's some handwriting that might be useful. Uh, what is it? Uh, table singers. Yes. It's the note of introduction he wrote when I came to meet Mrs. Grayson. Well, thanks very much, Inspector. All right. And thank you, Mr. Taylor, for being so cooperative. Come on, Nolan. We've got work to do. Eddie, please speak a little more respectfully. And Eddie, must you sing all the time? What's the matter with my singing? I didn't say there was anything... I sing torch songs like Crosby. Well, let's drop the subject. All I ask is sing when you get paid for it. Okay. I meant to talk to you about that. You don't want me to pay you for singing in this room, do you, Eddie? No, no, that ain't what I mean. I mean, when do I go to work again? Now, you let me take care of the business end. I say we stay under for a little while. But the cops don't know we're in Chicago. Well, I certainly hope you're right, my boy. You know, I give you credit when you got it coming. It's pretty cute the way we got here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. Yeah, you feel pretty good today, don't you? <laughs> Why not? We've pulled three jobs and we've got over 28000 between us. Two more jobs, we'll have twenty-five apiece and... Well, then you can sing all day long. Okay, okay, only let's get the next job started. Oh, all right, if you're that impatient, go ahead and get yourself a job. You mean? Certainly, I never say anything I don't mean. All right, here I go. Oh, come in, Nolan. What's up, Clark? Memphis office just phoned. On the uh, Grayson case? That's right. The car the two of them rented here was found abandoned in Memphis. Well, that was pretty cute. The Memphis office took all the descriptions we wired out to the airport. And? And found the two of them had hopped a plane for Chicago two days ago. Well, that means they're probably still there. That's it. They've never worked that territory before. Look, there's a flight out of here in 20 minutes for Chicago. I'm going to be on it. Okay, I'll call and make your reservation. Good. Then call the Chicago office and alert them. And tell them what time I get in. Hello, this is Special Agent Clark. Will you put me through to Mr. Walker, please? Hello, Clark. Hello, Walker. Where are you? I'm out at the airport. I just got in. Any word? I'm sorry, Clark, but we haven't been able to dig up a single lead. We checked all nightclubs and theatrical agencies. No lead at any of the hotels either, huh? Well, unless the room clerks are lying to us, they haven't checked in at any hotel we've been to so far. Yeah. We're still working on the hotels, though. How do you account for the fact that he hasn't gone to work yet? From what the theatrical agencies tell me, this isn't a very good time for male table singers. Oh, what do you mean? I hear all the places are putting in girls. Girls, huh? Uh-huh. Uh, wait. I think I've got an idea. Anything I can help on? No, no thanks. I can handle this alone. I'll be in the office in about an hour. Yes? That's me, Eddie. Oh. What? Well, what luck? Ah, uh, nobody's booking any male singers. So I'll take a crack at this. Uh, uh, what's that? Just an ad in the afternoon paper. Huh? What does it say? Uh, some cafe wants a male singer, but I've got to write for an interview and an audition. Well, you're not worried about taking an audition, are you? Well, the job only pays 50 in tips. My, they don't know how lucky they are getting Crosby that cheap. Hello, Granny. Did you get a call yet, Eddie? No. Oh, well, don't worry. I'm sure you will. Uh, why, what are you doing, Eddie? Packing. Pa- what for? I did a little thinking while you were downstairs. What do you mean? Now, look. I don't like being the number two man in the act, Granny. What do you mean, Eddie? I mean I'm pulling out right now and taking all the dough with me. Eddie! Now, give me that dough and give it to me quick. Put down that pistol. Where's the money? Stop it, I tell you. I tell you, Eddie! Drop that gun, Vanessa. 
Stop it! Who are you? What's the idea? Special agents of the FBI. FBI? That's right. You answered our ad and wrote us for an audition, Burnett. Your handwriting tallied with some we got in New Orleans. From a Mr. Taylor. After being tried and convicted, Mrs. Grayson and Edward Burnett were sentenced to long terms in the federal penitentiary. Again, we repeat what we have stated before on This Is Your FBI. Swindlers could be put out of business overnight if you, their potential victims, would exercise the simple caution of investigating the stranger with a proposition before doing business with him. Until everyone does exercise that simple caution, your FBI will remain on the job 24 hours a day protecting you, their employers. You, the American people. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. Now a quick review of the important advantages offered homeowners and home buyers by the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Don't forget, the mortgage interest is only 4%. The mortgage is paid off in full if the owner dies. A cash fund is built up to be used in financial emergencies. If you are seriously interested... Get in touch with the Equitable Society representative in your community. He has literature that explains the assured home ownership plan clearly. Call him tomorrow. Call the number of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Carnival Killing. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight's broadcast was directed by William M. Sweets. The music was under the direction of Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This Is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Andre Baruch speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Carnival Killing on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. And now a special request to boys and girls. If your father and mother don't happen to be listening to This Is Your FBI Tonight, please get them. Tell them that the Equitable Life Assurance Society, the sponsor of this program, is going to make an important announcement to homeowners and to all families that are thinking of buying or building a home. Tell mother and dad they're going to miss something if they don't get the facts on America's finest plan 
for home ownership. Tonight's FBI file, The Carnival Killing. Day after day, the criminal goes on defying it. And as twice reflected in tonight's case from the files of your FBI... Day after day, he is caught up in its inevitability. The inevitability of that ancient truth which disciplines all human conduct, and from which there is no exemption. Be sure your sins will find you out. Our story tonight could take place in most any kind of setting you could name. And it could involve persons of most any rank or station in life. But it just so happens that this particular time, it actually took place in a carnival setting. That music, of course, is coming from a merry-go-round somewhere down the midway. And the crowd, just part of the Saturday afternoon throng. Over here to one side, the main money wagon. The attractive girl seated at the open window is the cashier. And the dapper young gent in the plaid suit and straw hat just walking up to her runs the concession just across the midway. Hi, babe. Hi, Larry. Well, how goes with the ump chase, huh? Oh, kind of slow. Mm, yeah, I got the same complaint. No booze? Not enough. But uh, here's a hundred you can salt away for us. Hey, that ain't bad. Well, if the suckers will start throwing hoops, I ought to take in another yard by shutdown. Keep slugging then, Junior. Then pretty soon, babe. You get that ring. You mean the big one? The one we've seen in St. Louis? <laughs> oh, are you kidding? That comes heavy, sweetie. Well, it was your idea. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll keep slugging for it. Here, give me uh, four rolls of quarters, huh? Mm-hmm. Here you are. Uh, see you later, babe. So long, Larry. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Well, we settled the intro real quick, didn't we? Did we? My name's Jack Crawford. What's yours? People who know me call me Babe. I'll buy that. You don't know me. I will. Fast operator. How long have you been waiting for that ring? You were on the Erie. That's right. Why should the ring interest you? With me, you could have had it by now. Stop, will you? I mean it. Look, that ring has a marriage deal wrapped around it, Misty. So, uh, I guess the show is over. Just the first act, Fred. What do you mean? Here comes the second act now. Oh, he's seen you talking to me. What's wrong with that? Larry don't like for me to fool around. No kidding. Okay, Mac, quit bothering to help and move along before I... Before you what? Just... Get moving, that's all. You remember me now, don't you? Don't you? What are you talking about? Babe, as an old friend, you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Not even with a mustache. Am I right, Mr. Hampton? His name ain't Hampton, it's Marlin. Back in Terra Hart, it was Hampton. Larry, what's this all about? Oh, he's got me mixed up, that's all. Babe, tell the guy to quit covering, will you? It just so happens that your boyfriend here is a deserter from the army. What? And on account of that, the FBI is looking for him. And That's it... enough. I figured it would be. Larry. Now, as I was saying, back in Terre Haute, his name was Hampton. We were old pals back there, right, Larry? Well, even though he won't admit it, honey, we were. And because we were pals, I'm going to have to ask him for a little favor. What do you want? I got to get out of circulation for a while. And this looks like a good place to do it. So, I'm moving in with you. Now, wait a minute. And remember, before you make any beefs, that I'm in a real good spot to blow a whistle. So, how about it? Okay. Well, that's the end of the second act. Third act coming up, eh? <laughs> Oh, 
A few miles away in the St. Louis office of the FBI, agent in charge Phillips has just summoned Special Agent Gaynor to his office. You want to see me, Mr. Phillips? Yes, Gaynor. Well, what's up? Just got a follow-up on that Oklahoma bank robbery yesterday. Really? The agents down there caught two of the men early this morning. Did they talk? Yes. Here's the description of the third man, still at large. Hmm. Has it been checked with Washington? That's Washington's check on it in your hand now. Just came in on the teletype. Oh. The man's name is Jack Crawford. He's already served two years for robbery, too. His home state is Indiana, and he just may be headed for there. Which could bring him through Missouri and maybe even St. Louis. How was he traveling last? In the car they used in the robbery. There's an alarm out on it now. Well, he may abandon that soon. If so, it'll make his trail that much hotter. Well, are we getting a set of fingerprints and a photo on him? In the morning, airmail. Good. You better contact police headquarters here right away and see that they're up to date on the case, and state police, too. Right. Just a minute. How are you tonight, babe? Hello there. Got sick of hanging around Larry's trailer. Thought I'd come over and see yours. Uh-huh. You asking me in? Okay, come ahead. Thanks. Hey, it's real nice. All them curtains and stuff, just like home. Thanks. You, uh, through work for the day? No, I just got two hours off. Well, I got two free hours myself. Mind if I sit down? Go ahead. Thanks. Where's Larry? Out clipping the suckers, I guess. <laughs> you know, this county business is quite a touch. Imagine making a living out of people throwing hoops at little kids. Does Larry know you came over here? Why? He ain't gonna like it. That gonna bother you? No. Then, uh, let's not worry about him, hmm? Okay. Tell me something, will you? What? It's ring business. You really gonna marry the guy? That's the general idea. Why? Why do most people get married? Well, the book says love. You know, that moonlight and roses stuff. But, uh, I don't seem to catch any of that going on with you. You're doing an awful fast ad up, mister. No. Just watching history repeat itself. What do you mean? I already told you I knew Larry back in Terre Haute. So? So I've seen him in action with other dames. He's one of them nice guy characters. You know, sweetheart, that's all right for squares, but it ain't for you. Am I right? Want some coffee? Am I right? You're right. You know what you really want? Someone like me. I'm going to make that coffee. Wait a minute. Come in. Well? Now look, sweetheart. Who is it? Me, Larry. Oh. Let him in. But he... Let him in. Hiya, honey. I just got a minute and I thought I'd... What are you doing here, Jack? Just dropped in. Babe, has this guy been bothering you? No. No, he... He, he just came here looking for you. He knew where to find me. He came here to see you. Look. Be... Remember, I'm your guest. You forget it, you'll be Uncle Sam's guest. So just take it easy. See you later, babe. Phillips speaking. Now, this is Gaynor, Mr. Phillips. Oh, got a lead on Jack Crawford? Yes, the police just found his car. Where? He drove it into a garage here in St. Louis yesterday morning early and apparently abandoned it. That gives him over a 24-hour start on us. I know. Any new auto thefts reported? No. And start checking bus, railroad, and airline terminals and ticket offices. You've got his photo. Yes. If he didn't steal or buy transportation out of here, then he's somewhere in the vicinity. I hope he is. So do I. Keep in touch. Right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey, babe. Hey, babe. What is it, Larry? I thought you were going to wait for me at the money wagon. I didn't say I would. But you always do. Look, I've got to get back to the trail. Well, wait, wait a minute, babe. Look, i got to talk to you. Save it, will you, Larry? I'm tired. Well, I just wanted to tell you, honey, I, I'm sorry about this afternoon. I didn't mean to blow my top. But that guy coming to see you, finding him there, I just couldn't take you it. You told me all that. Good night, Larry. Uh, let me come in a minute, babe. Uh, I've got to talk this out with you. It's been talked out. Please, huh? J- just for a minute. Okay, come ahead. Don't forget this is getaway night. We've got a long trip ahead of us. I know. Can you turn on the light? Yeah, sure. There we are. Hiya, Larry. Jack. What are you doing here? Waiting for babe. What for? Because I wanted to see her. Look, you get out of here. Get out quick. Now, wait a minute. I think Babe should have something to say about that. You want me to go, hon? Leave her out of Look, this. Look, please, don't start anything. Yeah, the army might not like it. Jack, I got some news for you on that army business. It isn't going to work anymore. No? No. You know why I deserted. You know I went over the hill because my mother was sick. And at the time, I didn't have guts enough to go back. But your moving in on me has changed my mind. This hero talk is for your benefit, honey. No, no, no. It's for something I found again after a long, long time. My self-respect. Oh, this is great. Tell us more, Daddy. I've finished. Now get out. What for? You're going to turn yourself in. There's no need for me to get out. Ever. What do you mean? You tell him, babe. No, Jack, please. Okay, then I'll spill it makes no difference to Babe whether you go through with this patriotic pitch or not. What? She's changed her mind, too. Babe, what's she talking Look, about? let's not argue any more tonight, huh? Honey, might as well know. Well? She's found herself a real guy. Why, you dirty... <coughs> Jack! Jack, darling, did he hurt you? Yeah, he hurt me, but not as bad as this bottle will hurt him. Oh. <coughs> Hit him awful hard. So what? He's bleeding awful bad. Jack, I think he's dead. Now, before the FBI file on the carnival killing resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, I met a man with one of the biggest smiles I've ever seen in my life. Boy, do I feel good, he grinned, and he waved a paper at me. You see that, he said? That's the mortgage on my house. And today, it's just a piece of paper. That mortgage is all paid off every last cent. I own my home free and clear, and nobody can take it away from me. Well, there's no question about it. One of the red-letter days in any man's life is the day he pays off his mortgage. And that's a day that's not too far off when you buy a house through the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. A plan which combines these five advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. Immediately, the widow owns her home free and clear. Two, a special cash fund is built up. And it's always ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, mortgage interest, not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Four, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyers' fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission or bonus charges. Five, one low monthly payment covers everything and provides free and clear ownership in the time you select. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the assured home ownership plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. 
the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Carnival Killing. Sometimes fate inflicts a far severer penalty for a crime than justice would have meted out. Justice would not have demanded the life of the army deserter, the man called Larry Marlin, but fate in the form of a conspiracy by one who found out his crime did take his life. Though however harsh the penalty, it confirms the inevitability of that truth. Be sure your sins will find you out. And as for the man who took his life... It is next morning now, and in answer to a call from police headquarters a few minutes ago, Agent in Charge Phillips of the FBI's St. Louis office, accompanied by Special Agent Gaynor, have just entered the city morgue. Here's the body right here, Mr. Phillips. We knew, of course, this couldn't be Jack Crawford. No, that's not Crawford. But since no identification was found on him, we thought we'd better check with you in case he just might be somebody else the FBI was interested in. Glad you did. Took a set of fingerprints for you. Here they are. Thanks. Anything familiar about him to you, Gaynor? No, I, I can't say that there is. Look again, Gaynor. Forget there's a mustache on him. Yes. Yes, there is something kind of familiar about that face, now that you mention it. Lawrence Hampton. Hampton? He's an army deserter. We took his photo out of the files just last week. Oh, sure, I remember. I'm certain it's he. Well, the fingerprints will tell for sure. Where was this body found, officer? Way out near the edge of town. South side. Just before daylight. It's a nasty gash on his head. Yes. We thought at first he was a hit-and-run victim. But we checked some fragments of glass. We found the wound. They weren't from headlights. What then? They appear to be pieces from a whiskey bottle. And this was deliberate murder. I'd think so. Any trace of the whiskey bottle near the body? No, and we did a thorough search for it, too. It's my theory that the murder was committed somewhere else, and the body dumped there. Where are his clothes? We had them outside in the locker. Gainer. Yes, sir? Check them over. See what you can find. Right. I'm going to take these prints back to the office and make sure they're Hamptons. Babe? I thought you were working right through. Well, I had to get a relief. I feel awful. What's the matter? Now, what do you think? Look, forget that, will you? Jack, how can I? Nothing's going to happen, baby. When they find the body, they'll think he was hit by a car, that's all. Besides, he's a lamester. The cops won't care how he got it. That part of it don't bother me. What are you feeling so bad about? The way it happened. You're killing him like that. Look, how many times do I have to tell you I did it in self-defense? Besides, it brought us together, didn't it? Yeah. All right. Anybody been asking for him? Sure. What'd you tell him? Just like we made it up that he went off on a bender this morning as soon as we hit the lot. Probably wound up in St. Louis. That should cover it good. Jack, let's get out of here. Quit the show? Yeah. Look, honey, if you take a run out, you might as well put an ad in the paper that you've done the job. i done it. Sure. So take a pill for your nerves, kid, and go on back to work. Everything's going to turn out fine. Can I come in, Mr. Phillips? Yes, come ahead, Gaynor. How'd you make out? I have plenty to report. Good. Oh, uh, by the way, the victim is definitely Hampton. I checked the prints. And I checked his clothes. What'd you find? Well, nothing much until I got down to his shoes. What about them? 
Well, I examined the heels. Uh-huh. And they were made of rubber, and yeah. stuck in the indentations were bits of what turned out to be popcorn, peanut shells, and sawdust. That sounds like you've been to the circus. But there aren't any playing in St. Louis. Well, there was a carnival playing quite near where Hampton was found. It closed last night. I see. Now, if the officer's theory was right, if Hampton was killed elsewhere and dumped on the highway, the murder might have been committed on or near the carnival grounds. Yes. And I'm checking to find out where the show moved to, and... Well, meanwhile, I wondered if I should cooperate with the local police and hop out and go over the grounds with them. Good idea. Get on it right away. Phillips speaking. Now, this is Gaynor, Mr. Phillips. Oh, where are you, Gaynor? I just left the carnival grounds. Any luck? Yes, plenty. We found a number of blood-stained fragments of the bottle that was used in the murder. That was a break. I know. The neck of the bottle was intact, and there appears to be a good set of fingerprints on it. Fine, fine. And we found these fragments where the trailers had been parked, the trailers that the people in the show lived in. I see. Now, that could localize the killing. Yes. Now, has any report come in on where the show moved to? Not yet. It shouldn't be hard to find. Well, I'll bring the section of the bottle with the prints back with me. Good. We can do a quick check in our files before sending them on to Washington. Yes, sir. I'll be right over. Gainer. Yes, sir? Will you put those prints under the glass again, please? Yes, sir. There's something familiar about that one whorl. Hand me that stack of prints there. All right. I'm just going to play a hunch. Here you are. Now, let me see. That's identical. Those lines check. Little break there. It's the same gainer, the same prints. My hunch was right. Well, who is it? Our elusive friend, Jack Crawford. Crawford? Yes. Really? Well, how did he and Hampton ever get together? Well, that's what we have to find out. You say this bottle was found near where they parked the employees' trailers? That's right. Well, there's a chance Crawford is somehow linked with that show. Well, a report just came in. We know they play where they're playing now. It's only 50 miles from I here. I think we'd better get out there fast. Who is it? Let me in. Come on. What'd you have the door locked for? I ain't looking for company. Thought you were going to keep working. Oh, Jack, I had to quit. A thousand pills wouldn't do me any good. No, I won't. mean it. Every time a stranger had come up to the booth, I think it was a cop getting set to ask a few questions. I felt people standing in the crowds looking at me like they were watching my every move. Hey, take it easy, will you? Will you take I it easy? I can't go on with this anymore. we got to get out of here, and right now. What will we use for dough? I got Larry's money. Some he gave me toward the ring. How far will that get us? I don't care. we got to go now. Okay, babe. We do it your way. But how do we explain pulling out? Well, I'll say that I'm going to St. Louis to look for Larry. That'll do, I guess. You go get the car. It's parked in the lot. Okay. Here we are, Crawford. Huh? Don't try anything. Jack, who's that? We're special agents of the FBI. What? We want to talk to you both about the murder of Larry Hampton. Jack Crawford was sentenced to a long term in the penitentiary for the murder of Larry Hampton. His female companion was also sent to prison for her part in the crime. Why do criminals go on defying the inevitability of that inexorable truth? Be sure your sins will find you out. Why do they go on making their futile challenges to the inescapability of justice? Why do they play a game they cannot possibly beat? It's not even a gamble, for a gamble presupposes a chance to win. But justice gives no odds. Justice is unbeatable. (laughs) 
Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment. But now, let me refresh your memory on the more important features of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Remember that the mortgage interest is only 4%. Remember that one low monthly payment covers everything. Remember that if the owner dies, the widow owns the home without any mortgage at all. Yes, the Assured Home Ownership Plan is practically foreclosure-proof. These are only a few of the advantages of the Assured Home Ownership Plan. To get the full story, talk to the Equitable Society representative in your community. Ask him for literature that gives you all details. Look in your local phone book for the name, The Equitable Life Assurance Society, E-Q-U-I, T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Fugitive Horse Player. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Fugitive Horse Player. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. planning to buy or build a home, then we suggest that you have pencil and paper ready to make notes when the Equitable Life Assurance Society, sponsor of this program, tells you about America's finest plan for home ownership. The announcement on this plan is due in about 14 minutes. Have your pencil ready because this Equitable Society plan can save you money and give you greater security in a home of your own. Tonight's FBI file, The Fugitive Horse Player. There are many decent, honest people connected with the sport of horse racing. These people are interested in trying to keep the sport clean and well-conducted. However, there are millions of loose dollars connected with the business. And where you find millions of loose dollars, you will also find many loose characters. Parasites who will engage in any amount of hard work to make a dishonest dollar. 
Such a parasite of racing is the talc. The genius with patches in his pants who offers to make you a millionaire overnight. Sometimes the price is $10, sometimes the price is $5. And sometimes, as you will learn from tonight's case from the files of your FBI, he takes his payment in blood. Just about the time a recent meeting opened at an eastern racetrack, a shabby office was opened in the large city nearby. There was more than coincidence in the twin openings, because the office was to be the headquarters for Joe Muncy. Official title, Joe Muncy Tout. Muncy, a trimly built dapper man, is sitting at his desk. Brownie, his girl, his secretary, his wife, who had just entered the office in the small reception room. Come right in, Miss Brown. What is that? Oh, I thought you had a customer, Brownie. Are you kidding? Well, don't worry, baby. That code ad I put in the morning record will bring them in. The place to find suckers is at the track. We'll get a bite right here. Don't say that word bite. It makes me hungry. Look, baby, I don't like this no dough routine any more than you do. Then let's get out to the track and find some umpchays. Brownie, you don't have to go looking for horse players. If they think you know something, they'll come looking for you. That ad in the paper will bring us a cup. Yeah, listen. See what I told you? Somebody come in. Probably the landlord. All right, open the door. Open the door. Don't let me get away. Okay. Something I can do for you, sir? Uh, yes, I, I saw your ad in the morning record. Oh. Uh, don't keep the gentleman waiting, Miss Brown. Show him right in. Come inside, please. Uh, thank you. This gentleman has come here in regard to your ad, Mr. Muncy. Oh, splendid. Splendid. That'll be all, Miss Brown. Yes, sir. Uh, sit down, Mr. Adams. Sit down, Mr. Adams. Uh, Muncie's the name. Joe Muncie. Oh, how do you do? Fine, fine. Uh, Mr. Adams is a new customer. You're entitled to know about the firm. Established 1933, 15 years of satisfied customers. We pick them, you play them, results guaranteed. Uh, I see. And I suppose, like the dozens of other turf lovers that have been in here this morning, you're interested in today's cold special. Well, uh, yes. You couldn't have picked a better day, Mr. Adams. I can underwrite the fact that today's pig will be on the bill daily from wire to wire. Well, I, uh, I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. Oh, just parlance of the turf, Mr. Adams. This horse is a sure winner. Well, now, uh, how much is the code special? Uh, since you're a new customer, you're entitled to a special rate. The usual tariff is 20 bob, but I'm letting you in for a saw. What's a saw? Ten dollars. Oh, well, that's certainly reasonable enough. Uh, let me see now. Goodness, I thought I had ten dollars. I'm afraid I haven't anything less than a hundred. Well, I'd be very... A hundred? Uh, yes, can you change it? Well, not at the moment. I just just sent my bookkeeper to the bank to make a deposit. Well, now, maybe I can go downstairs and get some change. No, 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 huh? no. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Adams. Just sit right down there. Well, very well. Mr. Adams, I'm going to ask you a very direct question. Yes? Just... What kind of money are you prepared to bet? Well, uh, if I thought a horse had a real good chance, I, I'd be willing to wager a thousand dollars. I'm going to sit down too. You said a thousand dollars. That's right. A thousand dollars. Well, that does it. I'm going to break a rule of a lifetime, Mister Adams. I'm going to give you a complete and absolute stranger. Joe Muncy's super special. Well, now, how much does that cost? Absolutely nothing. Well, I, I, I don't understand. You're getting a winner absolutely free. All you got to do is bet 20% for me. What do you mean? If you bet a grand, then you lay two yards, 200, that is. You bet that much for me. You understand? Well, that certainly sounds fair enough. Uh, I'll uh, have to go uh, to get the money, though. Well, okay. Okay. But you'll be back here at noon, and we'll go out to the track together. Right? I'll be here. You can count on it, sir. Well, I'll, uh, I'll be getting along. Okay, Mr. Adams. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Muncy. Goodbye, Mr. Adams. Goodbye. <sighs> Brownie, Brownie. What is it? Sweetheart, did we just make a score? That was the sweetest time. I heard everything. What's with that tone of voice? What's with letting that short ten bucks get away? Chicken feed, honey. The sucker is good for a bundle. If he comes back... He'll come back. And what's the super special you dreamed up that's going to come through today? Well, I get one. What's the best bet in the scratch sheet? Breakaway in the third. That's the super special. And if he blows the deuce? He's a stick-out. Besides, we got 200 going for us for nothing. 
Before we're through, baby, we're liable to wind up with 20, 50, maybe 100 Gs. Yeah. You got two bits? I'm hungry. Barber downtown that same morning in the local office of the FBI, Special Agent Terrell is just entering the office of an assistant to the agent in charge. Did you want to see me, Mr. Naylor? Yes, Terrell. Say, did you ever hear of a town called Bentley? No. It's about 100 miles upstate. It must just be a wide place in the road. It's bigger than that. It's at least big enough to have a bank where a teller could get away with $28,000. Well. The teller didn't show up this morning. He left Bentley sometime after 5 o'clock yesterday. They think he's come here? They think it's possible, but they have no evidence yet. Has he any friends or relatives here? None that they know of. Mm Mm-hmm. I think you'd better train up there right away and investigate. You could be back in the morning. Okay. The missing teller's name is Fred Williams. He's probably changed there by now. Yes. He'd been with the bank 12 years. One of their most trusted employees. Did he take the $28,000 all in one lump? No. The defalcations cover a period of a year. Oh. But he did take a little over 10000 of it yesterday. Must have known the examiners would do then. Not necessarily. Anyway, do a thorough checkup on his friends and personal habits. We may get a good lead on him that way. Right. <laughs> Almost post time. You want the glasses, Mr. Adams? Oh, yeah, yes, thank you. Now, let me see. Which one is breakaway, Mr. Muncy? Uh, that uh, chestnut colt with number seven on the saddlecloth. Number seven, oh, yes. Oh, he's beautiful. Yeah. He'd be even more beautiful when they put his number up there on the tote board. I don't like that outside post position. Brownie, breakaway can stop for lunch at the head of the stretch with these pigs and still win it. Well, I'm glad you're so confident, Mr. Muncy. You know how confident I am? No. With the price up to two to one, I think you ought to press. Press? Yeah, press. Send in another thousand. This is the bet of the year. I hope you're right. You're going to press them? Oh, no, no, no. I'm satisfied. We're winning two thousand dollars on a race is enough for me. Ah, I get it. You want to see if my merchandise is any good first, huh? <laughs> Well, something like that. Why, Mr. Adams, the last time I had a loser, they closed the schools for three days. It was also Christmas time. It is now post time. Uh... Too late to make another bet now, even if you want to do. When that bell rings, the windows are closed. I wish this race would start. they would be out of there any second now. Huh? Keep your eye on that outside stall. And they're out! Get off there. Let's break away. Let's break away. Huh? He must be in the pack. But come on, break away. And for me, that's Western Story, Transatlantic and Hot Tamale. Yes. Then comes Glamour Boy, Dixie Lee, Southern Cross, and the last horse's breakaway. We got left. What? Left at the post. Oh, goodness, there goes my thousand. Not yet, Mr. Adams. Not yet. Come on, you breakaway. In the back stretch is Western Story by one Come line. On. Hot Tamale and Southern Cross, neck and neck for second. A gap of three lengths, we come to Dixie Lee, and on the rail, breakaway. He's, He's breaking, breakaway, Mr. Adams. He's breaking. Back, Glamour Boy, and the last horse is Transatlantic. He's making a move. What? Breakaway is making a move. What? Is that good, Mr. Munson? Shut up, will you? Come on, break away. Come whip on, Whip him, Eddie. Whip him. Go to the whip. Come on, and come on, Eddie. Catch that southern cross in front with break away ranging alongside. Come on, come on Eddie. Back we have hot tamale. Then Dixie Lee, Glamour Boy, Western Story, and the last one is Francis. Come, come on, Eddie. Come on. Come with that hole. Let's break away for a minute. Come on, Eddie. Come on. Come on. We win it. We win it. Oh, we win it. Yeah. I was never worried. Mr. Muncy, how much do I win? Well, they ain't put the prices up yet, but you should win over 2000 Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Mr. Adams, let me tell you something. Huh? What? This is only the beginning. Good morning, Mr. Naylor. Oh, hello, Terrell. Just get in? Yeah. Get anything that might give us a lead on that bank teller? I think so. What is it? He's probably right here in town. How do you know? I talked to a friend of his. He told me the, the teller had just taken a sudden interest in playing horses. Uh-oh. Which probably accounts for the series of defalcations over the past year. I would think so. And since there's a race meet going on here, that's probably where he is with the last 10000 he took. Yes. Did you get a picture of him? Uh-huh. Then I guess you and I'll be out at the track this afternoon. Oh, 
Tony. Hmm? Let me see that newspaper, will you? I'm reading something. I want to look at the selections. You got eight tout sheets there now. I'm making up a consensus. You can lose without that. Where's Adam? He's due at the hotel here any minute now. We're going to do a little playing on our own today, baby. That's big. Well, look, we made 400 yesterday. We got to put it to work, don't we? <laughs> you remember that old French saying, you can't accumulate unless you speculate. Joe. Sure. Man. Take a look at this guy's picture in the paper here. Huh? Who does he look like? Hey. It's Adams. Yeah. Only his real name is Williams. What's a gay? He's a bank teller from a jerk town named Bentley. Skipped out and short $28,000. Hey. No wonder he has that bundle. Oh, this ain't so good. What do you mean? Well, the guy's red hot. If the law picks him up, he's a cinch to tell who helped him spend that money. You're forgetting one thing, sweetheart. The law ain't got him yet. But we have. I don't get it. Today's special is going to cost Mr. Adams. You mean... That must be him now. Now, let me handle it. Okay. Hello, Mr. Munson. Hi, Mr. Adams. Come right in. Thank you. Hello, Miss Brown. Hi. Well, all set for another day of fun and speculation? Yes, indeed. I certainly hope we're as fortunate as we were yesterday. Well, I cased the card and come up with nothing but winners. In every race? That's right, Mr. Adams. Well, that's very reassuring. Just one thing, though, Mr. Adams. Uh, what's that? Today we bet a little different. How? Today you're laying a thousand a race for me. What? Show him the paper, brother. Okay. Here's a nice picture of you, Mr. Adams. Or should I say Mr. Williams? Oh. That's why we're betting my way. But now look here, I can't afford to bet that kind of money for you. I have to win a lot of money myself. No kidding. You see, I've got to pay the bank back that $28,000. And betting on those winners is the only way I can raise it. The bank can wait, Mr. Oh, no, no. Look, you got no choice. Oh, yes, I have. I can discontinue our relationship right now. Joe, he's walking out. Oh, no, he ain't. <laughs> Well, it finally picked a winner. And now, before the FBI file on the fugitive horse player resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week, at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, somebody asked how much it was wise for the average man earning $5,000 a year to pay when he buys a home on mortgage. The answer was $12,500, or two and a half times his yearly income. On this sound basis, a man getting $50 a week won't be over his head if he buys a six or $7,000 house. But no matter what your income is, it will pay you to investigate the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan, which offers you five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. Every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up, always ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage. Pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission, no bonus charges. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a house, get complete information on the assured home ownership plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Fugitive Horse Player. (laughs) 
racing touts fall into the category of chiselers. And all chiselers are unscrupulous opportunists. To them, money is something to be gotten by any method, even though it be criminal, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. The fact that the victim of the tout called Joe Muncie was himself guilty of a crime does not lessen Muncie's guilt in striking down his victim and robbing him. Rather, it stresses the meanness of his crime. It is nearly noon now, some two hours after Joe Muncie struck down and robbed the absconding bank teller, Fred Williams, alias Fred Adams, in Muncie's hotel room. The FBI's assistant to the agent in charge, Naylor, is sitting at his desk when Special Agent Terrell enters. I'm ready to leave for the racetrack whenever you are, Mr. Naylor. Well, since we're driving out, maybe we better get started. I gave some prints of the teller's photo to the police who will be working the track, too. Good. Between us all, we should be able to... Wait a minute. Naylor speaking. Yes? What? Are you sure? No, no. Just send him in the regular way. Right. We don't have to go to the racetrack, Terrell. Why not? Just watch who comes through that door. Mr. Naylor. Come in, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Well, for the love... Sit down. I'm sure you gentlemen are a little surprised. Well, that's hardly the word for it, Williams. I was going to give myself up anyway after I got the money back. But getting it back is out of the question now. Does that bruise on your face have something to do with it being out of the question? Yes, sir. Then let's have your story, Williams. From the beginning. Waiter. Yes, sir? Let's have a check, will you? Right. Come on, baby. Finish that coffee. Don't rush me. We just about got time to get to the station. You can eat at the track. Did somebody pass the law we have to get there for the first race? I got the winner. You don't want to miss a sure thing, do you? Oh, you've been reading your own ads. Relax. But, honey, I... I I'm did... not so sure I even want to go to the track. Look, I've only got the first four races handicapped. We blow after the fourth. Okay? What about Adam Williams, whatever his name is? What? You're, you're afraid you go to the cops, huh? Yeah, aren't you? Honey, Mr. Williams is hotter than the inside of a glove. He can't go near the cops, or they put him away for 50. I hope you're right. I know I am. Now, look, we play the first four races, beat it back to town, get the car, and head west. Are you sure this is the room Williams was slugged in? Yes. Here's the passkey, Darrell. Right. Well, they didn't lose any time getting out of here. Come on, let's see what we can find. No telling where they're headed for. They'll leave a trace wherever it is. What do you mean? Muncie's got all those hundred-dollar bills Williams took from the bank. Oh. And we've already sent out lists of the serial numbers to all field offices this morning. Good. Anything in the desk over there? No. Not a thing. I guess we'd better... Wait a minute. What'd you find? The scratch sheet and the racing form. I think we'd better go out to the track after all. Why? Muncie has handicapped four horses for the day. Well? Muncie's a horse player, Terrell. Nothing short of an earthquake could keep him from playing these four horses before he jumps town. After slugging Williams? Muncie would figure that Williams couldn't afford to go to the police. That's true. Do you suppose he bet with a bookmaker or went to the track? We'll just have to gamble at the track. We've missed the first race. But Muncie's got three more to go to make us four. And we'll be there before the third race. Come on. That's two winners in a row, Brownie. That's par for the course. Let's quit. Are you kidding? Let me collect our 3000 then I'll buy our tickets for the third, and we'll head for the bar. I wish we were heading west. Honey, we will be right after the fourth. I don't like it, Joe. It's paying off. You like that, don't you? Sure, Look, but... we leave this town with a satchel for it, baby. Now, come on, let's collect. <laughs> Oh, 
Over here, Mr. Naylor. Well, we're in, fella. You mean you spotted Muncie? Nobody's here. How do you know? Two of those hundred-dollar bills have shown up. At the betting window? Uh Uh-huh, the fifty-dollar window. I wish we had some positive way of identifying him. Williams can do that. But he's back in the city. He's on his way out here right now. Huh? I phoned the United States attorney before we left town. The fourth race starts in 20 minutes. Williams will be here for it. Suppose Muncie's fourth selection doesn't win. He won't be going to the window for the payoff. What's he playing in the fourth race? Um, Ragman. Carol. Yeah? Here's where you and I have got to root a winner home. The horses are on the way to the starting gate and Williams isn't here yet. Who's this coming now? Okay, you win. Mm-hmm. Did we make it in time, Mr. Naylor? Yes, Williams. Just in time to help us root Ragman home and catch Muncie. Good. That's going to be a real pleasure. Come on. Here's a good place to watch and root. It is now post time. Ragman's got post position three with the jockey wearing the bright gold blouse. I think I can get really get excited about this one. Well, they all seem pretty quiet. Maybe we're going to get a start. And they're off. They're off. And for the lead, that's Ragman. Colonel Tootsie, Buttons, and the last confusing... Come on, Ragman. young man. Whip him. Stay up there, Ragman. He's moving away from them. At the half, it's Ragman by three. The Colonel and Tootsie head and head. A length back, Buttons, and the last horse confusing... Come on, um, Ragman. Stay up there with that horse. Keep moving. I think he's going to do it. Going into the stretch turn, Ragman by three. Tootsie, the Colonel, and Buttons left each other. A gap of eight lengths confusing... He's starting to quit. Ragman's quitting. Come Stay on. up there, Bobby. Come Go on. to the whip. Hold him up, Bobby. Come on, drive now. Stretches Ragman on the rail by one. Tootsie ranging over the outside. Three lengths back, buttons in the curve, head and head. And 15 lengths back, confusing. Hang on, Ragman. Only a 16th to go, Bobby. Hit him, Bobby. Come on, you Ragman. Come on, Bobby. Come on. Come on. He lasted. He lasted. He won. Ragman's number is up. His picture's for place. Let's go down to the $50 window. Oh, baby, what a day. Four bets, four winners. Honey, I take back everything I said about you. Now do me a favor. Sure, honey, what? Let's go as soon as you come. Sure, sure. We're going to be on our way in five minutes. Just let me get on this line here. Hello, Mr. Muncie. What? Adams. Williams is the name. What are you doing here? I'm here with these gentlemen. Huh? We're special agents of the FBI, Muncie. Joe! Wait a minute, miss. We want you two. Together you make a wonderful parlay. Frederick Williams was tried and convicted of embezzlement and sentenced to a long term in the federal penitentiary. Joe Muncie and Florence Brown were jointly tried and found guilty of attempted murder and are likewise serving long terms in the penitentiary. Joe Muncie did hit four winners in a row because touts, like anyone else who follow the horses, have their lucky days at selecting winners. But ask any veteran of the sport and he'll tell you that you cannot possibly beat it for keeps. The bank teller, Williams, learned this the hardest way possible. The criminal way. And he learned, too, a lesson many hardened criminals could have told him. A lesson your FBI continues to prove 24 hours a day. That crime does not pay. Next week, another thrilling case from the files of your FBI. We'll tell you about it in just a moment, but now, let me refresh your memory on the more important features of the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. Remember that the mortgage interest is only 4%. Remember that if the owner dies, the widow owns the home without any mortgage at all. Yes, the Assured Home Ownership Plan is practically foreclosure-proof. To get the full story, talk to the Equitable Society representative in your community. Ask him for literature that gives all details. You'll find him in your local phone book under the name 
the Equitable Life Assurance Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Homicide Hideout. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI, is a Jerry Devine production. Now this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Homicide Hideout. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In about 14 minutes, the sponsor of this program, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, will have something important to say to homeowners. So Mrs. Housewife, If your husband is not listening to this program, better send one of the children to fetch him. Tell him he's going to hear about America's finest plan for home ownership, a plan that can save you money. Tonight's FBI file, The Homicide Hideout. It has been said that there is honor even among thieves. But no greater fallacy than that was ever uttered. For the thief, the criminal, could not possibly possess a true sense of honor and be what he is. This is demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Criminals in dealing with each other are still guided by the governing principles of their lives. Deceit, treachery, ruthlessness, and all other immoral qualities which combine to make the criminal dishonor incarnate. The weather-beaten old farm, half hidden in a clump of trees, is dark and gives no sign of life within. But a shaft of moonlight slanting across the porch and through an open window falls across an old feather bed and the faces of two women. One is hard and middle-aged, the other young and grotesquely scarred. Presently, the stillness is broken by the sound of an automobile coming up the trail from the main road. The girl is first awakened. Mom, Mom, wake up. Uh, Wake up, Mama, somebody's coming. What? I said wake up, there's a car coming up from the main road. Uh, Listen, 
hear it? Uh, I got ears, Lena. Yeah, but who could it be? I don't know, and I don't care if it means business. He's pulling in here. You want me to go look out the window? No, we'll both go. Where's my slippers? Right down there. Oh. The man by himself. Who is he? I don't know. Look, he's hurt. You see how he's holding himself? Yeah. This means business, all right. Stay right here, Lena. I'll go. Now, well, where's my wrapper? On the chair over there. Oh. Come on, open up, will you? Take it easy. Take it easy, mister. Well? Your name Benton. Mom Benton. That's right. Good. Now, just a minute. Let me in, will you? I was sent here. Who sent you? Chick Lansing. You got proof? Look, say the questions. Let me in. I'm bleeding. Okay, come ahead. I, I gotta sit down. Who are you? Look, can you dig up a doctor? I said, who are you? Red. Red Harper. What'd you get mixed up in? I can wait. I gotta have a doctor quick. The quicker you answer questions, the quicker you get the doc. Okay. Three of us pulled a bank job today. We had to split up it. I made for here because I remember Chick Ransom telling about you. Now, will you go what get a... What kind th- of a trail did you leave? I drove north and, and circled to the south. I threw the cops off, okay. How much money did you get? What difference does that make? How much did you get? Ten grand, my share. Then I'll take five thousand. Are you kidding? That's my price. I'm not giving you any five grand. Okay, mister, then you can bleed to death. Oh, you dirty... Oh, Get out of here, mister. Huh? Hold on a minute, Lena. Put down that gun. He's about done for anyway. Look, give me a talk, will you? I said it'll cost you $5,000. Okay. Okay. You can have it. On one condition. I... I walk out of here... Alive. Mm-hmm. Give me a hand with him, Lena. We'll put him on the couch. And then what? I'll run into town and get Doc Smith. If he ain't too full of whiskey. Call him a doctor after what he's done to my face. I'm not forgetting that, Lena. We can't get no legal doctor to do this job. Well, what makes you think Doc Smith will do it? Well, after him losing his license, he'll do anything to get money to buy whiskey. All right. Put him down. Here. Try to stop his bleeding. All right, Mom. I'll be back with Doc Smith as soon as I can. In the Cincinnati field office of the FBI, some hundred miles away, agent in charge Willard sits at his desk waiting for a particular phone call. At noon, three bandits had held up the National Trust Company and escaped with nearly $30,000. Two special agents were assigned to the case, but as yet Willard has received no word from them. It is now shortly after nine o'clock. Willard speaking. This is Lynette, Mr. Willard. Well, it's about time, Lynette. What happened to you and Russell? We picked up a hot trail right after we got to the bank and didn't have time to report. What kind of a hot trail? We just now caught two of the bandits. What? We nailed them in a little hotel room. Good work. What about the other one? He's still on the loose. How? He's got the stick-up car. Oh. What do you want us to do? Have the bandits talked any? Not yet. Discuss the fact with the U.S. attorney and arrange to file charges. Okay. Get a description of that car and the third man. I'll wait here for you. Right. Doc, yeah. Doc, come on, wake uh, up. Uh, wake up, you old sock. Uh, uh, wake up, I say. Hey. We ain't got much time. Huh? We ain't got time, I tell you. Time? Time. What is time? Never mind now. I'll tell you what the time Never is. Never mind that Time now. is the great disillusioner. That's what time is. Look at me, Doc. Huh? Look at me, I say. What, is, what do I look at you? Oh. So it's you, huh? You gotta come with me, Doc. There's a man needs you off a bed. Um, a man needs me? He's in a bad way, Doc. 
But aren't we all, my dear? Aren't we all, huh? Pour me a little drink. No, not anymore. Now we got to get started. It would be too late. And why have you come to me, madam? Oh, don't think I would have if I could have gone to anybody else. That, that's professional disrespect. I ain't forgetting what you've done to my Lena's face, treating them burns. Your daughter, madam, would only have grown to look more like you. Oh, I think that she got the best of it. Go away, woman. I want to go to sleep. Doc! Hey! Look here, woman. Now, I'm you can't... I'm only trying to get it through your rum-soaked brain that there's a man dying. Well, that's his good fortune. You gotta have money, don't you? Only when my liquor runs out. Is that all the liquor you've got? Unfortunately, yes. Good. Wait a minute. Wait, give me that bottle. <coughs> hey, why are you vicious old... Shut up and get uh, up from hey, there. Look, you can't... Look, hey. Look, look, I got liquor out at my place, and if you keep uh, that man from dying, I'll give you a hundred dollars besides to buy more. You... A hundred dollars? Yes. So get your tools and let's go. May I come in, Mr. Willard? Yes, come ahead, Leonard. Where's Russell? I left him giving all the details on the bank robbery to the U.S. attorney. Did the two prisoners furnish any information? They sure did. Did they identify the man still at large? His name is Red Harper. Here's his description. Harper, eh? And here's the description of the car he got away in. Good. We'll put out a wanted notice right away. We may not need it. Well, why not? Harper may be at a certain fugitive hideout about 100 miles from here. How do you know? One of the two bandits we caught said Harper was pretty badly wounded and may have made for the hideout to get fixed up. You know exactly where the place is? It's a farm run by a woman and her daughter. And I think I can find it from what the bandit told me. Good. I'll get the alarm out anyway, and then we'll get started. Hey. Hey, you. You want me? Yeah. I thought your old lady went to get a doc. She did. Why did she get here with him? They'll be along any minute now. See a good doc? You see my face, don't you? Yeah. Well, he done it. He made you look like that? Yeah. Yeah, he done it when he was drunk. That's how he lost his license. Drunk all the time. I want no guy like him working on me. Well, you can tell him that because he has mom bringing him now. Right in here, doc. We got him laying on the couch. Very well. Well, I see you come around, young man. Yeah. Go boil some water, Lena. All right, Mom. I'll go. Wait get a you. minute. What's the matter? Your daughter told me all about this drunken bum. What's that? What's the idea bringing him to work on me? Are you insinuating, sir, that I am incapable of performing? I want another doc, understand? Look, huh? You asked me to handle this. I didn't send for you. It's this doc, mister, or none. Okay. You promised me a drink, madam. Oh, yeah. Here's the jug. Thank you. I'll go help Lena. I'll be right back. Doc. Yes? I want to talk to you a minute. Without them. We got time, ain't we? Well, what's what's troubling you? Close that door. Just a minute. Just a minute. Quit drinking that stuff and close that door. Ah. Very well. Okay. Look, Doc, listen to me. You're the only chance I got, Sam. Yes. What a figure all went chances. By her we're born, by her we live. Never mind that stuff. Listen to me. Well, I got a proposition. You can't proposition with chance. I'm sir. talking about you, Doc. I don't know how much you was going to give you for this job. But if you don't drink no more of that stuff, you can make a bundle. Well, what's that you say? Here's my proposition. Yeah? She was going to stick me five grand. Yeah. Probably give you only 50 or 100 bucks. Yeah. But if you don't get hold of yourself and fix me up okay, we'll, we'll cut her out of it. And I'll give you two grand, see? Yeah, fine, let's drink to two grand. Put down that jug. It's truly a wonderful anesthetic, this. Doc, lay off the boots, will you? Uh, this is one more, sir. 
that he had rendered man insensible to the pains of his conscience. Doc, Doc, it's, will you lay off? Uh, it rendered man insensible. Doc, insensible. Mom, hey, Mom, come here, will you? What is it? Passed hot. Now you've got to get another doc. Lena. Lena. Huh? Hand me one of them rubber gloves the doc used and... Oh, yeah, that knife he operates with. Okay. Here, Mom. What are you going to do? I'm going to get even with that drunken old sot for what he done to Lena's face. Look, you ain't got time for that now. Time ain't going to mean anything to you anymore. What do you mean? I was listening... I heard the proposition you made the doc about cutting me out. What? I know you got your money hidden in your order, too. Oh, wait a minute. If I kill you with this operating knife, it'll look like the doc done it, because he was drunk. No, no, Don't wait. try to get up. I am getting up. you got to listen to me. you got to let me tell you what... I... Oh. Oh. before the FBI file on the homicide hideout resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week, I asked an equitable life assurance society field man what was the one ambition shared by more Americans than any other. Well, he thought a moment and answered, a man wants to say, this is my home, I own it. Yes, that's the typical American ambition. That's what most of us work and save for, a home of our own. And that's why there's nothing in the equitable society that gives us deeper satisfaction than our assured home ownership plan. A plan which offers you five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. And besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with the canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage. Pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission, no bonus charges. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the assured home ownership plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Homicide Hideout. We repeat, no greater fallacy was ever uttered than there is honor even among thieves. For, as already demonstrated in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, in dealing with each other, criminals are still guided by the governing principles of their lives. Deceit, treachery, ruthlessness, and all other immoral qualities which combine to make the criminal dishonor incarnate. Shortly after the killing, agent in charge Willard of the Cincinnati office of the FBI and Special Agent Lynette reached the farm where they had reason to believe the wounded bank bandit Red Harper was hiding out. Inside, they found the man known as Doc Smith sitting on the floor in a daze. He was wearing a pair of rubber gloves. His right hand held a bloody scalpel. A few feet away lay the body of the bandit, Harper. 
Smith is just concluding a hazy account of events. Well, I... I remember the woman bringing me here to operate on that man. Yes. But after taking two or three drinks from a jar of liquor... The that jar that's had, broken on the floor here? Yes. And, well, after that, I don't remember anything else. When the woman drove into the village for you, were you intoxicated then? I'm intoxicated most of the time, Mr. Lannan. And you're a doctor? I was a doctor. Is liquor the reason you're not a licensed doctor anymore? Yes. You say you don't even remember preparing to operate on that man? No, I don't. I. But judging from these rubber gloves I'm wearing, I... it's evident that I did prepare to. It also seems evident that you killed him. I, I haven't examined the body since I came to. His throat was slashed. Well, then I... I guess I'm guilty. Yes, it's possible that you're not. What? The woman and her daughter are gone. They left in this bandit's car and apparently with his share of the loot from a bank robbery. Yeah, but even... You're wearing the rubber gloves, all right, and holding the bloody scalpel, but... You passed out from the effects of liquor, right? Yes. You would hardly have gotten up, put on rubber gloves, cut the man's throat, and laid back down again beside that broken jaw, then. What do you think, Lynette? I think you're right. They could have killed him, put the gloves on you, doctor put the scalpel in your hand, and left you to take the blame for the murder. Well, I'm sure they hated me enough to do that. Why? Well, you see, the girl's face was hideously scarred from burns which I treated when I was drinking. I see. Burnett, mm -hmm. put out a wider alarm in that car and include the woman and the girl this time. Okay. And for the time being, Doctor, you'll remain in our custody. Walter when we get to Detroit. Well, they exchange for relations to go visiting each other. Yeah, but he won't know how come we got a car like this. He ain't going to know about no car. I'll fix that. Well, what about all the money we got? It's ours. We ain't going to tell him nothing about it. Mom, what about the police? Now, don't start worrying about that again. I know, but the... If the police track the bank robber to our shack before the doc comes to, they'll see for themselves that he done the murder. Yeah, but what if the doc comes to before the police get there? Well, he's bound to think he done it and run off. Then the police will be looking for us. They ain't going to find us. I hope you're right. Of course I am. Mom. Well? We, we, we got lots of money now. And I was thinking... I was thinking maybe... Thinking what? Maybe one of those good doctors in Detroit could do something about... My face. Sure. We'll find a good doc who'll make you just as pretty as I am. Good morning, Lynette. Good morning. Any results on the alarm we put out last night, Mr. Willard? No, not yet. Did you arrange to keep Smith in the holdover all right? Yes, he's available on a moment's notice if we need him. Good. Now all we need is a break on that alarm. I'll take it. Well, it's speaking. Good, put him on. Got something? I hope so. Detroit office calling. Hello? Yeah? Yeah? Fine. Start checking hotels, small ones in particular. Lynette and I will take the next plane. Right. What is it? Detroit police found the missing car abandoned there early this morning. Any trace of the woman and girl? No, but it's a break to know what city they're in. I'll get Smith, and we'll take the next plane for Detroit. Come on. The police and our agents have checked every hotel in Detroit, will it? But no luck. Well, of course, there are a thousand other places in the city they could be, Hope. They might even be staying with friends or relatives. Have you any information that might give us a lead in that direction? No, but we can get to work on it. It'll take too long to check that angle, Annette. There's a quicker way to smoke them out. What's that? The newspapers here are known for their assistance with law enforcement agencies. Yes, they'll give us all the cooperation possible. Good. Then we'll release a story with a Cincinnati dateline that will put the woman and the girl at ease about the murder and take them off guard. How do you mean? The story will tell of the cold-blooded scalpel murder of the notorious bank bandit, Red Harper. And will say that the ex-Dr. Smith has been arrested in connection with the slaying, which is the truth. 
Yes. But how's that going to lead us to the woman and the girl? I've got another idea for doing that. And if everything goes all right, we ought to... What is it, Lena? I put I saw in the evening paper. Well? It turned out just like you said. Doc Smith's been arrested for the murder of that bank robber. Look. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? Just like I told you all along. <laughs> we ain't got nothing to worry about. Yeah, I know. Oh, uh, you didn't let on to your Uncle Walter about what you read, did you? No, of course not. Oh, Mom. Well? Oh, well, you said when we got here to Detroit, maybe we'd get a fine doctor to see if he could do something about my face. That's right. Well, here's a chance, maybe, but it might cost a lot of money because he's so famous, even if he will do it. What are you talking about, Lena? Th- there's an article in this paper about a Dr. Gerard, a, a famous plastic surgeon. A what? W- well, he does wonders fixing people like me. Well, is he right here in Detroit? Yeah. Yeah, he's staying at the Central Hotel. Then we'll go see him right now. But, Mom, the papers say he's not taking any cases. Never mind that. What? Put your hat on, Lena. We're going to see that doctor and make him do something for you. <laughs> This is his room, Mom. Well, knock on the door, Lena. But what if he won't take my case? Well, he will when I'm through talking to him. Yeah, but if you, you won't knock on that door, I will. Famous or not, don't scare me. Yes? I suppose you're the famous. Well, for the love of... Dr. Smith. Yes. And these gentlemen are special agents of the FBI. What is this, anyway? Mrs. Benton, we want the bank's money you took from the bandit Harper, and the state of Ohio will be wanting you for his murder. I never murdered that bank robber. Doc Smith done it. The fingerprints on the surgical knife are yours. What fingerprints are you talking about? You used your fingers to place the knife in Dr. Smith's hand. Take the girl, Annette. Let's be going. <laughs> Benton was returned to the state of Ohio and tried for the murder of the bank robber, Harper. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. When one criminal meets death at the hands of another criminal, as in tonight's case from the files of your FBI, we are inclined, humanly enough, to say good riddance and let it go at that. But the law does not let it go at that. To the law, murder is murder, no matter who commits it or who the victim. And your local law enforcement officers and your FBI have one duty and one duty only, to enforce the law. Now, just a few more quick facts about the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan. If you're planning to buy or build a house, this plan can save you money. Or if you wish to finance your present home, here also this plan can save you money. So let me suggest that you look into the Assured Home Ownership Plan without further delay. The Equitable Society's representative nearest you will gladly explain the plan clearly and interestingly. He has literature that gives full details. Ask your equitable representative today about this assured home ownership plan, America's finest plan for home ownership. Look in the phone book for the name, The Equitable Life Assurance Society, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Slaughterhouse Swindlers. The 
The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. Now, this is Carl Frank speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Slaughterhouse Swindlers. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is your FBI, an official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Friends, if you happen to know anyone who is thinking of buying or building a home or is considering refinancing his present home, please phone him and tell him to listen to this program. For in a few minutes, our sponsor, the Equitable Life Assurance Society, will give facts and figures about America's finest plan for home ownership. Every family will want to hear about this great Equitable Society plan which saves money and gives special protection to homeowners. Tonight's FBI file, The Slaughterhouse Swindler. Professional criminals are avowed enemies of society, and as such merit the full penalty prescribed by the laws which they violate. But so-called good citizens who conspire with criminals to violate the law for personal gain are the Benedict Arnolds of society. The prayers for profit of the respect and welfare of those whom they would call fellow citizens. And as such, they merit the contemptuous kind of moral condemnation that is reserved for all traitors. On a modest little dairy farm a few miles out of Des Moines, Mrs. Reba Jones, recently widowed, has just completed the morning's chores and is walking up to the house when two men drive up in a truck designed for hauling livestock. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Are you Mrs. Reba Jones? Yes, sir. Well, my name's Latimer, and this is Mr. Randall. Oh, we're inspectors for the Department of Agriculture. Oh, how do you do? Hello. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I hate to tell you this, Mrs. Jones, but we're here on a kind of unpleasant mission. What's wrong? Well, a dairy company you sell your milk to has just reported to us a very unfavorable bacteria count on some of the milk from here. Oh, but they never said anything to me about it. Well, it's their duty to report to us first, Mrs. Jones, and our duty to check on your cows. Oh. You see, a lot of the dairy company's products are sold across the state line. And that makes it Uncle Sam's business to see that the quality meets federal standards of purity. Of, of course. Mrs. Jones, uh, how many cows in your herd? Well, I... There's only 12 heads. Mm-hmm. You gonna test them now? That's right. And if you... If you find some of them's deceased... Well, we'll have to condemn them. Oh. Yes, we'll have to take them with us, Mrs. Jones. 
Uh, but we're authorized to pay you a condemnation fee. But I, I just can't afford to lose any. Even with the whole herd, I just barely make a living from them. Oh, you wouldn't want to sell milk that you knew to be diseased, would you? No. Of course not. Uh, well, uh, the herd is down the pasture now. I'll go and get him into the barn for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Well, Al, she fell for it okay. <laughs> we should clip her for the whole herd. Come on. All right, boys. I'm giving you $200 a head for them cows. I thought you ran a slaughterhouse, Jenkins, not a clip. Now, let me handle this, Al. $200? That's my price. You better take another look at the weight figures, Jenkins. Price stands. Take it or leave it. Oh, look, we take all the risk getting these cows. Adamer, as far as I'm concerned, they're your own cows. I operate a legitimate licensed slaughterhouse. Who's kidding who? You're up to your ears in the black market, same as we are. Now, look here. You said yourself three of the last head we brought you were disease. And they were, too. But you bought them from us, didn't you? Maybe you'd better take your cows to some other slaughterhouse. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, both of you. You've got us over a barrel, Mr. Jenkins, and you know it. So, just give us a dough. Hmm. Now you're talking sense. Here's your money. Count it if you like. Oh, I'm sure it's all there. You don't steal your money that way. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you think? Come on, Al. Right. We'll be seeing you, Mr. Jenkins. Good day. Go ahead. Okay. Ah, what did you settle so easy for? Because we couldn't take the cows anyplace else. They were worth more than he gave us. What he gave us was only a down payment. What do you mean? I think I know a way to tap that old geezer for plenty. It was a little earlier that same day when Special Agent Meade of the Des Moines Field Office of the FBI entered the office of Agent in Charge Clark. Did you send for me, Mr. Clark? Oh, yes, Meade. Looks like we've got an impersonation swindle case to go to work on. Oh? Huh? A couple of days ago, two men posing as inspectors of the Department of Agriculture condemned some cows on a farm near the city. Yes? They claimed these cows were diseased, so they were authorized to pay $50 a head for them, and did, then loaded the cows into a truck and drove away. The black market, no doubt. More than likely. But the act of impersonating a federal officer is our immediate angle. How'd we hear about it? Well, the widow who owned the cows got suspicious later on, called the public health officer here in Des Moines. He just called me a minute ago. I guess he'd already checked with the Department of Agriculture. Yes, and I double-checked. What's the first move? Well, you better drive out there right away and interview the victim. Maybe others by now. That's why we want to work fast. What's her name? Mrs. Ruth Mason. Here. This is the location of her farm. Hmm. Okay. And Mead... Get a good description of the men and any other lead you can and hurry back. Right. All right, Al. Pull up in here by the stock pens. Right. There's old Jenkins coming out of the office now. Okay, stop the truck. We better get our dough for these cows before we spring the other deal on them. Shut up, here he comes. Now let me do the talking. Okay. Yeah. You fellas seem to be working pretty fast. Yeah, we don't believe in letting the grass grow under cows, Jenkins. I've dead, huh? Pretty good looking stuff, too. For change. Where'd you get him? Ain't you forgetting what you said? As far as you're concerned, all the cows we bring belong to us. All right, all right. Can you handle these? I can use all you get like that. That's fine. Al, huh? you run these over to the scales. Mr. Jenkins and I have got business to talk over. Okay. Can we go into your office? Sure. Come ahead. Go ahead in. All right. Well, what's on your mind, Latimer? You said you could handle all the cows we could get as good as those in the truck. That's right. Did you handle, say, say 150 head? Where are you going to get that many? 
Could you handle them? Certainly. Well, then I can get them all right. Uh, there's just one hitch. What's that? Money. I don't get you. Now, look, we lay out cash for them animals. We ain't getting no 150 head unless we put the dough on the line. Oh. So, where do we get the cash? How much would they cost? Me or you? Hmm? Well, I'm supposed to make a profit, you know. And how much would they cost you? About a hundred a head. Fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah, that's right. Who are you buying them from? Oh. <laughs> now, you ain't trapping me into a giveaway like that. <laughs> are you interested in putting up the dough? Maybe. Oh, look, don't hedge. Are you or ain't you? How do I know this isn't a swindle? You can come along if you want when I swing the deal. When would that be? Oh, right now, if you like. I don't keep that kind of money around the office. Hmm. Uh, when could you get it? Later in the day. Well, then we'll knock them off tonight. How much do you have to charge me for the cows? Usual rate. Two hundred a head. That's letting you fellas operate in my money and make a hundred percent profit. It's too much. Now look, Mr. Jenkins. Take it or leave it. I... Be here at my office tonight. Can I come in, Mr. Clark? Oh, yes, come ahead, Mead. Did you talk to the woman out at the farm? Yes. Get any good leads? She gave a pretty good description of the two men. Anybody we know? I don't think so. Their names are Latimer and Randall. At least those are the names they use. Yes. But this might give us an even better lead. What's that? The woman was smart enough to make them give her a receipt for her cows. Oh, good for her. Latimer signed it. And no doubt left his fingerprints on it. Right. Well, first thing, we'll alert all local police and licensed slaughterhouses in the city and state. Give them the description of those two men. Yes, sir. And, Meade, while I'm getting that started, will you run that receipt through the lab for fingerprints? Right. I'd like to catch those fellas before they clean up and get out of the state. Now. Okay. Good. There's a light on in Jenkins' office. Guess he's keeping our date all right. But will he have the dough with him? Well, sure. Why not? He didn't guarantee it this afternoon. Yeah, this sounds like too good a touch to him. He'll have it. Now, come on. Now, wait a minute. What's the matter? Look in and see if anybody's with him. No, he's by himself. Okay. Knock on the door. Come in. Come in. Go ahead, Al. All right. Well, how are you tonight, Mr. Jenkins? Let's get down to business. Yeah, that suits me fine. You, uh, you got the dough ready? I have. Well, where is it? In my pocket. The deal starts when it's in my pocket, Mr. Jenkins. Oh, no. I'm not giving up any money until I see those cows. You ain't seeing no cows. What does he mean? Well, uh, we're kind of changing the deal. Hmm? Well, that 15000 goes to us direct. What for? Well, sort of like a bonus. What are you talking about? Ah, quit wasting time with them chucks. Now, see here. What's this all about? You're paying us that 15 G's to keep quiet, Jenkins. What? You wouldn't like us to expose your operation here, would you? This is a licensed slaughterhouse, Latimer, and my books are clean. To a stranger, maybe, but not to the law. Look here. I've had enough of this. Oh, yeah? You're just trying to blackmail me. And what if we are? It won't work. No? No. Because I'm clean. You two are not. You couldn't report me to the law without getting slapped in jail yourselves, and you know it. Chuck, that angle ain't gonna work. It certainly isn't. Well, then I guess we'd better try another. The only thing that you can do is to get out of here and get out of here right now. Oh, that ain't the only thing. Get out, I say. Now, look, we came here for that 15 grand. We're going to get it. Go to work, Al. With pleasure. Now, wait a minute. You can't. Now, if you'll grab his wallet, Al, 
We'll turn out the lights and close up office for the night. And now, before the FBI file on the slaughterhouse swindlers resumes, as it will in just a moment, here's that important message for homeowners and home buyers. This week at the Equitable Life Assurance Society, we were talking about how a man feels when he lives in a home of his own. And someone said there's nothing like it. When you light that first fire in your fireplace, it's not like any fire that ever warmed you before. And the first flower you grow yourself in your own garden has a sweeter scent than any flower you ever smell before. Yes, a man who lives in a home of his own has satisfactions that the rent payer never knows. And that's why we of the Equitable Society take such pride in our assured home ownership plan, which offers home buyers security along with these five important advantages. One, the mortgage is canceled, paid off in full if owner dies. Besides, every dollar previously paid on principal is returned in full to the widow along with a canceled mortgage. Two, a special cash fund is built up, ready to be used if financial emergencies threaten the home. Three, this cash fund increases as the mortgage shrinks. It can be used to shorten the term of the mortgage, pay off a 20-year mortgage, for example, in as little as 14 years, saving six years' interest. Four, mortgage interest not at 6%, not at 5%, but at only 4%. Five, liberal allowance to cover title search, lawyer's fees, and other closing costs. No broker's commission, no bonus charges. Well, frankly, there is no other plan like this anywhere. The Equitable Society calls it America's finest plan for home ownership. It protects you against the two major hazards of home mortgages, death and hard times. So if you're planning to buy or build a house, or if you now own a home, get complete information on the assured home ownership plan from your Equitable Society representative. That's the Equitable Society. E Q U I. T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Slaughterhouse Swindler. The professing good citizen who consorts or conspires with professional criminals to violate the law for personal gain is not only flirting with justice at the hands of the law, he is also courting personal disaster at the hands of those with whom he conspires. Because to criminals, the renegade citizen is not one of them. Rather, he is a pawn to be played by them when the time comes. And always, he has played for a sucker. It is nearly two hours now after the slaughterhouse operator, Jenkins, was beaten into unconsciousness by the cattle swindlers and robbed of $15,000. Agent in charge Clark of the Des Moines office of the FBI is at his desk talking with Special Agent Meade when... Clark speaking. Police headquarters, Mr. Clark. This is Sergeant Eaton. Oh, hello, Sergeant. We've got something that may tie in with those two men you're looking for. Oh? Well, just a minute. Meade. Yeah? Get on the other phone and catch this, too, will you? Right. All right, Sergeant. Go ahead. It's about a man named Jenkins who operates a slaughterhouse at the edge of town. Yes? The night watchman making his rounds found him beaten unconscious on the floor of his office a little over an hour ago. Mm-hmm. The watchman remembered hearing a truck drive into the yard earlier. I see. Just before he discovered Jenkins on the floor, he had heard the truck drive away. But he hadn't seen who was in it. No, with Jenkins on duty himself, he hadn't paid much attention. Well, where's the victim now, Sergeant? We got him to the city hospital. He just came to a little while ago. Oh. What did he have to say? Well, that's just it. He wouldn't talk. Well, we'll get on it right away and check with you later, Sergeant. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye. I guess you better get over to the hospital right away. No, later. What? First, we're going to have a look around out at the slaughterhouse. Why? 
We just might find some evidence with which we can encourage Mr. Jenkins to talk. Come on. I told the nurse not to let anybody else in my room. We're special agents of the FBI, Mr. Jenkins. Oh, that's so. And I have nothing to say to you either. This is my affair. Now, we have reason to believe it's our affair, too. What do you mean? We've just come from your slaughterhouse. What are we doing there? Investigating the crime. Crime? What crime? Crime that's put you in this hospital. Now, look here. Well? I have nothing to say. All right, then, we have. We happened to run across a special memo of some cattle transactions which were not entered in your regular ledger, Mr. Jenkins. Hey, what are we? You're trying to tell me how to keep my books? Maybe the government will get around to that later. What do you mean? Right now, we're interested in finding two men named Latimer and Randall. Well? Some of those special cattle deals, according to the memo, were made with them. What of it? Latimer and Randall are wanted for cattle swindling by posing as agents of the Department of Agriculture. They were just cattle dealers to me. And you bought the cattle they obtained by criminal methods. As far as I was concerned, the cattle were their own. Mr. Jenkins... I'd like to point out that we're in a position to justifiably charge you with conspiracy for receiving and selling property obtained by criminal methods. But how can you... If you're brought to court, you'd have to explain your books and special memos and all your slaughterhouse operations to some experts who might find something wrong with them. Well? What do you wish to know? Where are Latimer and Randall? I don't know. Who beat you up tonight? They did. Why? All I'm saying is they beat me up, stole $15,000 for me, and escaped in their truck. Can you describe their truck? It's a cattle truck, and the license number is written down in a notebook in my coat pocket. Made. Yes. Get the notebook, please, please. Right. But Jenkins, the beating you've got tonight is what you might expect and deserve for playing ball with criminals. Please. When we catch Latimer and Randall, we'll get the whole story behind your dealings with them. And if it's what I think it is, you'll have quite a bit of explaining to do. Hey, wait, slow up, Al. I'm to a fork in the highway. So, Kel, we take the left turn to Kansas City. How do you know? I marked out the whole route on that map there. Okay, then keep going. Hey, Chuck. Yeah? Maybe we ought to get rid of this truck. Maybe it's getting hot by now. Yeah, I've been thinking of that already. So what do we do? The next town we hit, we kiss it goodbye and borrow somebody else's car. Here's the truck, Mr. Clark. We found it abandoned on a side street here earlier this morning. I see. And just a while ago, a man reported his car stolen during the night. Well, that sounds like two and two to me, officer. Well, that's what we figured. Made. Yes? Well, I'm taking down the information on the stolen car. Will you have a look in the truck? Right. What's the description of the stolen car, officer? Black Chevrolet sedan, 41 model. Sedan, 41 model. Iowa license, 426. 426. 73. Mr. Clark. 73. Yes? Look at this map I found on the seat. What about it? Pencil mark tracing the whole route from Des Moines to Kansas City. Oh? Huh? You think maybe they might be I headed? think we're going to get on an alarm on this stolen car right away and then head for Kansas City. Okay, Al, we didn't come to Kansas City for a rest. Now let's get busy. On what? I got a slaughterhouse all lined up to do business with us. But we ain't got a truck. Oh, I'm going to use one of theirs. Okay, where do we go first? Well, we're following our same plan. I got number one spotted. Come on, let's ride. Mr. Clark. 
Oh, yes, mate. Latimer and Randall are in Kansas City. They're not in a hotel. No? I spent all morning with our agents and the police here checking. No trace of them. No sign of the stolen car either? Not yet. Maybe this other thing will turn them up. What's that? Well, the county farm agent here in Kansas City has been helping me all morning make a lot of telephone calls. I don't get it. Well, Mead, I studied all those jobs that Latimer and Randall pulled around Des Moines. Yeah? And I think I've hit on the pattern of their operation. Really? And if I'm right... Well, if I'm right, maybe the phone is ringing right now with a proof. Mrs. Gilmer, we're sorry to have to report that we find five of your cows diseased. Good heavens, Mr. Latimer. That, that's going to be quite a blow to me. Well, the five head won't be a total loss to you, however. What do you mean? Well, as I told you when I made the appointment for this test, we're authorized to pay you a condemnation fee. Well, at least that's something. Come on, Randall. We'll start loading the cows in the truck. Okay. Those cows are staying right here, Latimer. Hey, what, who says? What's the idea and who are you? We're special agents of the FBI. You want to hear any more? Put up your hands, G-men. Sure, Randall. Sure, we'll put up our hands. Maybe you won't object if I use mine like this. Here, Mead. Take his gun. Right. Thanks for cooperating with us, Mrs. Gilmer. And thanks to you, Latimer, for your policy of cheating widows only. It made it a lot easier for us to catch you. Come on. in the federal court on the charge of impersonating agents of the U.S. government. Latimer and Randall were found guilty and sentenced to the penitentiary. The findings at their trial also enabled FBI agents later to bring the slaughterhouse operator Jenkins to justice and bring about his conviction on a charge of conspiracy. Latimer and Randall, as professional criminals, were enemies of society. But Jenkins, a professing good citizen. Because he conspired with criminals and betrayed the welfare of those whom he would call fellow citizens, Jenkins was that something far morally worse than an enemy of society. He was a Benedict Arnold of society. And it is his kind which does more damage to the moral structure of society than all of its openly avowed enemies combined. Now, before we tell you about next week's story from the files of your FBI... May I remind you that the Equitable Society's Assured Home Ownership Plan is a money-saving plan every step of the way. Naturally, we can't give you every detail here. But your Equitable Life Assurance Society representative can. He has literature that you can study. And once you get the facts, you'll be quick to agree that here's America's finest home ownership plan. Phone him tomorrow. Call the number of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E, the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, The Sinister Lighthouse. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner, the author was Frank Ferries, and your narrator was Dean Carlton. This is your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. And now this is Carl Frank, speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, 
and the Equitable Society's representative in your community, and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time, when the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States will bring you another colorful story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Sinister Lighthouse. On this is your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.